Chaos becomes male, female, and water incubated by light, and the threefold being issues as its firstborn. Ra, or Osiris Ta, creates his own limbs like Brahma by creating the gods destined to personify his phrases during the cycle. The Egyptian Ra, issuing from the deep, is the divine universal soul in its manifested aspect, and so is Narayana. The Purusha, concealed in Akasha and present in ether. This is the metaphysical explanation and refers to the very beginning of evolution, or, as we would rather say, of theogony. The meaning of the stanza, when explained from another standpoint in its reference to the mystery of man and his origin, is still more difficult to comprehend. In order to form a clear conception of what is meant by the one becoming two, and then being transformed into the threefold, the student has to make himself thoroughly acquainted with the what we call rounds. If he refers to esoteric Buddhism, the first attempt to sketch out an approximate outline of archaic cosmogony, he will find that by round is meant the serial evolution of nascent material nature, of the seven globes of our chain. With their mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms, man being included in the latter and standing at the head of it. During the whole period of a life cycle, which latter would be called by the Brahmins a day of Brahma. It is in short one revolution of the wheel, our planetary chain, which is composed of seven globes or seven separate wheels in another sense of this time. When evolution has run downward into matter from globe A to globe G, it is one round. In the middle of the fourth revolution, which is our present round, evolution has reached its acme of physical development, crowned its work with the perfect physical man, and from this point begins its work spiritward. All this needs little repetition, as it is well explained in esoteric Buddhism. That which is hardly touched upon, however, and of which the little that was said has mizzled many, is the origin of man, and it is upon this that a little more light may now be thrown, just enough to make the stanza more comprehensible, as the process will be fully explained only in its legitimate place in Volume 2. Now every round, on the descending scale, it is but a repetition and more concrete form of the round which preceded it. Just as every globe, down to our fourth sphere, the actual Earth, is a grosser and more material copy of the more shadowy sphere which precedes it, each in order on the three higher planes. On its way upwards, on the ascending arc, evolution spiritualizes and etherealizes, so to speak, the general nature of all, bringing it to a level with the plane on which the twin globe on the opposite arc is placed. The result being that when the seventh globe is reached, in whatever round, the nature of everything that is evolving returns to the condition it was at the starting point, plus, every time, a new and superior degree in the states of consciousness. Thus it becomes clear that the origin of man, so-called, in this our present round or life cycle on this planet, must occupy the same place in the same order, save details based on local conditions and time, as in the preceding round. Again, it must be explained and remembered that, as the work of each round is said to be apportioned to a different group of so-called creators or architects, so is that of every globe, that is, it is under the supervision and guidance of special builders and watchers, the various John Chohans. Creators is the incorrect word to use, as no other religion, not even the sect of the Vijavasvedas in India, one which anthropomorphizes even para Brahman, believes in creation ex nihilo, as Christians and Jews do, but only in evolution out of pre-existing materials. The group of the hierarchy which is commissioned to create man is a special group. Yet it evolved shadowy man in this cycle, just as a higher and still more spiritual group evolved him in the third round. 
But as it is the sixth on the downward scale of spirituality, the last and seventh being the terrestrial spirits, elementals, which gradually form, build, and condense his physical body, this sixth group evolves no more than the future man's shadowy form, a filmy, hardly visible, transparent copy of themselves. It becomes the task of the fifth hierarchy, the mysterious beings that preside over the constellation Capricornus, Macara, or Crocodile, in India and in Egypt, to inform the empty and ethereal animal form and make of it the rational man. This is one of those subjects upon which very little may be said to the general public. It is a mystery truly, but only to him who is prepared to reject the existence of intellectual and conscious spiritual beings in the universe, and to limit full consciousness to man alone, and that only as a function of the brain. Many are those among the spiritual entities who have incarnated bodily in man since his first appearance, and who, for all that, still exist as independently as they did before, in the infinitudes of space. To put it more clearly, such an invisible entity may be bodily present on earth without, however, abandoning its status and functions in the supersensuous regions. If this needs explanation, we can do no better than remind the reader of like cases in so-called spiritualism. Though such cases are very rare, at least as regards the nature of the entity incarnating or taking temporary possession of a medium. For the so-called spirits that may occasionally possess themselves of the bodies of mediums are not the monads or higher principles of disembodied personalities. Such spirits can only be either elementaries or nirmanikayas. Just as certain persons, whether by virtue of a peculiar organization or through the power of acquired mystic knowledge, can be seen in their double in one place, while their body is many miles away, so the same thing can occur in the case of superior beings. Man, philosophically considered, is, in his outward form, simply an animal, hardly more perfect than his pithecoid-like ancestor of the third round. He is a living body, not a living being, since the realization of existence, the ego sum, necessitates self-consciousness, and an animal can only have direct consciousness or instinct. This was so well understood by the ancients that even the Kabbalists made of soul and body two lives, independent of each other. In the New Aspects of Life, the author states the Kabbalist teaching. They held that, functionally, spirit and matter of corresponding opacity and density, tended to coalesce, and that the resultant created spirits in the disembodied state were constituted on a scale in which the differing opacities and transparencies of elemental or uncreated spirit were reproduced, and that these spirits in the disembodied state attracted, appropriated, digested, and assimilated elemental spirit and elemental matter whose condition was conformed to their own. They therefore taught that there was a wide difference in the conditions of created spirits, and that in the intimate association between the spirit world and the world of matter, the more opaque spirits in the disembodied state were drawn towards the more dense parts of the material world, and therefore tended towards the center of the earth, where they found the conditions most suited to their state. While the more transparent spirits passed into the surrounding aura of the planet, the most rarefied finding their home in its satellite. This relates exclusively to our elemental spirits and has not to do with either the planetary, sidereal, or cosmic or interetheric intelligent forces, or angels, as they are termed by the Roman Church. The Jewish Kabbalists, especially the practical occultists who dealt with ceremonial magic, busied themselves solely with the spirits of the planets and the elementals, so-called. Therefore, the above covers only a portion of the esoteric teaching. The soul, whose body vehicle is the astral, ethereal substantial envelope, could die a man and be living still on earth. That is to say, 
the soul could free itself and quit the tabernacle for various reasons, such as insanity, spiritual and physical depravity, etc. The possibility of the soul, that is, the eternal spiritual ego, dwelling in the unseen worlds while its body goes on living on earth is a preeminently occult doctrine, especially in Chinese and Buddhist philosophy. Many are the soulless men among us, for the occurrence is found to take place in wicked materialists, as well as in persons who advance in holiness and never turn back. Therefore, that which living men, initiates, can do, the dhyanas, who have no physical body to hamper them, can still do better. This was the belief of the antediluvians and it is fast becoming that modern intellectual society and spiritualism, as well as in the Greek and Roman churches, which teach the ubiquity of their angels. The Zoroastrians regarded their Amshaspans as dual entities. Pharaohers, applying this duality and esoteric philosophy at any rate, to all the spiritual and invisible denizens of the numberless worlds in space, which are visible to our eye. In a note of Damascus, 6th century, on the Chaldean oracles, we have ample evidence of the universality of this doctrine, for he says, In these oracles, the seven cosmocrators of the world, the world pillars, mentioned likewise by St. Paul, are double, one set being commissioned to rule the superior worlds, the spiritual and the sidereal, and the other to guide and watch over the worlds of matter. Such is also the opinion of Yamblichus, who makes an evident distinction between the archangels and the archons. The above may be applied, of course, to the distinction made between the degrees of orders of spiritual beings, and it is in this sense that the Roman Catholic Church tries to interpret and teach the difference. For while the archangels are, in her teaching, divine and holy, she denounces their doubles as devils. But the word pharaoh is not to be understood in this sense, for it means simply the reverse or the opposite side of some attribute or quality. Thus, when the occultist says that the demon is the inverse of God, evil, the reverse of the metal, he does not mean two separate actualities, but two aspects or facets of the same unity. But the best man living side by side with an archangel, as described in theology, would appear a fiend. Hence, a certain reason in depreciating a lower double, immersed far deeper in matter than its original. But still there is a little cause to regard them as devils, as this is precisely what the Roman Catholics maintain against all reason and logic. The identity between the spirit and its material double, in man it is the reverse, explains still better the confusion already alluded to in this work, in the names and individualities, as well as in the numbers of the Rishis and Prajapatis, especially of those of the Satya Yuga and the Mahabharatan period. It also throws additional light on what the secret doctrine teaches with regard to the root and the seed manas. Not only these progenitors of our mankind, but every human being, we are taught, has his prototype in the spiritual spheres which prototype is the highest essence of the seven principle. Thus the seven manas become fourteen, the root manu being the prime cause, and the seed manu its effect. And from the Satya Yuga, the first stage of the heroic period, these manus or rishis become twenty-one in number. B. The concluding sentence of this shloka shows how Archaic is the belief and the doctrine that man is sevenfold in his constitution, the thread of being which animates man and passes through all his personalities or rebirths on this earth, an allusion to Sutrapma, the thread on which, moreover, all his spirits are strung, is spun from the essence of the threefold, the fourfold, and the fivefold which contain all the preceding. Panchashika agreeably to Padma Purana, is one of the seven Kumaras who go to Shveta Vipa to worship Vishnu. We shall see further on what connection there is between the celibate 
and chaste sons of Brahma, who refuse to multiply in terrestrial mortals. Meanwhile, it is evident that the man plant, Septaparna, thus refers to the seven principles, and that man is compared to this seven leaved plant, which is so sacred among Buddhists. The Egyptian allegory in the Book of the Dead that relates to the reward of the soul is as suggestive of our septenary doctrine as it is poetical. The deceased is allotted a piece of land in the field of Anru, wherein the manes, the deified shades of the dead, glean as the harvest they have sown by their actions in life, the corn seven cubits high, which grows in a territory divided into seven and fourteen portions. This corn is the food on which they will live and prosper, or that will kill them, in Amenti, the realm of which the Anaru field is a domain. For, as said in the hymn, the deceased is either destroyed therein or becomes pure spirit for the eternity, in consequence of the seven times seventy-seven lives passed or to be passed on earth. The idea of the corn reaped as the fruit of our actions is very graphic. Number four. It is the root that never dies, the three-tongued flame of the four wicks. The wicks are the sparks that draw from the three-tongued flame. Shot out by the seven, their flame, the beams and sparks of one moon, reflected in the running waves of all the rivers of the earth. A, the three-tongued flame that never dies, is the immortal spiritual triad, the Atma, Bodhi, and Manas, or rather the fruitage of the last, assimilated by the first two after every terrestrial life. The four wicks that go out and are extinguished are the quaternary, the four lower principles including the body. I am the three wicked flame and my wicks are immortal, says the defunct. I enter into the domain of Sekim, the god whose hand sows the seed of action produced by the disembodied soul. And I enter the region of the flames who have destroyed their adversaries, i.e. got rid of the sin creating four wicks. The three-tongued flame of the four wicks corresponds to the four unities and the three binaries of the Sephirothal tree. B. Just as milliards of bright sparks dance on the water of an ocean, above which one and the same moon is shining, so are evanescent personalities, the elusive envelopes of the immortal monad ego, twinkle and dance on the waves of Maya. They appear, and as the thousands of sparks produced by the moonbeams last only so long as the Queen of Night radiates her luster on the running waves of life, the period of Manvantara, and then they disappear. The beams, symbols of our eternal spiritual egos, alone surviving, remerged in and being as they were before, one with the mother source. Stanza 7 continued. Number 5. The spark hangs from the flame by the finest thread of Fohat. It journeys through the seven worlds of Maya. It stops in the first, and is a metal and a stone. It passes into the second, and behold, a plant. The plant whirls through seven forms and becomes a sacred animal. From the combined attributes of these, Manu the thinker is formed. Who forms him? The seven lives and the one life. Who completes him? The fivefold La. And who perfects the last body? Fish, Sin, and Soma. A. The phrase, through the seven worlds of Maya, refers here to the seven globes of the planetary chain in the seven rounds, or the forty-nine stations of active existence that are before the spark, or monad, at the beginning of every great life cycle, or manvantara. The thread of Fohat is the thread of life before referred to. This relates to the greatest problem of philosophy, the physical and substantial nature of life, the independent nature of which is denied by modern science because that science is unable to comprehend it. The reincarnationists and believers in karma alone dimly perceive that the whole secret of life is the unbroken series of its manifestations, whether in or apart from the physical body. Because even if 
Life, like a dome of many-colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. Yet it is itself part and parcel of that eternity, for life alone can understand life. What is that spark which hangs from the flame? It is Eva, the monad in conjunction with manas, or rather, its aroma, that which remains from each personality, when worthy and hangs from atma buddhi, the flame, by the thread of life. In whatever way it is interpreted, and into whatever number of principles the human being is divided, it may be easily shown that this doctrine is supported by all the ancient religions, from the Vedic to the Egyptian, from the Zoroastrian to the Jewish. In the case of the last mentioned, the Kabbalistic works offer abundant proof of this statement. The entire system of the Kabbalistic numerals is based on the divine septenary hanging from the triad, thus forming the decad and its permutations, seven, five, four, and three, which finally all merge into the one itself, an endless and boundless circle. As says the Zohar, the deity, the ever invisible presence, manifests itself through the ten Sephiroth, which are its radiating witnesses. The deity is like the sea from which outflows a stream called wisdom, the waters of which fall into a lake named intelligence. From the basin, like seven channels, issues the seven Sephiroth. For ten equals seven, the Decad contains four unities and three binaries. The ten Sephiroth correspond to the limbs of man. When I, the Elohim, framed Adam Kadmom, the spirit of the Eternal shot out of his body, like a sheet of lightning that radiated at once on the billows of the seven millions of skies, and my ten splendors were his limbs. But neither the head nor the shoulders of Adam Kadmon can be seen. Therefore we read in the Sifra Dizanutha, the Book of the Concealed Mystery, In the beginning of time, after the Elohim, the sons of light and life, or the builders, had shaped out of the eternal essence the heavens and the earth. They formed the worlds six by six. The seventh being Malkuth, which is our earth on its plane, and the lowest on all the other planes of conscious existence. The Chaldean Book of Numbers contains a detailed explanation of all this. The first triad of the body of Adam Kadmon, the three upper planes of the seven, cannot be seen before the soul stands in the presence of the Ancient of Days. The Sephiroth of this upper triad are, number one, Kether, the crown, represented by the brow of Macroprosopus, number two, Chokma, wisdom, a male principle, by his right shoulder, and three, Bina, intelligence, a female principle, by the left shoulder, then come the seven limbs, or Sephiroth, on the planes of manifestation, the total of these four planes being represented by Microprosopus, the lesser face, or tetragrammaton, the four-lettered mystery. The seven manifested and three concealed limbs are the body of the deity. Thus, our earth, Malkuth, is both the seventh and the fourth world. The former, when counting from the first globe above, the latter, if reckoned by the planes. It is generated by the sixth globe, or Sephira, called Yezad, foundation, or, as said in the Book of Numbers, by Yezad, he, Adam Kadmon, fecundates the primitive Hiva, Eve, or our earth, Rendered in mystic language, this is the explanation why Malkuth, called the inferior mother, Matrona, queen and the kingdom of the foundation, is shown as the bride of Tetragrammaton, or Microprosopus, the second Logos, the heavenly man. When free from all impurity, she will become united with the spiritual Logos, i.e. in the seventh race of the seventh round. After the regeneration on the day of Sabbath, for the seventh day again has an occult significance undreamed of by our theologians. When Matronitha, the mother, is separated and brought face to face with the king, in the excellence of the Sabbath, all things become one body. Become one body means that all is reabsorbed once more into the one element, the spirits of men becoming nirvanis 
and the elements of everything else becoming again what they were before. Protail or undifferentiated substance. Sabbath means rest or nirvana. It is not the seventh day after six days, but a period the duration of which equals that of the seven days or any period made up of seven parts. Thus a pralaya is equal in duration to a manvantara, or night of Brahma is equal to his day. If the Christians will follow Jewish customs, they ought to adopt the spirit and not the dead letter thereof. They should work one week of seven days and rest seven days. That the word Sabbath had a mystic significance is disclosed in the contempt shown by Jesus for the Sabbath day, and by what is said in Luke. Sabbath is there taken for the whole week. See the Greek text where the week is called Sabbath. Literally, I fast twice in the Sabbath. Paul, an initiate, knew it well when referring to the eternal rest and felicity in heaven as Sabbath, and their happiness will be eternal, for they will ever be one with the Lord and will enjoy an eternal Sabbath. The difference between the Kabbalah and the archaic esoteric Vidya, taking the Kabbalah as contained in the Chaldean Book of Numbers, not as misrepresented by its now disfigured copy, the Kabbalah of the Christian mystics, is very small indeed, being confined to unimportant divergences of form and expression. Thus, Eastern occultism refers to our earth as the fourth world, the lowest of the chain above which run upward on both curves the six globes, three on each side. The Zohar, and on the other hand, calls the earth the lower, or the seventh, adding that upon the six depend all things which are in it, microprosopus. The smaller face, smaller because manifested and finite, is formed of six sephiroth, says the same work. Seven kings come and die in the thrice-destroyed world. Malkuth, our earth, destroyed after each of the three rounds which it has gone through. And the reign, that of the seven kings, will be broken up. This relates to the seven races, five of which have already appeared, and two more which have still to appear in this round. The Shinto allegorical accounts of cosmogony and the origin of man in Japan hint at that same belief. Captain C. Founders who studied the religion underlying the various sects of the land for nearly nine years in the monasteries of Japan, says, The Shinto idea of creation is as follows. Out of chaos, Kanton, the earth, in, which the sediment precipitated, and the heavens, Yo, the ethereal essences which ascended, man, Jin, appeared between the two. The first man was called Kunitu Ko, Tachino Mikoto, and five other names were given to him, and then the human race appeared, male and female. Isanagi and Isanami begat Tenshoko, Dojin, the first of the five gods of the earth. These gods are simply our five races, Isanagi and Isanami being the two kinds of ancestors the two preceding races which give birth to animal and to rational man. It will be shown in Volume 2 that the number 7, as well as the doctrine of the septenary constitution of man, was preeminent in all the secret systems. It plays as an important a part in Western Kabbalah as in Eastern occultism. Eliphas Levi calls the number 7 the key to the Mosaic creation and the symbols of every religion. He shows the Kabbalah faithfully following even the septenary division of man, for the diagram he gives in his Clef de Grand Mysteries is septenary. This may be seen at a glance, however cleverly the correct thought is veiled. One needs also only look at the diagram, the formation of the soul, in Mather's Kabbalah Unveiled, from the above-mentioned word of Levi, divine the same, though with a different interpretation. Thus it stands with both the Kabbalistic and the occult names attached. Levi calls Nepesh that which we name manas and vice versa. Nepesh is the breath of animal life in man, the breath of life. Instinctual in the animal and manas is the third soul, 
the human in its light side, and animal in its connection with Samael or Kama. Nefesh is really the breath of animal life, breathed into Adam, the man of dust. It is consequently the vital spark, the informing element. Without man as the reasoning soul, or mind, which is Levi's diagram, is miscalled Nepesh, Atma Bhuti is irrational on this plane and cannot act. It is Bhuti, which is the plastic mediator, not manas, the intelligent medium between the upper triad and the lower quaternary. But there are many such strange and curious transformations to be found in the Kabbalistic works, a convincing proof that this literature has become a sad jumble. We do not accept the classification, except in this one particular, in order to show the points of agreement. We will now give in tabular form what the very cautious we will now give in tabular form what the very cautious Eliphas Levi says in explanation of his diagram, and what the esoteric doctrine teaches and compare the two. Levi, too, makes a distinction between Kabbalistic and occult pneumatics. The first column says Eliphas Levi, the Kabbalist, Kabbalistic pneumatics. The second column say the Theosophists, esoteric pneumatics. Number one, the soul or ego is clothed light and this light is triple. Number one, the same for it is Atma Bodhi Manas. Number two, Nishama, pure spirit. Number two, the same. Number three, Ruach, the solar spirit. Number three, spiritual soul. Number four, Nepash, plastic mediator. Number four, mediator between spirit and man, the seat of reason, the mind in man. Number five, the garment of the soul is the ring, body of the image, astral soul. Number five, correct. Number six, the image is doubled because it reflects the good and the bad. Number six, too uselessly apocalyptic. Why not say that the astral reflects the good as well as the bad man, man who is ever trending to the upper triad, or else disappears with the quaternary? Seven, image body. Seven, the earthly image. Column one, occult pneumatics as given by Eliphas Levi. And column two, occult pneumatics as given by the occultists. Number one, Nefesh is immortal because it renews its life by the destruction of forms. But Nefesh, the breath of life, is a misnomer and a useless puzzle to the student. Number one, Manas is immortal because after every new incarnation it adds to Atma Bodhi something of itself and thus assimilating itself to the monad shares its immortality. Number two, Ruach progresses by the evolution of ideas. Number two, Bodhi becomes conscious by the accretions it gets from manas, on the death of man after every new incarnation. Number three, Nishama is progressive without oblivion and destruction. Number three, Atma neither progresses, forgets, nor remembers. It does not belong to this plane. It is but the ray of light eternal which shines upon and through the darkness of matter, when the latter is willing. Number four, the soul has three dwellings. Number four, the soul collectively, as the upper triad, lives on three planes. Besides its fourth, the terrestrial plane, and it is eternally on the highest of the three. Number five, the dwellings are the plane of mortals, the superior's Eden, and the inferior Eden. Number five, the dwellings are Earth for the physical man, or animal soul, Kamaloka, Hades, the limbo, for the disembodied man, or his shell, Devachan, for the higher triad. Number six, the image, man, is a sphinx that offers the riddle of birth. Number six, correct. Number seven, the fatal image, the astral, endows Nepesh with its aptitudes, but Ruach is able to substitute for it the image conquered in accordance with the inspirations of Nishama. Number seven, the astral, through Kama, desire, 
is ever drawing manas down into the sphere of material passions and desires. But if the better man or manas tries to escape the fatal attraction and turns its aspirations to atma, nishama, then buddhi, ruach, conquers and carries manas with it to the realm of eternal spirit. It is now very evident that the French Kabbalist either did not sufficiently know the real tenant, or distorted it to suit himself and his objects. Thus he says again, treating upon the same subject as follows, and we occultists answer the late Kabbalist and his admirers also as follows. Number one, the body is the mold of Nepesh, Nepesh the mold of Ruach, Ruach the mold of the garment of Neshama. Number one, the body follows the whims, good or bad, of manas. Manas tries to follow the light of booty but often fails. Booty is the mold of the garments of Atma, for Atma is no body or shape or anything, and because booty is only figuratively its vehicle. Number two, light, the soul, personifies itself in clothing itself with a body, and personality endures only when the garment is perfect. Number two, the monad becomes a personal ego when it incarnates, and something remains of that personality through manas, when the latter is perfect enough to assimilate booty. Number three, the angels aspire to become men, a perfect man, a man-god, is above all the angels. Number three, correct. Number four, every 14,000 years, the soul rejuvenates and rests in the jubilean sleep of oblivion. Number four, within a period, a great age or a day of Brahma, 14 Manus reign, after which comes Pralaya, when all the souls, egos, rest in Nirvana. Such are the distorted copies of the esoteric doctrine in the Kabbalah. But to return to Shloka 5 of stanza 7. B. The well-known Kabbalistic aphorism runs, A stone becomes a plant, a plant, a beast, the beast, a man, a man, a spirit, and the spirit, a god. The spark animates all the kingdoms in turn before it enters into and informs divine man, between whom and his predecessor, animal man, there is all the difference in the world. Genesis begins its anthropology at the wrong end, evidently for a blind and lands nowhere. The introductory chapters of Genesis were never meant to represent even a remote allegory of the creation of our earth. They embrace a metaphysical conception of some indefinite period, in eternity, when successive attempts were being made by the law of evolution at the formation of universes. The idea is plainly stated in the Zohar. There were old worlds which perished as soon as they came into existence, were formless and were called sparks. Thus, the smith, when hammering the iron, lets the sparks fly in all directions. The sparks are the primordial worlds which could not continue because the sacred aged, Sephira, had not as yet assumed its form of androgyne or opposite sexes. Of king and queen, Sephira and Cadmon. And the master was not yet at his work. Had Genesis begun as it ought, one would have found in it first the celestial logos, the heavenly man, which evolves as a compound unit of logi, out of which, after their prolaic sleep, a sleep that gathers the numbers scattered on the Maavik plane into one, and separates the globules of quicksilver on a plate blend into one mass. The Logi appear in their totality as the first, male and female, or Adam Cadmon, the Fiat Lux of the Bible, as we have already seen. But this transformation did not take place on our earth, nor on any material plane, but in the special depths of the first differentiation of the eternal root matter. On our nascent globe, things proceed differently. The monad, or yiva, as said in Isis Unveiled, is first of all shot down by the law of evolution into the lowest form of matter, the mineral. After a sevenfold gyration encased in the stone, or that which will become mineral and stone in the fourth round, it creeps out of it, say, as a lichen. Passing thence, 
through all the forms of vegetable matter into what is termed animal matter, it has now reached the point at which it has become the germ, so to speak, of the animal that will become the physical man. All this, up to the third round, is formless as matter and senseless as consciousness. For the monad, or yiva, per se, cannot be called even spirit. It is a ray, a breath of the absolute, or the absoluteness, rather, and the absolute homogeneity having no relations with the conditioned and relative finiteness is unconscious on our plane. Therefore, besides the material which will be needed for its future human form, the monad requires a, a spiritual model or prototype for that material to shape itself into, and b, an intelligent consciousness to guide its evolution and progress neither of which is possessed by the homogeneous monad, or by senseless though living matter. The atom of dust requires the soul of life to be breathed into him. The two middle principles, which are the sentient life of the irrational animal and the human soul, for the former is irrational without the latter, it is only when, from a potential androgyne, man has become separated into male and female, that he will be endowed with this conscious, rational, individual soul, manas. The principle or the intelligence of the Elohim, to receive which he has to eat of the fruit of knowledge, from the tree of good and evil, how is he to obtain all this? The occult doctrine teaches that while the monad is cycling on downward into matter, these very Elohim, or Petris, the lower Dian Chohans, are evolving. Peri Passu with it. On a higher and more spiritual plane, descending also relatively into matter on their own plane of consciousness, when after having reached a certain point, they will meet the incarnating senseless monad, encased in the lowest matter and blending the two potencies, spirit and matter, the union will produce the terrestrial symbol of the heavenly man in space. Perfect man. In the Sankhya philosophy, Purusha, spirit, is spoken of as something impotent unless it mounts on the shoulders of Prakriti, matter, which left alone is senseless. But in the secret philosophy, they are viewed as graduated. Spirit and matter, though one and the same thing in their origin, when once they are on the plane of differentiation, begin each of them their evolutionary progress in contrary directions. Spirit falling gradually into matter and the latter ascending to its original condition, that of pure spiritual substance. Both are inseparable, yet ever separated. On the physical plane, two like poles will always repel each other, while the negative and the positive are mutually attracted. So do spirit and matter stand to each other, the two poles of the same homogeneous substance, the root principle of the universe. Therefore, when the hour strikes for Purusha to mount on Prakriti's shoulders for the formation of the perfect man, rudimentary man of the first two and a half races being only the first, gradually evolving into the most perfect of mammals, the celestial ancestors, entities from our preceding worlds called in India the Shishta, step in on this our plane and incarnate in the physical or animal man as the Petris had stepped in before them for the formation of the latter. Thus, the two processes for the two creations, the animal and the divine man, differ greatly. The Petris shoot out from their ethereal bodies still more ethereal and shadowy similitudes of themselves, or what we should now call doubles or astral forms in their own likeness. This furnishes the monad with its first dwelling, and blind matter with a model around upon which to build henceforth. But man is still incomplete. From Svayambhuva Manu, from who descended the seven primitive Manus, or Prajapatis, each of whom gave birth to a primitive race of men, down to the Codex Nazareth, in which Carabantos, or Fetahil, Blind concupiscent matter begets on his mother, spiritus, seven figures, 
each of which stands as a progenitor of one of the primeval seven races. This doctrine has left its impress on every archaic scripture. Who forms Manu, the man, and who forms his body? The life and the lives, sin and the moon. Here Manu stands for the spiritual heavenly man, the real and non-dying ego in us, which is the direct emanation of the one life, or the absolute deity. As to our outward physical bodies, the house of the tabernacle of the soul, the doctrine teaches a strange lesson, so strange that unless thoroughly explained and as thoroughly comprehended, it is only the exact science of the future that is destined to fully vindicate the theory. It has been stated before now that occultism does not accept anything inorganic in the cosmos. The expression employed by science, inorganic substance, means simply that the latent life, slumbering in the molecules of so-called inert matter, is incognizable. All is life, and every atom of every mineral dust is a life, though beyond our comprehension and perception because it is outside the range of the laws known to those who reject occultism. The very atoms, says Tyndall, seem instinct with desire for life. Whence, then, we would ask, comes the tendency to run into organic form? Is it in any way explicable except according to the teachings of occult science? The worlds to the profane are built up of the known elements. To the conception of an Arhat, these elements are themselves collectively a divine life. Distributively, on the plane of manifestations, the numberless and countless crores of lives. Fire alone is one, on the plane of the one reality, on that of manifested, hence elusive, being its particles are fiery lives which live and have their being at the expense of every other life that they consume. Therefore they are named the devourers. Every visible thing in the universe was built by such lives, from conscious and divine primordial man down to the unconscious agents that construct matter. From the one life, formless and uncreate, proceeds the universe of lives. First was manifested from the deep, chaos, cold luminous fire, gaseous light, which formed the curds in space, irresolvable nebulae, perhaps. These fought, and a great heat was developed by the encountering and collision which produced rotation. Then came the first manifested material fire, the hot flames, the wanderers in heaven, comets. Heat generates moist vapor that forms solid water. Then dry mist, then liquid mist, watery that puts out the luminous brightness of the pilgrims, comets, and forms solid watery wheels. Matter globes? Bumi, the earth, appears with six sisters. These produce by their continuous motion the inferior fire, heat, and an aqueous mist, which yields the third world element, water, and from the breath of all, atmospheric, air, is born. These four are the four lives of the first four periods, rounds of Manvantara. The three last will follow. The commentary first speaks of the numberless and countless cores of lives. Is Pasteur then unconsciously taking the first step toward occult science in declaring that if he dared express his ideas fully upon this subject, he would say that the organic cells are endowed with a vital potency that does not seize its activity with the cessation of a current of oxygen towards them and does not, on that account, break off its relations with life itself, which is supported by the influence of that gas? I would add, continues Pasteur, that the evolution of the germ is accomplished by means of complicated phenomena, including which we must class processes of fermentation, and life, according to Claude Bernard and Pasteur, is nothing else than a process of fermentation. That there exist in nature beings or lives that can live and thrive without air, even on our globe, has been demonstrated by the same scientists. Pasteur found that many of the lower lives, such as vibrions and other microbes and bacteria, could exist without air, which, on the contrary, killed them. 
They derived the oxygen necessary for the multiplication from the various substances that surrounded them. He called them aerobes, living on the tissues of our matter. When the latter has ceased to form the part of an integral and living whole, then called very unscientifically by science dead matter and anaerobes. The one kind binds oxygen and contributes greatly to the destruction of animal life and vegetable tissues, furnishing to the atmosphere materials which enter, later on, into the constitution of other organisms. The other finally destroys, or rather annihilates, the so-called organic substance, ultimate decay being impossible without their participation. Certain germ cells, such as those of yeast, develop and multiply in air, but when deprived of it, they will adapt themselves to life without air and become ferments, absorbing oxygen from substances coming in contact with them and thereby ruining the latter. The cells in fruit, when lacking free oxygen, act as ferments and stimulate fermentation. Therefore, the vegetable cell, in this case, manifests its life as an anaerobic being. Why, then, should an organic cell form, in this case, an exception? Asks Professor Bogolubouf. Pasteur shows that in the substance of our tissues and organs, the cell, not finding sufficient oxygen for itself, stimulates fermentation in the same way as the fruit cell, and Claude Bernard thought that Pasteur's idea of the formation of the ferments found its application and corroboration in the fact that urea increases in the blood during strangulation. Life, therefore, is everywhere in the universe, and occultism teaches us it is also in the atom. Bumi appears with six sisters, says the commentary. It is a Vedic teaching that there are three earths corresponding to three heavens and our earth, the fourth, is called Bhumi. This is the explanation given by our exoteric Western Orientalists. But the esoteric meaning, an allusion to it in the Vedas, is that it refers to our planetary chain, three earths on the descending arc and the three heavens, which are the three earths or globes also, are far more ethereal on the ascending or spiritual arc. By the first three we descend into matter, by the other three we ascend into spirit. The lowest one, Bhumi, our earth, forming the turning point, so to say, and containing, potentially, as much as spirit as it does of matter. But we shall treat of this hereafter. The general teaching of the commentary, then, is that every new round develops one of the compound elements as now known to science which rejects the primitive nomenclature, preferring to subdivide them into constituents. If nature is the ever-becoming on the manifested plane, then these elements are to be regarded in the same light. They have to evolve, progress, and increase to the manventaric end. Thus, the first round, we are taught, developed but one element, and a nature and humanity in what may be spoken of as one aspect of nature, called by some very unscientifically, though it may be so de facto, one-dimensional space. The second round brought forth and developed two elements, fire and earth, and its humanity adapted to its condition of nature. If we can give the name humanity to beings living under conditions now unknown to men was to use again a familiar phrase in a strictly figurative sense, the only way in which it can be used correctly, a two-dimensional species. The processes of natural development which are now considering will at once elucidate and discredit the fashion of speculating on the attributes of two, three, and four or more dimensional space. But in passing, it is worthwhile to point out the real significance of the sound but incomplete intuition that is prompted among spiritualists and theosophists and several great men of science for the matter of that. The use of the modern expression, the fourth dimension of space, to begin with the superficial absurdity of assuming that space itself is measurable in any direction is of little consequence. The familiar phrase can only be an abbreviation of the fuller form, the fourth dimension of matter in space. But even thus expanded, it is an unhappy phrase, 
because while it is perfectly true that the progress of evolution may be destined to introduce us to new characteristics of matter, those with which we are already familiar and really more numerous than the three dimensions, the qualities, or what is perhaps the best available term, the characteristics of matter, must clearly bear a direct relation always to the senses of man. Matter has extension, color, motion, molecular motion, taste and smell, corresponding to the existing senses of man and the next characteristic it develops. Let us call it, for the moment, permeability. It will correspond to the next sense of man, which we may call normal clairvoyance. Thus, when some bold thinkers have been thirsting for a fourth dimension, to explain the passage of matter through matter, and the production of knots upon an endless cord, they have been in want of a sixth characteristic of matter. The three dimensions belong really to only one attribute or characteristic of matter, extension, and popular common sense justly rebels against that idea. Under any condition of things, there can be more than three of such dimensions as length, breadth, and thickness. These terms and the term dimension itself all belong to one plane of thought, to one stage of evolution, to one characteristic of matter. So long as there are foot rules within the resources of cosmos to apply to matter, so long as they will be able to measure it three ways and no more, just as from the time the idea of measurement first occupied a place in the human understanding, it has been possible to apply measurement in three directions and no more. But these considerations do not in any way mitigate against the certainty that, in the progress of time, as the faculties of humanity are multiplied, so will the characteristics of matter be multiplied also. Meanwhile, the expression is far more incorrect than even the familiar phrase of the sun's rising or setting. We now return to the consideration of material evolution through the rounds. Matter in the second round, it has been stated, may be figuratively referred to as two-dimensional. But here another caveat must be entered. This loose and figurative expression may be regarded, on one plane of thought, as we have just seen, as equivalent to the second characteristic of matter, corresponding to the second perceptive faculty or sense of man. But these two linked scales of evolution are concerned with the processes going on within the limits of a single round. The succession of primary aspects of nature, with which the succession of rounds is concerned, has to do, as already indicated, with the development of the elements. In the occult sense, fire, air, water, earth. We are only in the fourth round, and our catalog so far stops short. The order in which these elements are mentioned, in the last sentence but one, is the correct one for the esoteric purposes and in the secret teachings. Milton was right when he spoke of the powers of fire, air, water, earth. The earth, such as we know it now, had no existence before the fourth round, hundreds of millions of years ago, the commencement of our geological earth. The globe, says the commentary, was fiery, cool, and radiant as its ethereal men and animals during the first round, a contradiction or paradox in the opinion of our present science. Luminous and more dense and heavy during the second round, watery during the third, thus are the elements reversed. The centers of consciousness of the third round, destined to develop into humanity as we know it, arrived at a perception of the third element, water. If we had to frame our conclusions according to the data furnished by the geologists, then we would say that there was no real water, even during the Carboniferous period. We are told that gigantic masses of carbon, which existed formerly, spread in the atmosphere as carbonic acid, were absorbed by plants, while a large proportion of that gas was mixed in the water. Now, if this be so, and we have to believe that all the carbonic acid which went to compose those plants that formed bituminous coal, lignite, etc., and went towards the formation of limestone and so on, that all this was at that period in the atmosphere in gaseous form, then there must have been seas and oceans of liquid carbonic acid. 
But how then could the Carboniferous period be preceded by the Devonian and Silurian ages? Those of fishes and mollusks on that assumption. Barometric pressure, moreover, must have exceeded several hundred times the pressure of our present atmosphere. How could organisms, even so simple as those of certain fishes and mollusks, stand that? There is a curious work by Blanchard on the origin of life, wherein he shows some strange contradictions and confusions in the theories of his colleagues, and which we recommend to the reader's attention. Those of the fourth round have added earth as a state of matter to their shock as well as the three other elements in their present transformation. In short, none of the so-called elements were, in the three preceding rounds, as they are now. For all we know, fire may have been pure acacia, the first matter of the magnum opus, of the creators and builders, that astral light which the paradoxical Eliphas Levi calls in one breath the body of the Holy Ghost, and in the next Baphomet the androgyne goat of Mendes. Air, simply nitrogen, the breath of the supporters of the heavenly dome, as the Mahometan mystics call it. Water, that primordial fluid which was required, according to Moses, to make a living soul. And this may account for the flagrant discrepancies and unscientific statements found in Genesis. Separate the first from the second chapter, read the former as a scripture of the Elohists, and the latter as that of the far later Jehovists, still one finds, if one reads between the lines, the same order in which created things appear. Fire, light, air, water, and man, or earth. For the sentence of the first chapter, the Elohistic, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, is a mistranslation. It is not the heaven and the earth, but the duplex or dual heaven, the upper and the lower heavens, or the separation of primordial substance that was light in its upper and dark in its lower portions. The manifested universe, in its duality of the invisible to the senses and the visible to our perceptions. God divided the light from the darkness and then made the firmament, air. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters, i.e. the waters which were under the firmament, our manifested visible universe from the waters which were above the firmament, the, to us, invisible planes of being. In the second chapter, the Jehovistic, plants and herbs are created before water, just as in the first, light is produced before the sun. God made the earth and the heavens and every plant in the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God, Elohim, had not caused it to rain upon the earth, etc. An absurdity unless the esoteric explanation is accepted. The plants were created before they were in the earth. For there was no earth then such as it is now. And the herb of the field was in existence before it grew as it does now, in the fourth round. Discussing and explaining the nature of the invisible elements and the primordial fire mentioned above, Eliphas Levi invariably calls it the astral light. With him it is the grand agent magic. Undeniably it is so, but only so far as black magic is concerned and on the lowest planes of what we call ether the noumenon of which is Akasha, and even this would be held incorrect by orthodox occultists. The astral light is simply the older sidereal light of Paracelsus, and to say that everything which exists has been evolved from it, and it preserves and reproduces all forms, as he does, to enunciate truth only in the second proposition. The first is erroneous, for if all that exists was evolved through, or via, it, this is not the astral light. Since the latter is not the container of all things, but, at best, only the reflector of this all. Eliphas Levi very truly shows it a force in nature, by means of which a single man who can master it might throw the world into confusion and transform its face. For it is the great arcanum of transcendent magic. 
Quoting the words of the great Western Kabbalist in their translated form, we may perhaps the better explain them by the occasional addition of a word or two to show the difference between Western and Eastern explanations of the same subject. The author says of the great magic agent, This ambient and all-penetrating fluid, this ray detached from the central or spiritual sun's splendor, fixed by the weight of the atmosphere and the power of central attraction, the astral light, this electromagnetic ether, this vital and luminous caloric, is represented on ancient monuments by the girdle of Isis, which twines around two poles, and in ancient theogenies by the serpent devouring its own tail, emblem of prudence and of Saturn, emblem of infinity, immortality, and Kronos, time, not the god Saturn or the planet. It is the winged dragon of Medea, the double serpent of the Caduceus, and the tempter of Genesis. But it is also the brazen snake of Moses encircling the Tao. Lastly, it is the devil of exoteric dogmatism. And it is really the blind force, it is not blind and Levi knew it, which souls must conquer in order to detach themselves from the chains of earth. For if they should not, they will be absorbed by the same power which first produced them, and will return to the central and eternal fire. This great Archaeus is now publicly discovered by and for only one man, J. W. Keeley of Philadelphia. For others, however, it is discovered, yet must remain almost useless. So far shalt thou go. All the above is as practical as it is correct, save one error which we must explain. Eliphas Levi commits a great blunder in always identifying the astral light with which we call Akasha. What it really is will be expounded in Volume 2. Eliphas Levi further writes, The great magic agent is the fourth emanation of the life principle. We say it is the first in the inner and the second in the outer, our universe, of which the sun is the third form. For the day star, the sun is only the reflection and material shadow of the central sun of truth, which illuminates the intellectual and visible world of spirit, and which itself is but a gleam borrowed from the absolute. So far he is right enough. But when the great authority of the Western Kabbalist adds that, nevertheless, it is not the immortal spirit as the Indian hierophants have imagined, we answer that he slanders the said hierophants, as they have said nothing of the kind. For even the Puranic exoteric writings flatly contradict this assertion. No Hindu has ever mistaken Prakriti, the astral light being only above the lowest plane of Prakriti, the material cosmos, for the immortal spirit. Prakriti is ever called Maya, illusion, and is doomed to disappear with the rest, the gods included, at the hour of Pralaya. As it is shown that Akasha is not even the ether, least of all, then, we imagine, it can it be the astral light? Those unable to penetrate beyond the dead letter of the Puranas have occasionally confused Akasha with Prakriti, with ether, and even with the visible sky. It is true that those who have invariably translated the term Akasha by ether, Wilson, for instance, finding it called the material cause of sound, possessing moreover this one single property, have ignorantly imagined it to be material in the physical sense. True again that if the characteristics are accepted literally, then since nothing material or physical and therefore conditioned and temporary can be immortal, According to metaphysics and philosophy, it would follow that Akasha is neither infinite nor immortal. But all this is erroneous, since both the words pradana, primeval matter, and sound as a property, have been misunderstood. The former term, pradana, being certainly synonymous with mula prakriti and Akasha, and the latter, sound, with the verbum, the word, or the logos. This is easy to demonstrate, for it is shown in the following sentence from Vishnu Purana. There was neither day nor night, nor sky nor earth, nor darkness nor light, 
nor any other thing save only one, unapprehensible by intellect, or that which is Brahman and Pums, spirit, and Pradana, primordial matter. Now, what is Pradana if it is not Mula Prakriti, the root of all, in another aspect? For though Pradana is said further on to merge into the deity, as everything else does, in order to leave the one absolute during the pralaya, yet it is held as infinite and immortal. The literal translation is given as one Pradhanika Brahma spirit that was, and the commentator interprets the compound term as a substantive, not as a derivative word used attributively i.e. like something conjoined with Prada. The student has to note, moreover, that the Puranic is a dualistic system, not evolutionary, and that in this respect far more will be found, from an esoteric standpoint, in the Sankhya and even in the Manava Dharma Shastra, however much the latter differs from the former. Hence, Pradana is, even in the Puranas, is an aspect of Parabrahman, not in evolution and must be the same as the Vedantic Mula Prakriti. Prakriti, in its primary state, is Akasha, says a Vedantin scholar. It is almost abstract nature. Akasha, then, is Pradana in another form, and as such cannot be ether, the ever-invisible agent, courted even by physical science. Nor is it astral light. It is said the noumenon, of the sevenfold differentiated Prakriti, the ever immaculate mother of the fatherless son who becomes father on the lower manifested plane. For Mahat is the first product of Brnana, or Akasha, and Mahat, universal intelligence, whose characteristic property is Buddhi, is no other than the Logos, for he is called Ishvara, Brahma, Bhava, etc. He is, in short, the creator, or the divine mind in creative operation, the cause of all things. He is firstborn of whom the Puranas tell us that earth and Mahat are the inner and outer boundaries of the universe, or, in our language, the negative and the positive poles of dual nature, abstract and concrete. For the Purana adds, in this manner, as were the seven forms, principles of Prakriti, Reckoned from Mahat to Earth, so at the time, time of elemental dissolution, Pratyahara, these seven successively re enter into each other. The egg of Brahma, Sarva Mandala, is dissolved with its seven zones, Vipa, seven oceans, seven regions, etc. These are the reasons why the occultists refuse to give the name of the astral light to Akasha, or to call it ether. In my father's house are many mansions. May be contrasted with the occult saying, In our mother's house are seven mansions, or planes, the lowest of which is above and around us the astral light. The elements, whether simple or compound, could not have remained the same since the commencement of the evolution of our chain. Everything in the universe progresses steadily in the great cycle, while incessantly going up and down in the smaller cycles. Nature is never stationary during Manvantara, as it is ever becoming, not simply being, and mineral, vegetable, and human life are always adapting their organisms to the then reigning elements. And therefore those elements were then fitted for them, as they are now for the life of present humanity. It will only be in the next or fifth round that the fifth element, ether, the gross body of Akasha, if it can be called even that, will by becoming a familiar fact of nature to all men, as air is familiar to us now, cease to be, as at present, hypothetical, and an agent for so many things. And only during that round will those higher senses the growth and development of which Akasha subserves be susceptible of a complete expansion. As already indicated, a partial familiarity with the characteristic of matter, permeability, which should be developed concurrently with the sixth sense, may be expected to develop at the proper period in this round. 
But with the next element added to our resources in the next round, permeability will become so manifest a characteristic of matter that the densest form of this round will seem to man's perceptions as obstructive to him as a thick fog and no more. Let us now return to the life cycle. Without entering at length upon the description given of the higher lives, we must direct our attention, at present, simply to the earthly beings and the earth itself. The latter, we are told, is built up for the first round by the devourers, which disintegrate and differentiate the germs of other lives in the elements. Pretty much, it must be supposed, as in the present stage of the world, the aerobes do, when undermining and loosening the chemical structure in an organism. They transform animal matter and generate substances that vary in their constitutions. Thus, occultism disposes of the so-called Azoic Age of Science, for it shows that there never was a time when the Earth was without life upon it. Wherever there is an atom of matter, a particle, or a molecule, even in its most gaseous condition, there is life in it, however latent and unconscious. Whatsoever quits the Laia state becomes active life. It is drawn into the vortex of motion, the alchemical solvent of life. Spirit and matter are the two states of the one, which is neither spirit nor matter, both being the absolute life, latent. Spirit is the first differentiation of, and in, space, and matter the first differentiation of spirit. That which is neither spirit nor matter, that is it, the causeless cause of spirit and matter, which are the cause of cosmos, and that we call the one life, or the intracosmic breath. Once more we say, like must produce like. Absolute life cannot produce an inorganic atom, whether simple or complex. And there is life even in the laia, just as a man in a profound, cataleptic state. To all appearance, a corpse is still a living being. When the devourers, in whom the men of science are invited to see, with some show of reason, atoms of the fire mist, if they will, as the occultists will offer no objection to this, when the devourers, we say, have differentiated the fire atoms by a peculiar process of segmentation. The latter become life germs which aggregate according to the laws of cohesion and affinity. Then the life germs produce lives of another kind, which work on the structure of our globes. Thus, in the first round, the globe having been built by the primitive fire lives, i.e. formed into a sphere, had no solidity, no qualifications, save a cold brightness, no form, no color. It is only towards the end of the first round that it developed one element, which, from its inorganic, so to say, or simple essence, has become now, in our round, the fire we know throughout the system. The earth was in her first rupa, the essence of which is the Akashic principle named, that which is now known as, and very erroneously termed, astral light, which Eliphas Levi calls the imagination of nature, probably to avoid giving it its correct name, as others do. Speaking of it, in his preface to the Histoire de la Magique, Eliphas Levi says, it is through this force that all the nerve centers secretly communicate with each other. From it, that sympathy and antipathy are born. From it, that we have our dreams. And that the phenomena of second sight and extra-natural visions take place. Astral light, acting under the impulsion of powerful wills, destroys, coagulates, separates, breaks, and gathers in all things. God created it on that day when he said, Fiat Lux. It is directed by the egregores, i.e. the chiefs of the souls who are the spirits of energy and action. Eliphas Levi ought to have added that the astral light, or primordial substance, if matter at all, is that which, called light, lux, esoterically explained, is the body of those spirits themselves and their very essence. Our physical light is the manifestation on our plane, and the reflected radiance of the divine light, emanating from the collective body of those who are called the lights and the flames. 
but no other Kabbalist has ever had the talent of heaping up one contradiction on the other, of making one paradox chase another in the same sentence, and in such flowing language as Eliphas Levi. He leads his reader through the most lovely valleys to strand him after all on a desert and barren rock. Says the commentary, It is through and from the radiations of the seven bodies of the seven orders of Dhyanis that the seven discrete quantities, elements, whose motion and harmonious union produce the manifested universe of matter, are born. The second round brings into manifestation the second element air, an element the purity of which would ensure continuous life to him who would use it. In Europe there have been two occultists only who have discovered and even partially applied it in practice, though its composition has always been known among the highest eastern initiates. The ozone of the modern chemists is poison compared with the real universal solvent, which could never be thought of unless it existed in nature. From the second round, Earth, hitherto a fetus in the matrix of space, began its real existence. It had developed individual sentient life, its second principle. The second corresponds to the sixth principle. The second is life continuous, the other temporary. The third round developed the third principle, water, while the fourth transformed the gaseous fluids and plastic form of our globe into the hard, crusted, grossly material sphere we are living on. Bumi has reached her fourth principle. To this it may be objected that the law of analogy, so much insisted upon, is broken. Not at all. Earth will reach her true ultimate form, her body shell, inversely in this to man, only toward the end of the Manvantara after the seventh round. Eugenius Philethes was right when he assured his readers, on his word of honor, that no one had yet seen the earth, i.e. matter, in its essential form. Our globe is, so far, in its kamarupic state, the astral body of desires of Ahamkara, dark egotism, the progeny of Mahat on the lower plane. It is not molecularly constituted matter, least of all the human body. Stula Sharira, that is the grossest of all our principles, but verily the middle principle. The real animal center, whereas our body is but its shell, the irresponsible factor and medium through which the beast in us acts in all its life. Every intellectual theosophist will understand my real meaning. Thus, the idea that the human tabernacle is built by countless lives, just in the same way as was the rocky crust of our earth, has nothing repulsive in it for the true mystic. Nor can science oppose the occult teaching, for it is not because the microscope will ever fail to detect the ultimate living atom or life that it can reject the doctrine. C. Science teaches us that the living as well as the dead organisms of both man and animal are swarming with bacteria of a hundred various kinds. That from without we are threatened with the invasion of microbes with every breath we draw. And from within by leucomanes, aerobes, anaerobes, and what not. But science has never yet gone so far as to assert with the occult doctrine that our bodies as well as those of animals, plants, and stones are themselves altogether built up of such beings, which, with the exception of the larger species, no microscope can detect. So far as regards the purely animal and material portion of man, science is on its way to discoveries that will go far towards corroborating this theory. Chemistry and physiology are the two great magicians of the future, which are destined to open the eyes of mankind to great physical truths. With every day, the identity between the animal and physical man, between the plant and man, and even between the reptile and its nest, the rock and man, is more and more clearly shown. The physical and chemical constituents of all being found to be identical. Chemical science may well say that there is no difference between the matter which composes the ox and that which forms man. But the occult doctrine is far more explicit. It says, 
Not only the chemical compounds are the same, but the same infinitesimal and visible lives compose the atoms of the bodies of the mountain and the daisy, of man and the ant, of the elephant and of the tree which shelters it from the sun. Each particle, whether you call it organic or inorganic, is a life. Every atom and molecule in the universe is both life-giving and death-giving to such forms, and as much as it builds by aggregation universes and the ephemeral vehicles ready to receive the transmigrating soul, and as eternally destroys and changes the forms and expels the souls from their temporary abodes. It creates and kills, it is self-generating and self-destroying. It brings into being and annihilates the mystery of the mysteries. The living body of man, animal or plant, every second in time and space, and it generates equally life and death, beauty and ugliness, good and bad, and even the agreeable and disagreeable. The Beneficent and Maleficent Sensations It is that mysterious life, represented collectively by countless myriads of lives that follows, in its own sporadic way, the hitherto incomprehensible law of atavism, that copies family resemblances, as well as those it finds impressed in the aura of the generators of every future human being. A mystery, in short, that will receive further attention elsewhere. For the present, one instance may be cited in illustration. Modern science is beginning to find out that Tomain, the alkaloid poison generated by decaying corpses in matter, a life also extracted with the help of volatile ether, yields a smell as strong as that of the freshest orange blossoms, but that free from oxygen, such alkaloids yield either a most sickening, disgusting smell, or a most agreeable aroma, which recalls that of the most delicately scented flowers and it is suspected that such blossoms owe their agreeable smell to the poisonous tomain. The venomous essence of certain fungi also is nearly identical with the venom of the cobra of India, the most deadly of serpents. The French savants Arnaud, Gautier, and Villiers have found in the saliva of living men the same venomous alkaloid as that of the toad, the salamander, the cobra, and the Trigonocephalus of Portugal. It is proven that venom of the deadliest kind, whether called tomain or leucomane or alkaloid, is generated by living men, animals, and plants. Gautier also discovered an alkaloid in the fresh carcass and brains of an ox, and a venom which he calls xanthocreatinine, similar to the substance extracted from the poisonous saliva of reptiles. It is the muscular tissues, the most active organs in the animal economy, that are suspected of being the generators or factors of venoms, which have the same importance as carbonic acid and urea in the functions of life, and are the ultimate products of inner combustion. And though it is not yet fully determined whether poisons can be generated by the animal systems of living beings without the participation and interference of microbes, it is ascertained that the animal does produce venomous substances in its physiological or living state. Thus, having discovered the effects, science has to find their primary causes, and this it can never do without the help of the old sciences of alchemy, occult botany, and physics. We are taught that every physiological change, in addition to pathological phenomena, diseases, nay, life itself, or rather the objective phenomena of life, produced by certain conditions and changes in the tissues of the body, which allow and force life to act in that body, that all this is due to those unseen creators and destroyers which are called, in such a loose and general way, microbes. It might be supposed that these fiery lives and the microbes of science are identical. This is not true. The fiery lives are the seventh and highest subdivision of the plane of matter and correspond in the individual with the one life of the universe, though only on that plane of matter. The microbes of science are the first and lowest subdivision on the second plane, that of material prana or life. The physical body of man undergoes a complete change of structure every seven years 
and its destruction and preservation are due to the alternate functions of the fiery lives as destroyers and builders. They are builders by sacrificing themselves in the form of vitality to restrain the destructive influence on the microbes and by supplying the microbes with what is necessary, they compel them under that restraint to build up the material body and its cells. They are destroyers also when that restraint is removed and the microbes, unsupplied with vital constructive energy, are left to run riot as destructive agents. Thus, during the first half of man's life, the first five periods of seven years each, the fiery lives are indirectly engaged in the process of building up man's material body. Life is on the ascending scale and the force is used in construction and increase. After this period is passed, the age of retrogression commences and the work of the fiery lives exhausting their strength, the work of destruction and decrease also commences. An analogy between cosmic events in the descent of spirit into matter for the first half of a manvantara, planetary as well as human, and its ascent at the expense of matter in the second half may here be traced. These considerations have to do solely with the plane of matter, but the restraining influence of the fiery lives on the lowest subdivision of the second plane. The microbes is confirmed by the fact mentioned in the theory of Pasteur above referred to, that the cells of the organs, which they do not find sufficient oxygen for themselves, adapt themselves to that condition and form ferments, which, by absorbing oxygen and from substances which come in contact with them, produce their destruction. Thus the process is commenced by one cell robbing its neighbor of the source of its vitality, when the supply is insufficient, and the destruction so commenced steadily progresses. Such experimenters as Pasteur are the best friends and helpers of the destroyers, and the worst enemies of the creators, if the latter were not at the same time destroyers also. However it may be, one thing is certain in this, the knowledge of these primary causes, and of the ultimate essence of every element, of its lives, their functions, properties, and conditions of change, constitutes the basics of magic. Paracelsus was perhaps the only occultist in Europe, during the latter centuries of the Christian era, who was versed in this mystery. Had not a criminal hand put an end to his life years before the time allotted him by nature, physiological magic would have fewer secrets for the civilized world than it has now. D. But what is the moon to do in all this, we may be asked? What have fish, sin, and soma, moon, in the apocalyptic sentence of the stanza, to do in company with the life microbes? With the latter, nothing, except that they avail themselves of the tabernacle of clay prepared by them. With divine perfect man, everything since fish, sin, and moon can jointly compose the three symbols of the immortal being. This is all that can be given. Nor does the writer pretend to know more of these strange symbols that may be inferred about them from exoteric religions. From the mystery, perhaps, which underlies the Matsya, fish, Avatara of Vishnu, the Chaldean Owens, the man-fish recorded in the imperishable sign of the Zodiac, Pisces, and running throughout the two testaments in the personages of Joshua, son of Nun, the fish, and Jesus from the allegorical sin or fall of spirit into matter, and from the moon, insofar as it relates to the lunar ancestors, the Pitrus. For the present, it may be as well to remind the reader that while the moon goddesses were connected in every mythology, especially the Grecian, with childbirth because of the influence of the moon on women and conception, the occult and actual connection of our satellite with fecundation is to this day unknown to physiology, which regards every popular practice in this connection as gross superstition. As it is useless to discuss these in detail, we can only stop for the present to notice the lunar symbology casually, to show that the said superstition belongs to the most ancient beliefs and even to Judaism, the basis of Christianity. 
With the Israelites, the chief function of Jehovah was child-giving, and the esotericism of the Bible, interpreted Kabbalistically, shows undeniably that the Holy of the Holies in the Temple was simply the symbol of the womb. This is now proven beyond doubt and cavil by the numerical reading of the Bible in general, and of Genesis especially. This idea must certainly have been borrowed by the Jews from the Egyptians and Indians, whose Holy of Holies is symbolized by the King's Chamber and the Great Pyramid and the Yoni symbols of exoteric Hinduism. To make the matter clearer, and to show at the same time the enormous difference in the spirit of interpretation and the original meaning of the same symbols between the ancient Eastern occultists and the Jewish Kabbalists, We refer the reader to the section on the Holy of Holies in the second volume. Phallic worship has developed only with the loss of the keys to the true meaning of the symbols. It was the last and most fatal turning from the highway of truth and divine knowledge into the side path of fiction, raised into dogma through human falsification and hierarchic ambition. Number 6. From the Firstborn The thread between the silent watcher and his shadow becomes more strong and radiant with every change. The morning sunlight has changed into noonday glory. This sentence, the thread between the silent watcher and his shadow man, becomes more strong with every change, is another psychological mystery that will find its explanation in Volume 2. For the present, it will suffice to say that the watcher and his shadows, the latter numbering as many as there are reincarnations for the monad are one. The watcher, or the divine prototype, is at the upper rung of the ladder of being, the shadow at the lower. Withal, the monad of every living being, unless his moral turpitude, breaks the connection, and he runs loose and astray into the lunar path, to use the occult expression. It is an individual Yan Chohan distinct from others with a kind of spiritual individuality of its own during one special Manvantara. Its primary, the spirit, Atman, is one, of course, with the one universal spirit, Paramatma, but the vehicle, Vahan, it is enshrined in. The Bodhi is part and parcel of that Yan Kohanic essence. And it is in this that lies the mystery of that ubiquity, which was discussed a few pages back. My father, that is, in heaven, and I are one, says the Christian scripture. And in this, at any rate, it is the faithful echo of the esoteric tenet. Stanza 7, continued, number 7. This is thy present wheel, said the flame to the spark. Thou art myself, my image and my shadow. I have clothed myself in thee, and thou art my Vahan. To the day be with us, when thou shalt re-become myself and others, thyself and I. Then the builders, having donned their first clothing, descent on radiant earth, and reign over men who are themselves. A. The day when the spark will re-become the flame, when man will merge into his Yan Chohan, Myself and others, thyself and I, as the stanza has it, means that in Paranirvana, when Pralaya will have reduced not only material and psychical bodies, but even the spiritual egos to their original principle, the past, present, and even future humanities, like all things, will be one and the same. Everything will have re-entered the great breath. In other words, everything will be merged in Brahman, or the divine unity. Is this annihilation, as some think, or atheism, as other critics, the worshippers of a personal deity, and believers in an unphilosophical paradise are inclined to suppose? Neither. It is worse than useless to return to the question of implied atheism in that which is spiritually of a most refined character. To see in nirvana annihilation amounts to saying of a man plunged in a sound dreamless sleep one that leaves no impression on the physical memory and brain because the sleeper's higher self is then in its original state of absolute consciousness, that he too is annihilated. The latter simile answers to one side of the question only, the most material, since reabsorption is by no means such a dreamless sleep. 
But on the contrary, absolute existence, an unconditioned unity, or a state, to describe which human language is absolutely and hopelessly inadequate. The only approach to anything like a comprehensive conception of it can be attempted solely in the panoramic visions of the soul, through spiritual ideations of the divine monad. Nor is the individuality, nor even the essence of the personality, if any be left behind, lost because reabsorbed. For however limitless, from a human standpoint, the paranirvanic state, yet it has a limit in eternity. Once reached, the same monad will reemerge therefrom as a still higher being on a far higher plane to recommence its cycle of perfected activity. The human mind, in its present stage of development, cannot transcend. Scarcely can it reach this plane of thought. It totters here on the brink of incomprehensible absoluteness and eternity. B. The watchers reign over men during the whole period of Satya Yuga and the smaller subsequent yugas down to the beginning of the third root race, after which it is the patriarchs, heroes, and the mains, as in the Egyptian dynasties enumerated by the priests to Solon, the incarnated Dianis of a lower order, up to the king Menes and the human kings of other nations. All were carefully recorded. In the views of symbologists, this mythopoic age is of course regarded as only a fairy tale. But since traditions and even chronicles of such dynasties of divine kings, of gods reigning over men, followed by dynasties of heroes or giants, exist in the annals of every nation, it is difficult to understand how all the peoples under the sun, some of whom are separated by vast oceans and belong to different hemispheres, such as the ancient Peruvians and Mexicans, as well as the Chaldeans, could have worked out the same fairy tales in the same order of events. However, as the secret doctrine teaches history, which, although esoteric and traditional, is nonetheless more reliable than profane history, we are entitled to our beliefs as much as anyone else, whether religionist or skeptic. And that doctrine says that the Dhyani Buddhas of the two higher groups, namely the Watchers or the Architects, furnish the many and various races with divine kings and leaders. It is the latter who taught humanity their arts and sciences, and the former who revealed to the incarnated monads that had just shaken off their vehicles of the lower kingdoms, and who had therefore lost every recollection of their divine origin the great spiritual truths of the transcendental worlds. Thus, as expressed in the stanza, the watchers descend on radiant earth and reign over men, who are themselves. The reigning kings had finished their cycle on earth and other worlds in the preceding rounds. In the future Manvantars, they will have risen to higher systems than our planetary world, and it is the elect of our humanity, the pioneers on the hard and difficult path of progress, who will take the places of their predecessors. The next great Manvantara will witness the men of our own life cycle, becoming the instructors and guides of a mankind whose monads may now be still imprisoned, semi-conscious and the most intellectual of the animal kingdom, while their lower principles may be animating perhaps the highest specimens of the vegetable world. Thus proceed the cycles of the septenary evolution, in sevenfold nature, the spiritual or divine, the psychic or semi-divine, the intellectual, the passional, the instinctual, or cognitional, the semi-corporeal, and purely material or physical natures. All these evolve and progress cyclically, passing from one into another, in a double, centrifugal, and centripetal way, one in their ultimate essence, seven in their aspects. The lowest, of course, is that depending upon and subservient to our five physical senses, which are now in truth seven, as shown later, on the authority of the oldest Upanishads. Thus far, for individual, human, sentient, animal, and vegetable life, each of the microcosm of its higher macrocosm. The same for the universe which manifests periodically for purposes of the collection progress of the countless lives the outbreathings of the one life, in order that, through the ever-becoming, 
Every cosmic atom in this infinite universe passing from the formless and the intangible through the mixed natures of the semi-terrestrial down to matter and full generation and then back again, reascending at each new period higher and nearer the final goal. That each atom, we say, may reach through individual merits and efforts that plane where it re-becomes the one unconditioned all. But between the Alpha and the Omega there is the weary road, hedged in by thorns that goes down first, then winds uphill all the way, yes, to the very end. Starting upon the long journey, immaculate, descending more and more into sinful matter, and having connected himself with every atom in manifested space, the pilgrim, having struggled through and suffered in every form of life and being, is only at the bottom of the valley of matter, and half through his cycle, when he has identified himself with collective humanity. This he has made in his own image. In order to progress upwards and homewards, the god has now to ascend the weary uphill path of the Golgotha of life. It is the martyrdom of self-conscious existence. Like Vishvakarman, he has to sacrifice himself to himself, in order to redeem all creatures to resurrect from the many into the one life. Then he ascends into heaven indeed where plunged into the incomprehensible absolute being and bliss of para-nirvana, he reigns unconditionally, and whence he will redescend again at the next coming, which one portion of humanity expects in its dead-letter sense as the second advent, and the other as the last Kalkiavatara. Summing up The history of creation and of this world from its beginning up to the present time, is composed of seven chapters. The seventh chapter is not yet written. T. Subba Ro. The first of these seven chapters has been attempted and is now finished. However incomplete and feeble as an exposition, it is at any rate an approximation, using the word in a mathematical sense to that which is the oldest basis for all subsequent cosmogenies. The attempt to render, in a European tongue, the grand panorama of the ever-periodically recurring law, impressed upon the plastic minds of the first races endowed with consciousness, by those who reflected the same from the universal mind, is daring. For no human language, save the Sanskrit, which is that of the gods, can do so with any degree of adequacy. But the failures in this work must be forgiven for the sake of the motive. As a whole, neither the foregoing nor what follows can be found in full anywhere. It is not taught in any of the six Indian schools of philosophy, for it pertains to their synthesis, the seventh, which is the occult doctrine. It is not traced on any crumbling papyrus of Egypt nor is it any longer graven on a Syrian tile or granite wall. The books of the Vedanta, the last word of human knowledge, give out but the metaphysical aspect of this world cosmogony, and their priceless thesaurus, the Upanishads, Upa, Ni, Shad, being a compound word, expressing the conquest of ignorance by the revelation of secret spiritual knowledge, now requires the additional possession of a master key to enable the student to get at their full meaning. The reason for this, I venture to state here, is I learned it from the master. The name Upanishad is usually translated esoteric doctrine. These treatises from part of Shruti, or revealed knowledge, revelation in short, and are generally attached to the Brahmana portion of the Vedas as their third division. Now, the Vedas have a distinct dual meaning, one expressed by the literal sense of the words, the other indicated by the meter and the svara intonation, which are as the life of the Vedas. Learned pandits and philologists, of course, deny that svara had anything to do with philosophy, or ancient esoteric doctrines. But the mysterious connection between Svara and Light is one of the most profound secrets. There are over 150 Upanishads enumerated by Orientalists, 
who credit the oldest with being written probably about 600 years BC, but of genuine texts, there does not exist a fifth of the number. The Upanishads are to the Vedas what the Kabbalah is to the Jewish Bible. They treat of and expound the secret and mystic meaning of the Vedic texts. They speak of the origin of the universe, the nature of deity and the spirit, and of spirit and soul, as also of the metaphysical connection of mind and matter. In a few words, they contain the beginning and the end of all human knowledge, but they have ceased to reveal it since the days of Buddha. If it were otherwise, the Upanishads could not be called esoteric, since they are now openly attached to the sacred Brahmanical books, which have, in our present age, become accessible even to the outcasts and the European Orientalists. One thing in them, and this in all the Upanishads, invariably and constantly points to their ancient origin and proves a that they were written in some of their portions before the caste system became the tyrannical institution which it still is, and b that half of their contents have been eliminated while some of them have been rewritten and abridged. The great teachers of the higher knowledge and the Brahmins are continually represented as going to Kshatriya, military caste, kings to become their pupils. As Professor Cowell pertinently remarks, the Upanishads breathe an entirely different spirit from other Brahmanical writings. A freedom of thought unknown in any earlier work except in the Rig Veda hymns themselves. The second fact is explained by a tradition recorded in one of the MSS on Buddha's life. It says that the Upanishads were originally attached to their Brahmanas after the beginning of a reform, which led to the exclusiveness of the present caste system among the Brahmins, a few centuries after the invasion of India by the twice born. They were complete in those days and were used for the instruction of the Chelas who were preparing for initiation. This lasted so long as the Vedas and the Brahmanas remained in the sole and exclusive keeping of the temple Brahmins. While no one else had the right or to study or even read them outside of the sacred caste. Then came Gautama, the prince of Kapilavastu. After learning the whole of the Brahmanical wisdom in the Rahasya, or the Upanishads, and finding that the teachings differed little, if at all, from those of the teachers of life inhabiting the snowy ranges of the Himalayas, the disciple of the Brahmins, feeling indignant because the sacred wisdom was thus withheld from all but Brahmins, determined by popularizing it to save the whole world. Then it was that the Brahmins, seeing that their sacred knowledge and occult wisdom was falling into the hands of the Malekas, abridged the, the texts of the Upanishads, which originally contained thrice the matter of the Vedas and the Brahmins altogether, without altering, however, one word of the texts. They simply detached from the MSS the most important portions, containing the last word of the mystery of being. The key to the Brahmanical secret code remained henceforth with the initiates alone, and the Brahmins were thus in a position to publicly deny the correctness of Buddha's teaching by appealing to their Upanishads, silenced forever over the chief questions. Such is the esoteric tradition beyond the Himalayas. Sri Shankaracharya, the greatest initiate living in the historical ages, wrote many abhashya commentary on the Upanishads. But his original treatises, as there are reasons to suppose, have not yet fallen into the hands of the Philistines, for they are too jealously preserved in his monasteries, mathams. And there are still weightier reasons to believe that the priceless bashyas on the esoteric doctrine of the Brahmins, by their greatest expounder, will remain for ages still a dead letter to most of the Hindus except the Smartarva Brahmins. This sect, founded by Shankaracharya, which is still very powerful in southern India, is now almost the only one to produce students who have preserved sufficient knowledge to comprehend the dead letter of the Bhashyas. 
The reason for this, I am informed, is that they alone have occasionally real initiates at their hand in the Mathams, as for instance, in the Shringagiri, in the western Ghats of Mysore. On the other hand, there is no sect in that desperately exclusive caste of the Brahmins, more exclusive than is the Smartava, and the reticence of its followers, to say what they may know of the occult sciences and the esoteric doctrine is only equaled by their pride in learning. Therefore, the writer of the present statement must be prepared beforehand to meet with great opposition, and even the denial of such statements as are brought forward in this work. Not that any claim to infallibility or to perfect correctness in every detail of all which is herein written has ever been put forward. Facts are there, and they can hardly be denied. But owing to the intrinsic difficulties of the subjects treated of, and the almost insurmountable limitations of the English tongue, as of all other European languages, to express certain ideas, it is more than probable that the reader has failed to present the explanations in the best and the clearest form. Yet all that could be done, under every adverse circumstance, has been done, and this is the utmost that can be expected of any writer. Let us recapitulate, and by the vastness of the subjects expounded, show how difficult, if not impossible, it is to do them full justice. Number one, the secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of the ages, and its cosmogony alone is the most stupendous and elaborate of all systems, even as veiled in the exotericism of the Puranas. But such is the mysterious power of occult symbolism that the facts which have actually occupied countless generations of initiated seers and prophets to marshal, set down and explain in the bewildering series of evolutionary progress, all are recorded on a few pages of geometrical signs and glyphs. The flashing gaze of those seers has penetrated into the very kernel of matter and recorded the soul of things there where an ordinary profane observer, however learned, would have perceived but the external work of form. But modern science believes not in the soul of things, and hence will reject the whole system of ancient cosmogony. It is useless to say that the system in question is no fancy of one or several isolated individuals, that it is an interpreted record covering thousands of generations of seers, whose respective experiences were made to test and verify the traditions, passed on orally by one early race to another of the teachings of higher and exalted beings, who watched over the childhood of humanity, that for long ages the wise men of the fifth race of the stock saved and rescued from the last cataclysm and the shifting of continents passed their lives in learning, not teaching. How did they do so? It is answered, by checking, testing, and verifying, in every department of nature, the traditions of old, by the independent visions of great adepts, that is to say men who have developed and perfected their physical, mental, psychic, and spiritual organizations to the utmost possible degree. No vision of one adept was accepted till it was checked and confirmed by the visions so obtained as to stand as independent evidence of other adepts and by centuries of experience. Number two, the fundamental law in that system, the central point from which all emerges, around and towards which all gravitates and upon which is hung all its philosophy, is the one homogeneous divine substance principle, the one radical cause. Some few, whose lamps shone brighter, have led them from cause to cause to nature's secret head, and found that one first principle must be. It is called substance principle, for it becomes substance on the plane of the manifested universe, an illusion while it remains a principle, in the beginningless and endless abstract, visible and invisible space. It is the omnipresent reality, impersonal, because it contains all and everything. Its impersonality is the fundamental conception of the system. It is latent in every atom in the universe, and is the universe itself. 
Number three, the universe is the periodical manifestation of this unknown absolute essence. To call it essence, however, is to sin against the very spirit of the philosophy. For though the noun may be derived in this case from the verb s, to be, yet it cannot be identified with a being of any kind that can be conceived by human intellect. It is best described as neither spirit nor matter, but both. Parabrahman and Mulaprakriti are one in reality, yet two in the universal conception of the manifested. Even in the conception of the One Logos, the first manifestation, to which, as the able lecturer shows in the notes on the Bhagavad Gita, it appears from the objective standpoint as Mula Prakriti and not as Parabrahman, as its veil and not the one reality hidden behind, which is unconditioned and absolute. Number four, the universe with everything in it is called Maya because all is temporary therein, from the ephemeral life of a firefly to that of the sun. Compared to the eternal immutability of the One and the changelessness of that principle, the universe, with its evanescent, ever-changing forms, must be necessarily in the mind of a philosopher, no better than a will-of-the-wisp. Yet the universe is real enough to the conscious beings in it, which are as unreal as it is itself. Number five, everything in the universe throughout all its kingdoms is conscious, i.e. endowed with a consciousness of its own kind and on its own plane of perception. When men must remember that simply because we do not perceive any signs of consciousness, which we can recognize, say, in stones, we have no right to say that no consciousness exists there. There is no such thing as either dead or blind matter, as there is no blind or unconscious law. These find no place among the conceptions of occult philosophy. The latter never stops at surface appearances, and for it the noumenal essences have more reality than their objective counterparts, wherein it resembles the system of the medieval nominalists for whom it was the universals that were the realities, and the particulars which existed only in name and human fancy. 6. The universe is worked and guided from within outwards. As above, so it is below, as in heaven, so on earth. And man, the microcosm and miniature copy of the macrocosm, is the living witness to this universal law, and to the mode of its action. We see that every External motion, act, gesture, whether voluntary or mechanical, organic or mental, is produced and preceded by internal feeling or emotion, will or volition and thought or mind. As no outward motion or change when normal in man's external body can take place unless provoked by an inward impulse, given through one of the three functions named, so with the external or manifested universe, the whole cosmos is guided, controlled, and animated by almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings, each having a mission to perform and who, whether we give them one name or the other, whether we call them Yan Chohans or angels or messengers, in the sense only that they are the agents of karmic and cosmic laws. They are infinitely in their respective degrees of consciousness and intelligence. And to call them all pure spirits without any of the earthly alloy, which time is wont to prey upon, is only to indulge in poetical fancy. For each of these beings either was or prepares to become a man, if not in the present, then in a past or a coming manvantara. They are perfected when not incipient men and in their higher, less material spheres, differ morally from terrestrial human beings, only that they are devoid of the feeling of personality and of the human emotional nature, two purely earthly characteristics. The former, or the perfected, have become free from these feelings because a. they have no longer fleshly bodies, an ever-numbing weight on the soul, and b the pure spiritual element being left untrammeled and more free. They are less influenced by maya 
than man can ever be unless he is an adept who keeps his two personalities, the spiritual and the physical, entirely separated. The incipient monads, having never yet had terrestrial bodies, can have no sense of personality or egoism. That which is meant by personality being a limitation and a relation, or as defined by Coleridge, individuality existing in itself but with a nature as a ground. The term cannot, of course, be applied to non-human entities, but as a fact insisted upon by generations of seers, none of these beings, high or low, have either individuality or personality as separate entities i.e. they have no individuality in the sense in which a man says, I am myself and no one else. In other words, they are conscious of no such distinct separateness as men and things have on earth. Individuality is the characteristic of their respective hierarchies, not of their units. And these characteristics vary only with the degrees of the plane to which these hierarchies belong. The nearer to the region of homogeneity and the one divine, the purer and the less accentuated is that individuality in the hierarchy. They are finite in all respects, with the exception of their higher principles. The immortal sparks reflected the universal divine flame, individualized and separated only on the spheres of illusion, by a differentiation as elusive as the rest. They are living ones because they are the streams projected on the cosmic screen of illusion from the absolute life. Beings in whom life cannot become extinct, before the fire of ignorance is extinct in those who sense these lives. Having sprung into being under the quickening influence of the uncreated beam, the reflection of the great central sun that radiates on the shores of the river of life, it is the inner principle in them which belongs to the waters of immortality, while its differentiated clothing is as perishable as man's body. Therefore, Young was right in saying that angels are men of a superior kind, and no more. They are neither ministering nor protecting angels nor are they harbingers of the Most High, still less the messengers of wrath of any god such as man's fancy has created. To appeal to their protection is as foolish as to believe that their sympathy may be secured by any kind of propitiation, for they are, as much as man himself is, the slaves and creatures of immutable karmic and cosmic law. The reason for this is evident. Having no elements of personality in their essence, they can have no personal qualities, such as are attributed by men in exoteric religions to their anthropomorphic god, a jealous and exclusive god, who rejoices and feels wrathful, is pleased with sacrifice, and is more despotic in his vanity than any finite foolish man. Man, being a compound of the essences of all these celestial hierarchies, may succeed in making himself, as such, superior in one sense to any hierarchy or class, or even combination of them. Man can neither propitiate or nor command the divas, it is said, but by paralyzing his lower personality and arriving thereby at the full knowledge of the non-separateness of his higher self, from the one absolute self, man can, even during his terrestrial life, become as one of us. Thus it is, by eating of the fruit of knowledge, which dispels ignorance, that man becomes like one of the Elohim, or the Gianis, and once on their plane, the spirit of solidarity and perfect harmony which reigns in every hierarchy must extend over him, and protect him in every particular. The chief difficulty which prevents men of science from believing in divine as well as in nature spirits is their materialism. The main impediment before the spiritualist which hinders him from believing in the same, while preserving a blind belief in the spirits of the departed, is the general ignorance of all, except some occultists and cabalists, about the true essence and nature of matter. It is on the acceptance or rejection of the theory of the unity of all in nature, in its ultimate essence, that mainly rests the belief or unbelief in the existence around us of other conscious beings, besides the spirits of the dead. 
It is on the right comprehension of the primeval evolution of spirit matter and its real essence that the student has to depend for the further elucidation in his mind of the occult cosmogony and for the only sure clue which can guide his subsequent studies. In sober truth, as just shown, every so-called spirit is either a disembodied or a future man, as from the highest archangel, Dian Chohan, down to the last conscious builder, the inferior class of spiritual entities, all such are men having lived aeons ago in other manvantaras on this or other spheres. So the inferior, semi-intelligent, and non-intelligent elementals are all future men. The fact alone that a spirit is endowed with intelligence is a proof to the occultist that such a being must have been a man and acquired his knowledge and intelligence throughout the human cycle. There is but one indivisible and absolute omniscience and intelligence in the universe, and this thrills throughout every atom and infinitesimal point of the whole cosmos, which has no bounds and which people call space, considered independently of anything contained in it. But the first differentiation of its reflection in the manifested world is purely spiritual, and the beings generated in it are not endowed with a consciousness that has any relation to the one we conceive of. They can have no human consciousness or intelligence before they have acquired such personally and individually. This may be a mystery, yet it is a fact in esoteric philosophy and a very apparent one, too. The whole order of nature evinces a progressive march towards a higher life. There is a design in the action of the seemingly blindest forces. The whole process of evolution, with its endless adaptations, is a proof of this. The immutable laws that weed out the weak and the feeble species to make room for the strong, and which ensure the survival of the fittest. Though so cruel in their immediate action, all are working toward the grand end. The very fact that adaptations do occur, that the fittest do survive in the struggle for existence, shows that what is called unconscious nature is in reality an aggregate of forces, manipulated by semi-intelligent beings, elementals, guided by high planetary spirits, Yan Chohans whose collective aggregate forms the manifested verbum of the unmanifested logos, and constitutes at one and the same time the mind of the universe and its immutable law. For nature, taken in its abstract sense, cannot be unconscious, as it is the emanation from and thus an aspect on the manifested plane of the absolute consciousness. Where is that daring man who would presume to deny to vegetation and even to minerals a consciousness of their own? All he can say is that this consciousness is beyond his comprehension. Three distinct representations of the universe in its three distinct aspects are impressed upon our thoughts by the esoteric philosophy. The pre-existing evolved from the ever-existing and the phenomenal, the world of illusion, the reflection, and shadow thereof. During the great mystery and drama of life, known as the Manvantara, real cosmos is like the objects placed behind the white screen upon which shadows are thrown. The actual figures and things remain invisible, while the wires of evolution are pulled by unseen hands. Men and things are thus but the reflections on the white field of the realities behind the snares of Mahamaya, or the great illusion. This was taught in every philosophy, in every religion, anti as well as post diluvian in India and Chaldea, by the Chinese and the Grecian sages. In the former countries, these three universes were allegorized in exoteric teachings by the three trinities, emanating from the central eternal germ and forming with it a supreme unity, the initial, the manifested, and the created triad, or the three and one. The last is but the symbol, in its concrete expression, of the first ideal too. Hence, esoteric philosophy passes over the necessarianism of this purely metaphysical conception, and calls the first one only the ever-existing. This is the view of every one of the six great schools of Indian philosophy, 
The six principles of that unit body of wisdom of which the gnosis, the hidden knowledge, is the seventh. The writer hopes that, however superficially the comments on the seven standards may have been handled, enough has been given in this cosmogonic portion of the work to show the archaic teachings to be on their very face more scientific, in the modern sense of the word, than any other ancient scriptures left to be judged on their exoteric aspect. Since, however, as before confessed, this work withholds far more than it gives out, the student is invited to use his own intuitions. Our chief care is to elucidate that which has already been given out, and to our regret very incorrectly at times, to supplement the knowledge hinted at, wherever and whenever possible, by additional matter, and to bulwark our doctrines against the two strong attacks of modern sectarianism, and more especially against those of our latter-day materialism, very often miscalled science, whereas, in reality, the words scientists and sciolists ought alone to bear the responsibility for many illogical theories offered to the world. In its great ignorance, the public, while blindly accepting everything that emanates from authorities and feeling it to be its duty to regard every dictum coming from a man of science as a proven fact, the public, we say, is taught to scoff at anything brought forward from heathen sources. Therefore, as materialistic scientists can be fought solely with their own weapons, those of controversy and argument, an addendum is added to each volume, contrasting the respective views and showing how even great authorities may often err. We believe that this can be done effectually by showing the weak points of our opponents and by proving their too frequent sophisms, which are made to pass for a scientific dicta to be incorrect. We hold to Hermes and his wisdom in its universal character, they to Aristotle, as against intuition and the experience of the ages, fancying that truth is the exclusive property of the Western world. Hence the disagreement. As Hermes says, knowledge differs much from sense, for sense is of things that surmount it, but knowledge is the end of sense, i.e. of the illusion of our physical brain and its intellect, thus emphasizing the contrast between the laboriously acquired knowledge of the senses and mind, manas, and the intuitive omniscience of the spiritual divine soul, buddhi. Whatever may be the destiny of these actual writings in a remote future, we hope to have so far proven the following facts. Number one, the secret doctrine teaches no atheism except in the sense underlying the Sanskrit word nastika, a rejection of idols, including every anthropomorphic god. In this sense, every occultist is a nastika. Number two, it admits a logos, or a collective creator of the universe, a demiurge, in the sense implied when one speaks of an architect as the creator of an edifice, whereas that architect has never touched one stone of it, but furnishing the plan, has left all the manual labor to the masons. In our case, the plan was furnished by the ideation of the universe and the constructive labor was left to the hosts of intelligent powers and forces. But that demiurge is no personal deity, i.e. an imperfect extra-cosmic god, but only the aggregate of the Jian Chohans and the other forces. Number three, the Jian Chohans are dual in their character, being composed of a. the irrational brute energy inherent in matter, and b. the intelligent soul, or cosmic consciousness, which directs and guides that energy, and which is the dhyanic kohanic thought, reflecting the ideation of the universal mind. This results in a perpetual series of physical manifestations and moral effects on earth, during manvantaric periods, the whole being subservient to karma. As that process is not always perfect, and since however many proofs it may exhibit of a guiding intelligence beyond the veil, it still shows gaps and flaws and even very often results in evident failures. Therefore, neither the collective host, demiurge, nor any of the working powers individually are proper subjects for divine honors or worship. 
all are entitled to the grateful reverence of humanity. However, and man ought to be ever striving to help the divine evolution of ideas by becoming, to the best of his ability, a co-worker with nature in the cyclic task. The ever unknowable and incognizable Karana alone, the causeless cause of all causes, should have its shrine and altar on the holy and ever untrodden ground of our heart. Invisible, intangible, unmentioned, save through the still small voice of our spiritual consciousness. Those who worship before it ought to do so in the silence and the sanctified solitude of their souls, making their spirit the sole mediator between them and the universal spirit, their good actions the only priests, and their sinful intentions the only visible and objective sacrificial victims to the presence. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, but enter into thine inner chamber, and having shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret. Our Father is within us in secret, our seventh principle in the inner chamber of our soul perception. The kingdom of God and heaven is within us, says Jesus, not outside. Why are Christians so absolutely blind to the self-evident meaning of the words of wisdom they delight in mechanically repeating? Number four, matter is eternal. It is the apadi, or physical basis, for the one infinite universal mind to build thereon its ideations. Therefore, the esotericists maintain that there is no inorganic or dead matter in nature. The distinction between the two made by science being as unfounded as it is arbitrary and devoid of reason. Whatever science may think, however, and exact science is a fickle dame, as we all know by experience, occultism knows and teaches differently, as it has done from time immemorial, from Manu and Hermes down to Paracelsus and his successors. Thus, Hermes the thrice great says, O my son, matter becomes, formerly it was, for matter is the vehicle of becoming. Becoming is the mode of activity of the uncreate and foreseeing God. Having been endowed with the germ of becoming, objective matter is brought into birth, for the creative force fashions it according to the ideal forms. Matter, not yet engendered, had no form. It becomes when it is put into operation. To this, the late Dr. Anna Kingsford, the able translator and compiler of the Hermetic Fragments, remarks in a footnote. Dr. Menard observes that in Greek the same word signifies to be born and to become. The idea here is that the material of the world in its essence eternal, but that before creation on becoming, it is in a passive and motionless condition. Thus it was, before being put into operation, now it becomes, that is, it is mobile and progressive. And she adds the purely Vedantic doctrine of the Hermetic philosophy that creation is thus the period of activity, Manvantara, of God, who according to Hermetic thought, or which according to the Vedantin, has two modes, activity, or existence, God evolved, deus explicitus, and passivity of being, pralaya, God involved, deus implicitus. Both modes are perfect and complete, as are the waking and sleeping states of man. Fitched, the German philosopher, distinguished being sen as one, which we know only through existence, desen as the manifold, this view is thoroughly hermetic. The ideal forms are the archetypal and formative ideas of the Neoplatonists, the eternal and subjective concepts of things subsisting in the divine mind, prior to creation or becoming. Or, as in the philosophy of Paracelsus, everything is the product of one universal creative effort. There is nothing dead in nature. Everything is organic and living and therefore the whole world appears to be a living organism. Number five, the universe was evolved out of its ideal plan, upheld through eternity in the unconsciousness of that which the Vedantins call Parabrahman. This is practically identical with the conclusions of the highest Western philosophy. The innate, 
eternal and self-existing ideas of Plato, now reflected by von Hartmann. The unknowable of Herbert Spencer bears but a faint resemblance to that transcendental reality believed in by occultists, often appearing merely a personification of a force behind phenomena, an infinite and eternal energy, from which all things proceed, whereas the author of the philosophy of the unconscious has become, in this respect only, as near to a solution of the great mystery as mortal man can. Few have been those, whether in ancient or medieval philosophy, who have dared to approach the subject or even hinted it. Paracelsus mentions it inferentially, and his ideas are admirably synthesized by Dr. F. Hartman, FTS, in his Paracelsus, from which we have just quoted. All the Christian Kabbalists understood well the Eastern root idea, the active power, the perpetual motion of the great breath only awakens cosmos at the dawn of every new period, setting it into motion by means of the two contrary forces, the centripetal and the centrifugal forces, which are female and male, positive and negative, physical and spiritual, the two being the one primordial force, and thus causing it to become objective on the plane of illusion. In other words, that dual motion transfers cosmos from the plane of the eternal ideal into that of finite manifestation, or from the noumenal to the phenomenal plane. Everything that is, was, and will be, eternally is, even the countless forms, which are finite and perishable only in their objective, but not in their ideal form. They existed as ideas in the eternity, and when they pass away, will exist as reflections. Occultism teaches that no form can be given to anything, either by nature or by man, whose ideal type does not already exist on the subjective plane. More than this, that no form or shape can possibly enter man's consciousness, or evolve in his imagination, which does not exist in prototype, at least as an approximation. Neither the form of man, nor that of any animal, plant, or stone has ever been created and it is only on this plane of ours that it commenced becoming, that is to say, objectivizing into its present material ability, or expanding from within outwards, from the most sublimated and supersensuous essence into its grossest appearance. Therefore, our human forms have existed in the eternity as astral or ethereal prototypes, according to which models, the spiritual beings or gods, whose duty it was to bring them into objective being and terrestrial life, evolved the protoplasmic forms and the future egos from their own essence. After which, when this human apadi or basic mold was ready, the natural terrestrial forces began to work on these supersensuous molds, which contained besides their own the elements of all the past vegetable and future animal forms of this globe. Therefore, man's outward shell passed through every vegetable and animal body before it assumed the human shape. But as this will be fully described in Volume 2 in the commentaries, there is no need to say more of it here. According to the Hermetico-Kabbalistic philosophy of Paracelsus, it is Elaster, the ancestor of the just-born Protal. Introduced by Mr. Crookes into chemistry, or primordial promateria that evolved out of itself, the cosmos. When creation evolution took place, the elaster divided itself, so to say, melted and dissolved, developed out of, from within, itself the ideas or chaos, mysterium magnum, eladios, limbus major or primordial matter. This primordial essence is of a monistic nature, and manifests itself not only as vital activity, a spiritual force, an invisible, incomprehensible, and indescribable power, but also as vital matter of which the substance of living being consists. In this limbus, or ideos, of primordial matter, the only matrix of all created things, the substance of all things is contained. It is described by the ancients as the chaos out of which 
the macrocosmos and afterwards, by division and evolution and mysteria specialia, each separate being came into existence. All things and all elementary substances were contained in its potentia, but not in actu. This makes the translator, Dr. F. Hartman, justly observe that it seems that Paracelsus anticipated the modern discovery of the potency of matter 300 years ago. The magnus limbus, then, or elaster, of Paracelsus is simply our old friend, Father Mother. Within, before it appeared in space. It is the universal matrix of cosmos, personified in the dual character of macrocosm and microcosm, or the universe and our globe, by addition, prakriti, the spiritual and physical nature. For we find it explained in Paracelsus that the magnus limbus is the nursery out of which all creatures have grown, in the same sense as a tree may grow out of a small seed, With the difference, however, that the great limbus takes its origin from the word of God, while the limbus minor, the terrestrial seed or sperm, takes it from the earth. The great limbus is the seed out of which all beings have come, and the little limbus is each ultimate being that reproduces its form, and that has itself been produced by the great. The little limbus possesses all the qualifications of the great one, in the same sense as a son as an organization similar to that of his father. As the elaster dissolved, Aries, the dividing, differentiating, and an individualizing power, Fohat, another old friend, began to act. All production took place in consequence of separation. There were produced out of the ideals the element of fire, water, air, and earth, whose birth, however, did not take place in a material mode, or by simple separation, but spiritually and dynamically, not even by complex combinations. Example, mechanical mixture as opposed to chemical combination. Just as fire may come out of a pebble or a tree out of a seed, although there is originally no fire in the pebble nor a tree in the seed. Spirit is living and the life is spirit, and life and spirit, Akriti, Purusha, produce all things, but they are essentially one and not two. The elements, too, have each one its own elaster, because all the activity of matter in every form is only an effluvium of the same fountain. But as from the seed grown roots with their fibers, afterwards the stalk with its branches and leaves, and lastly the flowers and seeds, Likewise, all beings were born from the elements and consist of elementary substances out of which other forms may come into existence, bearing the characteristics of their parents. The elements, as the mothers of all creatures, are of an invisible spiritual nature and have souls. They all spring from the Mysterium Magnum. Compare this with Vishnu Purana. From Pradhana, primordial substance, presiding over by Kishtrana, embodied spirit, proceeds the unequal development, evolution of those qualities. From the great principle, Mahat, universal intellect or mind, is produced the origin of the subtle elements and of the organs of sense. Thus it may be shown that all the fundamental truths of nature were universal in antiquity, and that the basic ideas upon spirit, matter, and the universe, or upon God, substance, and man, were identical. Taking the two most ancient religious philosophies on the globe, Hinduism and Hermeticism, from the scriptures of India and Egypt, the identity of the two is easily recognizable. This becomes apparent to one who reads the latest translation and rendering of the Hermetic Fragments. Just mentioned by our late lamented friend, Dr. Anna Kingsford. Disfigured and tortured as these have been in their passage through sectarian Greek and Christian hands, the translator has most ably and intuitionally seized the weak points and tried to remedy them by means of explanations and footnotes. She says, The creation of the visible world by the working gods or titans as agents of the supreme god is a thoroughly hermetic idea, recognizable in all religious systems and in accordance with modern scientific research, 
which shows us everywhere the divine power operating through natural forces. To quote from the translation, that universal being that contains all and which is all, puts into motion the soul and the world, all that nature comprises. In the manifold unity of universal life, the innumerable individualities distinguished by their variations are nevertheless united in such a manner that the whole is one and that everything proceeds from unity. And again, from another translation, God is not a mind, but the cause that the mind is, not a spirit, but the cause that the spirit is, not light, but the cause that the light is. The above shows plainly that the divine pimander, however much distorted in some passages by Christian smoothing, was nevertheless written by a philosopher, while most of the so-called hermetic fragments are the production of sectarian pagans with a tendency towards an anthropomorphic supreme being. Yet both are the echo of the esoteric philosophy and the Hindu Puranas. Compare two invocations, one to the Hermetic Supreme All, the other to the Supreme All of the later Aryans. Says a Hermetic fragmented cited by Suedas. Adjure thee, heaven, holy work of the great God. I adjure thee, voice of the Father, uttered in the beginning when the universal world was framed. I adjure thee by the word, only Son of the Father, who upholds all things. Be favorable, be favorable. This is preceded by the following. Thus the ideal light was before the ideal light, and the luminous intelligence of intelligence was always, and its unity was nothing else than the spirit enveloping the universe, out of whom which is neither God nor angels nor any other essentials, for he, it, is the Lord of all things and the power and the light. And all depends on him, it, and is in him, it. A passage contradicted by the very same Trismegistus, who is made to say, To speak of God is impossible, for the corporeal cannot express the incorporeal. That which has not any body, nor appearance, nor form, nor matter, cannot be apprehended by sense. I understand, Tatios, I understand, that which it is impossible to define, that is God. The contradiction between the two passages is evident, and this shows a that Hermes was a generic nom de plume used by a series of generations of mystics of every shade, and b that great discernment has to be used before accepting a fragment as esoteric teaching only because it is undeniably ancient. Let us now compare the above with a like invocation in the Hindu scriptures, undoubtedly as old if not far older. Here it is. Parashara, the Aryan, Hermes, instructs Maitreya, the Indian, Asclepios, and calls upon Vishnu in his triple hypostasis. Glory to the unchangeable, holy, eternal, supreme Vishnu, of one universal nature, the mighty over all, to him who is Hiranyagarbha, Hari, and Shankara, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer of the world, to Vasudeva, the liberator of his worshippers, to him whose essence is both single and manifold, who is both subtile and corporeal, to discreet and discreet, to Vishnu, the cause of final emancipation, glory to the supreme Vishnu, the cause of the creation, existence, the end of this world. Who is the root of the world, and who consists of the world? This is a grand invocation with a deep philosophical meaning underlying it, but for the profane masses, as suggestive as it is this hermetic prayer of an anthropomorphic being, we must respect the feeling that dictated both. But we cannot help in finding full disharmony with its inner meaning, even with that which is found in the same hermetic treatise where it is said, Trismegistus. Reality is not upon the earth, my son, and it cannot be thereon. Nothing on earth is real, there are only appearances. He, man, is not real, my son, as man. The real consists solely in itself and remains what it is. Man is transient, therefore he is not real, he is but appearance, and appearance is the supreme illusion. 
Tatios. Then the celestial bodies themselves are not real, my father, since they also vary. Trismegistus. That which is subject to birth and to change is not real. There is in them a certain falsity, seeing that they too are variable. Tatios. And what then is the primordial reality, O my father? Trismegistus. He who, that which, is one and alone, O Tatios. He who, that which, is not made of matter nor in any body. Who which has neither color nor form. Who which changes not nor is transmitted, but who which always is. This is quite consistent with the Vedantic teaching. The leading thought is occult, and many are the passages in the Hermetic fragments that belong bodily to the secret doctrine. This doctrine teaches that the whole universe is ruled by intelligent and semi-intelligent forces and powers, as stated from the very beginning. Christian theology admits and even enforces belief in such, but makes an arbitrary division and refers to them as angels and devils. Science denies the existence of both and ridicules the very idea. Spiritualists believe in the spirits of the dead, and outside these deny entirely any other kind of class of invisible beings. The occultists and Kabbalists are thus the only rational expounders of the ancient traditions, which have now culminated in dogmatic faith on the one hand and dogmatic denial on the other. For both belief and unbelief each embrace but one small corner of the infinite horizons of spiritual and physical manifestations. And thus both are right from their respective standpoints, yet both are wrong in believing that they can circumscribe the whole within their own special and narrow barriers. For they can never do so. In this respect, science, theology, and even spiritualism show little more wisdom than the ostrich, when it hides its head in the sand at its feet, feeling sure that there can be thus nothing beyond its own point of observation and the limited area occupied by its foolish head. As the only works now extant upon the subject under consideration, within reach of the profane of the Western civilized races, are the above-mentioned hermetic books. Or rather, hermetic fragments, we may contrast them in the present case with the teachings of esoteric philosophy. To quote for this purpose from any other would be useless, since the public knows nothing of the Chaldean works, which are translated into Arabic and preserved by some Sufi initiates. Therefore, the definitions of Asclepios, as lately compiled and glossed by Dr. Anna Kingsford, FTS, some of which sayings are in remarkable agreement with the Eastern esoteric doctrine, have to be resorted to for comparison. Though not a few passages bear a strong impression of some later Christian hand, yet on the whole the characteristics of the genii and gods are those of Eastern teachings. Although concerning other things there are passages which differ widely in our doctrines. As to the genii, the hermetic philosophers called theoi, gods, genii, and daemons, those entities whom we call divas, gods, Gyan Chohans, Chitkala, and Kuan Yin of the Buddhists, and various other names, the daemons are, in the Socratic sense, and even in the Oriental and Latin theological sense, the guardian spirits of the human race those who dwell in the neighborhood of the immortals and thence watch over human affairs, as Hermes has it. In esoteric parlance, they are called chikala, some of which are those who have furnished man with his fourth and fifth principles from their own essence, and others the so-called petris. This will be explained when we come to the production of the complete man. The root of the name is chit, that by which the consequences of acts and species of knowledge are selected for the use of the soul, or conscience, the inner voice in man. With the yogins, chit is a synonym of mahat, the first and divine intellect, but in esoteric philosophy, madhat is the root of chit, its germ, and chit is a quality of manas in conjunction with buddhai, 
a quality that attracts to itself by spiritual affinity, a chitkala, when it develops sufficiently in man. This is why it is said that chit is a voice acquiring mystic life and becoming Kuan Yin. Extracts from an Eastern Private Commentary, Hitherto Secret. 27. The initial existence in the first twilight of the Manvantaran, after Mahapralaya that follows every age of Brahma, is a conscious spiritual quality. In the manifested worlds, solar systems, it is, in its objective subjectivity, like the film from a divine breath to the gaze of the entranced seer. It spreads as it issues from Laya throughout infinity as a colorless spiritual fluid. It is on the seventh plane and its seventh state in our planetary world. 28. It is substance to our spiritual sight. It cannot be called so by men in their waking state, therefore they have named it in their ignorance God's spirit. 19. It exists everywhere and forms the first apadi, foundation on which our world, solar system, is built. Outside the latter, it is said to be found in its pristine purity only between the solar systems or the stars of the universe, the worlds already formed or forming, those in Laya, resting meanwhile in its bosom. As its substance is of a different kind from that known on earth, the inhabitants of the latter, seeing through it, believe in their illusion and ignorance that it is empty space. There is not one finger's breadth, angula, of void space in the whole boundless universe. 20. Matter, or substance, is septenary within our own world as it is so beyond it. Moreover, each of its states, or principles, is graduated into seven degrees of density. Surya, the sun, in its visible reflection, exhibits the first or lowest state of the seventh. The highest state of the universal presence, the pure of the pure, the first manifested breath of the ever unmanifested sat, Venus, all the central, physical, or objective suns are, in their substance, the lowest state of the first principle of the breath. Nor are any of these any more than the reflections of their primaries, which are concealed from the gaze of all but the Jian Chohans, whose corporeal substance belongs to the fifth division of the seventh principle of the mother substance, and is therefore four degrees higher than the solar reflected substance. As there are seven Datu, principal substances, in the human body, so there are seven forces in man and in all nature. 21. The real substance of the concealed sun is a nucleus of mother substance, and is the heart and matrix of all the living and existing forces in our solar universe. It is the kernel from which proceed to spread on the cyclical journeys of all powers that set in action the atoms in their functional duties, and the focus within which they again meet in their seventh essence every eleventh year. He who tells thee he has seen the sun, laugh at him, as if he had said that the sun moves really onward in his diurnal path. 23. It is on account of his septenary nature that the sun is spoken of by the ancients as one who is driven by seven horses equal to the meters of the Vedas. Or again, that though he is identified with the seven Gana, classes of being, in his orb, he is distinct from them, as he is indeed, as also that he has seven rays, as indeed he has. 25. The seven beings in the sun are the seven holy ones, self-born from the inherent power in the matrix mother substance. It is they who send the seven principal forces, called rays, which at the beginning of pralaya will center into seven new suns for the next Mamantara. The energy from which they spring into conscious existence in every sun is what some people call Vishnu, which is the breath of the absoluteness. We call it the one manifested life, itself a reflection of the Absolute. 27. 
the latter must never be mentioned in words or speech, lest it should take away some of our spiritual energies that aspire toward its state, gravitating ever onward into it spiritually, as the whole physical universe gravitates toward its manifested center cosmically. 28. The former, the initial existence, which may be called, while in this state of being, the one life, is, as explained, a film for creative or formative purposes. It manifests in seven states, which, with their septenary subdivisions, are the 49 fires mentioned in sacred books. 29. The first is the mother, prime materia, septenary itself into its primary seven states. It proceeds down cyclically. When having consolidated itself in its last principle, as gross matter, it revolves around itself and informs, with the seventh emanation of the last, the first and the lowest element, the serpent biting its own tail. In a hierarchy, or order of being, the seventh emanation of her last principle is A. In the mineral, the spark that lies latent in it, and is called to its evanescent being by the positive awakening, the negative, and so forth. B. In the plant, it is that vital and intelligent force which informs the seed and develops it into a blade of grass, or the root and sapling. It is the germ which becomes the apati of the seven principles of the thing it resides in, shooting them out as the latter grows and develops. C. In every animal it does the same. It is its life principle and vital power, its instinct and qualities, its characteristic and special idiosyncrasies. D. To man, it gives all that it bestows on all the rest of the manifested units in nature, but develops, furthermore, the reflection of all its 49 fires in him. Each of his seven principles is an heir in full to and a partaker of the seven principles of the Great Mother. The breath of her first principle is his spirit, Atma. Her second principle is booty, soul. We call it, erroneously, the seventh. The third furnishes him with the brain stuff on the physical plane, and with the mind that moves it, which is the human soul, HPB, according to his organic capacities. E. It is the guiding force in the cosmic and terrestrial elements. It resides in the fire provoked out of its Latin into active being, for the whole of the seven subdivisions of the principle reside in the terrestrial fire. It whirls in the breeze, blows with the hurricane, and sets the air in motion, which element participates in one of its principles also. Proceeding cyclically, it regulates the motion of the water, attracts and repels the waves. According to the fixed laws, of which its seventh principle is the informing soul. F, its four higher principles, contain the germ that develops into the cosmic gods. Its three lower ones breed the lives of the elements, elementals. G, in our solar world, the one existence is heaven and earth the root and the flower, the action and the thought. It is in the sun, and it is as present in the glowworm. Not an atom can escape it. Therefore, the ancient sages have wisely called it the manifested God in nature. It may be interesting in this connection to remind the reader of what T. Subba Rho said of the forces, mystically defined. Kanya, the sixth sign of the zodiac, or Virgo, means a virgin and represents Shakti, or Mahamaya. The sign in question is the sixth Rashi, or division, and indicates that there are six primary forces in nature, synthesized by the seventh. These Shaktis stand as follows. 1. Parashakti, literally the great or supreme force or power. It means and includes the power of light and heat. 2. Yana Shakti, literally the power of intellect or real wisdom or knowledge. It has two aspects. 
One, the following are some of its manifestations when placed under the influence or control of material conditions. A. The power of the mind in interpreting our sensations. B. Its power in recalling past ideas, memory, and raising future expectation. C. Its power as exhibited in what are called by modern psychologists the laws of association, which enables it to form persisting connections between various groups of sensations and possibilities of sensations and thus generate the notion or idea of an external object. D. Its power in connecting our ideas together by the mysterious link of memory, and thus generating the notion of self or individuality. Number two, the following are some of its manifestations when liberated from the bonds of matter. A. Clairvoyance. B. Psychometry. Three, Ichashakti literally the power of the will. Its most ordinary manifestation is the generation of certain nerve currents, which set in motion such muscles as are required for the accomplishment of the desired object. 4. Kriya Shakti, the mysterious power of thought which enables it to produce external, perceptible, phenomenal results by its own inherent energy. The ancients held that any idea will manifest itself externally if one's attention is deeply concentrated upon it. Similarly, an intense volition will be followed by the desired result. A yogi generally performs his wonders by means of Ichashakti and Kriya Shakti. Number 5. Kundalini Shakti The power or force which moves in a serpentine or curved path. It is the universal life principle, which everywhere manifests in nature. This force includes the two great forces of attraction and repulsion. Electricity and magnetism are but manifestations of it. This is the power which brings about that continuous adjustment of internal relations to external relations, which is the essence of life according to Herbert Spencer, and that continuous adjustment of external relations to internal relations which is the basis of transmigration of souls, punaryanman, rebirth, and the doctrines of the ancient Hindu philosophers. A yogi must thoroughly subjugate this power or force before he can attain moksha. Number six, mantrika shakti, literally the force or power of letters, speech, or music. The whole of the ancient mantra shastra, has the force or power in its, all its manifestations for its subject matter. The influence of its music is one of its ordinary manifestations. The power of the merific, ineffable name is the crown of this shakti. Modern science has but partly investigated the first, second, and fifth of the forces or powers above named, but is altogether in the dark as regards the remaining powers. The six forces are in their unity represented by the astral light, Deva Prakriti, the seventh, the light of the Logos. The above is quoted to show the real Hindu ideas on the subject. It is all esoteric, though not covering the tenth part of what might be said. For one thing, the six names of the six forces mentioned are those of the six hierarchies of Dhyan Chohans, synthesized by their primary, the seventh, who personify the fifth principle of cosmic nature, or of the mother in its mystical sense. The enumeration alone of the yoga powers would require ten volumes. Each of these forces has a living, conscious entity at its head, of which entity it is an emanation. But let us compare with the commentary above cited the words of Hermes, the thrice great. The creation of life by the sun is as continuous as his light. Nothing arrests or limits it. Around him, like an army of satellites, are innumerable choirs of genii. These dwell in the neighborhood of the immortals, and thence watch over human things. They fulfill the will of the gods. Karma, by means of storms, tempests, transitions of fire and earthquakes, likewise by famine and wars, for the punishment of impiety. It is the sun who preserves and nourishes all creatures, and even as the ideal world, which environs the sensible world, fills this last with the plenitude 
and universal variety of forms. So also the sun, enfolding all in his light, accomplishes everywhere the birth and development of creatures. Under his orders is the choir of the genii, or rather the choirs, for there are many and diverse, and their number corresponds to that of the stars. Every star has its genii, good and evil by nature, or rather by their operation, for operation is the essence of the genii. All these genii preside over mundane affairs. They shake and overthrow the constitution of states and of individuals. They imprint their likeness on our souls. They are present in our nerves, our marrow, our veins, our arteries, and our very brain substance. At the moment when each of us receives life and being, he is taken in charge by the genii, elementals, who preside over births and who are classed beneath the astral powers, superhuman astral spirits. Perpetually they change, not always identically, but revolving in circles. They permeate by the body two parts of the soul, that it may receive from each the impress of his own energy. But the reasonable part of the soul is not subject to the genii. It is designed for the reception of the God who enlightens it with a sunny ray. Those who are illumined are few in number, and from them the genii abstain. For neither genii nor gods have any power in the presence of a single ray of God. But all other men, both soul and body, are directed by genii to whom they cleave, and whose operations they affect. The genii have then the control of mundane things, and our bodies serve them as instruments. The above, say a few sectarian points, represents that which was a universal belief, common to all nations till about a century or so back. It is still as orthodox in its broad outlines and features among pagans and Christians alike, if one accepts a handful of materialists and men of science. For whether one calls the genii of Hermes and his gods, powers of darkness and angels, as in the Greek and Latin churches, or spirits of the dead, as in spiritualism, or again boots and devas, shaitan or jinn, as they are still called in India and Muslim countries, they are all one and the same thing, illusion. Let not this, however, be misunderstood in the sense into which the great philosophical doctrine of the Vedantists has been lately perverted by Western schools. All that which is emanates from the Absolute, which by reason of this qualification alone, stands as the one and only reality. Hence, everything extraneous to this Absolute, this generative and causative element, must be an illusion, most undeniably. But this is only from the purely metaphysical view. A man who regards himself as mentally sane and is so regarded by his neighbors calls the visions of an insane brother hallucinations which make the victim either happy or supremely wretched, as the case may be. Likewise, illusions and fancies. But where is that madman for whom the hideous shadows in his deranged mind his illusions are not, for the time being, as actual and as real as the things which his physician or keeper may see? Everything is relative in this universe. Everything is an illusion. But the experience of any plane is an actuality for the percipient being, whose consciousness is on that plane, though the said experience, regarded from the purely metaphysical standpoint, may be conceived to have no objective reality. But it is not against metaphysicians, but against physicists and materialists that esoteric teaching has to fight. And for these latter vital force, light, sound, electricity, even to the objectively drawing force of magnetism, have no objective being, and are said to exist merely as modes of motion, sensations, and affections of matter. Neither the occultist generally, nor the theosophists reject, as erroneously believed by some, the views and theories of the modern scientists only because these views are opposed to theosophy. The first rule of our society is to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Theosophists, therefore, are the first to recognize the intrinsic value of science. 
But when its high priests resolve consciousness into a secretion from the gray matter of the brain, and everything else in nature into a mode of motion, we protest against the doctrine as being unphilosophical, self-contradictory, and simply absurd from a scientific point of view, as much and even more than from the occult aspect of the esoteric knowledge. For truly the astral light of the derided Kabbalists has strange and weird secrets for him who can see in it, and the mysteries concealed within its incessantly disturbed waves are there, the whole body of materialists and scoffers notwithstanding. The astral light of the Kabbalist is by some very incorrectly translated ether, the latter is confused with the hypothetical ether of science, and both are referred to by some theosophists as synonymous with Akasha. This is a great mistake. The author of A Rational Refutation writes, thus unconsciously helping occultism, A characterization of Akasha will serve to show how inadequately it is represented by ether. In dimension, it is infinite. It is not made up of parts in color, taste, smell and tangibility do not appertain to it, so far forth it corresponds exactly to time, space, Ishvara, the Lord, but rather creative potency, the soul, anima mundi, and soul. Its specialty, as compared therewith, consists in its being the material cause of sound. Except for its being so, one might take it to be one with vacuity. It is vacuity, no doubt, especially for rationalists. At any rate, Akasha is sure to produce vacuity in the brain of a materialist. Nevertheless, though Akasha is certainly not the ether of science, nor even the ether of the occultist who defines the latter as one of the principles of Akasha only, it is as certainly, together with its primary, the cause of sound, a psychical and spiritual, not a material cause by any means. The relations of ether to akasha may be defined by applying to both akasha and ether the words used in the god of the Vedas. So himself was indeed his own son, one being the progeny of the other and yet itself. This may be a difficult riddle to the profane, but very easy to understand for any Hindu even though not a mystic. The secrets of the astral light, along with many other mysteries, will remain non-existent to the materialists of our age. In the same way as America was a non-existent myth for Europeans during the early part of the medieval ages, whereas Scandinavians and Norwegians had actually reached and settled in that very old, new world several centuries before. But as a Columbus was born to rediscover and to force the old world to believe in antipodal countries, so will there be born scientists who will discover the marvels now claimed by occultists to exist in the regions of ether, with their varied and multiform denizens of conscious entities. Then, no lens volens, science will have to accept the old superstition, as it has several others, and having been once forced to accept it, its learned professors in all probability judging from past experience, as in the case of mesmerism and magnetism, now re-baptized hypnotism, will father the thing and reject the name. The choice of the new appellation will, in its turn, depend on the modes of motion, the new name for the older automatic physical processes among the nerve fibrils of the scientific brain. Of mole shot, and also most likely upon the last meal of the namer, since according to the founder of the new hilo idealistic scheme, cerebration is generically the same as chilification. Thus, were one to believe this preposterous proposition, the new name of the archaic truth would have to take its chance on the inspiration of the namer's liver, and then only would these truths have a chance of becoming scientific. But truth, however distasteful to the generally blind majority, has always had her champions ready to die for her. And it is not the occultist who will protest against its adoption by science under whatever name. But until absolutely forced on the notice and acceptance of scientists, many an occult truth will be tabooed, 
as the phenomenon of the spiritualists and other psychic manifestations were, to be finally appropriated by its extraducers, without the least acknowledgement or thanks. Nitrogen is added considerably to chemical knowledge, but its discoverer, Paracelsus, is to this day called a quack. How profoundly true are the words of H. T. Buckle in his admirable history of civilization when he says, Owing to circumstances still unknown, karmic provision, there appear from time to time great thinkers who, devoting their lives to a single purpose, are able to anticipate the progress of mankind and to produce a religion or a philosophy by which important effects are eventually brought about. But if we look into history, we shall clearly see that, although the origin of a new opinion may be thus due to a single man, the result which the new opinion produces will depend on the condition of the people among whom it is propagated. If either a religion or a philosophy is too much in advance of a nation, it can do no present service, but must bide its time until the minds of men are ripe for its reception. Every science, every creed has had its martyrs. According to the ordinary course of affairs, a few generations pass away. And then there comes a period when these very truths are looked upon as a commonplace facts. And a little later there comes another period in which they are declared to be necessary. And even the dullest intellect wonders how they could ever have been denied. It is barely possible that the minds of the present generations are not quite ripe for the reception of occult truths. Such perchance will be the retrospect furnished to the advanced thinkers of the sixth root race of the history of the acceptance of esoteric philosophy fully and unconditionally. Meanwhile, the generations of our fifth race will continue to be led away by prejudice and preconceptions. Occult sciences will have the finger of scorn pointed at them from every street corner, and everyone will seek to ridicule and crush them in the name, and for the greater glory of materialism and its so-called science. The present volumes, however, show in an anticipatory answer to several of the forthcoming scientific objections the true and mutual positions of defendant and plaintiff. The theosophists and occultists stand arraigned by public opinion, which still holds high the banner of the inductive sciences. The latter have, then, to be examined, and it must be shown how far their achievements and discoveries in the realm of natural law are opposed, not so much to our claims as to facts in nature. The hour has now struck to ascertain whether the walls of the modern Jericho are so impregnable that no blast of the occult trumpet is ever likely to make them crumble. The so-called forces with light and electricity heading them and the constitution of the solar orb must be carefully examined, as also gravitation and the nebular theories. The natures of ether and of other elements must be discussed. Thus contrasting scientific with occult teachings, while revealing some of the hitherto secret tenets of the latter. Some fifteen years ago, the writer of the first to repeat, after the Kabbalists, the wise commandments in the esoteric catechism. Close thy mouth, lest thou should speak of this, the mystery, and thy heart, lest thou should think aloud. And if thy heart has escaped thee, bring it back to its place for such is the object of our alliance. And again, from the rules of initiation, this is a secret which gives death. Close thy mouth, lest thou should reveal it to the vulgar. Compress thy brain, lest something should escape from it and fall outside. A few years later, a corner of the veil of Isis had to be lifted, and now another and a larger rent is made. But old and time-honored errors, such as become with every day more glaring and self-evident, stand arrayed in battle order now as they did then. Marshaled by blind conservatism, conceit, and prejudice, they are constantly on the watch, ready to strangle every truth which, awakening from its age-long sleep, happens to knock for admission. Such has been the case ever since man became an animal. That this proves in every case moral death to the revealers who bring to light any of these old, old truths 
is as certain as that it gives life and regeneration to those who are fit to profit even by the little that is now revealed to them. Part 2. The Evolution of Symbolism Section 1. Symbolism and Ideographs Is not a symbol ever, to him who has eyes for it, some dimmer or clearer revelation of the godlike? Through all, there glimmers something of a divine idea. Nay, the highest ensign that men ever met and embraced under, the cross itself had no meaning, save an accidental, extrinsic one. Carlyle The study of the hidden meaning in every religious and profane legend of whatsoever nation, large or small, and preeminently in the traditions of the East, has occupied the greater portion of the present writer's life. She is one of those who feel convinced that no mythological story, no traditional event in the folklore of a people, has ever, at any time, been pure fiction, but that every one of such narratives has an actual historical lining to it. In this, the writer disagrees with these symbologists however great their reputation, who find in every myth nothing save additional proofs of the superstitious bent of mind of the ancients, and believe that all mythologies sprang from and are built upon solar myths. Such superficial thinkers were admirably disposed of by Gerald Massey, the poet and Egyptologist in a lecture on Lunaltry, ancient and modern. His pointed criticism is worthy of reproduction in this part of this work, as it echoes so well our own feelings, expressed openly as far back as 1877, when Isis Unveiled was written. For 30 years past, Professor Max Muller has been teaching in his books and lectures in the Times, Saturday Review, and various magazines, from the platform of the Royal Institution, the pulpit of Westminster Abbey and his chair at Oxford, that mythology is a disease of language, and that the ancient symbolism was a result of something like a primitive mental aberration. We know, says Renouf, echoing Max Muller in his Hibbert lectures, we know that mythology is the disease which springs up at a peculiar stage of human culture. Such is the shallow explanation of the non-evolutionists and such explanations are still accepted by the British public. It gets its thinking done for it by proxy. Professor Max Muller, Cox, Gubernatus, and other propounders of the solar mythos have portrayed the primitive mythmaker for us as a sort of Germanized Hindu metaphysician, projecting his own shadow on a mental mist and talking ingeniously concerning smoke, or at least cloud, the sky overhead becoming like the Dome of Dreamland, scribbled over with the imagery of aboriginal nightmares. They conceive the early man in their own likeness and look upon him as perversely prone to self-mystification, or as Fontenelle has it, subject to beholdings that there are not there. They have misrepresented primitive or archaic man as having been idiotically mizzled from the first by an active but untutored imagination into believing all sorts of fallacies, which were directly and constantly contradicted by his own daily experience. A fool of fancy in the midst of those grim realities that were grinding his experiences into him, like the grinding icebergs making their imprints upon the rocks submerged beneath the sea. It remains to be said, and will one day be acknowledged, that these accepted teachers have been no nearer to the beginnings of mythology and language than Burns' poet Willie had been near to Pegasus. My reply is, tis but a dream of the metaphysician theorist that mythology was a disease of language, or of anything else except his own brain. The origin and meaning of mythology have been missed altogether by these solarites and weathermongers. Mythology was a primitive mode of thinging the early thought. It was founded on natural facts and is still verifiable in phenomena. There is nothing insane, nothing irrational in it, when considered in the light of evolution, 
and when its mode of expression by sign language is thoroughly understood. The insanity lies in mistaking it for human history or divine revelation. Mythology is the repository of man's most ancient science, and what concerns us chiefly is this. When truly interpreted once more, it is destined to be the death of those false theologies to which it has unwittingly given birth. In modern phraseology, a statement is sometimes said to be mythical in properties to its being untrue. But the ancient mythology was not a system or mode of falsifying in that sense. Its fables were the means of conveying facts. They were neither forgeries nor fictions. For example, when the Egyptian portrayed the moon as a cat, they were not ignorant enough to suppose that the moon was a cat, nor did their wandering fancies see any likeness in the moon to a cat, nor was a cat myth any more expansion of verbal metaphor, nor had they any intention of making puzzles or riddles. They had observed the simple fact that the cat saw in the dark, and that her eyes became full-orbed and grew most luminous by night. The moon was the seer by night in heaven, and the cat was its equivalent on the earth. And so the familiar cat was adopted as a representative, a natural sign, a living pictograph of the lunar orb. And so it followed that the sun which saw down in the underworld at night could also be called the cat, as it was, because it also saw in the dark. The name of the cat in Egyptian is Mao, which denotes the seer from Mao to see. One writer on mythology asserts that the Egyptians imagined a great cat behind the sun, which is the pupil of the cat's eye. But this imagining is all modern. It is the Mullerite stock in trade. The moon as cat was the eye of the sun, because it reflected the solar light and because the eye gives back the image in its mirror. In the form of the goddess Pasht, the cat keeps watch for the sun, with her paw holding down and bruising the head of the serpent of darkness, called his eternal enemy. This is a very correct exposition of the lunar mythos from its astronomical aspect. Selenography, however, is the least esoteric of the divisions of lunar symbology. To master thoroughly, if one is permitted to coin a new word, selenonosis, one must become proficient in more than its astronomical meaning. The moon is intimately related to the earth, as shown in the stanzas, and is more directly concerned with all the mysteries of our globe than is even Venus, Lucifer, the occult sister and alter ego of the earth. The untiring researches of Western, especially German symbologists, during the last and the present centuries, have induced the most unprejudiced students, and of course every occultist, to see that without the help of symbology, with its seven departments of which the moderns know nothing, no ancient scripture can ever be correctly understood. Symbology must be studied from every one of its aspects, for each nation had its own peculiar methods of expression. In short, no Egyptian papyrus no Indian Ola, no Assyrian tile, no Hebrew scroll should be read and interpreted literally. This every scholar now knows. The able lectures of Mr. Gerald Massey alone are sufficient to convince any fair-minded Christian that to accept the dead letter of the Bible is equivalent to falling into a grosser error and superstition than any hitherto evolved by the brain of the savage South Sea Islander. But the fact to which even the most truth-loving and truth-searching Orientalists, whether Arianists or Egyptologists, seem to remain blind, is that every symbol on papyrus or ola is a many-faced diamond, each of whose facets not only includes several interpretations, but also relates to several sciences. This is instance in the just-quoted interpretation of the cat symbolizing the moon. An example of sidereo terrestrial imagery for the moon has with other nations many other meanings besides. As a learned mason and theosophist, the late Kenneth Mackenzie has shown in his Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, there is a great difference between emblem and symbol. 
The former compromises a larger series of thoughts than a symbol, which may be said rather to illustrate some single special idea. Hence the symbols, lunar or solar for example, of several countries each illustrating such a special idea or series of ideas, form collectively an esoteric emblem. The latter is a concrete visible picture or sign representing principles or a series of principles recognizable by those who have received certain instructions, initiates. To put it still plainer, an emblem is usually a series of graphic pictures viewed and explained allegorically and unfolding an idea in panoramic views, one after the other. Thus, the Puranas are written emblems. So are the Mosaic and Christian Testaments, or the Bible, and all other exoteric scriptures. As the same authority shows, all esoteric societies have made use of emblems and symbols, such as the Pythagorean Society, the Eleusinia, the Hermetic Brethren of Egypt, the Rosicrucians, and the Freemasons. Many of these emblems is not proper to divulge to the general eye, and as a very minute difference may make the emblem or symbol differ widely in its meaning, the magical sigilla being founded on certain principles of number partake of this character, and, and although monstrous or ridiculous in the eyes of the uninstructed, convey a whole body of doctrine to those who have been trained to recognize them. The above enumerated societies are all comparatively modern, none dating back earlier than the Middle Ages. How much more proper, then, that the students of the oldest archaic schools should be careful not to divulge secrets of far more importance to humanity, as being dangerous in ignorant hands, than any of the so-called Masonic secrets which have now become those of Polichinelle, as the French say, but this restriction can only apply to the psychological, or rather psychophysiological and cosmical significance of symbol and emblem, and even to that only partially. For though an adept is compelled to refuse to impart the conditions and means that lead to any correlation of elements, whether psychic or physical, which may produce harmful as well as beneficent results, yet he is ever ready to impart to the earnest student the secret of the ancient thought, and anything that has respect to history concealed under mythological symbolism and thus to furnish a few more landmarks for a retrospective view of the past. In so far as it furnishes useful information with regard to the origin of man, the evolution of the races and geonosi, and yet it is the crying complaint today, not only among theosophists, but also among the few profane interested in the subject, why do not the adepts reveal that which they know? To this, one might answer, why should they, since one knows beforehand that no man of science will accept it, even as a hypothesis, much less as a theory or axiom? Have you so much as accepted or believed in the ABC of the occult philosophy contained in the Theosophist, Esoteric Buddhism, and other works and periodicals? Has not even the little which has been given been ridiculed and derided and made to face the animal and ape theory of Huxley and Hackle on the one hand and the rib of Adam and the apple on the other? Notwithstanding such an unenviable prospect, however, a mask of facts is given in the present work. And the origin of man, the evolution of the globe and the races, human and animal, are as fully treated as the writer is able to treat them. The proofs brought forward in the corroboration of the old teachings are scattered widely throughout the old scriptures of ancient civilizations. The Puranas, the Zendavesta, and the old classics are full of such facts, but no one has ever taken the trouble of collecting and collating them together. The reason for this is that all such events were recorded symbolically, and that the best scholars, the most acute minds among our Arianists and Egyptologists, have been too often darkened by one or another preconception, and still oftener by one-sided views of the secret meaning. Yet even a parable is a spoken symbol, a fiction or a fable as some think, an allegorical representation, we say, of life realities, events, and facts. 
And just as a moral was ever drawn from a parable, such moral being an actual truth and a fact in human life, so a historical real event was deduced by those versed in the heretic sciences from emblems and symbols recorded in the ancient archives of the temples. The religious and esoteric history of every nation was embedded in symbols. It was never expressed literally in so many words. All the thoughts and emotions, all the learning and knowledge revealed and acquired of the early races found their pictorial expression in allegory and parable. Why? Because the spoken word has a potency not only unknown to, but even unsuspected and naturally disbelieved in by the modern sages. Because sound and rhythm are closely related to the four elements of the ancients, and because such or another vibration in the air is sure to awaken the corresponding powers. Union with which produces good or bad results, as the case may be. No student was ever allowed to recite historical, religious, or real events of any kind in so many unmistakable words, lest the powers connected with the event should be once more attracted. Such events were narrated only during initiation, and every student had to record them in corresponding symbols, drawn out of his own mind and examined later by his master, before they were finally accepted. Thus, by degrees, was the Chinese alphabet created, or just before it, the hieratic symbols were fixed upon in old Egypt. In the Chinese language, the characters of which may be read in any language, and which, just as said, is only a little less ancient than the Egyptian alphabet of Thoth. Every word has its corresponding symbol in a pictorial form. This language possesses many thousands of such symbol letters or logograms, each conveying the meaning of a whole word. For letters proper, or an alphabet as we understand it, do not exist in the Chinese language, any more than they did in the Egyptian, till a far later period. Thus, a Japanese who does not understand one word of Chinese, meeting with a Chinaman who has never heard the language of the former, will communicate in writing with him, and they will understand each other perfectly, because their writing is symbolical. The explanation of the chief symbols and emblems is now attempted, as Book 2, which treats of anthropogenesis, would be most difficult to understand without a preparatory acquaintance with at least the metaphysical symbols. Nor would it be just to enter upon an esoteric reading of symbolism, without giving due honor to one who has rendered it the greatest service in this century, by discovering the chief key to ancient Hebrew symbology, strongly interwoven with metrology, one of the keys to the once universal mystery language. Mr. Ralston Skinner of Cincinnati, the author of The Key to the Hebrew-Egyptian Mystery and the Source of Measures, has our thanks. A mystic and a Kabbalist by nature, he has labored for many years in this direction, and his efforts have certainly been crowned with great success. In his own words, the writer is quite certain that there was an ancient language which modernly, and up to this time, appears to have been lost, the vestiges of which, however abundantly exist, the author discovered that this geometrical ratio, the integral ratio of the diameter to the circumference of a circle, was the very ancient and probably the divine origin of linear measures. It appears almost proven that the same system of geometry, numbers, ratio, and measures was known and made use of the continent of North America, even prior to the knowledge of the same by the descending Semites. The peculiarity of this language was that it could be contained in another, concealed and not to be perceived, save through the help of special instructions. Letters and syllabic signs possessing at the same time the powers or meaning of numbers, of geometrical shapes, pictures, or ideographs and symbols. The design scope of which would determinatively helped out by parables in the shape of narratives or parts of narratives, while also it could be set forth separately, independently, and variously by pictures in stonework or in earth constructions. To clear up an ambiguity as to the term language, primarily the word means the expression of ideas by human speech, 
but secondarily, it may mean the expression of ideas by any other instrumentality. This old language is so composed in the Hebrew text that by the use of the written characters which uttered shall be the language first defined, a distinctly separated series of ideas may be intentionally communicated, other than those ideas expressed by the reading of the sound signs. The secondary language sets forth, under a veil, a series of ideas, copies in imagination of things sensible, which may be pictured, and of things which may be classed as real without being sensible, as, for instance, the number nine may be taken as a reality, though it has no sensible existence, so also a revolution of the moon, as separated from the moon itself, by which that revolution has been made, may be taken as giving rise to or causing a real idea, though such a revolution has no substance. The idea language may consist of symbols, restricted to arbitrary terms and signs, having a very limited range of conceptions and quite valueless, or it may be a reading of nature in some of her manifestations of a value almost immeasurable as regards human civilization. A picture of something natural may give rise to ideas of coordinating subjects, radiating out in various and even opposing directions, like the spokes of a wheel, and producing natural realities in departments very foreign to the apparent tendency of the reading of the first or starting picture. Notion may give rise to connected notion, but if it does, then, however apparently incongruous, all resulting ideas must spring from the original picture and be harmonically connected, or related the one with the other. Thus, with a pictured idea radical enough, the imagination of the cosmos itself, even in its details of construction, might result. Such a use of ordinary language is now obsolete, but it has become a question with the writer whether at one time, far back in the past, or such, was not the language of the world and of universal use possessed, however, as it became more and more molded into its arcane forms by a select class or caste. By this, I mean that the popular tongue or vernacular commenced even in its origin to be made use of as the vehicle of this peculiar mode of conveying ideas. Of this, the evidences are very strong, and indeed, it would seem that in the history of the human race there happened, from causes which at present at any rate we cannot trace, a lapse or loss from an original perfect language and a perfect system of science. Shall we say perfect because they were of divine origin and importation. Divine origin does not here mean a revelation from an anthropomorphic god on a mount amidst thunder and lightning, but as we understand it, a language and a system of science imparted to early mankind by a more advanced mankind, so much higher as to be divine in the sight of that infant humanity. By a mankind, in short, from other spheres, an idea which contains nothing supernatural in it, but the acceptance or rejection of what depends upon the degree of conceit and arrogance in the mind of him to whom it was stated. For if the professors of modern knowledge would only confess that, though they know nothing of the future of the disembodied man, or rather will accept nothing, yet this future may be pregnant with surprises and unexpected revelations to them once their egos are rid of their gross bodies, then materialistic unbelief would have fewer chances than it has. Who of them knows or can tell what may happen when once the life cycle of this globe is run down and our mother earth herself falls into her last sleep? Who is bold enough to say that the divine egos of our mankind, at least the elect out of the multitudes passing on to other spheres, will not become in their turn the divine instructors of a new mankind, generated by them on a new globe called to life and activity by the disembodied principles of our earth. All this may have been the experience of the past, and these strange records lie embedded in the mystery language of the prehistoric ages, the language now called symbolism. Section 2 the Mystery Language and Its Keys Recent discoveries made by great mathematicians and Kabbalists thus prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
that every theology from the earliest down to the latest has sprung not only from a common source of abstract beliefs, but from one universal esoteric or mystery language. These scholars hold the key to the universal language of old and have turned it successfully, though only once, in the hermetically closed door leading to the Hall of Mysteries. The great archaic system known from prehistoric ages as the sacred wisdom science one that is contained and can be traced in every old as well as in every new religion, had and still has its universal language. Suspected by the Mason Ragon, the language of the Hierophants, which has seven dialects, so to speak, each referring and being specially appropriate to one of the seven mysteries of nature. Each had its own symbolism. Nature could thus either be read in its fullness or viewed from one of its special aspects. The proof of this lies to this day in the extreme difficulty which the Orientalists in general and the Indianists and Egyptologists in particular experience in interpreting the allegorical writings of the Aryans and the Hieratic records of Old Egypt. This is because they will never remember that all the ancient records were written in a language which was universal and known to all nations alike in days of old, but which is now intelligible only to the few. Like the Arabic figures which are understandable to men of every nation, or like the English word and which becomes et for the Frenchman, and for the German, and so on, yet which may be expressed for all civilized nations in the simple sign, and so all the words of that mystery language signify the same thing to each man of whatever nationality. There have been several men of note who have tried to re-establish such a universal and philosophical tongue. Delgarm, Wilkins, Leibniz, but Demimieux in his Passographe is the only one who has proven its possibility. The scheme of Valentinius, called the Greek Kabbalah, based on the combination of Greek letters, might serve as a model. The many-sided facets of the mystery language have led to the adoption of widely varied dogmas and rites in the exotericism of the church rituals. It is these, again, which are at the origin of most the dogmas of the Christian church. For instance, the seven sacraments, the Trinity, the Resurrection, the seven capital sins, and the seven virtues. The seven keys to the mystery tongue, however, have always been in the keeping of the highest among the initiated hierophants of antiquity. It is only the partial use of a few out of the seven which passed, through the treason of some early church fathers, ex-initiates of the temples, into the hands of the new sect of the Nazarenes. Some of the early popes were initiates, but the last fragments of their knowledge have now fallen into the power of the Jesuits, who have turned them into a system of sorcery. It is maintained that India, not confined to its present limit, but including its ancient boundaries, is the only country in the world which still has among her sons adepts who have the knowledge of all the seven subsystems and the key to the entire system. From the fall of Memphis, Egypt began to lose keys one by one, and Chaldea had preserved only three in the days of Barossus. As for the Hebrews and all their writings, they show no more than a thorough knowledge of the astronomical, geometrical, and numerical systems of symbolizing the human, and especially the physiological functions. They never had the higher keys. M. Gaston Maspero The great French Egyptologist and the successor of Mariette B. writes, Every time I hear people talking of the religion of Egypt, I am tempted to ask which of the Egyptian religions they are talking about. Is it of the Egyptian religion of the 4th dynasty, or the Egyptian religion of the Ptolemaic period? Is it of the religion of the rabble, or of that of the learned? Of the religion such as was taught in the schools of Heliopolis? or of that which is in the minds of conceptions of the Theban sacerdotal class. For between the first Memphite tomb, which bears the cartouche of a king in the third dynasty, and the last stones engraved at Esne under Caesar Philippus, 
the Arabian, there is an interval of at least 5,000 years. Leaving aside the invasion of the shepherds, the Ethiopian and Assyrian dominions, the Persian conquest, Greek colonization, and the thousand revolutions of its political life, Egypt has passed during those 5,000 years through many vicissitudes of life, moral and intellectual. Chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead, which seems to contain the exposition of the system of the world, as it was understood at Heliopolis during the time of the first dynasties, is known to us by a few copies of the 11th and 12th dynasties. Every one of the verses composing it was already interpreted in three or four different ways. So different, indeed, that according to this or another school, the Demiurge became either the solar fire, Rashu, or the primordial water. Fifteen centuries later, the number of readings had increased considerably. Time, in its course, has modified their ideas about the universe and the forces that ruled it. In the short 18 centuries that Christianity has existed, it has worked up, developed, and transformed most of its dogmas. How many times, then, might not the Egyptian priesthood have altered their dogmas during those 50 centuries that separated Theodosius from the king builders of the pyramids? Here, we believe the eminent Egyptologist is going too far. The exoteric dogmas may often have been altered, the esoteric never. He does not take into account the sacred immutability of the primitive truths, revealed only during the mysteries of initiation. The Egyptian priests had forgotten much, they altered nothing. The loss of a great part of the primitive teaching was due to the sudden deaths of the great hierophants, who passed away before they had time to reveal all to their successors, mostly in the absence of worthy heirs to the knowledge. Yet they preserved in their rituals and dogmas the principal teachings of the secret doctrine. Thus, in the chapter of the Book of the Dead mentioned by Maspero, we find one, Osiris saying he is tomb, the creative force in nature, giving form to all beings, spirits and men, self-generated and self-existent, issued from noon, the celestial river called Father Mother of the Gods, the primordial deity, which is chaos or the deep, impregnated by the unseen spirit. Two, he has found Shu, the solar force, on the stairway in the city of the eight, two squares of good and evil, and he has annihilated the children of rebellion, the evil principles in noon, chaos. Three, he is the fire and water, noon the primordial parent, and he created the gods out of his limbs. Fourteen gods, twice seven, seven dark and seven light gods, the seven spirits of the presence of the Christians, and the seven dark evil spirits. Four, he is the law of existence and being, the Benu, or Phoenix, the bird of resurrection and eternity, in whom night follows day and day-night, an allusion to the periodical cycles of cosmic resurrection and human reincarnation. For what else can this mean? The wayfarer who crosses millions of years is the name of one, and the great green primordial water or chaos, the name of the other one begetting millions of years in succession, the other engulfing them to restore them back. 5. He speaks of the seven luminous ones who follow their lord, Osiris, who confers justice in Amenti. All this is now shown to have been the source and origin of Christian dogmas, that which the Jews had from Egypt through Moses and other initiates, was confused and distorted enough in later days but that which the Church got from both is still more misinterpreted. Yet the system of the former, in this special department of symbology, the key namely to the mysteries of astronomy as connected with those of generation and conception, is now proven identical with those ideas in ancient religions which have developed the phallic element of theology. The Jewish system of sacred measures applied to religious symbols is the same, so far as geometrical and numerical combinations go, as those of Greece, Chaldea, and Egypt, for it was adopted by the Israelites during the centuries of their slavery and captivity among the two latter nations. What was this system? 
it is the intimate conviction of the author of the source of measures that the mosaic books were intended by a mode of art speech to set forth a geometrical and numerical system of exact science, which should serve as an origin of measures. Piazzi Smythe believes similarly. This system and these measures are found by some scholars to be identical with those used in the construction of the Great Pyramid, but this is only partially so. The foundation of these measures was the Parker Ratio, says Ralston Skinner, in the source of measures. The author of this very extraordinary work has discovered it, he says, in the use of the integral ratio of the diameter to the circumference of a circle, discovered by John A. Parker of New York. The ratio is 6561 for diameter and 20,612 for circumference. Furthermore, that this geometrical ratio was the very ancient and probably the divine origin of what have now become, through exoteric handling and practical application, the British linear measures, the underlying unit of which, viz, the inch, was likewise the base of the one of the royal Egyptian cubits and of the Roman foot. He also discovered that there was a modified form of the ratio, viz. 113 to 355, and that while the last ratio pointed through its origin to the exact integral pi, or to 6561 to 20,612, it also served as a base for astronomical calculations. The author discovered that a system of exact science, geometrical, numerical, and astronomical, founded on these ratios and to be seen in the use in the construction of the great Egyptian pyramid, was in part the burden of this language, as contained in and concealed under the verbiage of the Hebrew text of the Bible. The inch and the two-foot rule of 24 inches, interpreted for use through the elements of the circle and the ratios mentioned, were found to be the basis of foundation of this natural and Egyptian and Hebrew system of science. While, moreover, it seems evident enough that the system itself was looked upon as divine origin and of divine revelation. But let us see what is said by the opponents of Professor Piazzi Smythe's measurement to the pyramid. Mr. Petri seems to deny them and to have made short work altogether of Piazzi Smythe's calculations in their biblical connection. So does Mr. Proctor, the champion coincidentalist for many years, passed in every question of ancient arts and sciences. Speaking of the multitude of relations independent of the pyramid, which have turned up while the pyramidalists have been endeavoring to connect the pyramid with the solar system, he says, these coincidences, which would still remain if the pyramid had no existence, are altogether more curious than any coincidence between the pyramid and astronomical numbers. The former are as close and remarkable as they are real. The latter, which are only imaginary, have only been established by the process which schoolboys call fudging, and now new measures have left the work to be done all over again. On this, Mr. C. Staniland Wake justly observes, They must, however, have been more than mere coincidences if the builders of the pyramid had the astronomical knowledge displayed in its perfect orientation and in its other admitted astronomical features. They had it, assuredly, and it is on this knowledge that the program of the mysteries and of the series of initiations was based. Hence, the construction of the pyramid the everlasting record and the indestructible symbol of these mysteries and initiations on earth, the course of the stars are in heaven. The cycle of initiation was a reproduction in miniature of that great series of cosmic changes to which astronomers have given the name of the tropical or sidereal year. Just as at the close of the cycle of the sidereal year, 25,868 years, the heavenly bodies returned to the same relative positions as they occupied at its outset. So at the close of the cycle of initiation, the inner man has regained the pristine state of divine purity and knowledge from which he set out on this cycle of terrestrial incarnation. Moses, an initiate into the Egyptian mystagogy, based the religious mysteries of the new nation which he created 
upon the same abstract formula derived from this sidereal cycle, symbolized by the form and measurements of the tabernacle, which he is supposed to have constructed in the wilderness. On these data, the later Jewish high priest constructed the allegory of Solomon's temple, a building which never had a real existence any more than had King Solomon himself, who is as much a solar myth as is the still later Hiram Abiff of the Masons, as Ragon has well demonstrated. Thus, if the measurements of this allegorical temple, the symbol of the cycle of initiation, coincide with those of the Great Pyramid, it is due to the fact that the former were derived from the latter through the tabernacle of Moses. That our author has undeniably discovered one and even two of the keys is fully demonstrated in the work just quoted. One has only to read it, to feel a growing conviction that the hidden meaning of the allegories and parables of both testaments is now unveiled. But that he owes this discovery far more to his own genius than to Parker and Piazzi Smythe is also as certain, if not more so. For, as just shown, it is not so certain whether the measures of the Great Pyramid adopted by the biblical pyramidalists are beyond suspicion. A proof of this is to be found in the work called The Pyramids and the Temples of Giza by Mr. F. Petrie, and also in the other works written quite recently to oppose the said calculations, which their authors call biased. We gather that nearly every one of Piazzi Smythe's measurements differs from the later and more carefully made measurements of Mr. Petrie, who concludes the introduction to his work with this sentence. As to the results of the whole investigation, perhaps many theorists will agree with an American who was a warm believer in pyramid theories when he came to Giza. I had the pleasure of his company there for a couple of days, and at our last meal together, he said to me in a saddened tone, Well, sir, I feel as if I had been to a funeral. By all means, let the old theories have a decent burial, though we should take care that in our haste none of the wounded ones are buried alive. As regards the late J. A. Parker's calculation in general, and his third proposition especially, we have consulted some eminent mathematicians, and this is the substance of what they say. Parker's reasoning rests on sentimental rather than on mathematical considerations and is logically inconclusive. Proposition 3, namely that the circle is the natural basis or beginning of all area, and the square being made so in mathematical science is artificial and arbitrary, is an illusion of an arbitrary proposition and cannot safely be relied upon in mathematical reasoning. The same observation applies even more strongly to Proposition 7, which states that because the circle is the primary shape in natural and hence the basis of area, and because the circle is measured by and is equal to the square only in ratio of half its circumference by the radius, therefore circumference and radius and not the square of diameter, are the only natural and legitimate elements of area, by which all regular shapes are made equal to the square and equal to the circle. Proposition 9 is a remarkable example of faulty reasoning, though it is one in which Mr. Parker's quadrature mainly rests. It states that the circle and the equilateral triangle are opposite to one another in all the elements of their construction, and hence the fractional diameter of one circle, which is equal to the diameter of one square, is in the opposite duplicate ratio to the diameter of an equilateral triangle whose area is one, etc., etc., granting, for the sake of argument, that a triangle can be said to have a radius, in the sense in which we speak of the radius of a circle, for what Parker calls the radius of a triangle, is the radius of a circle inscribed in a triangle, and therefore not the radius of the triangle at all. And granting for the moment the other fanciful and mathematical propositions united in his premises, why must we conclude that, if the equilateral triangle and circle are opposite in all the elements of their construction, the diameter of any defined circle is in the opposite duplicate ratio of the diameter of any given equivalent triangle. What necessary connection is there between the premises and the conclusion? 
The reasoning is of a kind not known in geometry and would not be accepted by strict mathematicians. Whether the archaic esoteric system originated the British inch or not is of little consequence, however, to the strict and true metaphysician. Nor does Mr. Ralston Skinner's esoteric reading of the Bible become incorrect, merely because the measurements of the pyramid may not be found to agree with those of Solomon's temple, the Ark of Noah, etc., or because Mr. Parker's quadrature of the circle is rejected by mathematicians. For Mr. Skinner's reading depends primarily on the Kabbalistic methods and the rabbinical value of the Hebrew letters. But it is extremely important to ascertain whether the measures used in the evolution of the symbolic religion of the Aryans, in the construction of their temples, in the figures given in the Puranas, and especially in their chronology, their astronomical symbols, the duration of their cycles, and other computations were, or were not, the same as those used in the biblical measurements and glyphs. For this will prove that the Jews, unless they took their sacred cubit and measurements from the Egyptians, Moses being an initiate of their priests, must have got those notions from India. At any rate, they passed them on to the early Christians. Hence, it is the occultists and Kabbalists who are the true heirs to the knowledge, or the secret wisdom which is still found in the Bible, for they alone now understand its real meaning, whereas profane Jews and Christians cling to the husks and dead letter thereof. That it was this system of measures which led to the invention of the god names Elohim and Jehovah, and to their adaptation to phallicism, and that Jehovah is not a very flattering copy of Osiris, is now demonstrated by the author of The Source of Measures. But the latter, and Mr. Piazzi Smythe, both seem to labor under the impression that a. the priority of the system belongs to the Israelites, and the Hebrew language being the divine language, and that b. this universal language belongs to direct revelation. The latter hypothesis is correct only in the sense shown in the last paragraph of the preceding section. But we have yet to agree as to the nature and character of the divine revealer. The former hypothesis as to the priority will, for the profane, of course, depend on a. the internal and external evidence of the revelation, and b. on each scholar's individual preconceptions. This, however, cannot prevent either the theistic Kabbalist or the pantheistic occultist from believing each in his way, neither of the two convincing the other. The data furnished by history are too meager and unsatisfactory for either of them to prove the skeptic which of them is right. On the other hand, the proofs afforded by tradition are too constantly rejected for us to hope to settle the question in our present age. Meanwhile, materialistic science will be laughing at both Kabbalists and occultists indifferently. But the vexed question of priority once laid aside, science, in its departments of philology and comparative religion, will find itself finally taken to task and be compelled to admit the common claim. One by one the claims become admitted, as one scientist after another is compelled to recognize the facts given out from the secret doctrine though he rarely, if ever, recognizes that he has been anticipated in his statements. Thus, in the palmy days of Mr. Piazzi Smythe's authority on the Pyramid of Giza, his theory was that the porphyry sarcophagus of the king's chamber was the unit of measure for the two most enlightened nations on the earth, England and America, and was no better than a corn bin. This was vehemently denied by us in Isis, unveiled, which had just been published at that time. Then the New York press arose in arms, the Sun and the world newspapers chiefly, against our presuming to correct or find fault with such a star of learning. In that work, we had said that Herodotus, when treating of that pyramid, might have added that, externally, it symbolized the creative principle of nature and illustrated also the principles of geometry, mathematics, astrology, and astronomy. Internally, it was a majestic fane in whose somber recesses were performed the mysteries, and whose walls had often witnessed the initiation scenes of members of the royal family. 
the Porphyry sarcophagus, which Professor Piazzi Smythe, astronomer royal of Scotland, degrades into a corn bin, was the baptismal font upon emerging from which the neophyte was born again and became an adept. Our statement was laughed at at those days. We were accused of having got our ideas from the craze of Shaw, an English writer who had maintained that the sarcophagus had been used for the celebration of the mysteries of Osiris, although we had never heard of that writer. And now, six or seven years later, 1882, this is what Mr. Staniland Wake writes. The so-called King's Chamber, of which an enthusiastic pyramidist says, the polished walls, fine materials, grand proportions, and exalted place, eloquently tell of glories yet to come. If not, the Chamber of Perfections of Cheops' tomb was probably the place to which the initiate was admitted after he passed through the narrow upward passage and the grand gallery, with its lowly termination which gradually prepared him for the final stage of the sacred mysteries. Had Mr. Staniland Wake been a theosophist, he might have added that the narrow upward passage leading to the king's chamber had a narrow gate indeed, the same straight gate which leadeth into life or the new spiritual rebirth alluded to by James and Matthew, and that it was of this gate in the initiation temple that the writer, who regarded the words alleged to have been spoken by an initiate, was thinking. Thus the greatest scholars of science, instead of poo-pooing that supposed farrago of absurd fiction and superstitions, as the Brahminical literature is generally termed, will endeavor to learn the symbolical universal language with its numerical and geometrical keys. But here again they will hardly be successful, if they share the belief that the Jewish Kabbalistic system contains the key to the whole mystery, for it does not. Nor does any other scripture at present possess in its entirety, since even the Vedas are not complete. Every old religion is but a chapter or two of the entire volume of archaic primeval mysteries. Eastern occultism alone being able to boast that it is in possession of the full secret, with its seven keys. Comparisons will be instituted, and as much as possible will be explained in this work. The rest is left to the student's personal intuition. In saying that Eastern occultism has the secret, it is not as if a complete or even an approximate knowledge was claimed by the writer, which would be absurd. What I know, I give out. That which I cannot explain, the student must find out for himself. But though we may suppose that the entire cycle of the universal mystery language will not be mastered for centuries to come, yet even the little which has hitherto been discovered in the Bible by some scholars is quite sufficient to demonstrate the claim, mathematically, as Judaism availed itself of two keys out of the seven. And as these two keys have now been rediscovered, it becomes no longer a matter of individual speculation and hypothesis, least of all of coincidence, but one of a correct reading of the biblical texts, just as anyone acquainted with the arithmetic reads and verifies an addition sum. In fact, all we have said in Isis Unveiled is now found corroborated in the Egyptian mystery or the source of measures by such readings of the Bible with the numerical and geometrical keys. A few years longer and this system will kill the dead letter reading of the Bible, as it will that of all the other exoteric faiths, by showing the dogmas and their real naked meaning. And then this undeniable meaning, however incomplete, will unveil the mystery of being and will, moreover, entirely change the modern scientific systems of anthropology, ethnology, and especially that of chronology. The element of phallicism found in every god name and narrative in the Old, and to some degree in the New Testament, may also in time considerably change modern materialistic views on biology and physiology. Divested of their modern repulsive crudeness, such views of nature and man will on the authority of the celestial bodies and their mysteries, unveil the evolutions of the human mind and show how natural was such a course of thought. The so-called phallic symbols have become offensive only because of the element of materiality and animality in them. 
In the beginning, such symbols were but natural, as they originated with the archaic races, which, issuing to their personal knowledge from an androgyne ancestry, were the first phenomenal manifestations in their own sight of the separation of the sexes and the ensuing mystery of creating in their turn. If later races, especially the chosen people, have degraded them, this does not affect the origin of the symbols. This little Semitic tribe, one of the smallest branchlets from the commingling of the fourth and fifth subraces, the Mongolo Turanian and the so called Indo European after the sinking of the great continent, could only accept its symbology in the spirit which was given to it by the nations from which it was derived. And perchance in the Mosaic beginnings, the symbology was not so crude as it became later under the handling of Ezra, who remodeled the whole Pentateuch. To take an instance, the glyph of Pharaoh's daughter, the woman, the Nile, the great deep and water, and the baby boy found floating therein in the Ark of Rushes, was not primarily composed for or by Moses. It was anticipated in the fragments found on the Babylonian tiles, in the story of King Sargon, who lived far earlier than Moses. In his Assyrian Antiquities, Mr. George Smith says, In the palace of Sennacherib at Kuyunik, I found another fragment of the curious history of Sargon, published in my translation in the Transactions of the Society of Biblical Archaeology. The capital of Sargon, the Babylonian Moses, was the great city of Agadi, called by the Semites Akkad, mentioned in Genesis as the capital of Nimrod. Akkad lay near the city of Sippara on the Euphrates, and north of Babylon. Another strange coincidence is found in the fact that the name of the neighboring city of Sippara is the same as the name of the wife of Moses, Zipporah. Of course, the story is a clever addition by Ezra, who could not have been ignorant of the original. This curious story is found on fragments of tablets from Kuyunik and reads as follows. 1. Sargina, the powerful king, the king of Akkad, am I. 2. My mother was a princess, my father I did not know. A brother of my father ruled over the country. 3. In the city of Azuparanu, which by the side of the river Euphrates is situated. Number four, my mother, the princess, conceived me. In difficulty, she brought me forth. Number five, she placed me in an ark of rushes with bitumen, my exit she sealed up. Number six, she launched me in the river, which did not drown me. Number seven, the river carried me to Aki. The water carrier it brought me. Number eight, Aki, the water carrier, in tenderness of bowels, lifted me. And now let us compare the Bible narrative in Exodus. And when she, Moses' mother, could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and dabbed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she lay it in the flags by the river brink. Mr. G. Smith then continues, The story is supposed to have happened about 1600 BC, rather than earlier than the supposed age of Moses, and as we know that the fame of Sargon reached Egypt, it is quite likely that this account had a connection with the events related in Exodus 2, for every action, when once performed, has a tendency to be repeated. But now that Professor Sace had the courage to push back the dates of the Chaldean and Assyrian kings by 2,000 years more, Sargon must have preceded Moses by 2,000 years at least. The confession is suggestive, but the figures lack a cipher or two. Now what is the logical inference? Most assuredly, that which gives us the right to say that the story told of Moses by Ezra had been learned by him while at Babylon and that he applied the allegory told of Sargon to the Jewish lawgiver. In short, that Exodus was never written by Moses, but was refabricated from old materials by Ezra. And if so, then why should not other symbols and glyphs far more crude in their phallic element have been added by this adept, 
in the later Chaldean and Sabian phallic worship. We are taught that the primeval faith of the Israelites was quite different from that which was developed centuries later by the Talmudists, and before them by David and Ezekiah. All this notwithstanding the exoteric element, as now found in the two testaments, it is quite sufficient to class the Bible among esoteric works and to connect its secret system with India, Chaldean, and Egyptian symbolism. The whole cycle of biblical glyphs and numbers, as suggested by astronomical observations, astronomy and theology being closely connected, is found in Indian exoteric as well as esoteric systems. These figures and their symbols, the signs of the zodiac, the planets, their aspects and nodes, the last term, having now passed even into our modern botany, are known in astronomy as sextiles quartiles, and so on, and have been used for ages and aeons by the archaic nations, and in one sense have the same meaning as the Hebrew numerals. The earliest forms of elementary geometry must have certainly been suggested by the observation of the heavenly bodies and their groupings. Hence, the most archaic symbols in Eastern esotericism are a circle, a point, a triangle, a square, a pentagon, and a hexagon and other plain figures with various sides and angles. This shows the knowledge and use of geometrical symbology to be as old as the world. Starting from this, it becomes easy to understand how nature herself, even without the help of their divine instructors, could have taught primeval mankind the first principles of a numerical and geometrical symbol language. Hence, we find numbers and figures used as an expression and a record of thought in every archaic symbolical scripture. They are ever the same, with certain variations only arising from the first figures. Thus, the evolution and correlation of the mysteries of cosmos, of its growth and development, spiritual and physical, abstract and concrete, were first recorded in geometrical changes of shape. Every cosmogony began with a circle, a point, a triangle, and a square, up to number nine, when it was synthesized by the first line and a circle, the Pythagorean mystic decad, the sum of all, involving and expressing the mysteries of the entire cosmos. Mysteries recorded a hundred times more fully in the Hindu system than elsewhere, for him who can understand its mystic language. The numbers 3 and 4, in their combination 7, and also 5, 6, 9, and 10, are the very cornerstones of occult cosmogenies. This decad and its thousand combinations are found in every portion of the globe. One recognizes it in the caves and rock-cut temples of Hindustan and Central Asia, in the pyramids and lithoi of Egypt and America, in the catacombs of Osamandias, in the mounds of the Caucasian snow-capped fastnesses, in the ruins of Palenque and Easter Island, everywhere whither the foot of an ancient man had ever journeyed. The three and the four, the triangle and the cube, or the male and female universal glyph, showing the first aspect of the evolving deity, is stamped forever in the southern cross in the heavens, as in the Egyptian crux ansada, as well expressed. The cube unfolded in a display, a cross of the Tau, or Egyptian form, or of the Christian cross form. The circle attached to the first gives the unsatted cross. Number three and four counted on the cross, showing a form of the Hebrew golden candlestick in the Holy of the Holies. And of the three plus four equals seven, and six plus one equals seven, Days in the circle of the week, as seven lights of the sun, so also as the week of seven lights gave origin to the month and year, so it is the time marker of birth, the cross form being shown, then by the connected use of the form 113,355. The symbol is completed by the attachment of a man to the cross. This kind of measure was made to coordinate with the idea of the origin of human life, and hence the phallic form. The stanzas show the cross and these numbers playing a prominent part in archaic cosmogony. Meanwhile, we may profit by the evidence collected by the same author, 
in the section which he rightly calls the primordial vestiges of these symbols, to show the identity of symbols and their esoteric meaning all over the globe. Under the general view taken of the nature of number forms, it becomes a matter of research of the utmost interest as to when and where their existence and their first use became known. Has it been a matter of revelation in what we know as the historic age, a cycle exceedingly modern, when the age of the human race is contemplated? It seems, in fact, as to the date of its possession by man to have been farther removed in the past from the old Egyptians than are the old Egyptians from us. The Easter Isles in mid-Pacific present the feature of the remaining peaks of the mountains of a submerged continent. For the reason that these peaks are thickly studded with Cyclopean statues, remnants of the civilization of a dense and cultivated people, who must have, of necessity, occupied a widely extended area. On the backs of these images is to be found the ensatted cross, and the same modified to the outlines of the human form. A full description with plate showing the land with the thickly planted statues, also with copies of the images is to be found in the January number 1870 of the London Builder. In The Naturalist, published at Salem, Massachusetts, in one of the early numbers, about 36, it is to be found a description of some very ancient and curious carrying on the crest walls of the mountains of South America. Older by far, it is averred, than the race is now living. The strangeness of these tracings is that they exhibit the outlines of a man stretched out on a cross, by a series of drawings, by which from the form of a man that a cross springs, but so done that the cross may be taken as the man, or the man as the cross. It is known that tradition among the Aztecs has handed down a very perfect account of the deluge. Baron Humboldt says that we are to look for the country of Aztalan, the original country of the Aztecs, as high up, at least, as the 42nd parallel north, whence journeying they at last arrived in the Vale of Mexico. In that vale, the earthen mounds of the far north become the elegant stone pyramidal and other structures whose remains are now found. The correspondences between the Aztec remains and those of the Egyptians are well known. Atwater, from examination of hundreds of them, is convinced that they had a knowledge of astronomy. As to one of the most perfect of the pyramidal structures among the Aztecs, Humboldt gives a description to the following effect. The form of this pyramid, of Papantla, which has seven stories, is more tapering than any other monument of this kind yet discovered, but its height is not remarkable, being but 57 feet its base but 25 feet on each side. However, it is remarkable on one account. It is built entirely of hewn stones of an extraordinary size and very beautifully shaped. Three staircases lead to the top, the steps of which were decorated with hieroglyphical sculptures and small niches arranged with great symmetry. The number of these niches seem to allude to the 318 simple and compound signs of the days of their civil calendar. 318 is the Gnostic value of Christ and the famous number of the trained or circumcised servants of Abram. When it is considered that 318 is an abstract value and universal, as expressive of a diameter value to a circumference of unity, its use in the composition of a civil calendar becomes manifest. Identical glyphs, numbers, and esoteric symbols are found in Egypt, Peru, Mexico, Easter Island, India, Chaldea, and Central Asia. Crucified men and symbols of the evolution of races from gods, and yet, behold science repudiating the idea of a human race other than one made in our image. Theology clinging to its 6,000 years of creation. Anthropology teaching our descent from the ape, and the clergy tracing it from Adam 4,004 years BC. Shall one, for fear of incurring the penalty of being called a superstitious fool and even a liar, abstain from furnishing proofs, as good as any existent, only because that day when all the seven keys shall be delivered unto science, 
or rather the men of learning and research in the Department of Symbology has not yet dawned. In the face of the crushing discoveries of geology and anthropology with regard to the antiquity of man, shall we, in order to avoid the usual penalty that awaits every one who strays outside the beaten path of either theology or materialism, hold to the six thousand years and special creation, or accept in submissive admiration our genealogy and descent from the ape? Not so, as long as it is known that the secret records hold the said seven keys to the mystery of the genesis of man. Faulty, materialistic, and biased, as the scientific theories may be, they are a thousand times nearer the truth than the vagaries of theology. The latter are in their death agony for every one of the most uncompromising bigot and fanatic. Or rather, some of its defenders must have lost the reason. For what can one think when... In the face of the dead-letter absurdities of the Bible, these are still publicly supported, and as fiercely as ever. And one finds the theologians maintaining that though the scriptures carefully refrain from making any direct contribution to scientific knowledge, they have never stumbled upon any statement which will not abide the light of advancing science. Hence, we have no choice but to either blindly accept the deductions of science or to cut ourselves adrift from it and withstand it fearlessly to its face, stating what the secret doctrine teaches us and being fully prepared to bear the consequences. But let us see whether science, in its materialistic speculations and even theology, in its death rattle and supreme struggle to reconcile the 6,000 years since Adam with Sir Charles Lyell's geological evidences of the antiquity of man do not themselves unconsciously give us a helping hand. Ethnology, on the confession of some of its most learned votaries, finds it already impossible to account for the varieties in the human race unless the hypothesis of the creation of several atoms be accepted. They speak of a white atom and a black atom, a red atom and a yellow atom. Were they Hindus enumerating the rebirths of Vamadiva from the Linga Purana? They could say little more. For enumerating the repeated births of Shiva, they show him in one kalpa of a white complexion, in another of a black color, and still another of a red color, after which the Kumara becomes four youths of a yellow color. This strange coincidence, as Mr. Proctor would say, speaks only in favor of scientific intuition, as Shiva Kumara simply represents. Allegorically, the human race is during the genesis of man. But it has led to another intuitional phenomena in the theological ranks this time. The unknown author of Primeval Man, in a desperate effort to screen the divine revelation from the merciless and eloquent discoveries of geology and anthropology, remarking that it would be unfortunate if the defenders of the Bible should be driven into the position of either surrendering the inspiration of Scripture or denying the conclusions of geologists, finds a compromise. Nay, he devotes a thick volume to proving this fact. Adam was not the first man created upon this earth. The exhumed relics of pre-Adamic man, instead of shaking our confidence in Scripture, simply additional proof of its veracity. How so? In the simplest way imaginable. For the author argues that, henceforth we, the clergy, are enabled to leave scientific men to pursue their studies without attempting to coerce them by the fear of hearsay. Heresy. This must be a relief indeed to Mrs. Huxley, Tyndall, and Sir Charles Lyell, the Bible narrative does not commence with creation, as is commonly supposed, but with the formation of Adam and Eve, millions of years after our planet had been created. Its previous history, so far as the scriptures is concerned, is yet unwritten. There may have been not one, but twenty different races upon the earth before the time of Adam, just as there may be twenty different races of men on other worlds. Who then, or what were those races, since the author still maintains that Adam is the first man of our race? It was the satanic race and races, 
Satan was never in heaven, angels and men being one species. It was the pre-Adamic race of angels that sinned. Satan was the first prince of this world, we read. Having died in consequence of his rebellion, he remained on earth as a disembodied spirit and tempted Adam and Eve. The earlier ages of the Satanic race, and more especially during the lifetime of Satan, may have been a period of patriarchal civilization and comparative repose, a time of Tubal Cains and Jubals, when both sciences and arts attempted to strike their roots into the accursed ground. What a subject for an epic! There are inevitable incidents which must have occurred. We see before us the gay primeval lover wooing his blushing bride at dewy eye under the Danish oaks. That then grew where now no oaks will grow. The grey primeval patriarch the primeval offspring innocently gamboling by his side. A thousand such pictures rise before us. The retrospective glance at this satanic blushing bride in the days of Satan's innocence does not lose in poetry as it gains in originality. Quite the reverse. The modern Christian bride, who does not often blush nowadays before her gay modern lovers, might even derive a moral lesson from this daughter of Satan, created in the exuberant fancy of her first human biographer. These pictures, and to appreciate them at their true value, they must be examined in the volume that describes them, are all suggested with a view to reconcile the infallibility of revealed scripture with Sir Charles Lyell's Antiquity of Man and other damaging scientific works. But this does not prevent truth and fact appearing at the foundation of these vagaries, which the author has not dared to sign with his own, or even a borrowed name. For his pre-Adamic races, not Satanic but simply Atlantean, and the Hermaphrodites before the latter are mentioned in the Bible, if read esoterically as they are in the secret doctrine. The seven keys open the mysteries, past and future, of the seven great root races and of the seven kalpas. Though the genesis of man and even the geology of esotericism will surely be rejected by science, just as much as the satanic and pre-Adamic races, yet if the scientists, having no other way out of their difficulties, are compelled to choose between the two, we feel certain that scripture notwithstanding once the mystery language is approximately mastered, it is the archaic teaching that will be accepted. Section 3. Primordial Substance and Divine Thought As it would seem irrational to affirm that we already know all existing causes, permission must be given to assume, if need be, an entirely new agent. Assuming what is not strictly accurate as yet, that the undulatory hypothesis accounts for all the facts, we are called on to decide whether the existence of an undulating ether is thereby proved. We cannot positively affirm that no other supposition will explain the facts. Newton's corpuscular hypothesis is admitted to have broken down on interference, and there is at the present day no rival. Still, it is extremely desirable in all such hypotheses to find some collateral confirmation, some evidence aliund of the supposed ether. Some hypotheses consist of assumptions as to the minute structure and operation of bodies. From the nature of the case, these assumptions can never be proved by direct means. Their only merit is their suitability to express the phenomena. They are representative fictions. Logic by Alexander Bain, ILD, Part 2, page 133. Ether, this hypothetical Proteus, one of the representative fictions of modern science, which nevertheless was so long accepted, is one of the lower principles of what we call primordial substance, Akasha in Sanskrit. One of the dreams of old which has now again become the dream of modern science. It is the greatest, as it is the boldest, of the surviving speculations of ancient philosophers. 
For the occultists, however, both ether and the primordial substance are realities. To put it plainly, ether is the astral light, and the primordial substance is akasha, the apati of divine thought. In modern language, the latter would be better named cosmic ideation, spirit, the former, cosmic substance, matter. These, the Alpha and the Omega of being, are but the two facets of the one absolute existence. The latter was never addressed, or even mentioned, by any name in antiquity except in allegory. In the oldest Aryan race, the Hindu, the worship of the intellectual classes at no time ever consisted in an adoration of marvelous form and art, however fervent as with the Greeks an adoration which led later on to anthropomorphism. But while the Greek philosopher adored form, and the Hindu sage alone perceived the true relation of earthly beauty and eternal truth, the uneducated of every nation understood neither at any time. They do not understand it even now. The evolution of the God idea proceeds apace with man's own intellectual evolution. So true is it that the noblest ideal to which the religious spirit of one age can soar will appear but a gross caricature to the philosophic mind in a succeeding epoch. The philosophers themselves had to be initiated into perceptive mysteries before they could grasp the correct idea of the ancients in relation to this most metaphysical subject. Otherwise, outside such initiation, for every thinker there will be a thus far shalt thou go and no further. Mapped out by his intellectual capacity as clearly and as unmistakably as there is one for the progress of any nation or race in its cycle by the law of karma. Outside of initiation, the ideals of contemporary religious thought must always have their wings clipped and remain unable to soar higher. For idealistic as well as realistic thinkers, and even free thinkers, are but the outcome and the natural product of their respective environment and periods. The ideals of each are but the necessary result of their temperaments, and the outcome of that phase of intellectual progress to which a nation and its collectivity has attained. Hence, as already remarked, the highest flights of modern Western metaphysics have fallen far short of the truth. Much of the current agnostic speculation on the existence of the first cause is little better than veiled materialism, the terminology alone being different. Even so great a thinker as Mr. Herbert Spencer speaks of the unknowable occasionally in terms that demonstrate the lethal influence of materialistic thought which, like the deadly Scirocco, has withered and blighted all current ontological speculation. For instance, when he terms the first cause the unknowable, a power manifesting through phenomena, and an infinite eternal energy, it is clear that he has grasped solely the physical aspect of the mystery of being, the energies of cosmic substance only, the co-eternal aspect of the one reality. Cosmic ideation is absolutely omitted from consideration, and as to its noumenon, it seems non-existent in the mind of a great thinker. Without doubt, this one-sided mode of dealing with the problem is due largely to the pernicious Western practice of subordinating consciousness to matter, or regarding it as a byproduct of molecular motion. From the early ages of the fourth race, when spirit alone was worshipped and the mystery was made manifest, down to the last palmy days of Grecian art, at the dawn of Christianity, the Hellenes alone had dared publicly to raise an altar to the unknown God. Whatever St. Paul may have had in his profound mind when declaring to the Athenians that this unknown, which they ignorantly worshipped, was the true God announced by himself, that Didi was not Jehovah, nor was he the maker of the world and all things. For it is not the God of Israel, but the unknown of the ancient and modern pantheist that dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Divine thought cannot be defined, nor can its meaning be explained, except by the numberless manifestations of cosmic substance, in which the former is sensed spiritually by those who can do so.
To say this after having defined it as the unknown deity, abstract, impersonal, sexless, which must be placed at the root of every cosmogony and its subsequent evolution, is equivalent to saying nothing at all. It is like attempting a transcendental equation of conditions having in hand for deducing the true value of its terms only a number of unknown quantities. Its place is found in the old primitive symbolic charts, in which, as already shown, it is represented by a boundless darkness on the ground of which appears the first central point in white, thus symbolizing coeval and coeternal spirit matter making its appearance in the phenomenal world before its first differentiation. When the one becomes two, it may then be referred to as spirit and matter. To spirit is referable every manifestation of consciousness, reflective or direct, and of unconscious purposiveness. To adopt a modern expression used in Western philosophy, so-called, as evidence in the vital principle and nature's submission to the majestic sequence of immutable law. Matter must be regarded as objectivity in its purest abstraction, a self-existing basis whose septenary manventaric differentiations constitute the objective reality underlying the phenomenon of each phase of conscious existence. During the period of universal pralaya, cosmic ideation is non-existent and the variously differentiated states of cosmic substance are resolved back again into the primary state of abstract potential objectivity. Manventaric impulse commences with the reawakening of cosmic ideation. The universal mind, concurrently with and parallel to the primary emergence of cosmic substance, the latter being the manventaric vehicle of the former, from its undifferentiated prolaic state. Then, absolute wisdom mirrors itself in its ideation, which, by a transcendental process, superior to and incomprehensible by human consciousness, results in cosmic energy, fohat. Thrilling through the bosom of inert substance, fohat impels it to activity, and guides its primary differentiations on all seven planes of cosmic consciousness. There are thus seven protiles, as they are now called, whereas Aryan antiquity named them the seven prakritis, or natures, serving severally as the relatively homogeneous bases which in the course of the increasing heterogeneity in the evolution of the universe differentiate into the marvelous complexity presented by phenomena on the planes of perception. The term relatively is used designedly because the very existence of such a process, resulting in the primary segregations of undifferentiated cosmic substance into its septenary basis of evolution, compels us to regard the protile of each plane as only immediate phase assumed by substance in its passage from abstract into full objectivity. The term protile is due to Mr. Crook's the eminent chemist who has given that name to pre-matter, if one may so call primordial and purely homogeneous substance, suspected if not actually yet found, by science in the ultimate composition of the atom, but the incipient segregation of primordial matter into atoms and molecules takes its rise subsequent to the evolution of our seven protiles. It is the last of these that Mr. Crooks is in search of, having recently detected the possibility of its existence on our plane. Cosmic ideation is said to be non-existent during prolaic periods, for the simple reason that there is no one and nothing to perceive its effects. There can be no manifestation of consciousness, semi-consciousness, or even unconscious purposiveness, except through a vehicle of matter. That is to say, on this our plane, wherein human consciousness in its normal state cannot soar beyond what is known as transcendental metaphysics, it is only through some molecular aggregation or fabric that spirit wells up in a stream of individual or subconscious subjectivity. And as matter existing apart from perception is a mere abstraction, both of these aspects of the absolute Cosmic substance and cosmic ideation are mutually interdependent.
In strict accuracy, to avoid confusion and misconception, the term matter ought to be applied to the aggregate of objects of possible perception, and the term substance to noumena. For inasmuch as the phenomena of our plane are the creations of the perceiving ego, the modifications of its own subjectivity, all the states of matter representing the aggregate of perceived objects, can have but a relative and purely phenomenal existence for the children of our plane. As the modern idealists would say, the cooperation of subject and object results in the sense object or phenomena. But this does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that it is the same on all other planes, that the cooperation of the two on the planes of their septenary differentiation results in a septenary aggregate of phenomena, which are likewise non-existent, per se, though concrete realities for the entities of whose experience they form a part, in the same manner as the rocks and rivers around us are real from the standpoint of a physicist, though unreal illusions of sense from that of the metaphysician. It would be an error to say, or even conceive such a thing. From the standpoint of the highest metaphysics, the whole universe, gods included, is an illusion. Maya. But the illusion of him who is in himself an illusion differs on every plane of consciousness, and we have no more right to dogmatize about the possible nature of the perceptive faculties of an ego on, say, the sixth plane, than we have to identify our perceptions with or make them a standard for those of an ant in its mode of consciousness. Cosmic ideation focused in a principle, the apadi, basis, results as the consciousness of that individual ego. Manifestation varies with the degree of the apadi. For instance, through that known as manas, it wells up as mind consciousness. Through the more finely differentiated fabric, sixth state of matter, of buddhi, resting on the experience of manas as its basis, as a stream of spiritual intuition. The pure object apart from consciousness is unknown to us, while living on the plane of our three-dimensional world, for we know only the mental states it excites in the perceiving ego, and so long as the contrast of subject and object endures, to wit, so long as we enjoy our five senses and no more, and do not know how to divorce our all-perceiving ego from the thraldom of these senses, so long will it be impossible for the personal ego to break through the barrier which separates it from a knowledge of things in themselves, or substance. That ego, progressing in an arc of ascending subjectivity, must exhaust the experience of every plane. But not till the unit is merged in the all, whether on this or any other plane, and subject and object alike vanish in the absolute negation of the nirvanic state. Negation, again, only from our plane, not until then, is scaled that peak of omniscience, the knowledge of things in themselves, and the solution of the yet more awful riddled approach, before which even the highest Yan Chohan must bow in silence and ignorance, the unspeakable mystery of that which is called by the Vedantins para Brahman. Therefore, such being the case, all those who have sought to give a name to the incognizable principle have simply degraded it. Even to speak of cosmic ideation, save in its phenomenal aspect, is like trying to bottle up primordial chaos, or to put a printed label on eternity. What then is the primordial substance, that mysterious object of which alchemy was ever talking? and which was the subject of philosophical speculation in every age. What can it be, finally, even in its phenomenal predifferentiation? Even that is the all or manifested nature and nothing to our senses. It is mentioned under various names in every cosmogony, referred to in every philosophy, and shown to be, to this day, the ever-grasp eluding Proteus in nature. We touch it and do not feel it. We look at it without seeing it. We breathe it and do not perceive it. We hear and smell it without the smallest cognition that it is there. 
for it is in every molecule of that which, in our illusion and ignorance, we regard as matter in any of its states, or conceive as a feeling, a thought, an emotion. In short, it is the apati, or vehicle of every possible phenomenon, whether physical, mental, or psychic. In the opening sentence of Genesis, and in the Chaldean cosmogony, in the Puranas of India, and in the Book of the Dead of Egypt, everywhere it opens the cycle of manifestation. It is termed chaos, and the face of the waters incubated by the spirit, proceeding from the unknown, whatever the spirit's name may be. The authors of the sacred scriptures in India go deeper into the origin of the evolution of things than does Thales or Job, for they say, from intelligence, called Mahat in the Puranas, associated with ignorance, Ishvara as a personal deity, attended by its projective power, in which the quality of dullness, tamas, insensibility, predominates, precedes ether from either Air, from air, heat, from heat, water, from water, earth, with everything on it. From this, from this same self, was the ether produced, says the Veda. It thus becomes evident that it is not this ether, sprung at the fourth remove from an emanation of intelligence associated with ignorance, which is the high principle, the deific entity worshipped by the Greeks and Latins under the name of Pater, Omnipotence, Aether, and Magnus Aether, in its collective aggregate. The septenary gradation and the innumerable subdivisions and differences made by the ancients between the powers of Aether collectively, from its outward fringe of effects with which our science is so familiar, up to the imponderable substance, one admitted as the Aether of space, but now about to be rejected, have been ever a vexing riddle for every branch of knowledge. The mythologists and symbologists of our day, confused by this incomprehensible glorification on the one hand, and degradation on the other, of the same deified entity and in the same religious systems, are often driven to the most ludicrous mistakes. The church, firm as a rock in each and all of her early eras of interpretation, has made ether the abode of her satanic legions. The whole hierarchy of the fallen angels is there. Cosmocratories, the world bearers, according to Basut, Mundi tenants, the world holders, as Tertullian calls them, Mundi domini, world dominators, or rather dominators, the curbati, or curved, etc., thus making of the stars and celestial orbs in their courses, devils. For it is thus that the Church has interpreted the verse, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Further, St. Paul mentions the spiritual malices, wickedness in English texts, in the air, spiritualia, nequitia, cholestibus, the Latin texts giving various names to these malices, the innocent elementals. But the church is right this time, though wrong in calling them all devils. The astral light or lower ether is full of conscious, semi-conscious, and unconscious entities. Only the church has less power over them than over invisible microbes or mosquitoes. The difference made between the seven states of ether, itself one of the seven cosmic principles, whereas the ether of the ancients is universal fire, may be seen in the injunctions by Zoroaster and Celus, respectively. The former said, consult it only when it is without form or figure, which means without flames or burning coals. When it has a form, heed it not, teaches Celus. But when it is formless, obey it, for it is then sacred fire and all will reveal thee shall be true. This proves that ether itself, an aspect of Akasha, has in its turn several aspects or principles. All the ancient nations defied ether in its imponderable aspect and potency. Virgil called Jupiter, Pater Omnipotens Ether and the Great Ether, 
The Hindus have also placed it among their deities under the name of Akasha, the synthesis of ether. And the author of the Homo Homerian system of philosophy, Anaxagoras of Clazomene, firmly believed that the spiritual prototypes of all things, as well as their elements, were to be found in the boundless ether, where they were generated, whence they evolved, and whither they returned, an occult teaching. It thus becomes clear that it is from ether in its highest synthetic aspect, once anthropomorphized, that sprang the first idea of a personal creative deity. With the philosophical Hindus, the elements are tamasa, i.e. unenlightened by intellect, which they obscure. We have now to exhaust the question of the mystical meaning of primordial chaos and of the root principle, and show how they were connected in the ancient philosophies with Akasha, incorrectly translated ether, and also with Maya, illusion, of which Isvara is the male aspect. We shall speak further on of the intelligent principle, or rather of the invisible immaterial properties in the visible and material elements that sprang from the primordial chaos. For what is the primordial chaos but ether? It is asked in Isis Unveiled. Not the modern ether, not such as is recognized now, but such was known to the ancient philosophers long before the time of Moses. Ether, with all its mysterious and occult properties, containing in itself the germs of universal creation. The upper ether, or Akasha, is the celestial virgin and mother of every existing form and being, from whose bosom, as soon as incubated by the divine spirit, are called into existence matter and life, force and action. Ether is the Aditi of the Hindus, and it is Akasha. Electricity, magnetism, heat, light, and chemical action are so little understood even now that fresh facts are constantly widening the range of our knowledge. Who knows where ends the power of this protean giant, ether, or whence its mysterious origin? Who, we mean, that denies the spirit that works in it and evolves out of it all visible forms? It will be an easy task to show that the cosmogonical legends all over the world are based on a knowledge among the ancients of those sciences, which have in our days allied themselves in support of the doctrine of evolution, and that further research may demonstrate that these ancients were far better acquainted with the fact of evolution itself, embracing both its physical and spiritual aspects than we are now. With the old philosophers, evolution was a universal theorem, a doctrine embracing the whole, and an established principle, whereas our modern evolutionists are enabled to present us merely with speculative theoretics, with particular if not wholly negative theorems. It is idle for the representatives of our modern wisdom to close the debate and pretend that the question is settled, merely because the obscure phraseology of the mosaic account clashes with the definite exegesis of exact science. If we turn to the ordinances of Manu, we find the prototype of all these ideas, mostly lost to the Western world in their original form, disfigured by later interpolations and additions, they have nevertheless preserved quite enough of their ancient spirit to show its character. Removing the darkness, the self-existent Lord, Vishnu, Narayana, etc., become manifest and wishing to produce beings from his essence, created in the beginning water alone. In that he cast seed, that became a golden egg. Whence this self-existent Lord? It is called this and is spoken of as darkness, imperceptible without definite qualities, undiscoverable, unknowable, as if wholly in sleep. Having dwelt in that egg for a whole divine year, he who is called up in the world Brahma splits that egg in two, and from the upper portion he forms the heaven, from the lower the earth, and from the middle the sky, and the perpetual place of waters. Directly following these verses, however, there is something more important for us, as it entirely corroborates our esoteric teachings. 
From verse 14 to 36, evolution is given in the order described in the esoteric philosophy. This cannot be easily gainsaid. Even Madahati, the son of Virasvaman and the author of the commentary, the Manubasa, whose date, according to the Western Orientalists, is 1000 AD, help us with his remarks to the elucidation of the truth. He shows himself either unwilling to give out more because he knew what had to be kept from the profane, or else he was really puzzled. Still, what he does give out makes the septenary principle in man and nature plain enough. Let us begin with chapter 1 of the ordinances or laws after the self-existent Lord. The unmanifesting logos of the unknown darkness becomes manifest in the golden egg. It is from this egg, from two, that which is the undiscreet, undifferentiated, Cause, eternal, which is and is not, from it issued that male who is called in the world Brahma. Here, as in all genuine philosophical systems, we find even the egg, or the circle, or zero, boundless infinity, referred to as it, and Brahma, the first unit only, referred to as the male god, i.e. the fructifying principle. It is circle with line, or ten, the decad, on the plane of the septenary, or our world, only it is called Brahma. On that of the unified decad, in the realm of reality, this male Brahma is an illusion. 14. From self, Atmanak, he created mind, which is and is not, and from mind, egoism, Self-consciousness, A, the ruler, B, the lord. A, the mind is manas, maratiti, the commentator, justly observes here that it is the reverse of this and shows already interpolation and rearranging. For it is manas that springs from ahamkara, or universal, self-consciousness, as manas in the microcosm springs from mahat, or mahabuddhi, buddhi. And man. For manas is dual, as shown and translated by Colebrook, mind, serving both for sense and action, is an organ by affinity, being cognate with the rest, the rest here meaning that manas are fifth principle, the fifth because the body was named the first, which is the reverse of the true philosophical order, is in affinity both with Atma Bodhi and with the lower four principles. Hence our teaching, namely that manas follow atma buddhi to devachan, and that the lower manas, that is to say, the dregs or residue of manas, remain with the kama rupa, in limbus or kama loka, the abode of the shells. B. Metatithi translates this as the one conscious of the eye or ego, not the ruler as do the orientalists. Thus, also they translate the following shloka. Number 16. He also, having made the subtile parts of those six, the great self and the five organs of sense of unmeasured brightness, to enter into the elements of self, created all beings. When according to Madhatiti, it ought to read Matrabi instead of Atma Matrusu, and thus would read, He having pervaded the subtile parts of those six of unmeasured brightness by elements of self, created all beings. The latter reading must be the correct one, since he, the self, is what we call Atma, and thus constitutes the seven principle, the synthesis of the six. Such is also the opinion of the editor of Manava Dharma Shastra, who seems to have intuitionally entered far deeper into the spirit of the philosophy than has the translator, the late Dr. Burnell, for he hesitates little between the text of Kaluka Bada and the commentary of Madatiti, rejecting the Tanmatra, or subtile elements, and the Adamatra of Kaluka Bada, he says, applying the principles to the cosmic self. The six appear rather to be the manas plus the five principles of ether, air, fire, water, earth. 
Having united five portions of those six with the spiritual element, the seventh, he thus created all existing things. Atmamatra is therefore the spiritual atom as opposed to the elementary, not reflexive, elements of himself. Thus, he corrects the translation of verse 17. As the subtile elements of bodily forms of this one depend on the sixth, so the wise call his form Sharira. And he adds that elements mean here portions or parts of principles, which reading is borne out by verse 19, which says, This non-eternal universe arises then from the eternal by means of the subtile elements of forms of those seven very glorious principles. Purusha. Commenting upon which emendation of Madahiti, the editor remarks, The five elements plus mind, manas, and self-consciousness, ahamkara, are probably meant. Subtile elements, as before, meaning fine portions or form or principles. Verse 20 shows this when saying of these five elements or fine portions of form, rupa plus manas and self-consciousness, that they constitute the seven purusha or principles called in the Puranas the seven prakritis. Moreover, these five elements, or five portions, are spoken of in verse 27, those which are called the atomic destructible portions, and which are therefore distinct from the atoms of Nyaya. This creative Brahma, issuing from the mundane or golden egg, unites in himself both the male and female principles. He is, in short, the same as all the creative protologi. Of Brahma, however, it could not be said, as of Dionysos, a lunar Jehovah, Bacchus truly, with David dancing nude before his symbol in the ark, because no Lysitius, Dionysia, were ever established in his name and honor. All such public worship was exoteric, and the great universal symbols were distorted universally, as those of Krishna are now by the Valabakarias of Bombay, the followers of the infant god. But are these popular gods the true deity? Are they the apex and synthesis of the sevenfold creation, man included? Impossible. Each of all are one of the rungs of that septenary ladder of divine consciousness, pagan as Christian. Ein Suf is said to manifest through the seven letters of the name of Jehovah, who, having usurped the place of the unknown limitless, was given by his devotees his seven angels of the presence, his seven principles. But indeed, they are mentioned in almost every school. In the pure Sankhya philosophy, Mahat, Ahamkara, and the five Tanmatras are called the seven Pakritis, or natures, and are counted from Mahabudi, or Mahat, down to earth. Nevertheless, however disfigured by Ezra, for rabbinical purposes, is the original Elohistic version, however repulsive at times, is even the esoteric meaning in the Hebrew scrolls. Far more so indeed than its outward veil or cloaking may be, once the Jehovistic portions are eliminated, the Mosaic books are found full of purely occult and priceless knowledge, especially in the first six chapters. Read by the aid of the Kabbalah, one finds a matchless temple of occult truths, a well of deeply concealed beauty hidden under a structure, the visible architecture of which, notwithstanding its apparent symmetry, is unable to stand the criticism of cold reason, or to reveal the age of its hidden truth, for it belongs to all the ages. There is more wisdom concealed under the exoteric fables of the Puranas and Bible than in all the exoteric facts and science in the literature of the world, and more occult true science than there is of exact knowledge in all the academies. Or in plainer and stronger language, there is much more esoteric wisdom in some portions of the exoteric Puranas and Pentateuch, as there is of nonsense and of decidedly childish fancy, 
when read only in the dead letter and murderous interpretations of the great dogmatic religions, and especially of their sects. Let anyone read the first verses of Genesis and reflect upon them. Their God commands another God who does his bidding, even in the cautious English Protestant authorized translation of King James 1. In the beginning, the Hebrew language having no word to express the idea of eternity, God fashions the heaven and the earth, and the latter is without form and void, while the former is in fact not heaven, but the deep chaos with darkness upon its face. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, or the great deep of the infinite space, and the Spirit is Narayana, or Vishnu. And God said, Let there be a firmament. And God, the second, obeyed and made the firmament. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Now the latter does not mean light at all, but as in the Kabbalah, the androgyne Adam Kadmon, or Sephira, spiritual light. For they are one, or according to the Chaldean book of Numbers, the secondary angels, the first being the Elohim who are the aggregate of that fashioning God. For to whom are these words of command addressed, and who is it who commands? That which commands is the eternal law, and he who obeys, the Elohim, the known quantity acting in and with acts, or the coefficient of the unknown quantity, the forces of the one force. All this is occultism and is found in the archaic stanzas. It is perfectly immaterial whether we call these forces the Jian Chohans or the Ophenem, as Ezekiel does. The one universal light, which to man is darkness, is ever existence, says the Chaldean Book of Numbers. From it proceeds periodically that energy which is reflected in the deep, or chaos, the storehouse of future worlds, and once awakened, stirs up and fructifies the latent forces which are the ever-present, eternal potentialities in it. Then awake anew the Brahmas and Buddhas, the co-eternal forces, and a new universe springs into being. In the Sefer Yetzera, the Kabbalistic book of creation, the author has evidently repeated the words of Manu. In it, the divine substance is represented as having alone existed from the eternity, boundless and absolute, and as having omitted from itself the spirit. One is the spirit of the living God, blessed to be its name, which liveth forever. Voice, spirit, and word, this is the Holy Spirit, and this is the Kabbalistic abstract trinity, so unceremoniously anthropomorphized by the Christian fathers. From this triple one emanated the whole cosmos. First, from one emanated number two, or air, the father, the creative element, and then number three, water, the mother, proceeded from air. Ether, or fire, completes the mystic four, the arbor all, when the concealed, of the concealed wanted to reveal himself, he first made a point, the primordial point, or the first sephira, air, or Holy Ghost, shaped into a sacred form, the ten sephiroth, or the heavenly man, and covered it with a rich and splendid garment. That is the world. He maketh the wind his messengers, flaming fire his servants, says the Yetzera, showing the cosmical character of the later euhemerized elements, and that spirit permeates every atom in cosmos. Paul calls the invisible cosmic beings the elements, but now the elements are degraded into and limited to atoms to which nothing is known so far, and which are only children of necessity, as is ether also, as we said in Isis Unveiled. The poor primordial elements have long been exiled, and our ambitious physicists run races to determine who shall add one more to the fledgling brood of the sixty and odd elementary substances. Meanwhile, there rages a war in modern chemistry about terms. We are denied the right to call these substances chemical elements, for they are not primordial principles of self-existing essences, out of which the universe was fashioned, according to Plato, 
Such ideas associated with the word element were good enough for the old Greek philosophy, but modern science rejects them. For, as Mr. William Crookes says, they are unfortunate terms. An experimental science will have nothing to do with any kind of essences except those which it can see, smell, or taste. It leaves others to the metaphysicians. We must feel grateful even for so much. This primordial substance is called by some chaos. Plato and the Pythagoreans named it the soul of the world, after it had been impregnated by the spirit of that which broods over the primeval waters or chaos. It is by being reflected in it, say the Kabbalists, that the brooding principle created the phantasmagoria of a visible manifested universe. Chaos before, ether after this reflection, it is still the deity that pervades space and all things. It is the invisible, imponderable spirit of things and the invisible but only too tangible fluid that radiates from the fingers of the healthy magnetizer, for it is vital electricity, life itself. Called in derision by the Marquis de Merville, the nebulous almighty, it is to this day termed by the theurgists and occultists the living fire. And there is not a Hindu who practices at dawn a certain kind of meditation, but knows its effects. It is the spirit of light and Magnus, as truly expressed by an opponent, Magnus and Magnes are two branches growing from the same trunk and shooting forth the same resultants. And in this appellation of living fire, we may also discover the meaning of the puzzling sentence in the Zend Avesta, there is a fire that gives knowledge of the future, science, and amiable speech. That is to say, which develops an extraordinary eloquence in the Sibyl, the sensitive, and even some orators. Writing upon this subject in Isis Unveiled, we said, The chaos of the ancients, the Zoroastrian sacred fire, or the Atash Bayram of the Parsis, the Hermes fire, the Elmes fire of the ancient Germans, the lightning of Sibyl, the burning torch of Apollo, the flame on the altar of Pan, the inextinguishable fire in the temple of the Acropolis and in that of Vesta, the fire flame of Pluto's helm, the brilliant sparks on the caps of the Dioscuri, on the Gorgon's head, the helm of Pallas, and the staff of Mercury, the Egyptian Tara, the Grecian Zeus, Catabate, the descending, of Posineus, the Pentecostal fire tongues, the burning bush of Moses, the pillar of fire of Exodus, and the burning lamp of Abram, the eternal fire of the bottomless pit, the Delphic oracular vapors, the sidereal light of the Rosicrucians, the Akasha of the Hindu adepts, the astral light of Eliphas Levi, the nerve aura and the fluid of the magnetists, the odd of Reckenbach, the psychod and extentic force of Thury, the psychic force of Sergeant Cox and the atmospheric magnetism of some naturalists, galvanism, and finally electricity. All these are but various names for many different manifestations or effects of the same mysterious all-pervading cause, the Greek archaeus. We now add, it is all this and much more. The fire is spoken of in all the Hindu sacred books, as also in the Kabbalistic works. The Zohar explains it as the white hidden fire in the Risha Havura, the white head and whose will causes the fiery fluid to flow in 370 currents in every direction of the universe. It is identical with the serpent that runs with 370 leaps of the Sifra Zenutha, the serpent, which when the perfect man, the Metatron, is raised, that is to say, when the divine man indwells in the animal man, becomes three spirits, or Atma Buddhi Manas in our theosophical phraseology. Spirit, then, or cosmic ideation and cosmic substance, one of whose principles is ether, are one and include the elements in the sense St. Paul attaches to them. 
These elements are the veiled synthesis standing for Dion Chohans, Devas, Sephiroth, Amshaspens, Archangels, etc. The ether of science, the illus of barosis, or the protile of chemistry, constitutes, so to speak, the rude material, relatively, out of which the above-named builders, following the plan traced out for them eternally in the divine thought, fashion the systems in the cosmos. They are myths, we are told, no more so than ether and the atoms we answer. The two latter are absolute necessities of physical science. And the builders are as absolute a necessity of metaphysics. We are twitted with the objection, you never saw them, and we ask the materialists, have you ever seen ether, or your atoms, or again your force? Moreover, one of the greatest Western evolutionists of our modern day, co-discoverer with Darwin, Mr. A. R. Wallace, when discussing the inadequacy of natural selection alone, accounting for the physical form of man, admits the guiding action of higher intelligences as a necessary part of the great laws which govern the material universe. These higher intelligences are the Dian Chohans of the occultists. Indeed, there are a few myths in any religious system worthy of the name, but have a historical as well as a scientific foundation. Myths, justly observes Pocock, are now proved to be fables, just in proportion as we misunderstood them, truths in proportion as they were once understood. The most distinct and the one prevailing idea found in all ancient teaching with reference to cosmic evolution and the first creation of our globe with all its products, organic and inorganic, strange word for an occultist to use, is that the whole cosmos has sprung from the divine thought. This thought impregnates matter, which is co-eternal with the one reality, and all that lives and breathes evolves from the emanations of the one immutable, Parabrahman, Mula Prakriti, the eternal one root. The former of these, in its aspect of the central point turned inward, so to say, into regions quite inaccessible to human intellect, is absolute abstraction. Whereas, in its aspect as Mula Prakriti, the eternal root of all, it gives one at least some hazy comprehension of the mystery of being. Therefore, it was taught in the inner temples that this visible universe of spirit and matter is but the concrete image of the ideal abstraction. It was built on the model of the first divine idea. Thus, our universe existed from eternity in a Latin state. The soul animating this purely spiritual universe is the central sun, the highest deity itself. It was not the one who built the concrete form of the idea, but the first begotten. And as it was constructed on the geometrical figure of the dodecahedron, the first begotten, was pleased to employ 12,000 years in its creation. The latter number is expressed in the Tyranian cosmogony, which shows man created in the sixth millennium. This agrees with the Egyptian theory of 6,000 years and with the Hebrew computation. But it is the exoteric form of it. The secret computation explains that the 12,000 and the 6,000 years are years of Brahma, one day of Brahma being equal to 4,320,000,000 years. Sanchunayathan, in his cosmogony, declares that when the wind, spirit, became enamored of its own principles, chaos, an intimate union took place which connection was called pothos, and from this sprang the seed of all. And the chaos knew not its own production, for it was senseless, but from its embrace with the wind was generated mo, or the illus, mud. From this proceeded the spores of creation and the generation of the universe. Zeus, Zen, ether, and clothonia, chaotic earth, and Metis, water, his wives, Osiris, also representing ether, the first emanation of the supreme deity, Amun, the primeval source of light, and Isis Latona, the goddess earth and water, again Mithras, the rock-born god, 
the symbol of the male mundane fire, or the personified primordial light, and Mithra, the fire goddess, at once his mother and his wife, the pure element of fire, the active or male principle, regarded as light and heat in conjunction with earth and water, or matter, the female or passive element of cosmical generation. Mithras, who was the son of Borgi, the Persian mundane mountain, from which he flashed out as a radiant ray of light. Brahma, the fire god, and his prolific consort, and the Hindu Agni, the refulgent deity from whose body issue a thousand streams of glory and seven tongues of flame, and in whose honor certain Brahmins to this day maintain a perpetual fire. Shiva, personated by Meru, the mundane mountain of the Hindus, the terrific fire god who is said in the legend to have descended from heaven, like the Jewish Jehovah in a pillar of fire, and a dozen other archaic double-sexed deities all loudly proclaim their hidden meaning. And what could be the dual meaning of these myths but the psychochemical principle of primordial creation, the first evolution in its triple manifestation of spirit, force, and matter, the divine correlation at its starting point, allegorized as the marriage of fire and water, the products of electrifying spirit, the union of the male active principle with the female passive element, which become the parents of their Tellurian child, cosmic matter, the prima materia, whose soul is ether and whose shadow is the astral light. But the fragments of the cosmogonical systems that have reached us are now rejected as absurd fables. Nevertheless, occult science, which has survived even the great flood that submerged the antediluvian giants, and with them their very memory, save the record preserved in the secret doctrine, the Bible and other scriptures, still holds the key to all the world's problems. Let us then apply this key to the rare fragments of long-forgotten cosmogenies, and by means of their scattered portions endeavor to re-establish the once universal cosmogony of the secret doctrine. The key fits them all. No one can seriously study ancient philosophies without perceiving that the striking similitude of conception in all of them, in their exoteric form very frequently, and in their hidden spirit invariably, is the result of no mere coincidence, but of a concurrent design, and that, during the youth of mankind, there was but one language, one knowledge, one universal religion, when there were no churches, no creeds or sects, but when every man was a priest unto himself. And if it is shown that already in those early ages which are shut out from our sight by the exuberant growth of tradition, human religious thought developed in uniform sympathy in every portion of the globe, then it becomes evident that that thought, born under whatever latitude, in the cold north or the burning south, in the east or west, was inspired by the same revelations, and that man was nurtured under the protecting shadow of the same tree of knowledge. Section 4. Chaos, Theos, Cosmos These three are the containment of space or as a learned Kabbalist has defined it, space, the all-containing, uncontained, is the primary embodiment of simple unity, boundless extension. But he asks again, boundless extension of what? And makes the correct reply, the unknown container of all, the unknown first cause. This is a most correct definition and answer, most esoteric and true, from every aspect of occult teaching. Space, which, in their ignorance, and with their iconoclastic tendency to destroy every philosophic idea of old, the modern wiseacres have proclaimed an abstract idea, and a void, is, in reality, the container and the body of the universe in its seven principles. It is a body of limitless extent, whose principles in occult phraseology, each being, in its turn, a septenary, manifest in our phenomenal world only the grossest fabric of their subdivisions. No one has ever seen the elements in their fullness, the doctrine teaches. We have to search for our wisdom in the original expressions and synonyms of the primeval peoples. 
Even the Jews, the latest of these, show the same idea in their Kabbalistic teachings. When they speak of the seven-headed serpent of space called the Great Sea, in the beginning, the Alhim created the heavens and the earth, the six, Sephiroth. They created six, and on these all things are based. And these six depend on the seven forms of the cranium, up to the dignity of all dignities. Now wind, air, and spirit have ever been synonymous in every nation. Numa, spirit, and animos, wind, with the Greeks. Spiritus and, and Ventus, with the Latins, were convertible terms, even if dissociated from the original idea of the breath of life. In the forces of science, we see but the material effect of the spiritual effect of one or other of the four primordial elements, transmitted to us by the fourth race, just as we shall transmit ether, or rather, its gross subdivision, in its fullness to the sixth root race. Chaos was called senseless by the ancients because chaos and space being synonymous, it represented and contained in itself all the elements in the rudimentary undifferentiated state. They made ether the fifth element, the synthesis of the other four, for the ether of the Greek philosophers was not its dregs, although indeed they knew more than science does now of these dregs, ether, which are rightly enough supposed to act as an agent for many forces that manifest on earth. Their ether was the akasha of the Hindus. The ether accepted in physics is but one of its subdivisions, on our plane, the astral light of the Kabbalists, with all its evil as well as its good effects. Seeing that the essence of ether, or even the unseen space, was considered divine as being the supposed veil of deity, it was regarded as the medium between this life and the next. The ancients considered that when the directing active intelligences, the gods, retired from any portion of ether in our space, or the four realms which they superintend, then that particular region was left in the possession of evil, so called by reason of the absence from it of good. The existence of spirit in the common mediator, the ether, is denied by materialism, while theology makes of it a personal god, but the Kabbalist holds that both are wrong, saying that in ether, the elements represent only matter, the blind cosmic forces of nature, while spirit represents the intelligence which directs them, the Arian, Hermetic, Orphic, and Pythagorean cosmogonical doctrines, as well as those of Sanchuniathan and Barosis, are all based upon one irrefutable formula, viz. That ether and chaos, or in the Platonic language, mind and matter, were the two primeval and eternal principles of the universe, utterly independent of anything else. The former was the all vivifying intellectual principle, while chaos was a shapeless liquid principle, without form or sense, from the union of which two sprang into existence the universe, or rather the universal world, the first androgynous deity chaotic matter becoming its body, and ether its soul. According to the phraseology of a fragment of Hermaeus, chaos from this union with spirit, obtaining sense, alone with pleasure, and thus was produced protogonos, the firstborn light. This is the universal trinity, based on the metaphysical conceptions of the ancients, who reasoning by analogy made of man, who is a compound of intellect and matter, the microcosm of the macrocosm or great universe. Nature abhors vacuum, said the peripatetics, who, though materialists in their way, comprehend perhaps why Democritus, with his instructor Lucipius, taught that the first principles of all things contained in the universe were atoms and a vacuum. The latter means simple Latin force or deity, which, before its first manifestation, when it became will, Communicating the first impulse to these atoms was the great nothingness, ein su for no thing, and therefore to every sense a void or chaos. This chaos, however, became the soul of the world, according to Plato and the Pythagoreans. According to Hindu teaching, Didi, in the shape of ether or akasha, pervades all things. It was called, therefore, by theurgists the living fire. 
the spirit of light, and sometimes Magnus. According to Plato, the highest deity itself built the universe in the geometrical form of the dodecahedron, and its first begotten was born of chaos and primordial light, the central sun. The firstborn, however, was only the aggregate of the host of the builders, the first constructive forces, who were called in ancient cosmogonies the ancients, born of the deep or chaos, and the first point. He is the tetragrammaton, so called at the head of the seven lower Sephiroth. This was also the belief of the Chaldeans. Philo the Jew, speaking very flippantly of the first instructors of his ancestors, writes as follows. These Chaldeans were of the opinion that the cosmos, among the things that exist, is a single point, either being itself God, Theos, or that in it is God, comprehending the soul of all things. Chaos, Theos, Cosmos, are all but the three symbols of their synthesis, space. One can never hope to solve the mystery of this tetractus by holding to the dead letter even of the old philosophies of now extant. But even in these chaos, theos, cosmos, and space are identified in all eternity as the one unknown space, the last word on which will never perhaps be known before our seventh round. Nevertheless, the allegories and metaphysical symbols about the primeval and perfect cube are remarkable even in the exoteric Puranas. There also, Brahma is Theos, evolving out of chaos, or the great deep, the waters over which spirit or space, the spirit moving over the face of the future boundless cosmos, is silently hovering in the first hour of reawakening. It is also Vishnu, sleeping on Anantashisha, the great serpent of eternity, of which Western theology, ignorant of the Kabbalah, the only key that opens the secrets of the Bible has made the devil. It is the first triangle, or the Pythagorean triad, the god of the three aspects, before it is transformed. Through the perfect quadrature of the infinite circle, and to the four-faced Brahma, of him who is, and yet is not, from non-being, the eternal cause is born the being, Purusha, says Manu, the legislator. In the Egyptian mythology, Nap, the eternal unrevealed god, is represented by a snake emblem of eternity encircling a water urn, with its head hovering over the waters, which it incubates with its breath. In this case, the serpent is the Agathodamon, the good spirit. In its opposite aspect, it is the Kakodamon, the evil spirit. In the Scandinavian Eddas, the honeydew, the fruit of the gods, and of the creative, busy Yagrasil bees, falls during the hours of night when the atmosphere is impregnated with humidity, and in the northern mythologies, as the passive principle of creation, it typifies the creation of the universe out of water. This dew is the astral light in one of its combinations, and possesses creative as well as destructive properties. In the Chaldean legend of Barossus, Ones, or Dagon, the man-fish instructing the people shows the infant world created out of water and all beings originating from this prima materia. Moses teaches that the only earth and water can bring into existence a living soul. And we read in the scriptures that herbs cannot grow until the eternal caused it to rain upon earth. In the Mexican Popo Vol, man is created out of mud or clay, terra glace, taken from under the water. Brahma creates the great Muni, or first man, seated on his lotus, only after having called spirits into being, who thus enjoyed over mortals a priority of existence, and he creates him out of water, air, and earth. Alchemists claim that the primordial or pre-Adamic earth, when reduced to its first substance, is in its second stage of transformation like clear water, the first being the alkahest proper. This primordial substance is said to contain within itself the essence of all that goes to make up man. It contains not only all the elements of his physical being, but even the breath of life in a latent state, ready to be awakened. This it derives from the incubation of the Spirit of God, 
upon the face of the waters, chaos. In fact, this substance is chaos itself. From this it was that Paracelsus claimed to be able to make his homunculi. This is why Thales, the great natural philosopher, maintained that water was the principle of all things in nature. Job says that dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. In the original text, instead of dead things, it is written dead rafame, giants or mighty primitive men, from whom evolution may one day trace our present race. In the primordial state of the creation, says Polier's Mythology de Induis, the rudimental universe, submerged in water, reposed in the bosom of Vishnu. Sprung from this chaos and darkness, Brahma, the architect of the world, poised on a lotus leaf, floated, moved upon the waters, unable to discern anything but water and darkness. Perceiving such a dismal state of things, Prama siliquizes in consternation. Who am I? Whence came I? Then he hears a voice. Direct your thoughts to Bhagavat. Brahma, rising from his natatory position, seats himself upon the lotus in an attitude of contemplation and reflects upon the Eternal, who, pleased with this evidence of piety, disperses the primeval darkness and opens his understanding. After this, Brahma issues from the universal egg, infinite chaos, as light, for his understanding is now opened and he sets himself to work. He moves on the eternal waters, with the Spirit of God within himself, and his capacity of mover of the waters, he is Vishnu, or Narayana. This, of course, is exoteric, yet, in its main idea, it is as identical as possible with the Egyptian cosmogony, which, in its opening sentences, shows Anthor, or Mother Night, representing illimitable darkness as the primeval element which covered the infinite abyss, animated by water in the universal spirit of the eternal, dwelling alone in chaos. Similarly, in the Jewish scriptures, the history of the creation opens with the Spirit of God and His creative emanation, another deity. The Zohar teaches that it is the primordial elements, the trinity of fire, air, and water, the four cardinal points, and all the forces of nature which form collectively the voice of the will, memrab, or the word, the logos of the absolute silent all. The invisible point, limitless and unknowable, spreads itself over space, and thus forms a veil, the Mula Prakriti of Parabrahman, which conceals this absolute point. In the cosmogonies of all the nations, it is the architects, synthesized by the Demiurge, in the Bible the Elohim, or Alhem, who fashioned cosmos out of chaos, and who are the collective Theos, male, female, spirit, and matter, by a series, Yom of foundations has off. The Alhim caused earth and heaven to be, in Genesis, it is first Alhim, then Yava Alhim, and finally Yehovah. After the separation of the sexes in the fourth chapter, it is noticeable that nowhere, except in the later, or rather the last, cosmogenies of our fifth race, does the ineffable and unutterable name, the symbol of the unknown deity, which was used only in the mysteries, occur in connection with the creation of the universe. It is the movers, the runners, the theoi, who do the work of formation, the messengers of the Manvantaric law, who have now become in Christianity simply the messengers, Malakim. This seems to be also the case in Hinduism or early Brahmanism, for in the Rig Veda, it is not Brahma who creates, but the Prajapatis, the lords of being, who are also the Rishis. The term Rishi, according to Professor Mahadeo Kunte, being connected with the word to move, to lead on, applied to them in their terrestrial character, when, as patriarchs, they lead their hosts on the seven rivers. Moreover, the very word God in the singular, embracing all the gods, or theoi, came to the superior civilized nations from a strange source, one as entirely and preeminently phallic as the sincere outspokenness of the Indian lingam. 
The attempt to derive God from the Anglo-Saxon synonym good is an abandoned idea, for in no other language, from the Persian coda down to the Latin deus, has an instance been found of the name for God being derived from the attribute of goodness. To the Latin races, it comes from the Arian deus, the day. To the Slavonian, from the Greek Bacchus, bag dog and to the Saxon races, directly from the Hebrew Yod or Jod. The latter is the number letter Io, male and female, and Yod is the phallic hook. Hence the Saxon Gotta, the Germanic Gott, and the English God. This symbolic term may be said to represent the creator of physical humanity on the terrestrial plane, But surely it had nothing to do with the formation or creation of either spirits, gods, or cosmos. Chaos, theos, cosmos, the triple deity, is all in all. Therefore it is said to be male and female, good and evil, positive and negative, the whole series of contrasted qualities. When latent in prolea, it is incognizable and becomes the unknowable deity. It can be known only in its active functions. Hence, as matter force and living spirit, the correlations and outcome or the expression on the visible plane of the ultimate and ever to be unknown unity. In its turn, this triple unit is the producer of the four primary elements, which are known in our visible terrestrial nature as the seven, so far the five elements, each divisible into 49, seven times seven sub-elements with about 70 of which chemistry is acquainted. Every cosmical element, such as fire, air, water, earth, partaking of the qualities and defects of its primaries, is in its nature good and evil, force or spirit and matter, etc. And each, therefore, is at one and the same time life and death, health and disease, action and reaction. They are ever-forming matter under the never-ceasing impulse of the one element, the incognizable represented in the world of phenomena by ether. They are the immortal gods who give birth and life to all. In the philosophical writings of Solomon ben Yehuda, Ibn Gibral, in treating of the structure of the universe, it is said, Our Yehuda began, it is written, Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Come see, at the time that the Holy created the world. He created seven heavens above. He created seven earths below, seven seas, seven days, seven rivers, seven weeks, seven years, seven times, and seven thousand years that the world has been. The Holy is in the seventh of all. This, besides showing a strange identity with the cosmogony of the Puranas, corroborates all our teachings with regard to number seven, as briefly given in esoteric Buddhism. The Hindus have an endless series of allegories to express this idea. In the primordial chaos, before it became developed into the Sapta Samudra, or seven oceans, emblematical of the seven gunas, or conditioned qualities, Composed of trigunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, lie latent both amrita, or immortality, and visha, or poison, death, evil. This is to be found in the allegorical churning of the ocean by the gods. Amrita is beyond any guna, for it is unconditioned per se, but when once fallen into phenomenal creation, it became mixed with evil, chaos, with latent theos in it before cosmos was evolved. Hence we find Vishnu, the personification of eternal law, periodically calling forth cosmos into activity, or in allegorical phraseology, churning out of the primitive ocean, or boundless chaos, the Amrita of eternity, reserved only for the gods and devas, and in the task he has to employ nagas and asuras, or demons in exoteric Hinduism. The whole allegory is highly philosophical, and indeed we find it repeated in every ancient system of philosophy. Thus, we find it in Plato, whom having fully embraced the ideas with Pythagoras and brought from India, compiled and published them in a form more intelligible than the original mysterious numerals of the Samian sage, 
Thus, the cosmos is the sun with Plato having for his mother and father divine thought and matter. The Egyptians, says Dunlap, distinguished between an older and younger Horus, the former the brother of Osiris, the latter the sons of Osiris and Isis. The first is the idea of the world remaining in the demiurgic mind, born in darkness before the creation of the world. The second Horus is the idea going forth from the Logos, becoming clothed with matter and assuming an actual existence. The Chaldean oracles speak of the mundane god, eternal, boundless, young and old, of winding form. This winding form is a figure to express the vibratory motion of the astral light, with which the ancient priests were perfectly well acquainted, though the name astral light was invented by the Martinists. Cosmolatry has the finger of scorn pointed at its superstitious by modern science. Science, however, before laughing at it, ought, as advised by a French savant, to entirely remodel its own system of cosmo-pneumatological education, satis eloquentia sapiense parum. Cosmolatry, like pantheism, in its ultimate expression, may be made to express itself in the same words in which the Purana describes Vishnu. He is only the ideal cause of the potencies to be created in the work of creation and from him proceed the potencies to be created after they have become the real cause. Save that one ideal cause, there is no other to which the world can be referred. Through the potency of that cause, every created thing comes by its proper nature. Section 5. On the Hidden Deity, Its Symbols and Glyphs the Logos, or creative deity, the word made flesh, of every religion has to be traced to its ultimate source and essence. In India, it is a proteus of 1,008 divine names and aspects in each of its personal transformations, from Brahma Purusha through the seven divine rishis and ten semi-divine prajapadis, also rishis, down to the divine human avatars. The same puzzling problem of the one in many and the multitude in one is found in other pantheons. In the Egyptian, the Greek, and the Chaldeo-Judaic, the latter having made confusion still more confused by presenting its gods as euhemerizations in the shapes of patriarchs, and these patriarchs are now accepted by those who reject Romulus as a myth and are represented as living and historical entities. Verbum Satis Sapienti In the Zohar, Ein Suf is also the one, the infinite unity. This was known to the very few learned fathers of the Church, who were aware that Jehovah was no highest god but a third-rate potency. But while complaining bitterly of the Gnostics and saying, Our heretics hold that Propator is known but to the only begotten Son, who is Brahma, that is to the mind, Nous, Irenaeus failed to mention that the Jews did the same in their real secret books. Valentinius, the profoundest doctor of the Gnosis, held that there was a perfect ion who existed before Bythos, the first father of unfathomable nature, which is the second Logos, called Propator. It is this Aeon who springs as a ray from Ein Suf, which does not create, or Aeon who creates, or through whom, rather, everything is created, or evolves. For as the Basilideans taught, there was a supreme god, Abraxas, by whom was created mind, Mahat in Sanskrit, Nous in Greek. From mind proceeded the word, Logos. From the word, Providence. Divine light, rather. Then from it, virtue and wisdom in principalities, powers, angels, etc. By these angels, the 365 aeons were created. Amongst the lowest, indeed, and those who made the world, he, Basilides, set last of all the God of the Jews, whom he denies to be God, and very rightly, affirming he is one of the angels. Here, then, we find the same system as in the Puranas, wherein the incomprehensible drops a seed which becomes the golden egg, 
from which Brahma is produced. Brahma produces Mahat, etc. True esoteric philosophy, however, speaks neither of creation nor of evolution, in the sense in which the exoteric religions do. All these personified powers are not evolutions from one another, but so many aspects of the one and sole manifestation of the absolute all. The same system as that of the Gnostic emanations prevails in the Sephirothic aspects of Ein Suf. And as these aspects are in space and time, a certain order is maintained in their successive appearances. Therefore, it becomes impossible not to take notice of the great changes that the Zohar has undergone under the handling of generations of Christian mystics. For even in the metaphysics of the Talmud, the lower face or lesser countenance, a microprosophus, could never be placed on the same plane of abstract ideals as the higher or greater countenance macroprosopus. The latter is, in the Chaldean Kabbalah, a pure abstraction. The word, or logos, or dabar in Hebrew, which word, though it becomes in fact a plural number, or words, d-a-b-a-r-i-m, when it reflects itself, or falls into the aspect of a host of angels, or sephiroth, the number is still collectively one, and on the ideal plane a not zero, circle, nothing. It is without form or being, with no likeness, with anything else. And even Philo calls the Creator the Logos who stands next God, the second God, when he speaks of the second God who is his, the highest God's wisdom. Didi is not God, it is no thing and darkness, it is nameless and therefore called Ein Suf, the word, Ayin meaning nothing, the highest God, the unmanifested Logos, is its son. Nor are most of the Gnostic systems which have come down to us, mutilated as they are by the Church Fathers, anything better than the distorted shells of our, the original speculations. Nor were they, moreover, ever open to the public or general reader, for had their hidden meaning or esotericism been revealed, it would have been no more an esoteric teaching, and this could never have been. Marcus, the chief of the Marcosians, who flourished in the middle of the second century, and taught that Didi had to be reviewed under the symbol of four syllables, gave out more of the esoteric truths than any other Gnostic. But even he was never well understood. For it is only on the surface or dead letter of his revelation that it appears that God is a quaternary, to wit, the ineffable, the silence, the Father, and truth. Since in reality it is quite erroneous and divulges only one more esoteric riddle. This teaching of Marcus was that of the early Kabbalists and is ours. For he makes of Didi the number 30, in four syllables, which, translated esoterically, means a triad, or triangle, and a quaternary, or a square, in all seven, which, on the lower plane, made the seven divine or secret letters of which the God name is composed. This requires demonstration. In his revelation, speaking of divine mysteries expressed by means of letters and numbers, Marcus narrates how the supreme tetrad came down unto him from the region which cannot be seen nor named, in a female form, because the world would have been unable to bear her appearing in a male figure and revealed to him the generation of the universe untold before to either gods or men. The first sentence already contains a double meaning. Why should the apparition of a female figure be more easily born or listened to by the world than a male figure? On the face of it, this appears nonsensical. But to one who is acquainted with the mystery language, it is quite clear and simple. Esoteric philosophy, or the secret wisdom, was symbolized by a female form, while a male figure stood for the unveiled mystery. Hence, the world, not being ready to receive it, could not bear it, and the revelation of Marcus had to be given allegorically. Thus he writes, When first its father, of the Tetrad, the inconceivable, the beingless, sexless, the Kabbalistic Ein Suf, 
desired that its ineffable, the first logos, or aeon, should be born, and its invisible should be clothed with form, its mouth opened and uttered the word like unto itself. This word, logos, standing near it, showed what it was, manifesting itself in the form of the invisible one. Now the uttering of the ineffable name through the word came to pass in this manner. It, the supreme Logos, uttered the first word of its name, which was a combination syllable of four elements, letters, and the second combination was added, also of four elements. Then the third, composed of ten elements, and after this the fourth was uttered, which contained twelve elements. The utterance of the whole name consisted thus of thirty elements and of four combinations. Each element had its own letters and peculiar character and pronunciation, and groupings and similitudes, but none of them perceives the form of that of which it is the element, nor understands the utterance of its neighbor. But what each sounds forth itself as sounding forth all it can, that it thinks good to call the whole, and these sounds are they which manifest in form the beingless and ingenerable aeon, and these are the forms which are called angels, perpetually beholding the face of the Father, the Logos, the second God, who stands next God, the inconceivable according to Philo. This is as plain as ancient esoteric secrecy could make it. It is as Kabbalistic, though less veiled than the Zohar, in which the mystic names or attributes are also four-syllabled, twelve, forty-two, and even seventy-two syllabled words. The tetrad shows to Marcus the truth in the shape of a naked woman, and letters every limb of that figure calling her head A, her neck B, shoulders and hands X, etc. In this, Sephira is easily recognized, the head or crown Kether being numbered 1, the brain or Chokma 2, the heart or intelligence Bina 3, and the other seven Sephiroth representing the limbs of the body. The Sephirothic tree is the universe, and Adam Kadmon personifies it in the West, as Brahma represents it in India. Throughout, the ten Sephiroth are represented as divided into three higher, or the spiritual triad, and the lower septenary. The true esoteric meaning of the sacred number seven, though cleverly veiled in the Zohar, is betrayed by the double way of writing the term in the beginning, or Birashith and Bireshaith, the latter, the higher or upper wisdom. As shown by S. L. McGregor Mathers and Isaac Meyer, both of these Kabbalists being supported by the best ancient authorities, these words have a dual and secret meaning. Rashith, bara Elohim, means that the sixth, over which stands the seventh, Sephira, belong to the lower material class, or, as the author says, seven, are applied to the lower creation, and three to the spiritual man, the heavenly prototypic or first Adam. When the theosophists and occultists say that God is no being, for it is nothing, no thing, they are more reverential and religiously respectful to the deity than those who call God he, and thus make of him a gigantic male. He who studies the Kabbalah will soon find the same idea in the ultimate thought of its authors. The earlier and great Hebrew initiates, who got this secret wisdom in Babylonia from the Chaldean hierophants, just as Moses got his in Egypt. The Zoharic system cannot be very well judged by its translations into Latin and other tongues, when all its ideas were softened and made to fit with the views and policy of the Christian arrangers. For its original ideas are identical with those of all other religious systems. The various cosmogenies show that the universal soul was considered by every archaic nation as the mind of the demiurgic creator, and that it was called the mother, Sophia, or the female wisdom, with the Gnostics, the Sephira with the Jews, Sarasvati or Vak with the Hindus, the Holy Ghost also being a female principle. Hence, the Kyrios, or Logos, born from it, was, with the Greeks, the God-mind, Nous. Now, koros, kurios, signifies the pure and unmixed nature of intellect, wisdom. 
says Plato and Cratylus, and Curios is Mercury, Mercurius, Mercurios, the divine wisdom, and Mercury is soul, the sun, from whom thought Hermes received this divine wisdom. While then the logi of all countries and religious are correlative in their sexual aspects with the female soul of the world, or the great deep, the deity, from which these two in one have their being, is ever concealed and hidden, called the hidden one, and is connected only indirectly with creation, as it can act only through the dual force emanating from the eternal essence. Even Asclepius, called the savior of all, is identical, according to ancient classical writers, with the Egyptian Ptah, the creative intellect or divine wisdom, and with Apollo, Baal, Adonis, and Hercules. And Ptah is one of its aspects in the Anima Mundi, the universal soul of Plato, the divine spirit of the Egyptians, the Holy Ghost of the early Christians and Gnostics, and the Akasha of the Hindus, and even in the lower aspect, the astral light. For Ptah was originally the god of the dead, he into whose bosom they were received, hence the limbus of the Greek Christians or the astral light. It was far later that Ta was classed with the sun gods, his name signifying he who opens, as he is shown to be the first to unveil the face of the dead mummy, to call the soul to life in his bosom. Nap, the eternal unrevealed, is represented by the snake emblem of eternity encircling a water urn with its head hovering over the waters, which it incubates with its breath another form of the one original idea of darkness with its ray moving on the waters, etc. As the Logos soul, this permutation is called Ta, and the Logos creator, he becomes Imhotep, his son, the god of the handsome face. In their primitive characters, these two were the first cosmic duad, Newt, space or sky, and noon, the primordial waters the androgyne unity, above whom was the concealed breath of Nep. And all of them had the aquatic animals and plants sacred to them, the ibis, the swan, the goose, the crocodile, and the lotus. Returning to the Kabbalistic deity, this concealed unity is then Ein Suf, endless, boundless, non-existent, so long as the absolute is within Ulam, the boundless and termless time. As such, Ein Suf cannot be the creator or even the modeler of the universe, nor can it be our light. Therefore, Ein Suf is also darkness. The immutable, infinite, and the absolutely boundless can neither think, will, nor act. To do this, it has to become finite, and it does so by its rays penetrating into the mundane egg, or infinite space and emanating from it as a finite god. All this is left to the ray latent in the One. When the period arrives, the absolute will expands naturally, the force within it according to the law of which it is the inner and ultimate essence. The Hebrews did not adopt the egg as a symbol, but they substituted for it the duplex heavens. For translated correctly, the sentence God made the heavens and the earth would read, in and out of his own essence, as a womb, the mundane egg, God created the two heavens. The Christians, however, have chosen the dove, the bird, and not the egg as the symbol of their Holy Ghost. Whoever acquaints himself with Hud, the Merkaba, and the Langash, secret speech or incantation, will learn the secret of secrets. Lagash is nearly identical in meaning with Vak, the hidden power of the mantras. When the active period has arrived, from within the eternal essence of Ein Suf comes forth Sephira, the active power called the primordial point and the crown Kether. It is only through her that the unbound wisdom could give a concrete form to the abstract thought. Two sides of the upper triangle, by which the ineffable essence and its manifested body, the universe, are symbolized, the right side and the base are composed of unbroken lines. The third, the left side, is dotted. It is through the latter that emerges Sephira, spreading in every direction. 
she finally encompasses the whole triangle. In this emanation, the triple triad is formed. From the invisible dew falling from the higher unitriad, the head, thus leaving seven sephiroth only, sephira creates primeval waters, or in other words, chaos takes shape. In the first stage, towards the solidification of spirit, which, through various modifications, will produce earth. It requires earth and water to make a living soul, says Moses. It requires the image of an aquatic bird to connect it with water, the female element of procreation, with the egg and the bird that fecundates it. When Sephira emerges as an active power from within the Latin deity, she is female. When she assumes the office of a creator, she becomes a male. Hence, she is androgyne. She is the father and mother Aditi of the Hindu cosmogony and of the secret doctrine. If the oldest Hebrew scrolls had been preserved, the modern Jehovah worshipper would have found that many and uncomely were the symbols of the creative God. The frog in the moon, typical of his generative character, was the most frequent. All the birds and animals now called unclean in the Bible have been the symbols of this deity in days of old. A mask of uncleanliness was placed over them in order to preserve them from destruction because they were so sacred. The brazen serpent is not a bit more poetical than the goose or swan if symbols are to be accepted a la letter. In the words of the Zohar, the invisible point, which has no limit and cannot be comprehended because of its purity and brightness, expanded from without, forming a brightness that served the indivisible point as a veil, yet the latter also, could not be viewed in consequence of its immeasurable light. It too expanded from without, and this expansion was its garment. Thus, though a constant upheaving motion, finally the world originated. The spiritual substance sent forth by the infinite light is the first sephira, or shekinah. Sephira, exoterically, contains all the other nine sephiroth in her. Esoterically, she contains but two, chokma, or wisdom, a masculine, active potency whose divine name is Yah, and Bina, or intelligence, a feminine, passive potency represented by the divine name Yehovah. Which two potencies form, with Sephira the third, the Jewish trinity, or the crown, Kether? These two Sephiroth, called Abba, Father, and Amona, Mother, are the duad, or the double-sexed Logos, from which issued the other seven Sephiroth. Thus, the first Jewish triad, Sephira, Chokma, and Bina, is the Hindu Trimurti. However veiled even in the Zohar and still more in the exoteric pantheon of India, every particular connected with one is reproduced in the other. The Prajapadis are the Sephiroth. Ten with Brahma, they dwindle to seven with the Trimurti, or the Kabbalistic Triad, are separated from the rest. The seven builders or creators become the seven Prajapati, or the seven Rishis in the same order as the Sephiroth become the creators, then the patriarchs, etc. In both secret systems, the one universal essence is incomprehensible and inactive in its absoluteness, and can be connected with the building of the universe only in an indirect way. In both, the primeval male-female or androgynous principle and its ten and seven emanations, Brahma, Viraj, and Aditi Vak, on the one hand, and the Elohim Jehovah, or Adam Adami, Adam Kadmon, and Sephira Eve, on the other, with the Prajapatis and Sephiroth in their totality, represent primarily the archetypal man, the Proto-Logos, and it is only in their secondary aspect that they become cosmic powers and astronomical or sidereal bodies. If Aditi is the mother of the gods, Devamatri, Eve, is the mother of all living. Both are the Shakti, or generative power, in their female aspect of the heavenly man. And they are both compound creators, says a Gupta Vidya Sutra. In the beginning, a ray issuing from the Paramarthaka, the one and only true existence, became manifested in Vayaharika, 
conventional existence, which was used as a vahana to descend within to the universal mother and cause her to expand, swell, free. And in the Zohar it is stated, The infinite unity, formless and without similitude, after the form of the heavenly man was created, used it. The unknown light, darkness, used the heavenly form. Adam, Olia, as a chariot, Merkaba, through which to descend and wished to be called by this form, which is the sacred name, Jehovah. As the Zohar again says, in the beginning was the will of the king, prior to any other existence. It, the will, sketched the forms of all things that had been concealed but now came into view. And there went forth as a sealed secret from the head of Ein Suf a nebulous spark of matter without shape or form. Life is drawn from below, and from above the source renews itself. The sea is always full and spreads its waters everywhere. Thus the deity is compared to a shoreless sea, to water which is the fountain of life. The seventh palace, the fountain of life, is the first in the order from above. Hence the Kabbalistic tenet on the lips of the very Kabbalistic Solomon, who says in Proverbs, Wisdom hath builded her house, it hath hewn out of its seven pillars. Whence, then, all this identity of ideas, if there were no primeval universal revelation? The few points so far brought out are like a few straws in a stack, in comparison to that which will be disclosed as the work proceeds. If we turn to the Chinese cosmogony, the most hazy of all, even there the same idea is found. See, say, the self-existent is the unknown darkness, the root of the Wu Liang Shu, boundless age. Amitabha and Tian, heaven, come later on. The great extreme of Confucius gives the same idea, his straws notwithstanding. The latter are a source of great amusement to the missionaries who laugh at every heathen religion, despise and hate that of their brother Christians of other denominations, and yet one and all accept their own genesis literally. If we turn to the Chaldean, we find it in Anu, the concealed deity, the one whose name, moreover, shows it to be of Sanskrit origin. For Anu in Sanskrit means Adam. Aniyamsam, Aniyasam, smallest of the small, being a name of Parabrahman in the Vedantic philosophy, in which Parabrahman is described as smaller than the smallest atom, and greater than the greatest sphere or universe. Anagraniyas and Mahaturavat. In the first verses of the Akkadian Genesis, as found in the cuneiform texts on the Babylonian tiles or Latter is coke tiles, and as translated by George Smith, we find Anu, the passive deity, or Ein Suf. Bel, the creator, the spirit of God, or Sephira, moving on the face of the waters, hence water itself. And He, the universal soul, or wisdom of the three combined. The first eight verses read as follows. One, when above were not raised the heavens. Two, and below on the earth, a plant had not grown up. Three, the abyss had not broken open their boundaries. Four, the chaos, or water, Tiamat, the sea, was the producing mother of the whole of them. This is the cosmical Aditi and Sephira. Five, those waters at the beginning were ordained, but. Six, a tree had not grown, a flower had not unfolded. Seven, When the gods had not sprung up, any one of them. Eight, a plant had not grown, and order did not exist. This was the chaotic or antigenetic period, the double swan, and the dark swan which becomes white when light is created. The symbol chosen for the majestic ideal of the universal principle may perhaps seem little calculated to answer its sacred character. A goose or even a swan will no doubt be thought an unfit symbol to represent the grandeur of the spirit. Nevertheless, it must have had some deep occult meaning since it figures not only in every cosmogony and world religion, but was also chosen by the Crusaders. 
among the medieval Christians as the vehicle of the Holy Ghost, which was supposed to be leading the army to Palestine, to wrench the tomb of the Savior from the hands of the Saracen. If we are to credit Professor Draper's statement in his Intellectual Development of Europe, the Crusaders under Peter the Hermit were preceded, the head of the army, by the Holy Ghost under the shape of a white gander in the company of a goat. Seb, the Egyptian god of time, carries a goose on his head. Jupiter assumes the form of a swan, and so also does Brahma, and the root of all this is that mystery of mysteries, the mundane egg. One should learn the reason of a symbol before depreciating it. The dual element of air and water is that of the ibis, swan, goose, and pelican, of crocodiles and frogs, lotus flowers and water lilies, etc. And the result is the choice of the most unseemingly symbols by the modern as much as by the ancient mystics. Pan, the great god of nature, was generally figured in company with aquatic birds, geese especially, and so were other gods. If later on, with the gradual degeneration of religion, the gods to whom geese were sacred became priapictetes, it does not, therefore, follow that waterfowls were made sacred to Pan and other phallic deities, as some scoffers, even of antiquity, would have it. But that the abstract and divine power of procreative nature had become grossly anthropomorphized, nor does the swan of Leda show priapic doings in her enjoyment thereof, as Mr. Hargrave Jennings chastely expresses it. For the myth is but another version of the same philosophical idea of cosmogony. Swans are frequently found associated with Apollo, as they are the emblems of water and fire, and also of the sunlight before the separation of the elements. Our modern symbologists might profit by some remarks made by a well-known writer, Mrs. Lydia Maria Child, who says, From time immemorial, an emblem has been worshipped in Hindustan as the type of creation, or the origin of life, Shiva, or the Mahadeva, being not only the reproducer of human forms, but also the fructifying principle, the generative power that pervades the universe. The material emblem is likewise a religious type. This reverence for the production of life introduced into the worship of Osiris the sexual emblems. It is strange that they regarded with reverence the great mystery of human birth. Were they impure thus to regard it? Or are we impure that we do not so regard it? But no clean and thoughtful mind could so regard them. We have traveled far and unclean have been the paths. Since those old anchorites first spoke of God and the soul in the solemn depths of the first sanctuaries, let us not smile at their mode of tracing the infinite and the incomprehensible cause throughout all the mysteries of nature, lest by so doing we cast the shadow of our own grossness on their patriarchal simplicity. Section 6 The Mundane Egg Whence this universal symbol? The egg was incorporated as a sacred sign in the cosmogony of every people on the earth, and was revered both on account of its form and of its inner mystery. From the earliest mental conceptions of man, it has been known as that which represented most successfully the origin and secret of being, the gradual development of the imperceptible germ within the closed shell the inward working without any apparent outward interference of force, from which a latent nothing produced an active something, needing naught save heat, and which, having gradually evolved into a concrete living creature, broke its shell, appearing to the outward senses of all as a self-generated and self-created being. All this must have been a standing miracle from the beginning. The secret teaching explains the reason for this reverence by the symbolism of the prehistoric races. In the beginnings, the first cause had no name. Later, it was pictured in the fancy of the thinkers as an ever-invisible, mysterious bird that dropped an egg into chaos, which egg became the universe. Hence, Brahma was called Kalahansa, the swan in space and time, 
becoming the swan of eternity, Brahma, at the beginning of each Mahanmanvantara, lays a golden egg, which typifies the great circle, or circle, itself a symbol for the universe and its spherical bodies. A second reason for the egg having been chosen as the symbolical representation of the universe and of our earth was its form. It was a circle and a sphere, and the ovi form shape of our globe must have been known from the beginning of symbology, since it was so universally adopted. The first manifestation of the cosmos in the form of an egg was the most widely diffused belief of antiquity. As Bryant shows, it was a symbol adopted among the Greeks, the Syrians, Persians, and Egyptians. In the Egyptian ritual, Seb, the god of time and of the earth, is spoken of as having laid an egg, or the universe, an egg conceived at the hour of the great one of the dual force. Ra is shown like Brahma gestating in the egg of the universe. The deceased is resplendent in the egg of the land of mysteries. For this is the egg to which is given life among the gods. It is the egg of the great clucking hen, the egg of Seb who issues from it like a hawk. Among the Greeks, the Orphic egg is described by Aristophanes and was part of the Dionysiac and other mysteries during which the mundane egg was consecrated and its significance explained. Porphyry also shows it to be a representation of the world. Faber and Bryant have tried to show that the egg typified the Ark of Noah, a wild belief unless the latter is accepted as purely allegorical and symbolical. It can only have typified the Ark as a synonym of the moon, the Arga which carries the universal seed of life, but had surely nothing to do with the Ark of the Bible. Anyhow, the belief that the universe existed in the beginning in the shape of an egg was general, and as Wilson says, a similar account of the first aggregation of the elements in the form of an egg is given in all the Puranas, with the usual epithet, Haima or Hiranya, golden as it occurs in Manu. Hiranya, however, means resplendent, shining, rather than golden, as is proven by the great Indian scholar, the late Svami Dayanand Sarasvati, in his unpublished polemics with Professor Max Muller. As said in the Vishnu Purana, intellect, Mahat, the unmanifested gross elements inclusive, formed an egg, and the Lord of the universe himself abided in it. In the character of Brahma. In that egg, O Brahmana, were the continents and seas and mountains, the planets and divisions of the planets, the gods, the demons, and mankind. Both in Greece and in India, the first visible male being who united in himself the nature of either sex abode in the egg and issued from it. This firstborn of the world was Dionysus with some Greeks the god who sprang from the mundane egg, and from whom the mortals and immortals were derived. The god Ra is shown in the Book of the Dead, beaming in his egg, the sun, and the stars off as soon as the god Shu, the solar energy, awakens and gives him the impulse. He is in the solar egg, the egg to which is given life among the gods. The solar god exclaims, I am the creative soul of the celestial abyss. None sees my nest, none can break my egg. I am the Lord. In view of this circular form, the I issuing from the circle or the egg, or the male from the female in the androgyne, it is strange to find a scholar saying, on the ground, that the most ancient Indian MSS show no trace of it, that the ancient Aryans were ignorant of the decimal notation. The ten, being the sacred number of the universe, was secret and esoteric, both as regards to the unit and cipher, or zero, the circle. Moreover, Professor Max Muller tells that the two words, cipher and zero, which are but one, are sufficient to prove that our figures are borrowed from the Arabs. Cipher is the Arabic cipheron and means empty, a translation of the Sanskrit sanyan or not, says the professor. The Arabs had their figures from Hindustan and never claimed the discovery for themselves. 
As to the Pythagoreans, we need but turn to the ancient manuscripts of Boethius' treatise, De Arithmetica, composed in the 6th century, to find among the Pythagoreans numerals the 1 and the 0 as the first and final figures. And Porphyry, who quotes from the Pythagorean Moderatus, says that the numerals of Pythagoras were hieroglyphical symbols, by means whereof he explained ideas concerning the nature of things, or the origin of the universe. Now, if on the one hand the most ancient Indian MSS show as yet no trace of decimal notation in them, and Max Muller states very clearly that until now he has found but nine letters, the initials of the Sanskrit numerals, on the other hand, we have records as ancient to supply the wanted proof. We speak of the sculptures and the sacred imagery in the most ancient temples of the Far East. Pythagoras derived his knowledge from India, and we find Professor Max Muller corroborating this statement, at least as far as to allow the Neo-Pythagoreans were the first teachers of ciphering among the Greeks and Romans, that they, at Alexandria or in Syria, became acquainted with the Indian figures and adapted them to the Pythagorean abacus. This cautious admission implies that Pythagoras himself was acquainted with only nine figures. Thus, we might reasonably answer that, although we possess no certain proof, exoterically, that the decimal notation was known to Pythagoras, who lived at the very close of the Archaic Ages. Yet we have sufficient evidence to show that the full numbers, as given by Boethius, were known to the Pythagoreans even before Alexandria was built. This evidence we find in Aristotle, who says that some philosophers hold the ideas and numbers are the same nature, and amount to ten in all. This, we believe, will be sufficient to show that the decimal notation was known among them at least as early as four centuries BC. For Aristotle does not seem to treat the question as an innovation of the Neo-Pythagoreans. But we know more than this. We know that the decimal system must have been used by the mankind of the earliest archaic ages, since the whole astronomical and geometrical portion of the secret sacerdotal language was built upon the number 10, or the combination of the male and female principles, and since the pyramid of Cheops, so-called, is built upon measures of this decimal notation, or rather upon the digits and their combinations with the knot. Of this, however, sufficient has been said in Isis Unveiled, and it is useless to repeat it. The symbolism of the lunar and solar deities is so inextricably mixed up that it is next to impossible to separate from each other such glyphs as the egg, the lotus, and the sacred animals. The ibis, for instance, was held in the greatest veneration in Egypt. It was sacred to Isis, who was often represented with the head of that bird, and also sacred to Mercury, or Thoth, who was said to have assumed its form while escaping from Typhon. There were two kinds of ibises in Egypt. Herodotus tells us, one quite black and the other black and white. The former is credited with fighting and exterminating the winged serpents, which came every spring from Arabia and infested the country. The other was sacred to the moon because the latter planet is white and brilliant on her external side, dark and black on that side which she never turns to the earth. Moreover, the ibis kills land serpents and makes the most terrible havoc amongst the eggs of the crocodile, and thus saves Egypt from having the Nile over-infested by those horrible saurians. The bird is credited with doing this in the moonlight, and thus being helped by Isis whose sidereal symbol is the moon. But the more correct esoteric truth underlying these popular myths is that Hermes, as shown by Abenepius, watched over the Egyptians under the form of that bird and taught them the occult arts and sciences. This simply means that the Ibis religiosa had and has magical properties in common with many other birds the albatross preeminently, and the mythical white swan, the swan of eternity or time, the Kalahansa. Were it otherwise, indeed, why should all the ancient peoples, who were no more fools than we are, 
have had such a superstitious dread of killing certain birds. In Egypt, he who killed an ibis, or the golden hawk, the symbol of the sun, and Osiris, risked death and could hardly escape it. The veneration of some nations for birds was such that Zoroaster, in his precepts, forbids their slaughter as a heinous crime. In our age, we laugh at every kind of divination. Yet why should so many generations have believed in divination by birds, and even in omancy, which is said by Sudas to have been imparted by Orpheus, who taught now under certain conditions to perceive in the yolk and white of an egg that which the bird born from it would have seen around it during its short life. The occult art, which 3,000 years ago demanded the greatest learning and the most abstruse mathematical calculations, has now fallen into the depths of degradation. And today, it is the old cooks and fortune tellers who read the future for servant girls in search of husbands from the white of an egg in a glass. Nevertheless, even Christians have to this day their sacred birds. For instance, the dove the symbol of the Holy Ghost, nor have they neglected the sacred animals and the evangelical zoolatry with its bull, eagle, lion, and angel, in reality the cherub or seraph, the fiery-winged serpent, is as much pagan as that of the Egyptians or the Chaldeans. These four animals are, in reality, the symbols of the four elements and of the four lower principles in man. Nevertheless, they correspond physically and materially to the four constellations that form, so to speak, the suite or cortege of the solar god, and which, during the winter solstice, occupy the four cardinal points of the zodiacal circle. These four animals may be seen in many of the Roman Catholic New Testaments in which the portraits of the evangelists are given. They are the animals of Ezekiel's Merkabah. As truly stated by Ragon, the ancient hierophants have combined so cleverly the dogmas and symbols of their religious philosophies that these symbols can be fully explained only by the combination and knowledge of all the keys. They can only be approximately interpreted even if one discovers three out of the seven systems, viz. the anthropological, the psychic, and the astronomical, the two chief interpretations, the highest and the lowest, the spiritual and the physiological, were preserved in the greatest secrecy, until the latter fell into the dominion of the profane. Thus far, with regard only to the prehistoric hierophants, with whom that which has now become purely or impurely phallic, was a science as profound and as mysterious as biology and physiology are now. This was their exclusive property, the fruit of their studies and discoveries. The other two were those which dealt with the creative gods or theogony, and with creative man, that is to say, with the ideal and the practical mysteries. These interpretations were so cleverly veiled and combined that many were those who, while arriving at the discovery of one meaning, were baffled in understanding the significance of the others and could never unriddle them sufficiently to commit dangerous indiscretions. The highest, the first, and the fourth, theogony in relation to anthropogeny, were almost impossible to fathom. We find the proofs of this in the Jewish holy writ. It is owing to the serpent being oviparous that it became a symbol of wisdom and an emblem of the logi, or the self-born. It is the temple of Philae in Upper Egypt. An egg was artificially prepared of clay mixed with various incenses. This was hatched by a peculiar process, and a cerists, or a horned viper, was produced. The same was done in the Indian temples in antiquity in the case of the cobra. The creative god emerges from the egg that issues from the mouth of Nep. As a winged serpent for the serpent is the symbol of all wisdom. With the Hebrews, the same deity is glyphed by the flying, or fiery serpents, of Moses in the wilderness, and with the Alexandrian mystic she becomes the Orphiochristos, the Logos of the Gnostics. The Protestants try to show that the allegory of the brazen serpent and of the fiery serpents has a direct reference to the mystery of the Christ and the crucifixion. 
whereas in truth it has a far nearer relation to the mystery of generation. When dislocated from the egg with the central germ, or the circle with its central point, Protestant theologians would have us believe their interpretation only because the brazen serpent was lifted on a pole, whereas it had rather a reference to the Egyptian egg standing upright supported by the sacred Tau. Since the egg and the serpent are inseparable in the old worship and symbology of Egypt, and since both the brazen and the fiery serpents were seraphs, the burning, fiery messengers, or the serpent gods, the Nagas of India. Without the egg, it was a purely phallic symbol, but when associated therewith, it related to cosmic creation. The brazen serpent had no such holy meaning as the Protestants would ascribe to it, nor was it, in fact, glorified above the fiery serpents. For the bite of which it was only a natural remedy, the symbolical meaning of the word brazen being the feminine principle and that of fiery or gold the masculine principle. Brass was a metal symbolizing the netherworld, that of the womb where life should be given. The word for serpent in Hebrew was nakash, but this is also the term for brass. It is said in Numbers that the Jews complained of the wilderness where there was no water, after which the Lord sent fiery serpents to bite them, and then, to oblige Moses, he gave him as a remedy the brazen serpent on a pole for them to look at after which any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, lived. After that, the Lord gathered the people together at the well of beer, gave them water, and grateful Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well. When, after studying symbology, the Christian reader comes to understand the innermost meaning of these three symbols, water, brazen, and serpent, and a few more, in the sense given to them in the Holy Bible, he will hardly like to connect the sacred name of his Savior with the brazen serpent incident. The seraphim, or widely winged serpents, are no doubt connected with and inseparable from the idea of the serpent of eternity, God, as explained in Keneally's Apocalypse. But the word cherub also meant serpent in one sense, though its direct meaning is different for the cherubim and the Persian-winged griffins, the guardians of the Golden Mountain are the same, and the compound name of the former shows their character as it is formed of a circle and ob or ub a serpent, and therefore means a serpent in a circle. And this settles the phallic character of the brazen serpent and justifies Hezekiah for breaking it. In the Book of the Dead, as just shown, reference is often made to the egg. Ra, the Mighty One, remains in his egg during the struggle between the Children of the Rebellion and Shu, the Solar Energy, and the Dragon of Darkness. The deceased is resplendent in his egg when he crossed to the Land of Mystery. He is the egg of Seb. The egg was the symbol of life in immortality and eternity, and also the glyph of the generative matrix, whereas the Tau, which was associated with it, was the only symbol of life and birth in generation. The mundane egg was placed in Kum, the water of space or the feminine abstract principle, Kum becoming with the fall of mankind into generation and phallicism, Amun the creative god. When Ta, the fiery god, carries the mundane egg in his hand, then the symbolism becomes quite terrestrial and concrete in its significance. In conjunction with the hawk, the symbol of Osiris' son, the symbol is dual and relates to both lives, the mortal and the immortal. The engraving of a papyrus in Kircher's Oedipus Egypticus shows an egg floating above the mummy. This is the symbol of hope and the promise of a second birth for the Osirified dead. His soul, after due purification in the Amenti, will gestate in this egg of immortality, to be reborn therefrom into a new life on earth. For this egg, in the esoteric doctrine, is Devachan, the abode of bliss, the winged Scarabaeus also being another symbol of it. 
The winged globe is but another form of the egg, and has the same significance as the scarabaeus, the coparu, from the root copru, to become, to be reborn, which relates to the rebirth of man as well as to his spiritual regeneration. In the Theogony of Mochus, we find ether first and then air, the two principles from which Ulam, the, the intelligible deity, the visible universe of matter, is born out of the mundane egg. In the Orphic hymns, Eros Phanes evolves from the divine egg, which the ethereal winds impregnate, wind being the spirit of God, or rather the spirit of the unknown darkness. The divine idea of Plato, which is said to move in ether, in the Hindu, Kathapanishad, Purusha, the divine spirit, already stands before the original matter, from whose union springs the great soul of the world. Mahatma, Brahma, the spirit of life, etc., the latter appellations being all identical with Anima Mundi, or the universal soul, the astral light of the Kabbalist and the occultist, or the egg of darkness. Besides this, there are many charming allegories on this subject, scattered through the sacred books of the Brahmins. In one place, it is the female creator who is first a germ, then a drop of heavenly dew, a pearl, and then an egg. In such cases, of which there are too many to enumerate separately, the egg gives birth to the four elements within the fifth ether and is covered with seven coverings, which become later on the seventh upper and the seven lower worlds. Breaking in two, the shell becomes the heaven, and the contents the earth, the white forming the terrestrial waters. Then again, it is Vishnu who emerges from within the egg with a lotus in his hand. Vanata, a daughter of Daksha, the wife of Kashyapa, the self-born sprung from time, one of the seven creators of our world brought forth an egg from which was born Garuda, the vehicle of Vishnu. The later allegory having a relation to our earth as Garuda is the great cycle. The egg was sacred to Isis and therefore the priests of Egypt never ate eggs. Isis is almost always represented holding a lotus in one hand and in the other a circle and a cross, Coxansada. Diodorus Siculus states that Osiris was born from an egg, like Brahma, from Leda's egg, Apollo and Latona were born, and also Castor and Pollux, the bright Gemini. And though the Buddhists do not attribute the same origin to their founder yet, no more than the ancient Egyptians or the modern Brahmins, do they eat eggs lest they should destroy the germ of life latent in them, and thereby commit sin. The Chinese believe that the first man was born from an egg, which Tian dropped down from heaven to earth into the waters. This egg symbol is still regarded by some as representing the idea of the origin of life, which is a scientific truth, though the human ovum is invisible to the naked eye. Therefore, we see respect shown to it from the remotest antiquity by the Greeks, Phoenicians, Romans, the Japanese and the Siamese, the North and South American tribes, and even the savages of the remotest lands. With the Egyptians, the concealed god was Ammon, or Mon, the hidden, the supreme spirit. All their gods were dual, the scientific reality for the sanctuary, its double, the fabulous and mythical entity for the masses. For instance, as observed in the section Chaos, Theos, Cosmos, the Elder Horus was the idea of the world remaining in a demiurgic mind born in darkness before the creation of the world. The second Horus was the same idea going forth from the Logos, becoming clothed with matter and assuming an actual existence. Horus, the Elder, or Herori, is an ancient aspect of the solar god. Contemporary with Ra and Shu, Herori is often mistaken for Hor, Horsusi, son of Osiris and Isis. The Egyptians very often represented the rising sun under the form of Hor, the elder, rising from a full-blown lotus, the universe, when the solar disk is always found on the hawk head of that god. Herori is Kanum, 
The same with Knum and Ammon, both are represented as ram-headed and both are often confused, though their functions are different. Knum is the modeler of men, fashioning men and things out of the mundane egg, on a potter's wheel. Amun-Ra, the generator, is the secondary aspect of the concealed deity. Knum was adored at Elephanta and Philae, Ammon at Thebes. But it is Emeft, the one supreme planetary principle, who blows the egg out of his mouth and who, therefore, is Brahma, the shadow of the deity, cosmic and universal, of that which broods over and permeates the egg with its vivifying spirit, until the germ contained it and its ripe was the mystery god whose name was unpronounceable. It is Ta, however, he who opens, the opener of life and death, who proceeds from the egg of the world to begin his dual work. According to the Greeks, the phantom form of Chemis, Chemi, ancient Egypt, which floats on the ethereal waves of the Empyrean sphere, was called into being by Horus Apollo, the sun god, who caused it to evolve out of the mundane egg. The Brahmanda Purana contains fully the mystery about Brahma's golden egg. This is why, perhaps, it is inaccessible to the Orientalists who say that this Purana, like the Skanda, is no longer procurable in a collective body, but is represented by a variety of Khandas and Mahatmyas professing to be derived from it. The Brahmanda, Purana, is described as that which has declared in 12,200 verses the magnificence of the egg of Brahma, and in which an account of the future Kalpas is contained as revealed by Brahma quite so and much more perchance. In the Scandinavian cosmogony placed by Professor Max Muller in point of time, as far anterior to the Vedas in the poem of Woluspa, the song of the prophetess, the mundane egg is again discovered in the phantom germ of the universe, which is represented as lying in the Ginnungap, the cup of illusion, Maya, the boundless and void abyss. In this world's matrix, formerly a region of night and desolation, Nephilim, the mist place, the nebular, as it is called now in the astral light, dropped a ray of cold light which overflowed this cup and froze in it. Then the invisible blew a scorching wind which dissolved the frozen waters and cleared the mist. These waters, chaos, called the streams of Elowagar, distilling in vivifying drops, fell down and created the earth and the giant mirror, who had only the semblance of man, the heavenly man, and the cow, Adumula, the mother, astral light, or cosmic soul, from whose udder flowed four streams of milk, the four cardinal points, the four heads of the four rivers of Eden, etc., which four are symbolized by the cube in all its various and mystical meanings. The Christians, especially the Greek and Latin churches, have fully adopted the symbol and see it as a commemoration of life eternal, of salvation, and of resurrection. This is found in and corroborated by the time-honored custom of exchanging Easter eggs from the Anguinum, the egg of the pagan druid, whose name alone made Rome tremble with fear, to the red Easter egg of the Slavonian peasant a cycle has passed. And yet, whether in civilized Europe or among the abject savages of Central America, we find the same archaic primitive thought, if we will only search for it and do not, in the haughtiness of our fancied mental and physical superiority, disfigure the original idea of the symbol. Section 7. The Days and Nights of Brahma This is the name given to the periods called Manvantara, Manuantara, or between the Manus, and Pralaya, or dissolution, one referring to the active periods of the universe, the other to its times of relative and complete rest, whether they occur at the end of a day, or an age, or life, of Brahma. These periods, which follow each other in regular succession, are also called small and great kalpas, the minor and the maha kalpas, 
Though, properly speaking, the Maha Kalpa is never a day, but a whole life or age of Brahma. For it is said in the Brahma Vivarta, chronologers compute a Kalpa by a life of Brahma. Minor Kalpas, as Samvarda and the rest, are numerous. In sober truth, they are infinite, for they have never had a commencement, or in other words, there never was a first Kalpa, nor will there ever be a last in eternity. One Pararda, or half of the existence of Brahma, in the ordinary exception of this measure of time, has already expired in the present Mahakalpa. The last Kalpa was the Padma, or that of the Golden Lotus. The present one is the Varaha, the boar, incarnation, or avatara. One thing is to be especially noted by the scholar who studies the Hindu religion from the Puranas. He must never take the statements found therein literally, and in one sense only, and those especially which concern the Manvantaras or Kalpas, have to be understood in their several references. Thus, these ages relate, in the same language, to both the great and the small periods, to maha kalpas and to minor cycles. The matsya, or fish avatara, happened before the varaha, or boar avatara. The allegories, therefore, must relate to both the padma and the present manvantara, and also to the minor cycles which have occurred since the reappearance of our chain of worlds and the earth. And as the Matsya avatara of Vishnu and Vavasveda's deluge are correctly connected with an event that happened on our earth during this round, it is evident that while it may relate to precosmic events, precosmic in the sense of our cosmos or solar system, it has reference in our case to a distant geological period. Not even esoteric philosophy can claim to know, except by analogical inference that which took place before the reappearance of our solar system, and previous to the last Maha Pralaya. But it teaches distinctly that after the first geological disturbance of the Earth's axis, which ended in the sweeping down the bottom of the seas of the whole second continent, with its primeval races of which successive continents, or Earths, Atlantis was the fourth, there came another disturbance owing to the axis again resuming its previous degree of inclination as rapidly as it had changed it. When the earth was indeed once more raised out of the waters, as above, so below, and vice versa. There were gods on the earth in those days, gods and not men, as we know them now, says the tradition. As will be shown in Volume 2, the computation of periods in exoteric Hinduism refers to both the great cosmic and the small terrestrial events and cataclysms, and the same may be demonstrated in respect to names. For instance, the name Yudhishthira, the first king of the Sesi, or Shakas, who opens the Kali Yuga era, which has to last 432,000 years, an actual king who lived 3,102 years BC applies to the great deluge at the time of the first sinking of Atlantis. He is the Yadishthira born on the mountain of the Hundred Peaks, at the extremity of the world, beyond which nobody can go, and immediately after the flood. We know of no flood, 3,102 years ago, not even that of Noah, for agreeably with Judeo-Christian chronology, it took place 2,349 years B.C. This relates to an esoteric division of time and a mystery explained elsewhere, and may therefore be left aside for the present. Suffice it to remark at this juncture that all the efforts of imagination of the Wilfords, Bentleys, and other would-be Oedipuses of esoteric Hindu chronology have sadly failed. No computation of either the Four Ages or the Manvantaras has ever yet been unriddled by our very learned Orientalists, who have therefore cut the Gordian knot by proclaiming the whole a figment of the Brahmanical brain. So be it, and may the great scholars rest in peace. 
This figment is given at the end of the commentaries on stanza 2 of the Anthropogenesis in volume 2 with esoteric editions. Let us see, however, what were the three kinds of prolias, and what is the popular belief about them? For once it agrees with esotericism, of the prolea before which 14 manvantaras elapse, having over them as many presiding manus, and at whose close occurs the incidental, or Brahma's, dissolution. It is said in Vishnu Purana, in condensed paraphrase, at the end of a thousand periods of four ages, which complete a day of Brahma, the earth is almost exhausted. The eternal Avyaya, Vishnu, then assumes the character of Rudra, the destroyer, Shiva, and reunites all his creatures to himself. He enters the seven rays of the sun and drinks up all the waters of the globe. He causes the moisture to evaporate, thus drying up the whole earth. Oceans and rivers, torrents and small streams are all exhaled. Thus, fed with abundant moisture, the seven solar rays become seven suns, by dilation, and they finally set the world on fire. Harry, the destroyer of all things, who is the flame of time, Caligny, finally consumes the earth. Then Rudra, becoming Yanardana, breathes clouds and rain. There are many kinds of pralaya, but three chief periods are specially mentioned in the old Hindu books. The first of these, as Wilson shows, is called Namatika, occasional or incidental caused by the intervals of Brahma's days. It is the destruction of creatures of all that lives and has a form, but not of the substance, which remains in status quo till the new dawn after that night. The second is called Prakritika, and occurs at the end of the age or life of Brahma, when everything that existed is resolved into the primal element to be remodeled at the end of that longer night. The third, Achyantika, does not concern the worlds or the universe, but only the individualities of some people. It is thus the individual pralaya or nirvana, after having reached which there is no more future existence possible, no rebirth till after the Maha Pralaya, the latter night lasting, it does, 311 trillion 40 billion years, with the possibility of also being doubled in the case of the lucky Ivan Mukta, who reaches Nirvana at the end period of a Manvantara, is long enough to be regarded as eternal, if not endless. The Bhagavata Purana speaks of a fourth kind of Pralaya the nitya, or constant dissolution, and explains it as the change which takes place imperceptibly in everything in this universe from the globe down to the atom without cessation. It is growth and decay, life and death. When the Maha Pralaya arrives, the inhabitants of Svarloka, the upper sphere, disturbed by the conflagration, seek refuge. With the Petris, their progenitors, the Manus, the seven Rishis, the various orders of celestial spirits, and the gods in Mahar Loka. When the latter is also reached, the whole of the above enumerated beings migrate in their turn from Mahar Loka and repair to Yanaloka, in their subtile forms, destined to become re embodied in similar capacities as their former when the world is renewed at the beginning of the succeeding Kalpa. Clouds, mighty in size and loud in thunder, fill up all space. Showering down torrents of water, these clouds quench the dreadful fires. And then they reign uninterruptedly for a hundred divine years and deluge the whole world, solar system. Pouring down in drops as large as dice, these rains overspread the earth and fill the middle region, Buvaloka, and inundate heaven. The world is now enveloped in darkness, and all things, animate or inanimate, having perished, the clouds continue to pour down their waters, and the night of Brahma reigns supreme over the scene of desolation. This is what we call, in the esoteric doctrine, a solar pralaya. When the waters have reached the region of the seven rishis and the world, our solar system, is the one ocean they stop. 
The breath of Vishnu becomes a strong wind, which blows for another hundred divine years until all clouds are dispersed. The wind is then reabsorbed, and that, of which all things are made, the Lord by whom all things exist, he who is inconceivable, without beginning the beginning of the universe, reposes sleeping upon Shisha, the serpent of infinity, in the midst of the deep. The creator, Hari, sleeps upon the ocean of space in the form of Brahma, glorified by Sanaka and the saints Siddhas of Yanaloka, and contemplated by the holy denizens of Brahmaloka, anxious for final liberation. Involved in mystic slumber, the celestial personification of his own illusions. This is the dissolution, termed incidental because Harry is its incidental ideal cause. When the universal spirit wakes, the world revives. When he closes his eyes, all things fall upon the bed of mystic slumber. In like manner, as a thousand great ages constitute a day of Brahma, in the original it is Padmayoni, the same as Abhyaoni, lotus-born, not Brahma, so his night consists of the same period. Awakening at the end of his night, the unborn creates the universe anew. This is incidental pralaya, what is the elemental prakritika dissolution. Parashara describes it to Maitreya as follows. When by dearth and fire all the worlds and patalas, hells, are withered up, the progress of elemental dissolution has begun. Then, first, the waters swallow up the property of earth, which is the rudiment of smell, and earth, deprived of the property, proceeds to destruction, and becomes one with water when the universe is, thus pervaded by the waves of the watery element, its rudimentary flavor is licked up by the element of fire, and the waters themselves are destroyed, and become one with fire, and the universe is, therefore, entirely filled with ethereal flame which gradually overspreads the whole world. While space is one flame, the element of wind seizes upon the rudimentary property, or form, which is the cause of light, and that being withdrawn, perlina, all becomes of the nature of air. The rudiment form being destroyed, and fire, deprived of its rudiment, air extinguishes fire and spreads over space, which is deprived of light when fire merges into air. Air then, accompanied by sound, which is the source of ether, extends everywhere throughout the ten regions, until ether seizes upon contact, sparsha, cohesion, touch. Its rudimentary property, by the loss of which air is destroyed, and ether, ka, remains unmodified. Devoid of form, flavor, touch, sparsha, and smell, it exists embodied and vast and pervades the whole of space. Ether, akasha, whose characteristic property and rudiment is sound, the word, exists alone, occupying all the vacuity of space, or rather occupying the whole containment of space. Then the origin, noumenon, of the elements, budadi, devours sound, the collective demiurgis, and the host of Yan Chohans, and all the existing elements are at once merged into their original. This primary element is consciousness combined with the property of darkness, tamasa, spiritual darkness rather, and is itself swallowed up, disintegrated by Mahat, the universal intellect, whose characteristic property is intelligence, buddhi, and earth and Mahat are the inner and outer boundaries of the universe. In this manner, as in the beginning, were the seven forms of nature, Prakriti, reckoned from Mahat to earth, so these seven successively re-enter into each other. The egg of Brahma, Sarva Mandala, is dissolved in the waters that surround it, with its seven zones, Vipas, seven oceans, seven regions, and their mountains. The investure of water is drunk by fire, 
The stratum of fire is absorbed by that of air. Air blends itself with ether, akasha, the primary element, budati, the origin, or rather the cause of the primary element, devours the ether and is itself destroyed by intellect. Mahat, the great, the universal mind, which, along with all these, is seized upon by nature, prakriti, and disappears. This prakriti is essentially the same whether discrete or indiscreet, only that which is discrete is, finally, lost or absorbed in the indiscreet. Spirit, pums, also, which is one, pure, imperishable, eternal, all-pervading, is a portion of that supreme spirit which is all things. That spirit, sarvesha, which is other than embodied spirit and in which there are no attributes of name, species, naman and yati or rupa, hence body rather than species, or the like, remains as the sole existent sata, nature, prakriti, and spirit, purusha, both resolve finally into supreme spirit. This is the final pralaya, the death of cosmos, after which its spirit rests in nirvana, or in that for which there is neither day nor night. All the other pralayas are periodical and follow the manvantars in regular succession, as the night follows the day of every human creature, animal, and plant. The cycle of creation of the lives of cosmos is run down, the energy of the manifested word having its growth, culmination, and decrease, as have all things temporary, however long their duration. The creative force is eternal as noumenal, as a phenomenal manifestation. In its aspects, it has a beginning and must therefore have an end. During that interval, it has its periods of activity and its periods of rest. And these are the days and nights of Brahma. But Brahman, the noumenon, never rests as it never changes, but ever is, though it cannot be said to be anywhere. The Jewish Kabbalists felt the necessity of this immutability in an eternal, infinite deity, and therefore applied the same thought to the anthropomorphic God. The idea is poetical and very appropriate in its application. In the Zohar, we read as follows. As Moses was keeping a vigil on Mount Sinai, in company with the deity, who was concealed from his sight by a cloud, he felt a great fear overcome him, and suddenly asked, Lord, where art thou? Sleepest thou, O Lord? And the spirit answered him, I never sleep. Were I to fall asleep for a moment before my time, all the creation would crumble into dissolution in one instant. Before my time is very suggestive. It shows the God of Moses to be only a temporary substitute, like Brahma, the male, a substitute and an aspect of that which is immutable, and which therefore can take no part in the days or nights, nor have any concern whatever with reaction or dissolution. While the Eastern occultists have seven modes of interpretation, the Jews have only four. Namely, the real mystical, the allegorical, the moral, and the literal or passionate. The latter is the key to the exoteric churches and not worth discussion. Here are several sentences which read in the first or mystical key, show the identity of the foundations of construction in every scripture. They are given in Isaac Meyer's excellent book on the Kabbalistic works, which he seems to have well studied. I quote verbatim. In the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth, the meaning of which is the six sephiroth, or construction, over which Brashith stands all belong below. It created six, and on these stand exist all things. And those depend upon the seven forms of the cranium, up to the dignity of all dignities. And the second earth does not come into calculation, therefore it has been said, and from it, that earth which underwent the curse came at forth. It, the earth, was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the abyss, and the spirit of Elohim was breathing, i.e. hovering, brooding over, moving over the waters. Thirteen depend on thirteen forms of the most worthy dignity, 
6,000 years hang are referred to in the first six words. The seventh, thousands, the millennium, above it, the cursed earth, is that which is strong by itself. And it was rendered entirely desolate during 12 hours, one day. In the thirteenth, the deity shall restore them, and everything shall be renewed as before, and all those six shall continue. The Sephiroth of construction are the six Gyan Chohans, or the Manus, or Prajapatis, synthesized by the seventh Breshith, the first emanation, or Logos, and who are called, therefore, the builders of the lower or physical universe, all belonging below. These six, whose essence is of the seventh, are the Apati, the base or fundamental stone on which the objective universe is built, the Numenoi of all things. Hence they are at the same time the forces of nature, the seven angels of the presence, the sixth and seventh principles in man, the spirito-psycho-physical spheres of the septenary chain, the root races, etc., they all depend upon the seven forms of the cranium up to the highest. The second earth does not come into calculation because it is no earth, but the chaos or abyss of space in which rested the paradigmatic or model universe in the ideation of the oversoul brooding over it. The term curse is here very misleading for it means simply doom or destiny or that fatality which sent it forth into the objective state. This is shown by the earth under the curse, being described as without form and void, in whose abysmal depths the breath of the Elohim or collective Logi produced, or so to say photographed, the first divine ideation of the things to be. This process is repeated after every pralaya before the beginnings of a new manvantara, or period of sentient individual being. 13, depend on 13 forms, refers to the 13 periods personified by the 13 Manus, with Zvayambhuva, the 14th, 13 instead of 14, being an additional veil, these 14 Manus who reign within the term of Maha Yuga, a day of Brahma. These 1314 of the objective universe depend on the 1314 paradigmatic ideal forms. The meaning of the 6,000 years, which hang in the first six words, has again to be sought in the Indian wisdom. They refer to the primordial six, seven kings of Edom, who typify the worlds or spheres of our chain during the first round, as well as the primordial men of this round. They are the septenary pre-Adamic first root race, or they who existed before the third separated race. As they were shadows and senseless, for they had not yet eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they could not see the parzufim, or face could not see face. That is to say, primeval men were unconscious. Therefore, the primordial seven kings died, i.e. were destroyed. Now, who are these kings? They are the kings who are the seven rishis, certain secondary divinites, Indra, Shaktra, Manu and the kings his sons, who are created and perish at one period, as Vishnu Purana tells us. For the seventh thousand, which is not the millennium of exoteric Christianity, but that of anthropogenesis, represents both the seven period of creation, that of physical man, according to Vishnu Purana, and the seventh principle, both macrocosmic and microcosmic and also the pralaya of the seventh period, the night, which has the same duration as the day of Brahma. It was rendered entirely desolate during twelve hours. It is in that thirteenth, twice six, and the synthesis, that everything shall be restored and the six shall continue. Thus the author of the Kabbalah remarks quite truly that, long before his... Ibn Gibberol's time, many centuries before the Christian era, there was in Central Asia a wisdom religion, fragments of which subsequently existed among the learned men of the archaic Egyptians and the ancient Chinese, Hindus, etc., and that the Kabbalah most likely originally came from Aryan sources through Central Asia, Persia, India, and Mesopotamia 
For from Ur and Haran came Abraham and many others into Palestine. Such was also the firm conviction of C.W. King, the author of The Gnostics and the Remains. Vamadeva Modlier describes the coming night most poetically. Though it is given in Isis unveiled, it is worthy of repetition. Strange noises are heard proceeding from every point. These are the precursors of the night of Brahma. Dusk rises at the horizon and the sun passes away beyond the 13th degree of Makara, the 10th sign of the zodiac, and will reach no more the sign of the Mina, the zodiacal sign Pisces or the fish. The gurus of the pagodas appointed to watch the Rashi Chakram, Zodiac, may now break their circle and instruments, for they are henceforth useless. Gradually light pales, heat diminishes, uninhabited spots multiply on the earth, the air becomes more and more rarefied, the springs of waters dry up, the great rivers see their waves exhausted, the ocean shows its sandy bottom and plants die. Men and animals decrease in size daily, life and motion lose their force. Planets can hardly gravitate in space. They are extinguished one by one like a lamp which the hand of the Chokra servant neglects to replenish. Surya, the sun, flickers and goes out. Matter falls into dissolution, pralaya, and Brahma merges back into Dius, the unrevealed god. And his task being accomplished, he falls asleep. Another day is passed, night sets in and continues until future dawn. And now again re-enter into the golden egg of his thought, the germs of all that exist as the divine Manu tells us. During his peaceful rest, the animated beings endowed with the principles of action seize their functions and all feeling, manas, becomes dormant. When they are all absorbed in the Supreme Soul, the soul of all the beings sleeps in complete repose, till the day when it resumes its form and awakens again from its primitive darkness. As the Satya Yuga is always the first in the series of the four ages of Yugas, so the Kali ever comes the last. The Kali Yuga now reigns supreme in India, and it seems to coincide with that of the Western Age. Anyhow, it is curious to see how prophetic in almost all things was the writer of Vishnu Purana when foretelling the Maitreya, some of the dark influences and sins of this Kali Yuga. For after saying that the barbarians will be the masters of the banks of the Indus, of Chandrabhaga and Kashmira, he adds, there will be contemporary monarchs reigning over the earth, kings of churlish spirit, violent temper, and ever addicted to falsehood and wickedness. They will inflict death on women, children, and cows. They will seize upon the property of their subjects, or, according to another reading, be intent upon the wives of others. They will be of limited power. Their lives will be short, their desires insatiable. People of various countries intermingling with them will follow their example, and the barbarians being powerful in India and the patronage of the princes, whilst pure tribes are neglected, the people will perish. Or, as the commentator has it, the Malekas will be in the center and the Aryas at the end. Wealth and piety will decrease day by day until the world will be wholly depraved. Property alone will confer rank. Wealth will be the only source of devotion. Passion will be the sole bond of union between the sexes. Falsehood will be the only means of success in litigation. And women will be objects merely of sensual gratification. External types will be the only distinction of the several orders of life. Dishonesty, anyaya, will be the universal means of subsistence. Weakness, the cause of dependence. Menace and presumption will be the substitution for learning. Liberality will be devotion. A man, if rich, will be reputed pure. Mutual assent will be marriage. Fine clothes will be dignity. He who is the strongest will reign. The people, unable to bear the heavy burdens, Karabara, load of taxes, will take refuge among the valleys. Thus, in the Kali age, will decay constantly proceed. Until the human race approaches its annihilation, pralaya, 
when the close of the Kali age shall be nigh, a portion of that divine being which exists of its own spiritual nature, Kalki Avatara, shall descend upon earth, endowed with the eight superhuman faculties. He will reestablish righteousness upon earth, and the minds of those who live at the end of the Kali Yuga shall be awakened, and shall be pellucid as crystal. The men who are thus changed shall be as the seeds of human beings, and shall give birth to a race who shall follow the laws of the Krita age, the age of purity. As it is said, when the sun and moon and the lunar asterism, Titia, and the planet Jupiter are in one mansion, the Krita, or Satya, age shall return. Two persons, the Vapi, of the race of Kuru and Maru, Moru, or the family of Ishvaku, continue alive throughout the four ages, residing at Kalapa. They will return hither in the beginning of the Krita age. Maru, Moru, the son of Shigra, through the power of devotion, Yoga is still living and will be the restorer of the Kshatriya race of the solar dynasty. Whether right see are wrong with regard to the latter prophecy, the blessings of Kali Yuga are well described, and fit in admirably even with that which one sees and hears in Europe and other civilized and Christian lands in the full 19th and at the dawn of the 20th century of our great era of enlightenment. Section 8. The Lotus as a Universal Symbol There are no ancient symbols without a deep and philosophical meaning attached to them, their importance and significance increasing with their antiquity, such as the Lotus. It is the flower sacred to nature and her gods, and represents the abstract and the concrete universes, standing as the emblem of the productive powers of both spiritual and physical nature. It was held as sacred from the remotest antiquity by the Aryan Hindus, the Egyptians, and by the Buddhists after them. It was revered in China and Japan and adopted as a Christian emblem by the Greek and Latin churches, who made of it a messenger, as do now the Christians, who have replaced it with the water lily. In the Christian religion, in every picture of the Annunciation, Gabriel, the archangel, appears to the Virgin Mary holding in his hand a spray of water lilies. This spray, typifying water and fire, or the idea of creation and generation, symbolizes precisely the same idea as the lotus. In the hand of the Bodhisattva who announces to Mahamaya, Gautama's mother, the birth of Buddha, the world savior. Thus also were Osiris and Horus, represented by Egyptians in association with the lotus, both being sun gods or gods of fire, just as the Holy Ghost still typified by tongues of fire in the Acts. It had and still has its meaning, which is identical with every nation on the earth. We refer the reader to St. William Jones. With the Hindus, the lotus is the emblem of the productive power of nature, through the agency of fire and water, spirit and matter, eternal, I see Brahm the creator enthroned in thee above the lotus, says a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, and Sir W. Jones shows, as already noted in the stanzas, that the seed of the lotus, even before they germinate, contain perfectly formed leaves, the miniature shapes of what they will become one day as perfected plants. The lotus in India is the symbol of prolific earth and, what is more, of Mount Meru. The four angels are genii of the four quarters of heaven. The maharajas of the stanzas each stand on a lotus. The lotus is the twofold type of the divine and human hermaphrodite, being so to say of dual sex. With the Hindus, the spirit of fire or heat, which stirs up, fructifies and develops into concrete form, 
From its ideal prototype, everything which is born of water, or primordial earth, evolved Brahma. The lotus flower, represented as growing out of Vishnu's navel, the god who rests in the waters of space on the serpent of infinity, is the most graphic symbol ever yet made. It is the universe evolving from the central sun, the point, the ever-concealed germ. Lakshmi, who is the female aspect of Vishnu, and who is also called Padma, the lotus, in the Ramayana, is likewise shown floating on a lotus flower at the creation and during the churning of the ocean, of space as also springing from the sea of milk, like Venus Aphrodite from the foam of the ocean. Then, seated on a lotus, beauty's bright goddess, peerless Shri, arose out of the waves. Sings an English Orientalist and poet Sir Monier Williams. The underlying idea in this symbol is very beautiful, and furthermore shows an identical parentage in all the religious systems. Whether as the lotus or water lily, it signifies one and the same philosophical idea, namely the emanation of the objective form of subjective, divine ideation passing from the abstract into the concrete or visible form. For as soon as darkness, or rather that which is darkness, for ignorance has disappeared in its own realm of eternal light, leaving behind itself only its divine manifested ideation, the creative logi have their understanding opened, and they see in the ideal world, hitherto concealed in the divine thought, the archetypal forms of all, and proceed to copy and build or fashion upon these models forms evanescent and transcendent. At this stage of action, the demiurge is not yet the architect. Born in the twilight of action, he has yet to first perceive the plan, realize the ideal forms which lie buried in the bosom of eternal ideation. Just as the future lotus leaves, the immaculate petals are concealed within the seed of that plant. In esoteric philosophy, the demiurge, or logos, regarded as the creator, is simply an abstract term, an idea like the word army, as the latter is the all-embracing term for a body of active forces or working units, soldiers, so is the demiurge the qualitative compound of a multitude of creators or builders. Bernouf, the great orientalist, sees the idea perfectly when he said that Brahma does not create the earth any more than the rest of the universe. Having evolved himself from the soul of the world, one separated from the first cause, he evaporates it and emanates all nature out of himself. He does not stand above it, but is mixed up with it. Brahma and the universe form one being, each particle of which is in essence Brahma himself, who proceeded out of himself. In a chapter of the Book of the Dead, called Transformation into the Lotus, the god, figured as a head emerging from this flower, exclaims, I am the pure lotus emerging from the luminous ones. I carry the messages of Horus. I am the pure lotus which comes from the solar fields. The lotus idea may be traced even in the Elohistic first chapter of Genesis, as stated in Isis Unveiled. It is to this idea that we must look for the origin and explanation of the verse in the Jewish cosmogony, which reads, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. In all the primitive religions, the creative God is the Son of the Father. That is to say, his thought made visible, and before the Christian era, from the Trimurti of the Hindus down to the three Kabbalistic heads of the scriptures. As explained by the Jews, the triune godhead of each nation was fully defined and substantiated in its allegories. Such is the cosmic ideal significance of this great symbol with the Eastern peoples. But when applied to practical and exoteric worship, which had also its esoteric symbology, the lotus, in time became the carrier and container of a more terrestrial idea. No dogmatic religion has ever escaped having the sexual element in it, 
and to this day it soils the moral beauty of the root idea of symbology. The following is quoted from the same Kabbalistic MS, which we have already cited on several occasions. Pointing to like signification was the lotus growing in the waters of the Nile. Its mode of growth peculiarly fitted it as a symbol of the generative activities. The flower of the lotus, which is the bearer of the seed of reproduction as the result of its maturing, is connected by its placenta-like attachment to Mother Earth, or the womb of Isis. Through the water of the womb, that is, the Nile River. By the long cord-like stalk, the um umbilicus. Nothing can be plainer than the symbol, and to make it perfect in its intended signification, a child is sometimes represented as seated in or issuing from the flower. Thus, Osiris and Isis, the children of Kronos, or time without end, and the development of their nature forces in this picture become the parents of man under the name Horus. We cannot lay too great stress upon the use of this generative function as a basis for a symbolical language and a scientific art speech. Thought upon the idea leads at once to reflection upon the subject of creative cause. In its workings, nature is observed to have fashioned a wonderful piece of living mechanism, governed by an added living soul, the life development and history of which soul, as to its whence, its present, and its whither, surpass all efforts of the human intellect. The newborn is an ever-recurring miracle an evidence that within the workshop of the womb, an intelligent creative power has intervened to fasten a living soul to a physical machine. The amazing wonderfulness of the fact attaches a holy sacredness to all connected with the organs of reproduction, as the dwelling and place of evident construction intervention of deity. This is a correct rendering of the underlying ideas of old, of the purely pantheistic conceptions, impersonal and reverential, of the archaic philosophers of the prehistoric ages. It is not so, however, when applied to sinful humanity, to the gross ideas attached to personality. Therefore, no pantheistic philosopher would fail to find the remarks that follow the above, and which represent the anthropomorphism of Judeo-symbology, other than dangerous for the sacredness of true religion, and fitting only for our materialistic age, which is the direct outcome and result of that anthropomorphic character. For this is the keynote to the entire spirit and essence of the Old Testament. As the MS states, treating of the symbolism of the art speech of the Bible. Therefore, the locality of the womb is to be taken as the most holy place, the sanctum sanctorum, and the veritable temple of the living God. With man, the possession of a woman has always been considered as an essential part of himself, to make one out of two, and jealously guarded as sacred, even the part of the ordinary house or home consecrated to the dwelling of the wife was called the penetralia, the secret or sacred, and hence the metaphor of the holy of holies, of sacred construction taken from the idea of the sacredness of the organs of generation. Carried to the extreme of description by metaphor, this part of the house is described in the sacred books as the between the thighs of the house. And sometimes the idea is carried out constructively in the great door opening of churches placed inward between flanking buttresses. No such thought, carried to the extreme, ever existed among the old primitive Aryans. This is proven by the fact in the Vedic period, their women were not placed apart from men in penetralia, or zananas. This seclusion began when the Mohammedans, the next heirs to Hebrew symbolism, after Christian ecclesiasticism, had conquered the land and gradually enforced their ways and customs upon the Hindus. The pre- and post-Vedic woman was as free as man, and no impure terrestrial thought was ever mixed with the religious symbology of the early Aryans. The idea and application are purely Semitic. This is corroborated by the writer of the said intensely learned and Kabbalistic revelation, when he closes the above-quoted passages by adding, 
If to these organs as symbols of creative cosmic agencies, the idea of the origin of measures as well as of time periods can be attached, then indeed in the constructions of the temples as dwellings of Didi or of Jehovah, that part designated as the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place should borrow its title from the recognized sacredness of the generative organs, considered as symbols of measures as well as of creative cause. With the ancient wise, there was no name and no idea and no symbol of a first cause. Most decidedly not. Rather, never give a thought to it and leave it forever nameless, as the early pantheists did, than degrade the sacredness of that ideal of ideals by dragging down its symbols into such anthropomorphic forms. Here again, one perceives the immense chasm between Aryan and Semitic religious thought the two opposite poles, sincerity and concealment. With the Brahmins, who have never invested the natural procreative functions of mankind with an original sin element, it is a religious duty to have a son. A Brahmin, in days of old, having accomplished his mission of human creator, retired to the jungle and passed the rest of his days in religious meditation. He had accomplished his duty to nature, as mortal man and its co-worker, and henceforth gave all his thoughts to the spiritual and immortal portion of himself, regarding the terrestrial as a mere illusion, an evanescent dream, which indeed it is. With the Samite it was different. He invented a temptation of flesh in a garden of Eden, and showed his god, esoterically, the tempter and the ruler of nature, cursing forever an act which was in the logical program of that nature. All this exoterically, as in the cloak and dead letter of Genesis and the rest. At the same time, esoterically, he regarded the supposed sin and fall as an act so sacred as to choose the organ, the perpetrator of the original sin, as the fittest and most sacred symbol to represent that God, who is shown as branding its entering into function as disobedience and everlasting sin. Who can ever fathom the paradoxical depths of the Semitic mind? And this paradoxical element, minus its innermost significance, has now passed entirely into Christian theology and dogma. Whether the early fathers of the Church knew the esoteric meaning of the Hebrew Testament, or whether only a few of them were aware of it, while the others remained ignorant of the secret, is for posterity to decide. One thing at any rate is certain, as the esotericism of the New Testament agrees perfectly with that of the Hebrew Mosaic books, and since, at that same time, a number of purely Egyptian symbols and pagan dogmas in general, the Trinity for example, have been copied by and incorporated into the Synoptics and St. John, it becomes evident that the identity of those symbols was known to the writers of the New Testament whoever they may have been. They must have been also aware of the priority of the Egyptian esotericism, since they have adopted several symbols which typify purely Egyptian conceptions and beliefs, in their outward and inward meaning, and which are not to be found in Jewish canon. One of these is the water lily in the hands of the archangel, and the early representations of his appearance to the Virgin Mary and these symbolical images are preserved to this day in the iconography of the Greek and Roman churches. Thus water, fire, and the cross, as well as the dove, the lamb, and other sacred animals, with all their combinations, esoterically yield an identical meaning, and must have been accepted as an improvement upon Judaism pure and simple. For the lotus and water are among the oldest symbols, and in their origin are purely Aryan, though they became common property during the branching off of the fifth race. To give an example, letters, as well as numbers, were all mystic, whether in combination or taken separately. The most sacred of all is the letter M. It is both feminine and masculine, or androgyne, and is made to symbolize water in its origin, the great deep. It is a mystic letter in all languages, Eastern and Western, and stands as a glyph for the waves. Thus, point, 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 in the Aryan esotericism, as in the Semitic, this letter has always stood for the waters, 
In Sanskrit, for instance, Makara, the tenth sign of the zodiac, means a crocodile, or rather an aquatic monster associated always with water. The letter MA is equivalent to and corresponds with the number five, which is composed of a binary, the symbol of the two sexes separated, and of the ternary, the symbol of the third life, the progeny of the binary. This again is often symbolized by a pentagon, the latter being a sacred sign of divine monogram. Maitreya is the secret name of the fifth Buddha, and the Kalki Avatara of the Brahmins, the last messiah who will come at the culmination of the great cycle. It is also the initial letter of the Greek metis, or divine wisdom, or mimra, the word or logos, and of Mithras, the mirror. The monad mystery. All these are born in and from the great deep and are the sons of Maya, the mother. In Egypt, Mut. In Greece, Minerva, divine wisdom, or Mary, or Miriam, Mira, etc. The mother of the Christian Logos and of Maya, the mother of Buddha. Madhava and Madhavi are the titles of the most important gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. Finally, Mandala is, in Sanskrit, a circle or an orb, also the ten divisions of the Rig Veda. The most sacred names in India generally begin with this letter. From Mahat, the first manifested intellect, and Mandara, the great mountain used by the gods to churn the ocean, down to Mandakini, the heavenly Ganja, or Ganges, Manu, etc., etc. Will this be called a coincidence? A strange one it is then indeed, when we see even Moses found in the water of the Nile with the symbolic consonant on his name, and Pharaoh's daughter called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Besides which, the Hebrew sacred name of God, applied to this letter, M is Mabarak, the holy or the blessed, and the name for the water of the flood is Mabul, a reminder of the three Marys at the crucifixion, and their connection with Mare, the sea or water, may close these examples. This is why in Judaism and Christianity, the Messiah is always connected with water, baptism, and also with the fishes. The sign of the zodiac, called Minam in Sanskrit, and even with the Malsia, Matsya, fish, Avatara, and the lotus, the symbol of the womb, or with the water lily, which has the same signification. In the relics of ancient Egypt, the greater the antiquity of the votive symbols and emblems of the objects exhumed, the oftener are lotus flowers and water found in connection with the solar gods. The god Knum, the moist power, or water, as Thales taught, being the principle of all things, sits on a throne enshrined in a lotus. The god Bess stands on a lotus, ready to devour his progeny. Thought, the god of mystery and wisdom, the sacred scribe of Amenti, wearing the solar disc as headgear, sits with a bull's head, the sacred bull of Mendes being a form of thought, and a human body on a full-blown lotus. Finally, it is the goddess Hiquit, under her shape of a frog who rests on the lotus, thus showing her connection with water. And it is from the unpoetical shape of this frog symbol, undeniably the glyph of the most ancient of the Egyptian deities, that the Egyptologists have been vainly trying to unravel the mystery and functions of the goddess. Its adoption in the church by the early Christians shows that they knew it better than our modern Orientalists. The frog or toad goddess was one of the chief cosmic deities connected with creation on account of this animal's amphibious nature and chiefly because of its apparent resurrection. After long ages of solitary life enshrined in old walls and rocks, etc. She not only participated in the organization of the world together with Knum, but also was connected with the dogma of resurrection. There must have been some very profound and sacred meaning attached to this symbol, since notwithstanding the risk of being charged with a disgusting form of zoolatry, the early Egyptian Christians adopted it for their churches. 
frog or toad enshrined in a lotus flower or simply without the latter emblem was the form chosen for the church lamps on which were engraved the words i am the resurrection these frog goddesses are also found on all the mummies section nine the moon Deus lunus phoebe this archaic symbol is the most poetic of all symbols, as also the most philosophical. The ancient Greeks brought it into prominence, and the modern poets have worn it threadbare. The queen of night, riding in the majesty of her peerless light in heaven, throwing all, even Hesperus, into darkness, and spreading her silver mantle over the whole sidereal world, has ever been a favorite theme with all the poets of Christendom from Milton and Shakespeare down to the latest versifier. But the refulgent lamp of the night, with her suite of stars unnumbered, spoke only to the imagination of the profane. Until lately, religion and science had not to do with the beautiful mythos. Yet the cold, chaste moon, she who in the words of Shelley, makes all beautiful on which she smiles, that wandering shrine of soft yet icy flame, which ever is transformed yet still the same, and warms not but illumines, stands in closer relation to the earth than any other sidereal orb. The sun is the giver of life to the whole planetary system. The moon is the giver of life to our globe. The early races understood and knew it, even in their infancy. She is the queen, and she is the king. She was King Soma before she became transformed into Phoebe, and the chaste Diana. She is preeminently the deity of the Christians. Through the Mosaic and the Kabbalistic Jews, though the civilized world may have remained ignorant of that fact for long ages, in fact, ever since the last initiated father of the church died, carrying with him into his grave the secrets of the pagan temples. For such fathers as Origen or Clemens Alexandrinus, the moon was Jehovah's living symbol the giver of life and the giver of death, the disposer of being in our world. For if Artemis was Luna in heaven, and with the Greek, Diana on earth, who presided over childbirth and life, with the Egyptians she was Hecate, Hecate in hell, the goddess of death who ruled over magic and enchantments, more than this as the personified moon whose phenomena are triadic, Diana, Hecate, Luna is the three in one, for she is Diva Triformis, Terjmina, Triceps, three heads on one neck, like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Hence, she is the prototype of our trinity, which has not always been entirely male. The number seven, so prominent in the Bible, so sacred in the seventh day, or Sabbath, came to the Jews from antiquity deriving its origin from the fourfold number seven contained in the 28 days of the lunar month, each septenary portion thereof being typified by one quarter of the moon. It is worth the trouble of presenting in this work a bird's eye view of the origin and development of the lunar myth and worship in historical antiquity on our side of the globe. Its earlier origin is untraceable by exact science, which rejects all tradition, while for theology, which under the guidance of the crafty popes has put a brand on every fragment of literature that does not bear the imprintur of the Church of Rome. Its archaic history is a sealed book. Whether the Egyptian or the Aryan Hindu religious philosophy is the more ancient, the secret doctrine says it is the latter, does not much matter in this instance, as the lunar and solar worship are the most ancient in the world. Both have survived and prevailed to this day throughout the whole world, with some openly with others, as for instance in Christian symbology, secretly. The cat, a lunar symbol, was sacred to Isis, who was the moon in one sense, just as Osiris was the sun, and is often seen on the top of the sistrum in the hand of the goddess. This animal was held in great veneration in the city of Bubastis, which went into deep mourning on the death of the sacred cats, because Isis, as the moon, was particularly worshipped in that city of mysteries. 
The astronomical symbolism connected with it has already been given in Section 1, and no one has better described it than Mr. Gerald Massey, in his lectures and in the natural genesis. The eye of the cat, it is said, seems to follow the lunar phases in their growth and decline, and its orbs shine like two stars in the darkness of night. Hence the mythological allegory which shows Diana hiding the moon, under the shape of a cat, when she was seeking, in company with other deities, to escape the pursuit of Typhon, as related in the Metamorphosis of Ovid. The moon, in Egypt, was both the eye of Horus and the eye of Osiris, the sun. The same with the Cenocephalus. The dog-headed ape was a glyph to symbolize the sun and moon. In turn, though the Cenocephalus is really more a hermetic than a religious symbol, for it is the hieroglyph of Mercury, the planet, and of the Mercury of the alchemical philosophers who say that Mercury has to be ever near Isis as her minister, for without Mercury, neither Isis nor Osiris can accomplish anything in the great work. The Cenocephalus, whenever represented with the caduceus, the crescent or the lotus is a glyph of the philosophical Mercury. But when seen with a reed, or a roll of parchment, he stands for Hermes, the secretary and advisor of Isis, as Hanumana filled the same office with Rama. Though the regular sun worshippers, the Parsis, are few, yet not only is the bulk of the Hindu mythology and history based upon, and interblended with, these two warships, but so is even the Christian religion itself. From their origin down to our modern day, it has colored the theologies of both the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. Indeed, the difference between the Aryan Hindu and the Aryan European faiths is very small, if only the fundamental ideas of both are taken into consideration. Hindus are proud of calling themselves Suryavashas and Chandra Ravanchas of the solar and lunar dynasties. The Christians pretend to regard this as idolatry, and yet they adhere to a religion entirely based upon solar and lunar worship. It is vain and useless for the Protestants to exclaim against the Roman Catholics for their Mariolatry, based on the ancient cult of lunar goddesses, when they themselves worship Jehovah, preeminently a lunar god. And when both churches have accepted in their theologies the Son Christ and the Lunar Trinity, what is known of Chaldean moon worship of the Babylonian god Sin, called by the Greeks Deus Lunus, is very little. And that little is apt to mislead the profane student, who fails to grasp the esoteric significance of the symbols. As popularly known to the ancient profane philosophers and writers, for those who were initiated were pledged to silence, the Chaldeans were the worshippers of the moon under her and his various names just as were the Jews who came after them. In the unpublished MS on the art speech already mentioned, given a key to the formation of the ancient symbolical language, a logical raison d'etre is brought forward for this double worship. It is written by a wonderfully well-informed and acute scholar and mystic who gives it in the comprehensive form of a hypothesis. The latter, however, forcibly becomes a proven fact in the history of religious evolution and human thought. To anyone who has ever had a glimpse into the secret of ancient symbology. Thus, he says, one of the first occupations among men connected with those of actual necessity would be the perception of time periods, marked on the vaulted arch of the heavens, sprung and risen over the level floor of the horizon or the plain of still water. These would come to be marked as those of day and night, of the phases of the moon of its stellar or synodic revolutions, and of the period of the solar year with recurrence of the seasons, and with the application to such periods of the natural measure of day and night, or of the day divided into the light and the dark. It would also be discovered that there was a longest and shortest solar day, and two solar days of equal day and night within the period of the solar year. And the points in the year of these could be marked with the greatest precision in the starry groups of the heavens or the constellations, subject to that retrograde movement thereof, which in time would require a correction by 
intercalation, as was the case in the description of the flood, where correction of 150 days was made for a period of 600 years, during which confusion of landmarks had increased. This would naturally come to pass with all races in all time, and such knowledge must be taken to have been inherent in the human race, prior to what we call the historic period as during the same. On this basis, the author seeks for some natural physical function, possessed in common by the human race, and connected with the periodical manifestations, such that the connection between the two kinds of phenomena became fixed in common or popular usage. He finds it in A, the feminine physiological phenomena every lunar month of 28 days or four weeks of seven days each, so that 13 occurrences of the period should happen in 364 days, which is the solar week year of 52 weeks of seven days each. B, the quickening of the fetus is marked by a period of 126 days, or 18 weeks of seven days each. C, that period which is called the period of viability, is one of 210 days, or 30 weeks of seven days each. And D, the period of Parturition is accomplished in 280 days, or a period of 40 weeks of 7 days each, or 10 lunar months of 28 days each, or of 9 calendar months of 31 days each, continuing on the royal arch of heavens for the measure of the period of traverse from the darkness of the womb to the light and glory of conscious existence, that continuing unscrutable mystery and miracle. Thus, the observed periods of time marking the workings of the birth function would naturally become a basis of astronomical calculation. We may almost affirm that this was the mode of reckoning among all nations, either independently or intermediately and indirectly by tuition. It was the mode with the Hebrews, for even today they calculate the calendar by means of the 354 and 355 of the lunar year and we possess a special evidence that it was the mode with the ancient Egyptians, as to which this is the proof. The basic idea underlying the religious philosophy of the Hebrews was that God contained all things within himself, and that man was his image, man including woman. The place of the man and woman with the Hebrews was among the Egyptians occupied by the bull and the cow, sacred to Osiris and Isis who were represented, respectively, by a man having a bull's head and a woman having the head of a cow, which symbols were worshipped. Notoriously, Osiris was the sun and the river Nile, the tropical year of 365 days, which number is the value of the word Nilos, and the bull, as he was also the principle of fire and of life-giving force, while Isis was the moon, the bed of the Nile River, or the Mother Earth for the parturient energies of which water was a necessity, the lunar year of 354 to 364 days, the time maker of the periods of gestation, and the cow marked by, or with, the crescent new moon. But the use of the cow of the Egyptians for the woman of the Hebrews was not intended as any radical difference of signification, but a concurrence in the teaching intended and merely as a substitution of a symbol of common import, which was this, viz. the period of parturition with the cow and the woman was held to be the same or 280 days or 10 lunar months of four weeks each. And in this period consisted the essential value of this animal symbol, whose mark was that of the crescent moon. These parturient and Natural periods are found to have the subjects of symbolism all over the world. They were thus used by the Hindus and are found to be most plainly set forth by the ancient Americans in the Richardson and Guest tablets, in the Palenque Cross and elsewhere, and manifestly lay at the base of the formation of the calendar forms of the Mayas of Yucatan, the Hindus, the Assyrians, and the ancient Babylonians, as well as the Egyptians and Old Hebrews. The natural symbols would be either the phallus or the phallus and yoni, male and female. Indeed, the words translated by the generalizing terms male and female in the 27th verse of the first chapter of Genesis are sacra, and kabva, or literally phallus and yoni, 
While the representation of the phallic emblems would barely indicate the genital members of the human body, when their functions and the development of the seed vehicles emanating from them were considered, there would come into indication a mode of measures of lunar time and through lunar of solar time. This is the physiological or anthropological key to the moon symbol, the key that opens the mystery of theogony or the evolution of the Manvantaric gods is more complicated and has nothing phallic in it. There, all is mystical and divine, but the Jews, beyond connecting Jehovah directly with the moon as a generative god, preferred to ignore the higher hierarchies and have made their patriarchs of some of these zodiacal constellations and planetary gods, thus euhemerizing the purely theosophical idea and dragging it down to the level of sinful humanity. The MS, from which the above is extracted, explains very clearly to what hierarchy of gods Jehovah belonged and who this Jewish god was, for it shows in clear language that which the writer has always insisted upon. Namely, that the god with which the Christians have burdened themselves was no better than the lunar symbol of the reproductive or generative faculty in nature. They have ever ignored even the Hebrew secret god of the Kabbalists, Ein Suf, a conception as grand as Para Brahman in the earliest Kabbalistic and mystical ideas, but it is not the Kabbalah of Rosenroth that can ever give the true original teachings of Shimeon ben Yochai which were as metaphysical and philosophical as any could be. And how many are there among the students of the Kabbalah who know anything of them except in their distorted Latin translations? Let us glance at the idea which led the ancient Jews to adopt the substitute for the ever-unknowable, and which has mizzled the Christians into mistaking the substitute for the reality. If to these organs, phallus and yoni, are symbols of creative cosmic agencies, the idea of time periods can be attached, then indeed in the construction of temples as dwellings of Didi or of Jehovah, that part designated as the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place, should borrow its title from the recognized sacredness of the generative organs, considered as symbols of measure as well as creative cause. With the ancient wise, there was no name and no idea, and no symbol of a first cause. With the Hebrews, the indirect conception of such was couched in a term of negation of comprehension, viz. ein suf, or the without bounds. But the symbol of its first comprehensible manifestation was the conception of a circle with its diameter line, to at once carry a geometric, phallic, and astronomical idea. For the one takes its birth from the, the O, or the circle, without which it could not be, and from the I, or primal one, spring the nine digits, and geometrically all plane shapes. So in the Kabbalah, this circle with its diameter line is the picture of ten sephiroth, or emanations composing the Adam Kadmon, or the archetypal man, the creative origin of all things. This idea of connecting the picture of the circle and its diameter line, that is the number 10, with the signification of the reproductive organs and the most holy place was carried out constructively in the king's chamber, or holy of holies, of the great pyramid. In the tabernacle of Moses and in the holy of holies of the temple of Solomon. It is the picture of a double womb, for in Hebrew the letter he is at the same time the number 5, and the symbol of the womb, and twice five is ten, or the phallic number. This double womb also shows the duality of the idea carried from the highest or spiritual down to the lowest or terrestrial plane, and limited by the Jews to the latter. With them, therefore, the number seven has acquired the most prominent place in their exoteric religion, a cult of external forms and empty rituals. Take, for instance, their Sabbath, the seventh day, sacred to their deity, the moon, symbolical of the generative Jehovah. But with the other nations, the number seven was typical of theogenic evolution, of cycles, cosmic planes, and the seven forces and occult powers in cosmos as a boundless whole, whose first upper triangle was unreachable to the finite intellect of man.
while other nations therefore busied themselves in their forcible limitation of cosmos and space and time with only its septenary manifested plane, the Jews centered this number solely in the moon and based all their sacred calculations thereupon. Hence we find the thoughtful author of the MS just quoted remarking in reference to the meteorology of the Jews that if 20,612 be multiplied by four-thirds, the product will afford a base for the ascertainment of the mean revolution of the moon. And if this product be again multiplied by four-thirds, this continued product will afford a base for finding the exact period of the mean solar year. This form, becoming, for the finding of astronomical periods of time, a very great service. This double number, male and female, is symbolized also in some well-known idols. For instance, Ardhari Ishvara, the Isis of the Hindus, Iridanus or Arden of the Hebrew Jordan, or source of descent. She is standing on a lotus leaf floating on the water, but the signification is that it is androgyne or hermaphrodite, that is phallus and yoni combined, the number 10 the Hebrew letter Yod, the containment of Jehovah. She, or rather she, he, gives the minutes of the same circle of 360 degrees. Jehovah is, in its best aspect, is Bina, the upper mediating mother, the great sea or Holy Spirit, and therefore rather a synonym of Mary, the mother of Jesus, than of his father, that mother being the Latin mare, the sea is here, also Venus, the Stella de Mar, or Star of the Sea. The ancestors of the mysterious Akkadians, the Chandravanshas, or the Indovanshas, the lunar kings whom tradition shows reigning at Prayaga, Allahabad, ages before our era, had come from India, and brought with them the worship of their forefathers, of Soma and his son Buddha, which afterwards became that of the Chaldeans. Yet such adoration, apart from popular astrology and heliolatry, was in no sense idolatry. No more at any rate than the modern Roman Catholic symbolism, which connects the Virgin Mary, the Magna Mater of the Syrians and Greeks, with the moon. Of this worship the most pious Roman Catholics feel quite proud, and loudly confess to it. In a memoir to the French Academy, the Marquis de Merville says, It is only natural that, as an unconscious prophecy, Amun-Ra should be his mother's husband, since the Magna Mater of the Christians is precisely the spouse of that son she conceives. We, Christians, can understand now while Neith throws radiance on the sun, while remaining the moon, since the Virgin, who is the Queen of Heaven, as was Neith, clothes the Christ's son as does Neith, and is clothed by him, as is sung by the Roman Catholic during their service. We, Christians, understand how it is that the famous inscription at Sais should have stated that none have ever lifted my veil, peplum, considering that this sentence, literally translated, is the summary of what is sung in the church on the day of the Immaculate Conception. Surely nothing could be more sincere than this. It justifies entirely what Mr. Gerald Massey has said in his lecture on luniolatry, ancient and modern. The man in the moon, Osiris Sut, Jehovah Satan, Christ Judas, and other lunar twins is often charged with bad conduct. In the lunar phenomenon, the moon was, as the moon, which was twofold in sex and threefold in character, as mother, child, and adult male. Thus, the child of the moon became the consort of his own mother. It could not be helped if there was to be any reproduction. He was compelled to be his own father. These relationships were repudiated by later sociology, and the primitive man in the moon got tabooed. Yet, in its latest, most inexplicable phase, this has become the central doctrine of the grossest superstition in the world. For these lunar phenomena and their humanly represented relationships, the incestuous included, are the very foundation of the Christian trinity and unity. 
Through ignorance of the symbolism, the simply representation of early time has become the most profound religious mystery in modern luniolatry. The Roman Church, without being in any wise ashamed of the proof, portrays the Virgin Mary arrayed with the sun and the horned moon at her feet, holding the lunar infant in her arms as, as child and consort of the mother moon. The mother child and adult male are fundamental. In this way, it can be proved that our Christology is mummified mythology and legendary lore, which have been palmed off upon us in the Old Testament and the New as divine revelation uttered by the very voice of God. A charming allegory is found in the Zohar, one which unveils better than anything else ever did the true character of Jehovah, or YHVH, in the primitive conception of the Hebrew Kabbalists. It is now found in the philosophy of Ibn Gibral's Kabbalah, translated by Isaac Meyer, in the introduction written by R. Hizquia, which is very old and forms part of our Brody edition of the Zohar, is an account of a journey taken by R. Elazar, son of R. Shimon, B. Yohai, and R. Abba. They met a man bearing a heavy burden. They conversed together, and the explanations of the Thorah by the man with the burden were so wonderful that they asked him for his name. He replied, Do not ask me who I am. But we will all proceed with the explanation of the Thorah, law. They asked, Who caused thee thus to walk and carry such a heavy load? He answered, The letter, Yod, which equals ten, and is the symbolical letter of Kether, and the essence and germ of the holy name, YHVH, made war, etc. They said to him, If thou wilt tell us the name of thy father, we will kiss the dust of thy feet. He replied, As to my father, he had his dwelling in the great sea, and was a fish therein like Vishnu and Dagon or Ones, which first destroyed the great sea. And he was great and mighty and ancient of days, until he swallowed all the other fishes in the great sea. Our Eleazar listened to the words and said to him, Thou art the son of the holy flame, thou art the son of Rabham Huna Saba, the old, the fish in Aramaic or Chaldee is Nun, noon. Thou art the son of the light of the Thorah, Dharma, etc. Then the author explains that the feminine Sephira, Bina, is termed by the Kabbalists the Great Sea. Therefore, Bina, whose divine names are Jehovah, Yah, and Elohim, is simply the Chaldean Tiamat, the female power, the Thaleth of Berosus, who presides over the chaos and was made out later by Christian theology to be the serpent and the devil. She, he, Yahovah, is the supernal he and Eve. This Yahovah then, or Jehovah, is identical with our chaos, father, mother, son, on the material plane and in the purely physical world. Deuce and demon at one and the same time, the sun and moon, good and evil, God and demon. Lunar magnetism generates life, preserves and destroys it, psychically as well as physically. And if, astronomically, the moon is one of the seven planets of the ancient world, in theogony she is one of the regents thereof. With Christians now as much as with pagans, the former referring to under the name of their archangels, and the latter under that of one of their gods. Therefore, the meaning of the fairy tale, translated by Trollson, from the Arabic translation of the old Chaldean MS of Kutami, being instructed by the idol of the moon, is easily understood. Seldenus tells us the secret, as well as Mamonides in his Guide to the Perplexed. The worshippers of the Teraphim, or the Jewish oracles, carved images and claim that the light of the principal stars, planets, permeating these through and through, the angelic virtues or the regents of the stars and planets, conversed with them, teaching them many most useful things and arts. And Seldinus explained that the teraphim were built and composed after the position of certain planets, those which the Greeks called Otozella, and according to figures that were located in the sky, 
and called Alextampu, or the tutelary gods. Those who traced out these were called diviners by them. It is such sentences, however, in the Nabathean agriculture which have frightened the men of science and made them proclaim the work either of apocryphon or a fairy tale unworthy of the notice of an academician. At the same time as shown zealous Roman Catholics and Protestants metaphorically tore it to pieces, the former because it described the worship of demons, the latter because it was ungodly. Once more, all are wrong. It is not a fairy tale, and as far as the pious churchmen are concerned, the same worship may be shown in their scriptures, however disfigured by translation. Solar and lunar worship and also the worship of the stars and elements can be traced and figure in Christian theology. These are defended by papists and can be stoutly denied by the Protestants only at their own risk and peril. Two instances may be given. Ammianus Marcellinus teaches that ancient divinations were always accomplished with the help of the spirits of the elements, spiritus elementorum, and in Greek. But it is found that the planets and the elements and the zodiac were figured not only at Heliopolis by the twelve stones called mysteries of the elements, elementorum arcana, but also in Solomon's temple and as pointed out by various writers in several old Italian churches, and even at Notre Dame in Paris, where they can be seen to this day. No symbol, even including the sun, was more complex in its manifold meanings than the lunar symbol. The sex was, of course, dual. With some it was male, as for the instance the Hindu King Soma and the Chaldean Sin. With other nations it was female, the beauteous goddess Diana Luna, Elithia, Lucina, with the Tory human victims, were sacrificed to Artemis, a form of the lunar goddess. The Cretans called her Dictina, and the Medes and Persians Anatus, as shown by the inscription of Chloe. But we are now concerned chiefly with the most chaste and pure of the virgin goddesses, Luna Artemis, to whom Pampos was first to give the surname of, and to whom Hippolytus wrote, this Artemis Lokia, the goddess that presided at conception and childbirth, is in her functions, and as the triple Hecate, the Orphic Didi, the predecessor of the god of the rabbins and pre-Christian Kabbalists, and his lunar type. This goddess was the personified symbol of the various and successive aspects represented by the moon in each of her three phases. And this interpretation was already that of the Stoics, while the Orphians explained the epithet by the three kingdoms of nature over which she reigned. Jealous, bloodthirsty, revengeful, and exacting, Hecate Luna is a worthy counterpart of the jealous god of the Hebrew prophets. The whole riddle of the solar and lunar worship, as now traced in the churches, hangs indeed on this world-old mystery of lunar phenomena. The correlative forces in the Queen of Night that lie latent for modern science, but are fully active to the knowledge of Eastern adepts, explain well the thousand and one images under which the moon was represented by the ancients. It also shows how much more profoundly learned in the Selenic mysteries were the ancients than are now our modern astronomers. The whole pantheon of the lunar gods and goddesses, Nephthys or Neith, Proserpina, Melita, Cybele, Isis, Astarte, Venus, and Hecate on the one hand, and Apollo, Dionysus, Adonis, Bacchus, Osiris, Attis, Thamuz, etc. on the other, all show on the face of their names and titles those of sons and husbands of their mothers, their identity with the Christian trinity. In every religious system, the gods were made to merge their functions as father, son, and husband into one, and the goddesses were identified as wife, mother, and sister of the male god, the former synthesizing the human attributes as the son, the giver of life, the latter merging all the other titles in the grand synthesis known as Maya, Maya, Maria, etc., a generic name, Maya, 
in its force derivation has come to mean with the Greeks mother, from the root ma, nurse, and even gave its name to the month of May, which was sacred to all these goddesses before it became consecrated to Mary. Its primitive meaning, however, was Maya, Durga, translated by the Orientalists as inaccessible, but meaning in truth the unreachable, in the sense of illusion and unreality, as being the source and cause of spells, the personification of illusion. In religious rites, the moon served a dual purpose, personified as a female goddess for exoteric purposes, or as a male god in allegory and symbol. In occult philosophy, our satellite was regarded as a sexless potency to be well studied, because it was to be dreaded. With the initiated Aryans, Chaldeans, Greeks, and Romans, Soma, Sin, Artemis, Sotira, the hermaphrodite Apollo, whose attribute is the lyre, and the bearded Diana of the bow and arrow, Deuce Lunas, and especially Osiris Lunas and Thought Lunas, were the occult potencies of the moon. But whether male or female, whether Thought or Minerva, Soma or Astaroth, the moon is the occult mystery of mysteries, and more a symbol of evil than of good. Her seven phases in the original esoteric division are divided into three astronomical phenomena and four purely psychic phases. That the moon was not always reverenced is shown in the mysteries, in which the death of the moon god the three phases of gradual waning and final disappearance was allegorized by the moon standing for the genius of evil that for the time triumphs over the light and life-giving god, the sun. And all the skill and learning of the ancient hierophants in magic were required to turn this triumph into a defeat. It was the most ancient worship of all, that of the third race of our round, the hermaphrodites, in which the male moon became sacred, when, after the so-called fall, the sexes had become separated. Deus Lunas then became an androgyne, male and female in turn, to finally serve, for purposes of sorcery, as a dual power for the fourth root race, the Atlanteans. With the fifth, our own race, the lunar-solar warship divided the nations into two distinct, antagonistic camps. It led to events described aeons later in the Mahabharatan War which to the Europeans is the fabulous, to the Hindus and occultists the historical strife between the Servianches and the Indovanches. Originating in the dual aspect of the moon, the worship of the female and the male principles respectively, it ended in distinct solar and lunar cults. Among the Semitic races, the sun was for a very long time feminine and the moon masculine the latter notion being adopted by them from the Atlantean traditions. The moon was called the Lord of the Sun, Bel Shemesh, before the Shemesh worship. The ignorance of the incipient reasons for such a distinction and of occult principles led the nations into anthropomorphic idol worship. During that period, which is absent from the Mosaic books, these, from the exile from Eden to the allegorical flood, the Jews, with the rest of the Semites, worshipped Dionysi, the ruler of men, the judge, or the sun. Though the Jewish canon and Christianism have made the sun to become the Lord God and Jehovah in the Bible, yet the same Bible is full of indiscreet traces of the androgyn deity, which was Jehovah, the sun, and Ashtoreth, the moon in its female aspect, and quite free from the present metaphorical element given to it. God is a consuming fire, appears in and is encompassed by fire. It was not only envisioned that Ezekiel saw the Jews worshipping the sun. The Baal of the Israelites, the Shemesh of the Moabites, and the Moloch of the Ammonites was the identical son Jehovah, and he is still now the king of the host of heaven. The sun, as much as Ashtaroth, was the queen of heaven or the moon. The sun of righteousness has only now become a metaphorical expression. But the religion of every ancient nation had been primarily based upon the occult manifestations of a purely abstract force or principle now called God. 
very establishment of such worship shows in its details and rites that the philosophers who evolved such systems of nature, subjective and objective, possessed profound knowledge and were acquainted with many facts of a scientific nature. For besides being purely a cult, the rites of lunar worship were based, as just shown, upon a knowledge of physiology, quite a modern science with us, psychology, sacred mathematics, geometry, and metrology, and their right applications to symbols and figures, which are but glyphs recording observed and natural and scientific facts, in short, upon a most minute and profound knowledge of nature. As we have just said, lunar magnetism generates life, preserves, and destroys it, and Soma embodies the triple power of the Trimurti, though it remains unrecognized by the profane to this day. The allegory that makes Soma, the moon, produced by the churning of the ocean of life, space, by the gods in another man, Ventara, that is, in the pre-genetic day of our planetary system, and the myth which represents the Rishis milking the earth, whose calf was Soma, the moon, have a deep cosmographical meaning. For it is neither our earth, which is milk, nor was the moon, which we know the calf. Had our wise men of science known as much of the mysteries of nature as the ancient Aryans did, they would surely never have imagined that the moon was projected from the earth. Once more, the oldest of permutations in theogony, the son becoming his own father, and the mother generated by the son, has to be remembered and taken into consideration if the symbolical language of the ancients is to be understood by us. Otherwise, mythology will ever be haunting the Orientalist as simply the disease which springs up at a peculiar stage of human culture, as Renouf gravely observes. The ancients taught the auto-generation, so to speak, of the gods, the one divine essence, unmanifested, perpetually begetting a second self, manifested, which second self, androgynous in its nature, gives birth in an immaculate way to everything macrocosmical and microcosmical in this universe. This was shown in the circle in the diameter, or the sacred ten, a few pages back. But our Orientalists, notwithstanding their extreme desire to discover our homogeneous element in nature, will not see it. Cramped in their researchers by such ignorance, the Arianists and Egyptologists are constantly led astray from truth in their speculations. Thus, de Rouge is unable to understand, in the text which he translates, the meaning of Amun-Ra saying to King Amenophis, who is supposed to be Memnon, Thou art my son, I have begotten thee. And finding the same idea in many a text and under various forms, this very Christian Orientalist is finally compelled to exclaim. For this idea to have entered the mind of a hierogrammatist, there must have been in their religion a more or less defined doctrine, indicating as a possible fact that might come to pass a divine and immaculate incarnation under a human form. Precisely. But why throw the explanation onto an impossible prophecy when the whole secret is explained by the later religion copying the earlier? This doctrine was universal, nor was it the mind of any one hierogrammatist that evolved it, for the Indian avatars are a proof to the contrary, after which, having come to realize more clearly what the Divine Father and Son were with the Egyptians, De Rouge still fails to account for and to perceive what were the functions attributed to the feminine principle in that primordial generation. He does not find it in the goddess Neith of Sais, yet he quotes the sentence of the commander of Tecambesis when introducing that king into the Satic temple. I made known to his majesty the dignity of Sais, which is the abode of Neith, the great female producer genetrix of the sun, who is the firstborn and who is not begotten, but only brought forth, and hence is the fruit of an immaculate mother. How much more grandiose, philosophical, and poetical, for whoever is able to understand and appreciate it, is the real distinction made between the immaculate virgin of the ancient pagans and the modern papal conception. But the former, the ever-youthful mother nature, the antitype of her prototypes, the sun and moon, 
generates and brings forth her mind-born sun, the universe. The sun and moon, as male-female deities, fructify the earth, the microcosmical mother, and the latter conceives and brings forth in her turn. With the Christians, the firstborn, primogenitus, is indeed generated, i.e. begotten, genitus, non-factus, and positively conceived and brought forth. Virgo periat, explains the Latin church. Thus, does that church drag down the noble spiritual idea of the Virgin Mary to the earth, and making her of the earth earthly, degrades the idea she portrays to the lowest of the anthropomorphic goddesses of the rabble. Truly, Neith, Isis, Diana, etc., by whatever name she was called, was a demiurgical goddess, at once visible and invisible, having her place in heaven and helping on the generation of species. The moon, in short. Her occult aspects and powers are numberless, and in one of them, the moon becomes with the Egyptians Hathor, another aspect of Isis, and both of these goddesses are shown suckling Horus. Behold, in the Egyptian Hall of the British Museum, Hathor worshipped by Pharaoh Thotmes, who stands between her and the Lord of Heavens. The monolith was taken from Karnak. The same goddess has the following legend inscribed on her throne. The Divine Mother and Lady, or Queen of Heaven, also the Morning Star and the Light of the Sea, Stella Mututina and Lux Maris. All the lunar goddesses had a dual aspect, one divine, the other infernal. All were the virgin mothers of an immaculately born sun, the sun. Raoul Rochette shows the moon goddess of the Athenians, Pallas, or Sibyl, Minerva, or again Diana, holding her child son on her lap, invoked in her festivals as the one mother of God, sitting on a lion and surrounded by twelve personages, in whom the occultist recognizes the twelve great gods, and the pious Christian Orientalist the apostles, or rather the Grecian pagan prophecy thereof. They are both right for the immaculate goddess of the Latin church is a faithful copy of the older pagan goddesses. The number of the apostles of that which is twelve tribes, and the latter are a personification of the twelve great gods, and of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Almost every detail in the Christian dogma is borrowed from the heathens. Samil, the wife of Jupiter and mother of Bacchus, the sun is, according to Nonus, also carried or made to ascend to heaven after her death, where she presides between Mars and Venus under the name of the Queen of the World, or the Universe, at the name of which, as at the names of Hathor, Hecate, and other infernal goddesses, all the demons tremble. This Greek inscription on a small temple reproduced on a stone that, found by Beggar and copied by Montfaucon, as de Merville tells us, informs us of the stupendous fact that the Magna Mater of the Old World was an impudent plagiarism of the Immaculate Virgin Mother of his Church, perpetrated by the demon. Whether so or vice versa is of no importance. That which is interesting to note is the perfect identity between the archaic copy and the modern original. Did space permit, we might show the inconceivable coolness and unconcerned exhibited by certain followers of the Roman Catholic Church when they are made to face the revelations of the past. To Mori's remark that the Virgin took possession of all the sanctuaries of Ceres and Venus, and that the pagan rites proclaimed and practiced in honor of these goddesses were in a great measure transferred to the Mother of Christ. The advocate of Rome answers, that such is the fact, and that it is just as it should be and quite natural. As the dogma, the liturgy, and the rites professed by the Roman Apostolical Church in 1862 are found engraved on monuments, inscribed on papyri, and cylinders hardly posterior to the deluge, it does seem impossible to deny the existence of a first anti-historical Roman Catholicism of which our own is but the faithful continuation. But while the former was the culmination, the summum of the impudence of demons and goetic necromancy, the latter is divine. If in our Christian revelation, 
the apocalypse, Mary clothed with the sun and having the moon under her feet, has no longer anything in common with the hunted servant, Servant of Nazareth. It is because she has now become the greatest of theological and cosmological powers in our universe. Verily so, since Pindar thus signs of her assumption. She sits at the right hand of her father, Jupiter, and is more powerful than all the other angels or gods, a hymn likewise applied to the Virgin. St. Bernard also, quoted by Cornelius Alapide, is made to address the Virgin Mary in this wise. The Son Christ lives in thee, and thou livest in him. Again, the Virgin is admitted to be the moon by the same unsophisticated holy man. Being the Lucina of the Church, in childbirth, the verse of Virgil, casta fov Lucina, tu yam regnat Apollo, is applied to her. Like the moon, the Virgin is the Queen of Heaven, adds the innocent saint. This settles the question. According to such writers as de Merville, the more similarity there exists between the pagan conceptions and the Christian dogmas, the more divine appears the Christian religion and the more it is seen to be the only true inspired one, especially in its Roman Catholic form. The unbelieving scientists and academicians who think they see in the Latin Church quite the opposite of divine inspiration, and who will not believe in the satanic tricks of plagiarism by anticipation, are severely taken to task. But then they believe in nothing and reject even the Nabathean agriculture as a romance and a pack of superstitious nonsense, complains the memorialist. In their perverted opinion, Kutami's idol of the moon and the statue of the Madonna are one. A noble marquis 25 years ago wrote six huge volumes, or as he calls them, memoirs to the French Academy, with the sole object of proving Roman Catholicism to be inspired and revealed faith. As a proof thereof, he furnishes numberless facts, all tending to show that the entire ancient world, ever since the deluge, had, with the help of the devil, been systematically plagiarizing the rites, ceremonies, and dogmas of the future Holy Church, which has to be born ages later. What would that faithful son of Rome have said had he heard his co-religionist, Mr. Renouf, the distinguished Egyptologist of the British Museum, declaring in one of his learned lectures that neither Hebrews nor Greeks borrowed any of their ideas from Egypt. But perhaps Mr. Renouf intended to say that it was the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Aryans who borrowed their ideas from the Latin Church. And if so, why, in the name of logic, do the Papists reject the additional information which the occultists may give them on moon worship? since it all tends to show that the worship of the Roman Catholic Church is as old as the world, of Sabiism and astrology. The reason of early Christian and later Roman Catholic astrology, or the symbolical worship of sun and moon and a worship identical with that of the Gnostics, though less philosophical and pure than the sun worship of the Zoroastrians, is a natural consequence of its birth and origin. The adoption by the Latin Church of such symbols as fire, water, sun, moon, and stars, and many others, is simply a continuation by the early Christians of the old worship of pagan nations. Thus, Odin got his wisdom, power, and knowledge by sitting at the feet of Mimir, the thrice-wise Wyotan, who passed his life by the fountain of primeval wisdom, the crystalline waters of which increased his knowledge daily. Mimer drew the highest knowledge from the fountain, because the world was born of water, hence primeval wisdom was to be found in that mysterious element. The eyes which Odin had to pledge to acquire that knowledge may be the sun, which enlightens and penetrates all things, his other eye being the moon, whose reflection gazes out of the deep, and which at last, when setting, sinks into the ocean. But it is something more than this. Loki, the fire god, is said to have hidden in the water, as well as in the moon, the light giver, whose reflection he found therein. This belief that the fire finds refuge in the water was not limited to the old Scandinavians. It was shared by all nations and was finally adopted by the early Christians, who symbolized the Holy Ghost under the shape of fire, cloven tongues like as of fire, the breath of the Father-Son. 
This fire descends also into the water, or the sea, Mare, Mary. The dove was the symbol of the soul with several nations. It was sacred to Venus. The goddess born from the sea foam and had become later the symbol of the Christian anima mundi, or Holy Spirit. One of the most occult chapters in the Book of the Dead is that entitled The Transformation into the God Living Light to the Path of Darkness, wherein woman light of the shadow serves thought in his retreat in the moon. Thought Hermes is said to hide therein because he is the representative of the secret wisdom. He is the manifested logos of his light side, the concealed deity or dark wisdom, when he is supposed to retire to the opposite hemisphere. Speaking of her power, the moon calls herself repeatedly, the light which shineth in the darkness, the woman light. Hence it became the accepted symbol of all the virgin mother goddesses. As the wicked evil spirits warred against the moon in days of yore, so they are supposed to war now, without, however, being able to prevail against the actual queen of heaven, Mary the moon. Hence also the moon was intimately connected in all the pagan theogenies with the dragon, her eternal enemy. The virgin, or Madonna, stands on the mythical Satan thus symbolized, who lies crushed and powerless under her feet. This because the head and tail of the dragon, which to this day in Eastern astronomy represents the ascending and descending nodes of the moon, were also symbolized in ancient Greece by the two serpents. Hercules kills them on the day of his birth, and so does the babe in his virgin mother's arms. As Mr. Gerald Massey aptly observes in this connection, all such symbols figured their own facts from the first and did not prefigure others of a totally different order. The iconography and dogmas, too, had survived in Rome from a period remotely pre-Christian. There was neither forgery nor interpolation of types, nothing but a continuity of imagery with a perversion of its meaning. Section 10. Tree, Serpent, and Crocodile Worship Object of horror or of adoration, men have for the serpent an implacable hatred, or prostrate themselves before its genius. Lie calls it, prudence claims it, envy carries it in its heart, and eloquence on its caduceus. In hell it arms the whip of the furies, in heaven eternity makes of its symbol. De Chateaubriand The Ophites asserted that there were several kinds of genie from God to man, that the relative superiority of these was decided by the degree of light that was accorded to each, and they maintained that the serpent had to be constantly called upon and to be thanked for the signal service it had rendered humanity, for it taught Adam that if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would raise his being immensely by the learning and wisdom he would thus acquire. Such was the exoteric reason given. It is easy to see whence is the primal idea of the dual Janus-like character of the serpent, the good and the bad. The symbol is one of the most ancient, because the reptile preceded the bird and the bird the mammal. Hence the belief, or rather the superstition, of the savage tribes who think that the souls of their ancestors live under this form, and the general association of the serpent with the tree. The legends about the various meanings it represents are numberless, but as most of them are allegorical, they have now passed into the class of fables based on ignorance and dark superstition. For instance, when Philostratus narrates that the natives of India and Arabia fed on the heart and liver of serpents in order to learn the language of all the animals, the serpent being credited with that faculty he certainly never meant his words to be accepted literally. As will be found more than once as we proceed, serpent and dragon were names given to the wise ones, the initiated adepts of olden times. It was their wisdom and their learning that were devoured or assimilated by their followers, whence the allegory. When the Scandinavian Sigurd is fabled to have roasted the heart of Fafnir, the dragon, whom he had slain, and thence to have become the wisest of men, the meaning is the same. Sigurd had become learned in the runes and magical charms. 
He had received the word from an initiate of the name of Fafnir, or from a sorcerer, after which the latter died, as do many after passing the word. Epiphanius lets out a secret of the Gnostics in trying to expose their heresies. The Gnostic Ophites, he says, had a reason for honoring the serpent. It was because he taught the primeval men the mysteries. Verily so. But they did not have Adam and Eve in the garden in their minds when teaching this dogma, but simply that which is stated above. The Nagas of the Hindu and Tibetan adepts were human Nagas, serpents, not reptiles. Moreover, the serpent has ever been the type of consecutive or serial rejuvenation of immortality and time. The numerous and extremely interesting readings, the interpretations and facts about serpent worship, given in Mr. Gerald Massey's Natural Genesis, are very ingenious and scientifically correct. But they are far from covering the whole of the meanings implied. They divulge only the astronomical and physiological mysteries, with the addition of some cosmic phenomena. On the lowest plane of materiality, the serpent was, no doubt, the great emblem of mystery in the mysteries, and was, very likely, adopted as a type of feminine pubescence, on account of its sloughing and self-renewal. It was so, however, only with regard to mysteries concerning terrestrial animal life, for as the symbol of reclothing and rebirth in the universal mysteries, its final phase, or shall we rather say its incipient and culminating phases, was not of this plane. These phases were generated in the pure realm of ideal light, and have accomplished the round of the whole cycle of adaptations and symbolism, the mysteries returned from whence they had come, into the essence of immaterial causality. They belonged to the highest gnosis, and surely this could have never obtained its name and fame solely on account of its penetration into physiological and especially feminine functions. As a symbol, the serpent had as many aspects and occult meanings as the tree itself, the tree of life, with which it was emblematically and almost indissolubly connected. Whether viewed as a metaphysical or a physical symbol, the tree and serpent, jointly or separately, have never been so degraded by antiquity as they are now. In this our age of the breaking of idols, not for truth's sake, but to glorify the most gross matter, the revelations and interpretations in General Forlong's Rivers of Life would have astounded the worshippers of the tree and serpent in the days of archaic Chaldean and Egyptian wisdom. And even the early Shevas would have recoiled in horror at the theories and suggestions of the author of the said work. The notion of pain knight and in man that the cross or tau is simply a copy of the male organs in a triadic form is radically false, writes Mr. G. Massey, who proves what he says. But this is a statement that could be as justly applied to almost all the modern interpretations of ancient symbols. The natural genesis, a monumental work of research and thought, the most complete on that subject that has ever been published, covering as it does a wider field, and explaining much more than all the symbologists who have hitherto written, does not yet go beyond the psychotheistic stage of ancient thought. Nor were Pain Knight and In Men altogether wrong except in entirely failing to see that their interpretations of the tree of life, as the cross and phallus, fitted the symbol only in the lowest and latest stage of the evolutionary development of the idea of the giver of life. It was the last and the grossest physical transformation of nature, in animal, insect, bird, and even plant, for biune creative magnetism, in the form of the attraction of contraries, or sexual polarization acts in the constitution of reptile and bird as it does in that of man. Moreover, the modern symbologists and orientalists, from first to last, being ignorant of the real mysteries revealed by occultism, can necessarily see but this last stage. If told that this mode of procreation, which the whole world of being has now in common on this earth, is but a passing phase, a physical means of furnishing the conditions to and producing the phenomena of life, and that it will alter with this and disappear with the next root race, 
They would laugh at such a superstitious and unscientific idea. But the most learned occultists assert this because they know it. The universe of living things, of all those which procreate their species, is the living witness to the various modes of procreation in the evolution of animal and human species and races. And the naturalist ought to sense this truth intuitionally, even though he is yet unable to demonstrate it. How could he, indeed, with the present modes of thought? The landmarks of the archaic history of the past are few and scarce, and those that men of science come across are mistaken for finger posts of our little era. Even so-called universal history embraces but a tiny field in the almost boundless space of the unexplored regions of our latest fifth root race. Hence every fresh signpost, every new glyph of the hoary past that is discovered, is added to the old stock of information to be interpreted on the same lines of pre-existing conceptions, and without any reference to the special cycle of thought which that particular glyph may belong to. How can truth ever come to light if this method is never changed? Thus, in the beginning of their joint existence as a glyph of immortal being, the tree and serpent were divine imagery, truly. The tree was reversed and its roots were generated in heaven and grew out of the rootless root of all being. Its trunk grew and developed, causing the plains of the Pleroma. It shot out crossways its luxuriant branches, first on the plane of hardly differentiated matter, and then downward till they touched the terrestrial plane. Thus, the Ashvada, tree of life and being, whose destruction alone leads to immortality, is said in the Bhagavad Gita to grow with its roots above and its branches below. The roots represent the supreme being, or first cause, the logos. But one has to go beyond those roots to unite oneself with Krishna, who says Arjuna is greater than Brahman, the first cause, the indestructible, that which is, that which is not and what is beyond them. Its boughs are Hiranyagarbha, Brahma, or Brahman, in its highest manifestations, say Sridhara, Svaman, and Madhusudana, the highest Yan Chohans or Divas. The Vedas are its leaves. He only goes beyond the roots, shall never return. That is to say, shall reincarnate no more during this age of Brahma. It is only when its pure boughs had touched the terrestrial mud of the Garden of Eden, of our Adamic race, that this tree became soiled by the contact and lost its pristine purity, and that the serpent of eternity, the heaven-born Logos, was finally degraded. In days of old, of the divine dynasties on earth, the now dreaded reptile was regarded as the first beam of light that radiated from the abyss of divine mystery. Various were the forms with which it was made to assume, and numerous the natural symbols adapted to it, as it crossed the aeons of time, as from infinite time, Kala itself fell into the space and time evolved out of human speculation. These forms were cosmic and astronomical, theistic and pantheistic, abstract and concrete. They became in turn the polar dragon and the southern cross the Alpha Draconis of the Pyramid, and the Hindu Buddhist dragon, which ever threatens yet never swallows the sun during its eclipses. Till then the tree remained evergreen, for it was sprinkled by the waters of life. The great dragon remained ever divine, so long as it was kept within the precincts of the sidereal fields. But the tree grew and its lower boughs at last touched the infernal regions, our earth, then the great serpent Nidhogg, he who devours the corpses of the evildoers in the hall of misery, human life, so soon as they are plunged into Hurgelmir, the roaring cauldron of human passions, gnawed the reversed world tree. The worms of materiality covered the once healthy and mighty roots, and are now ascending higher and higher along the trunk, while the Midgard snake coiled at the bottom of the seas and circles the earth and through its venomous breath, makes her powerless to defend herself. The dragons and serpents of antiquity are all seven-headed, one head for each race, and every head with seven hairs on it, as the allegory has it. 
I, from Ananta, the serpent of eternity, which carries Vishnu through the Manvantara, from the original primordial Shisha, whose seven heads become one thousand heads in the Puranic fancy, down to the seven-headed Akkadian serpent. This typifies the seven principles throughout nature and in man, the highest or middle head being the seventh. It is not of the Mosaic, Jewish Sabbath that Philo speaks in his creation of the world, when saying that the world was completed according to the perfect nature of number six. For when that reason, nous, which is holy in accordance with the number seven, has entered the soul, the living body rather, the number six is thus arrested in all the mortal things which that number makes. And again, number seven is the festival day of all the earth, the birthday of the world. I know not whether anyone would be able to celebrate the number seven in adequate terms. The author of the Natural Genesis thinks that the septenary of stars seen in the Great Bear, the Saptarshish, and seven-headed dragon furnished a visible origin for the symbolic seven of time above. The goddess of the seven stars was the mother of time, as Kep, whence Kepti and Septi, for the two times and number seven. So this is the star of the seven by name. Sevak, Kronos, the son of the goddess, has the name of the seven or seventh. So has Sefek Abu, who builds the house on high, as wisdom, Sophia, built hers with seven pillars. The primary chronotypes were seven, and thus the beginning of time in heaven is based on the number and the name of seven, on account of the starry demonstrators. The seven stars, as they turned round annually, kept pointing, as it were, with the forefinger of the right hand, and describing a circle in the upper and lower heaven. The number seven naturally suggests a measure by seven that led to what may be termed sevening, and to the marking and mapping of the circle in seven corresponding divisions, which were assigned to the seven great constellations. And thus was formed the celestial heptanimus of Egypt in the heavens. When the stellar heptanimus is broken up and divided into four quarters, it was multiplied by four and the 28 signs took the place of the primary seven constellations. The lunar zodiac of 28 signs being the registered result of reckoning 28 days to the moon, or a lunar month. In the Chinese arrangement, the four sevens are given to four genii that preside over the four cardinal points, or rather the seven northern constellations make up the black warrior. The seven eastern, Chinese autumn, constitute the white tiger. The seven southern are the vermilion bird, and the seven western, called vernal, are the azure dragon. Each of these four spirits preside over its heptanimus during one lunar week. The genetrix of the first heptanimus, Typhon of the seven stars, now took a lunar character. In this phase, we find the goddess Sephic, whose name signifies number seven, is the feminine word, or logos, in place of the mother of time who was the earlier word as goddess of the seven stars. The author shows that it was the goddess of the great bear and mother of time who was in Egypt from the earliest times the living word, and that Sevek, Kronos, whose type was the crocodile dragon, the preplanetary form of Saturn, was called her son and consort. He was her word logos. The above is quite plain, but it was not the knowledge of astronomy only that led the ancients to the process of sevening. The primal cause goes far deeper and will be explained in its place. The above quotations are no digressions. They are brought forward as showing A, the reason why a full initiate was called a dragon, a snake, a naga, and B, that our septenary division was used by the priests of the earlier dynasties in Egypt for the same reason, and on the same basis as by us. This needs further elucidation, however. As already stated, what Mr. Gerald Massey calls the four genii of the four cardinal points, and the Chinese, the black warrior, white tiger, vermilion bird, and azure dragon, are called in the secret books the four hidden dragons of wisdom, and the celestial nagas. Now the seven-headed or septenary dragon logos is shown to have, in course of time, 
been split up, so to speak, into four heptonomic parts, or 28 portions. Each week has a distinct occult character in the lunar month. Each day of the 28 has its special characteristics. For each of the 12 constellations, whether separately or in combination with other signs, has an occult influence either for good or for evil. This represents the sum of knowledge that men can acquire on this earth. Yet few are those who acquire it, and still fewer are the wise men who get to the root of knowledge symbolized by the great root dragon. The spiritual logos of these visible signs, but those who do receive the name of dragons, and they are arhats of the four truths of the 28 faculties, or attributes, and have always been so called. The Alexandrian Neoplatonists asserted that to become real Chaldees, or Magi, one had to master the science or knowledge of the periods of the seven rectors of the world, in whom is all wisdom. And Iamblichus is credited with another vision, which does not, however, alter the meaning, for he says, The Assyrians have not only preserved the records of seven and twenty-eight myriads of years, as Hipparchus says they have, but likewise of the whole apocastases and periods of the seven rulers of the world. The legends of every nation and tribe, whether civilized or savage, point to the one universal belief in the great wisdom and cunning of the serpents. They are charmers. They hypnotize the bird with their eye, and man himself very often does not overcome their fascinating influence. Therefore, the symbol is a most fitting one. The crocodile is the Egyptian dragon. It was the dual symbol of heaven and earth, of sun and moon, and was made sacred in consequence of its amphibious nature to Osiris and Isis. According to Eusebius, the Egyptians represented the sun in a ship as its pilot, the ship being carried along by a crocodile. To show the motion of the sun in the moist space, the crocodile was, moreover, the symbol of Lower Egypt herself the lower being the more swampy of the two countries. The alchemists claim another interpretation. They say that the symbol of the sun and the ship on the ether of space meant that the hermetic matter is the principle or basis of gold, or again, the philosophical sun. The water within which the crocodile is swimming is that water or matter made liquid. The ship herself, finally representing the vessel of nature, in which the sun, or the sulfuric igneous principle, acts as a pilot, because it is the sun which conducts the work by its action upon the moist or mercury. The above is only for the alchemists. The serpent became the type and symbol of evil and of the devil. Only during the Middle Ages, the early Christians, as well as the Ophite Gnostics, had their dual logos, the good and the bad serpent. The Agathodemon and the Cacodemon. This is demonstrated by the writings of Marcus, Valentinus, and many others, and especially in Pistis Sophia, certainly a document of the earliest centuries of Christianity. On the marble sarcophagus of a tomb discovered in 1852 near the Porta Pia, one sees the scene of the adoration of the Magi, or else, remarks the late C.W. King in the Gnostics and the Remains. The prototype of that scene, the birth of the new sun, the mosaic floor exhibited a curious design which might have represented either Isis suckling the babe Harpocrates or the Madonna nursing the infant Jesus. In the smaller sarcophagi that surrounded the larger one, many leaden plates rolled like scrolls were found, eleven of which can still be deciphered. The contents of these ought to be regarded as final proof of a much vexed question, for they show that either the early Christians up to the 6th century were bona fide pagans, or that dogmatic Christianity was borrowed wholesale and passed in full into the Christian church, sun, tree, serpent, crocodile, and all. On the first is seen Anubis holding out a scroll. At his feet are two female busts. Below, all are two serpents entwined about. A corpse swathed up like a mummy. In the second scroll is Anubis holding out a cross, the sign of life. Under his feet lies the corpse encircled in the numerous folds of a huge serpent. 
the Agathodemon, guardian of the deceased. In the third scroll, the same Anubis bears on his arm an oblong object, held so as to convert the outline of the figure into a complete Latin cross. At the god's foot is a rhomboid, the Egyptian egg of the world, towards which crawls a serpent coiled into a circle. Under the busts is the letter W, repeated seven times in a line, remaining one of the names, and very remarkable also is the line of characters, apparently palmarine, upon the legs of the first Anubis. As for the figure of the serpent, supposing these talismans to emanate not from the Isaic, but the newer Ophite creed, it may well stand for that true and perfect serpent, who leads forth the souls of all that put their trust in him out of the Egypt of the body, and through the Red Sea of Death into the land of promise, saving them on their way from the serpents of the wilderness, that is, from the rulers of the stars. And this true and perfect serpent is the seven-lettered God who is now credited with being Jehovah, and Jesus one with him. To this seven-voweled God, the candidate for initiation is sent by the first mystery in the Pistis Sophia, a work earlier than St. John's Revelation and evidently of the same school. The serpent of the seven thunders uttered these seven vowels, but seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not, says Revelation. Do ye seek after these mysteries, inquires Jesus in Pistis Sophia? No mystery is more excellent than they, the seven vowels, for they shall bring your souls into the light of light, i.e. true wisdom. Nothing, therefore, is more excellent than the mysteries which ye seek after, saving only the mystery of the seven vowels, and their forty and nine powers, and the numbers thereof. In India, it was the mystery of the seven fires, and their forty-nine fires, or aspects, or the numbers thereof. The seven vowels are represented by the svastika signs on the crowns of the seven heads of the serpent of eternity. In India, among esoteric Buddhists, in Egypt, in Chaldea, etc. And among the initiates of every other country, they are the seven zones of post-mortem ascent in the hermetic writings, in each of which the mortal leaves one of his souls or principles until arrived on the plane above all zones. He remains as the great formless serpent of absolute wisdom, or the deity itself. The seven-headed serpent has more than one signification of the arcane teachings. It is the seven-headed Draco, each of whose heads is a star of a lesser bear. But it was also, and preeminently, the serpent of darkness, inconceivable and incomprehensible, whose seven heads were the seven logi, the reflections of the one and first manifested light. The Universal Logos. Section 11. Demon es Deus Inversus. The symbolical sentence in its many-sided forms is certainly most dangerous and iconoclastic in the face of all the dualistic later religions, or rather theologies, and especially so in the light of Christianity. Yet it is neither just nor correct to say that it is Christianity which has conceived and brought forth Satan. As an adversary, the opposing power required by the equilibrium and harmony of things in nature, as shadow is required to make still brighter the light, as night to bring into greater relief the day, and as cold to make one appreciate the more the comfort of heat, so has Satan ever existed. Homogeneity is one and indivisible. But if the homogeneous one and absolute is no mere figure of speech, and if heterogeneity in its dualistic aspect is its offspring, its bifurcurous shadow or reflection, then even that divine homogeneity must contain in itself the essence of both good and evil. If God is absolute, infinite, and the universal root of all and everything in nature and its universe, whence comes evil or devil, if not from the same golden womb of the absolute? Thus we are forced either to accept the emanation of good and evil, of agathodemon and cacodemon as offshoots from the same trunk of the tree of being, 
or to resign ourselves to the absurdity of believing in two eternal absolutes. Having to trace the origin of the idea to the very beginnings of the human mind, it is but just, meanwhile, to give his due even to the proverbial devil. Antiquity knew of no isolated, thoroughly and absolutely bad god of evil. Pagan thought represented good and evil as twin brothers, born from the same mother, nature. So soon as that thought ceased to be archaic, wisdom passed into philosophy. In the beginning, the symbols of good and evil were mere abstractions, light and darkness. Later, their types were chosen among the most natural and ever-recurrent periodical cosmic phenomena, the day and the night, or the sun and the moon. Then the hosts of the solar and lunar deities were made to represent them, and the dragon of darkness was contrasted with the dragon of light. The host of Satan is a son of God, no less than the host of the Bani Alhim, the children of God who came to present themselves before the Lord, their father. The sons of God became the fallen angels, only after perceiving that the daughters of men were fair. In the Indian philosophy, the Sarasi are among the earliest and the brightest gods and became Azuras only when dethroned by Brahmanical fancy. Satan never assumed an anthropomorphic, individualized shape until the creation by man of a one living personal god had been accomplished, and then merely as a matter of prime necessity. A screen was needed, a scapegoat to explain the cruelty, blunders, and but too evident injustice perpetrated by him for whom absolute perfection, mercy, and goodness were claimed. This was the first karmic effect of abandoning a philosophical and logical pantheism to build, as a prop for lazy man, a merciful father in heaven, whose daily and hourly actions, as natura, naturens, the comely mother but stone cold, belie the assumption. This led to the primal twins, Osiris, Typhon, Urmazd, Araman, and finally Cain Abel, and the tutti quanti of contraries. Having commenced by being synonymous with nature, God, the creator, ended by being made its author. Haskell settles this difficulty very cunningly by saying, Nature has perfections in order to show that she is the image of God, and defects in order to show that she is only his image. The further back one recedes into the darkness of the prehistoric ages, the more philosophical does the prototype figure of the later Satan appear. The first adversary in, in individual human form that one meets with in old Puranic literature is one of her greatest rishis and yogis, Narada, surnamed the Strife Maker. And he is a Brahmaputra, a son of Brahma, the male. But of him later on, who the great deceiver really is, one can ascertain by searching for him with open eyes and an unprejudiced mind, in every old cosmogony in scripture. It is the anthropomorphized demiurge, the creator of heaven and earth, when separated from the collective hosts of his fellow creators, whom, so to speak, he represents and synthesizes. It is now the god of theologies, the wish is to father to the thought. Once upon a time, a philosophical symbol left to perverse human fancy, afterwards fashioned into fiendish, deceiving, cunning, and jealous god. As the dragons and other fallen angels are described in other parts of this work, a few words upon the much slandered Satan will be sufficient. The student will do well to remember that, with every people except with Christian nations, the devil is to this day no worse an entity than the opposite aspect, in the dual nature of the so-called creator, this is only natural. One cannot claim God as the synthesis of the whole universe, as omnipresent and omniscient and infinite, and then divorce him from evil. As there is far more evil than good in the world, it follows on logical grounds that either God must include evil, or stand as the direct cause of it, or else surrender his claims to absoluteness. The ancients understood this so well that their philosophers, now followed by the Kabbalists, defined evil as the lining of good or God. 
Demon est deus inversus, being a very old adage. Indeed, evil is but an antagonizing blind force in nature. It is reaction, opposition, and contrast. Evil for some, good for others. There is no malum in se, only the shadow of light, without which light could have no existence, even in our perceptions. If evil disappeared, good would disappear along with it from earth. The old dragon was pure spirit before he became matter, passive before he became active. In the Srio Chaldean magic, both Ophis and Ophiomorphus are joined in the zodiac in the sign of the androgyne Virgo Scorpio. Before its fall on earth, the serpent was Ophis Christos, and after its fall, it became Ophimorphos Christos. Everywhere, the speculations of the Kabbalists treat of evil as a force, which is antagonistic, but at the same time essential to good, as giving it vitality and existence, which it could never have otherwise. There would be no life possible in the Mayavec sense without death, no regeneration and reconstruction without destruction. Plants would perish in eternal sunlight, and so would man, who would become an automaton without the exercise of his free will and is aspiring towards that sunlight, which would lose its being and value for him had he nothing but light. Good is infinite and eternal only in the eternally concealed from us, and this is why we imagine it eternal. On the manifested planes, one equilibrates the other. Few are those theists, believers in a personal God, who do not make of Satan the shadow of God, or who, confounding both, do not believe they have a right to pray to their idol, asking its help and protection for the exercise of and immunity for their evil and cruel deeds. Lead us not into temptation is addressed daily to our Father in heaven, and not to the devil by millions of Christian hearts. This they do, repeating the very words put into the mouth of their Savior, and yet do not give one thought to the fact that their meaning is contradicted point blank by James the brother of the Lord. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Why then say that it is the devil who tempts us, when the church teaches us on the authority of Christ, that it is God who does so? Open any pious volume in which the word temptation is defined, in its theological sense, and forthwith you will find two definitions. One, those afflictions and troubles whereby God tries his people. And two, those means and enticements which the devil makes use of to ensnare and allure mankind. Accepted literally, the teachings of Christ and James contradict each other, and what dogma can reconcile the two if the occult meaning is rejected. Between the alternative allurements, wise will be that philosopher who will be able to decide where God disappears to make room for the devil. Therefore, when we read that the devil is a liar and the father of it, that is an incarnate lie, and are also told in the same breath that Satan, the devil, was a son of God and the most beautiful of his archangels. Rather than believe that father and son are a gigantic, personified, and eternal lie, we prefer to turn to pantheism and to pagan philosophy for information. Once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, the scientific and symbolical Kabbalah unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical, and so are Jehovah and Cain. That Cain is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God. Jehovah tempts the king of Israel to number the people, and Satan tempts him to do the same in another place. Jehovah turns into the fiery serpents to bite those he is displeased with, and Jehovah informs the brazen serpent that heals them. These short and seemingly contradictory statements in the Old Testament, contradictory because the two powers are separated instead of being regarded as the two faces of one and the same thing, are the echoes distorted out of recognition by exotericism and theology of the universal and philosophical dogmas in nature, so well understood by the primitive sages. 
We find the same groundwork in several personifications of the Puranas, only far and more ample and philosophically suggestive. Thus, Pulasya, a son of God, one of the first progeny, is made the progenitor of demons, the Rakshashas, the tempters and the devourers of men. Pishasha, a female demon, is the daughter of Daksha, a son of God too, and a god, and the mother of all the Pishashas. The demons, so called in the Puranas, are very extraordinary devils when judged from the standpoint of European and Orthodox views, since all of them, Danayas, Deityas, Pishachas, and Rakshashas, are represented as extremely pious following the precepts of the Vedas, some of them even being great yogins. But they oppose the clergy and ritualism, sacrifices and forms, just as the head yogins do to this day in India, and are no less respected for it, though they are permitted to follow neither caste nor ritual, hence all those Puranic giants and titans are called devils. The missionaries, ever on the watch to show, if they can, that the Hindu traditions are nothing better than a reflection of the Jewish Bible, have evolved a whole romance on the alleged identity of Pulastya with Cain, and the Rakshasas with the Cainites, the accursed, the cause of the Noachian deluge. See the work of Abi Gorisio, who etymologizes Pulastya's name as meaning the rejected, hence Cain, if you please. Pulastya dwells in Kedera, he says, which means a dug-up place, a mine, and Cain is shown in tradition and the Bible as the first worker in metals and a miner thereof. While it is very probable that the Giborim, or giants of the Bible, are the Rakshasas of the Hindus, it is still more certain that both are Atlanteans and belong to the submerged races. However it may be, no Satan could be more persistent in slandering his enemy, or more spiteful in his hatred, than the Christian theologians are in cursing him as the father of every evil. Compare their vituperation and their opinions about the devil with the philosophical views of the Puranic sages and their Christ-like mansuetude. When Parasha, whose father was devoured by Rakshasha, was preparing himself to destroy by magic arts the whole race, his grandsire Vesashatha, after showing the irate sage on his own confession that there is evil and karma, but no evil spirits, speaks the following suggestive words. Let thy wrath be appeased. The Rakshasas are not culpable. Thy father's death was the work of destiny, karma. Anger is the passion of fools. It becometh not a wise man. By whom it may be asked, and is anyone killed? Every man reaps the consequences of his own acts. Anger, my son, is the destruction of all that man obtains, and prevents the attainment of emancipation. The sages shun wrath. Be not thou, my child, subject to its influence. Let no more of those unoffending spirits of darkness be consumed. Let this thy sacrifice cease. Mercy is the might of the righteous. Thus, every such sacrifice or prayer to God for help is no better than an act of black magic. That which Parashara prayed for was the destruction of the spirits of darkness, for his personal revenge. He is called a pagan, and the Christians have doomed him as such to eternal hell. Yet in what respect is the prayer of sovereigns and generals who pray before every battle for the destruction of their enemy any better? Such a prayer is in every case black magic of the worst kind, concealed like a demon, Mr. Hyde under a sanctimonious Dr. Jekyll. In human nature, evil denotes only the polarity of matter and spirit, a struggle for life, between the two manifested principles in space and time which principles are one per se, inasmuch as they are rooted in the absolute. In cosmos, the equilibrium must be preserved. The operations of the two contraries produce harmony, like the centripetal and centrifugal forces. 
which being mutually interdependent are necessary to each other, in order that both should live. If one should be arrested, the action of the other would become immediately self-destructive. Since the personification called Satan has been amply analyzed from its triple aspect in the Old Testament, Christian theology and the ancient Gentile attitude of thought, those who had learned more from the subject and referred to Isis Unveiled in the second part of Volume 2 of the present work. The subject is here touched upon and fresh explanations are attempted, for a very good reason. Before we can approach the evolution of physical and divine man, we have first to master the idea of cyclic evolution. To acquaint ourselves with the philosophies and beliefs of the four races which preceded our present race, and to learn that there were the ideas of those titans and giants, giants verily mentally as well as physically. The whole of antiquity was imbued with that philosophy which teaches the involution of spirit into matter, the progressive downward cyclic descent or active self conscious evolution. The Alexandrian Gnostics have sufficiently divulged the secrets of initiations, and the records are full of the falling down of the eons, and their double qualification of angelic beings and periods. The one, the natural evolution of the other. On the other hand, Oriental traditions on both sides of the black water, the oceans that separate the two, Easts, are equally full of allegories about the downfall of the Pleroma or that of the gods and devas. One and all, they allegorized and explained the fall as the desire to learn and acquire knowledge, the desire to know. This is the natural sequence of mental evolution, the spiritual becoming transmuted into the material or physical. The same law of descent into materiality and of reascent into spirituality asserted itself during the Christian era. The reaction having only stopped just now in our own special sub race. That which was allegorized in Pymander perhaps 10 millenniums ago for a triune mode of interpretation and intended for a record of an astronomical, anthropological, and even alchemical fact, namely the allegory of the seven rectors breaking through the seven circles of fire, was dwarfed into one material and anthropomorphic interpretation the rebellion and fall of the angels. The multivocal, profoundly philosophical narrative under its poetical form of the marriage of heaven with earth, the love of nature for divine form, and the heavenly man enraptured with his own beauty mirrored in nature. That is to say, spirit attracted into matter has now become, under theological handling, the seven rectors disobeying Jehovah, self-admiration generating satanic pride, followed by their fall, Jehovah permitting no worship to be lost save upon himself. In short, the beautiful planet angels, the glorious cyclic aeons of the ancients, have become synthesized in their most orthodox shape in Samael, the chief of the demons in the Talmud that great serpent with twelve wings that draws down after himself, in his fall, the solar system, or the titans. But Schemo, the alter ego and the Sabian type of Samael, in his philosophical and esoteric aspect, meant the year, in the astrological evil aspect, with its twelve months or wings, of unavoidable evils in nature. In esoteric theogony, both Schemo and the Samael represented a particular divinity. With the Kabbalists, they are the spirit of the earth, the personal god that governs it, and therefore de facto identical with Jehovah. For the Talmudists themselves admit that Samael is a god name of one of the seven Elohim. The Kabbalists, moreover, show the two Schemo and Samael as a symbolical form of Saturn, Kronos, the twelve wings, standing for the twelve months, and the symbol in its collectivity representing a racial cycle. Jehovah and Saturn are also glyphically identical. This leads in its turn to a very curious deduction from a Roman Catholic dogma. Many renowned writers belonging to the Latin Church admit that a difference exists, and should be made between the Uranian Titans, 
the antediluvian giants, who are also titans, and the post-diluvian giants, in whom the Roman Catholics persist in seeing the descendants of the mythical Ham. In clearer words, there is a difference to be made between the cosmic, primordial opposing forces guided by cyclic law, the Atlantean human giants, and the post-diluvian great adepts, whether of the right or the left hand. At the same time, they show that Michael, the generalissimo of the fighting celestial host, the bodyguard of Jehovah, as it would seem, according to de Merville, is also a titan, only with the adjective of divine before the cognomen. Thus, those Urinides, who are called everywhere divine titans, and who, having rebelled against Kronos or Saturn, are therefore also shown to be the enemies of Samael, also one of the Elohim and synonymous with Jehovah and his collectivity, are identical with Michael and his host. In short, the roles are reversed. All the combatants are confused, and no student is able to distinguish clearly which is which. Esoteric explanation may, however, bring some order into this confusion in which Jehovah becomes Saturn and Michael and his army, Satan and the rebellious angels, owing to the indiscreet endeavors of the two faithful zealots to see a devil in every pagan god. The true meaning is far more philosophical, and the legend of the first fall of the angels assumes a scientific coloring when correctly understood. Kronos stands for endless and hence immovable duration, without beginning, without end, and divided into time and beyond space. Those angels, genie or devas, who were born to act in space and time, that is to break through the seven circles of the super-spiritual planes into the phenomenal or circumscribed super-terrestrial regions, are said allegorically to have rebelled against Kronos and fought the lion who was then the one living and the highest god. When Kronos, in his turn, is represented as mutilating Uranus, his father, the meaning of the allegory is very simple. Absolute time is made to become the finite and conditioned. A portion is robbed from the whole, thus showing that Saturn, the father of the gods, has been transformed from eternal duration into a limited period. Kronos, with his scythe, cuts down even the longest and, to us, seemingly endless cycles, which, for all that, are limited in eternity, and with the same scythe destroys the mightiest rebels. I, not one, will escape the scythe of time. Praise the god or gods, and flout one or both, that scythe will not tremble one millionth of a second in its ascending or descending course. The titans of Hesiod's Theogony were copied in Greece from the Suras and Azuras of India. These Hesiodic titans, the Uranides, which were once upon a time numbered as only six, have been recently discovered in an old fragment relating to the Greek myth. To be seven, the seventh being called Phoreg. Thus, their identity with the seven rectors is fully demonstrated. The origin of the war in heaven and the fall has, in our mind, to be traced unavoidably to India, and perhaps far earlier than the Puranic accounts thereof. For the Tarakamaya was in a later age, and there are accounts of three distinct wars to be traced in almost every cosmogony. The first war happened in the night of time between the gods and a suras, and lasted for the period of one divine year. On this occasion, the deities were defeated by the Detyas, under the leadership of Harada. But afterwards, owing to a device of Vishnu, to whom the conquered gods applied for help, the latter defeated the Asuras. In the Vishnu Purana, no interval is found between the two wars. In the esoteric doctrine, however, one war takes place before the building of the solar system. Another, on earth, at the creation of man, and a third war is mentioned as taking place at the close of the fourth race, between its adepts and those of the fifth race, that is, between the initiates of the sacred island and the sorcerers of Atlantis. We shall notice the first contest, as recounted by Parashara, 
and endeavor to separate the two accounts, which are purposely blended together. It is stated that as the Dachyas and the Asuras were engaged in the duties of their respective orders and followed the paths prescribed by Holy Writ, practicing also religious penance, a queer employment for demons, if they are identical with our devils, as it is claimed, it was impossible for the gods to destroy them. The prayers addressed by the gods to Vishnu are curious, as showing the ideas involved in an anthropomorphic deity. Having, after their defeat, fled to the northern shore of the Milky Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, the discomfited gods address many supplications, to the first of beings, the divine Vishnu, and among others, the following. Glory to thee, who art one with the saints, whose perfect nature is ever blessed, and traverses, unobstructed, all permeable elements. Glory to thee, who art one with the serpent race, double-tongued, impetuous, cruel, insatiate of enjoyment, and abounding with wealth. Glory to thee, O Lord, who hast neither color nor extension, nor bulk, Ghana, nor any predictable qualities, and whose essence, Rupa, purest of the pure, is appreciable only by holy Paramarshis, the greatest of sages or rishis. We bow to thee in the nature of Brahma, uncreated, undecaying who art in our bodies, and in all other bodies, and in all living creatures, and beside whom nothing exists. We glorify that Vasudeva, the Lord of all, who is without soil, the seed of all things, exempt from dissolution, unborn, eternal, being in essence Paramapadadat Matvat, beyond the condition of spirit and in substance, Rupa, the whole of this universe. The above is quoted as an illustration of the vast field offered by the Puranas to adverse the erroneous criticism by every European bigot who forms an estimate of an alien religion on mere external evidence. Any man accustomed to subject what he reads to thoughtful analysis will see at a glance the incongruity of addressing the accepted unknowable the formless and attributeless absolute, such as the Vedantins define Brahman as being one with the serpent race, double-tongued, cruel, and insatiable, thus associating the abstract with the concrete, and bestowing adjectives on that which is free from any limitations and conditionless. Even Professor Wilson, who, after living surrounded by Brahmins and Pandits in India for so many years, ought to have known better, even that scholar lost no opportunity of criticizing the Hindu scriptures on this account. Thus, he exclaims, the Puranas constantly teach incompatible doctrines. According to this passage, the supreme being is not the inert cause of creation only, but exercises the functions of an active providence. The commentator quotes a text of the Veda in support of this view. Universal soul entering into men governs their conduct. Incongruities, however, are as frequent in the Vedas as in the Puranas. Less frequent in sober truth than in the Mosaic Bible, but prejudice is great in the hearts of our Orientalists, especially in those of reverend scholars. Universal soul is not the inert cause of creation or para Brahman, but simply that which we call the sixth principle of intellectual cosmos, on the manifested plane of being. It is Mahat or Mahabudi, the great soul, the vehicle of spirit, the first primeval reflection of the formless cause, and that which is even beyond spirit. So much for Professor Wilson's uncalled for fling at the Puranas. As for the apparently incongruous appeal to Vishnu by the defeated gods, the explanation is there in the text of Vishnu Purana, if Orientalists would only notice it. There is Vishnu as Brahma, and Vishnu in his two aspects, philosophy teaches. There is but one Brahman, essentially Prakriti and spirit. This ignorance is truly and beautifully expressed in the praise of the yogis to Brahma, the upholder of the earth, when they say, those who have not practiced devotion conceive erroneously of the nature of the world. The ignorant who do not perceive that this universe is of the nature of wisdom, 
and judge of it as an object of perception only are lost in the ocean of spiritual ignorance. But they who know true wisdom and whose minds are pure behold this whole world as one with divine knowledge, as one with thee, O God, be favorable, O universal spirit. Therefore, it is not Vishnu, the inert cause of creation, which exercises the functions of an active providence, but the universal soul, that which, in its material aspect, Eliphas Levi calls astral light. And the soul is, in its dual aspect of spirit and matter, the true anthropomorphic god of the theists. For this god is a personification of that universal creative agent, both pure and impure, owing to its manifested condition and differentiation in this Mavaic world, God and devil truly. But Professor Wilson failed to see how Vishnu, in this character, closely resembles the Lord God of Israel, especially in the policy of deception, temptation, and cunning. In the Vishnu Purana, this is made as plain as can be, for it is said there that, at this conclusion of their prayers, Stotra, the gods beheld the sovereign deity, Harry, Vishnu, armed with the shell, the discus, and the mace, riding on Garuda. Now Garuda is the Manvantaric cycle, as will be shown in its place. Vishnu, therefore, is the deity in space and time, the peculiar god of the Vaishnavas. Such gods are called in esoteric philosophy tribal or racial, that is to say, one of the many Dhyanis or gods or Elohim, one of whom was generally chosen for the same special reason by a nation or a tribe, and thus become gradually a god above all gods, the highest god, as Jehovah, Osiris, Bel, or any of the other seven regents. The tree is known by its fruit, the nature of a god by his actions. We must either judge these actions by the dead letter narratives, or must accept them allegorically. If we compare the two, Vishnu as the defender and champion of the defeated gods, and Jehovah, the defender and champion of the chosen people, so called by Antiphrasis, no doubt, as it is the Jews who had chosen that jealous God. We shall find that both use deceit and cunning. They do so on the principle of to end justifying the means in order to have their best of their representative opponents and foes, the demons. Thus, while according to the Kabbalists, Jehovah assumes the shape of the tempting serpent in the Garden of Eden, sends Satan with a special mission to tempt Job, harasses and wearies Pharaoh with Sarai, Abraham's wife, and hardens other Pharaoh's heart against Moses lest there should be no opportunity for plaguing his victims with great plagues. Vishnu is made in this Purana to resort to a trick no less unworthy of any respectable god. The defeated gods address Vishnu as follows. Have compassion upon us, O Lord, and protect us, who have come to thee for succour from the Daityas, demons. They have seized upon thee three worlds and appropriated the offerings which are our portion, taking care not to transgress the precepts of the Veda. Although we, as well as they, are parts of thee, engaged, as they are, in the paths prescribed by the Holy Writ, it is impossible for us to destroy them. Do thou, whose wisdom is immeasurable, Instruct us in some device by which we may be able to exterminate the enemies of the gods. When the mighty Vishnu heard their request, he emitted from his holy body an illusory form, Maya Moha, the deluder by illusion, which he gave to the gods and thus spoke, This Maya Moha shall wholly beguile the Deityas, so that being led astray from the path of the Vedas, they may be put to death. Go then and fear not. Let this delusive vision precede you. It shall this day be of great service unto you, O gods. After this, the great delusion, Maya Maha, having proceeded to earth, beheld the Deityas, engaged in ascetic penances, and approaching them in the semblance of Degambara, naked mendicant, with his head shaven, he thus addressed them in gentle accents. 
Ho, lords of the Data race! Wherefore it is that you practice these acts of penances, etc. Finally, the Datas were seduced by the wily talk of Myomaha. As Eve was seduced by the advice of the serpent, they became apostates to the Vedas. As Dr. Muir translates the passage, the great deceiver, practicing illusion, next beguiled other Datas by means of many other sorts of hearsay. Heresy. In a very short time, these asuras, datyas, deluded by the deceiver, who was Vishnu, abandoned the entire system founded on the ordinances of the Triple Veda. Some reviled the Vedas, others the ceremonial of sacrifice, and others the Brahmins. This, they exclaimed, is a doctrine which will not bear discussion. The slaughter of animals in sacrifice is not conducive to religious merit. To say that oblations of butter consumed in the fire produce any future reward is the assertion of a child. If it be a fact that a beast slain in sacrifice is exalted to heaven, why does not the worshipper slaughter his own father? Infallible utterances do not, great asuras, fall from the skies. It is only assertions founded on reasoning that are accepted by me and by other intelligent persons like yourselves. Thus, by numerous methods, the Datyas were unsettled by the great deceiver, reason. When the Datyas had entered on the path of error, the deities mustered all their energies and approached to battle. Then followed a combat between the gods and the Asuras, and the latter, who had abandoned the right road, were smitten by the former. In previous times, they had been defended by the armor of righteousness, which they bore. But when that had been destroyed, they also perished. Whatever may be thought of the Hindus, no enemy of theirs can regard them as fools. A people whose holy men and sages have left to the world the greatest and most sublime philosophies that ever emanated from the minds of men must have known the difference between right and wrong. Even a savage can discern white from black, good from bad, and deceit from sincerity and truthfulness. Those who had narrated this event in the biography of their god must have seen that in this case it was the god who was the arch-deceiver, and the Datyas who never transgressed the precepts of the Vedas, who had the sunny side of the transaction, and who were the true gods. Thence there must have been, and there is, a secret meaning hidden under this allegory. In no class of society, and no nation, are deceit and craft considered as divine virtues, except perhaps in the clerical classes of theologians and modern Jesuitism. The Vishnu Purana, like all other works of this kind, passed at a later period into the hands of the temple Brahmins and the old MSS have no doubt been further tampered with by sectarians. But there was a time when the Puranas were esoteric works, and so they are still for the initiates who can read them with the key that is in their possession. Whether the Brahmin initiates will ever give out full meaning of these allegories is a question with which the writer is not concerned. The present object is to show that, while honoring their creative powers in their multiple forms, no philosopher could have, or ever has, accepted the allegory for its true spirit, except perhaps some philosophers belonging to the present superior and civilized Christian races. For, as shown, Jehovah is not one whit the superior of Vishnu on the plane of ethics. This is why the occultists, and even some Kabbalists, whether or not they regard those creative forces as living and conscious entities, and one does not see why they should not be so accepted, will ever confuse the cause with the effect and accept the spirit of the earth for Para Brahman or Ein Suf. At all events, they know well the true nature of what was called the Greeks' father, Aether, Jupiter Titan, etc. They know that the soul of the astral light is divine and its body, the light waves on the lower planes, infernal. This light is symbolized by the magic head in the Zohar, the double face on the double pyramid, the black pyramid rising against a pure white ground, with a white head and face within its black triangle. 
the white pyramid inverted, the reflection of the first in the dark waters, showing the black reflection on the white face. This is the astral light, or demon, as do inversus. Section 12. The Theogony of the Creative Gods to thoroughly comprehend the idea underlying every ancient cosmology necessitates the study and comparative analysis of all the great religions of antiquity. For it is only by this method that the root idea can be made plain. Exact science, could it soar so high, in tracing the operations of nature to their ultimate and original sources, would call this idea the hierarchy of forces. The original, transcendental, and philosophical conception was one. But as systems began to reflect more and more with every age the idiosyncrasies of nations, and as the latter, after separating, settled into distinct groups, each evolving along its own national or tribal groove, the main idea became gradually veiled by the overgrowth of human fancy. While in some countries the forces, or rather the intelligent powers of nature, received divine honors to which they were hardly entitled. In others, as now in Europe and the other civilized lands, the very thought of such forces being endowed with intelligences seems absurd and is proclaimed unscientific. Therefore, one finds relief in such statements as are found in the introduction to Asgard and the Gods. Tales and Traditions of Our Northern Ancestors, edited by W. S. W. Anson, who says, Although in Central Asia, or on the banks of the Indus, in the land of the pyramids, and in the Greek and Italian peninsulas, and even in the north, whither Celts, Teutons, and Slavs wandered, the religious conceptions of the people have taken different forms. Yet their common origin is still perceptible. We point out this connection between the stories of the gods and the deep thought contained in them and their importance in order that the reader may see that it is not a magic world of erratic fancy which opens out before him, but that life and nature form the basis of the existence and action of these divinities. And although it is impossible for any occultist or student of Eastern esotericism to concur in the strange idea that the religious conceptions of the most famous nations of antiquity are connected with the beginnings of civilization amongst the Germanic races. He is yet glad to find such truths expressed as that. These fairy tales are not senseless stories written for the amusement of the idol. They embody the profound religion of our forefathers. Precisely so. Not only their religion, but likewise their history. For a myth in Greek, means oral tradition, passed from mouth to mouth, from one generation to the other. And even in the modern etymology, the term stands for a fabulous statement conveying some important truth. A tale of some extraordinary personage whose biography has become overgrown, owing to the veneration of successive generations, with rich popular fancy, but which is no wholesale fable. Like our ancestors, the primitive Aryans, we believe firmly in the personality and intelligence of more than one phenomenon producing force in nature. As time rolled on, the archaic teaching grew dimmer, and the nations more or less lost sight of the highest and one principle of all things, and began to transfer the abstract attributes of the causeless cause to the caused effects, which became in their turn causative, the creative powers of the universe. The great nations thus acted from fear of profaning the idea, the smaller because they either failed to grasp it or lacked the power of philosophic conception needed to preserve it in all its immaculate purity. But one and all, with the exception of the latest Aryans, now become Europeans and Christians, show this veneration in their cosmogenies. As Thomas Taylor, the most intuitional of all the translators of the Greek fragments, shows, no nation has ever conceived the one principle as the immediate creator of the visible universe, for no sane man would credit a planner and architect with having built with his own hands the edifice he admires. 
On the testimony of Damascius in his work on first principles, they referred to it as the unknown darkness. The Babylonians passed over this principle in silence. To that God, says Porphyry, and is on abstinence, who is above all things, neither external speech ought to be addressed, nor yet that which is inward. Hesiod begins his theogony with the words, chaos of all things was the first produced. Thus allowing the inference that its cause or producer must be passed over in reverential silence. Homer, in his poems, ascends no higher than night, which he represents Zeus as reverencing. According to the ancient theologists and the doctrines of Pythagoras and Plato, Zeus, or the immediate artificer of the universe, is not the highest god any more than Sir Christopher Wren, in its physical human aspect, is the mind in him which produced his great works of art. Homer, therefore, is not only silent with respect to the first principle, but likewise with respect to those two principles immediately posterior to the first, the ether and chaos of Orpheus and Hesiod, and the bound infinity of Pythagoras and Plato. Proclus says of the highest principle that it is the unity of unities, and beyond the first adita, more ineffable than all silence and more occult than all essence concealed amidst the intelligible gods. To what was written by Thomas Taylor in 1797, namely that the Jews appear to have ascended no higher than the immediate artificer of the universe, as Moses introduces a darkness on the face of the deep without even insinuating that there was any cause of its existence, one might add something more. Never have the Jews in their Bible, a purely esoteric, symbolical work, so profoundly degraded their metaphorical deity as have the Christians, by accepting Jehovah as their one living yet personal God. This first, or rather one, principle was called the circle of heaven, symbolized by the hierogram of a point with a circle or equilateral triangle, the point being the Logos. Thus, in the Rig Veda, where Brahma is not even named, cosmogony is preluded with the Hiranyagarbha, the golden egg, and Prajapati, later on Brahma, from whom emanate all the hierarchies of creators. The monad, or point, is the original and is the unit from which follows the entire numeral system. This point is the first cause, but that from which it emanates, or of which, rather, it is the expression, the logos, is passed over in silence. In its turn, the universal symbol, the point within the circle, was not yet the architect, but the cause of that architect. And the latter stood to it in precisely the same relation as the point itself stood to the circumference of the circle, which cannot be defined according to Hermes Trismegistus. Pufiri shows that the monad and the duad of Pythagoras are identical with Plato's infinite and finite. In Philebus, or what Plato calls the Amenpov and Runepas, it is the latter only, the mother, which is substantial, the former being the cause of all unity and measure of all things. The duad, Mulapakriti, the veil of Parabrahman, being thus shown to be the mother of the Logos and at the same time his daughter, that is to say the object of his perception, the produce producer and the secondary cause of it. With Pythagoras, the monad returns into silence and darkness as soon as it has evolved the triad, from which emanate the remaining seven numbers of the ten numbers which are the base of the manifested universe. In the Norse cosmogony, it is again the same. In the beginning was a great abyss, chaos, neither day nor night existed. The abyss was Ginnigagap, the yawning gulf, without beginning, without end. All Father, the uncreated, the unseen, dwelt in the depth of the abyss, space, and willed, and what was willed came into being. As in the Hindu cosmogony, the evolution of the universe is divided into two acts, which are called in India the Prakriti and the Padma creations. Before the warm rays pouring from the home of brightness awaken life in the great waters of space, the elements of the first creation come into view, and from them is formed the giant mirror, or orgomir, literally seething clay, 
primordial matter differentiated from chaos. Then comes the cow and Dumla, the nourisher, from whom is born Buri, the producer, whose son Bor, born by Bestla, the daughter of the frost giants. The sons of Mir had three sons, Odin, Willy, and We, or spirit, will, and holiness. This was when darkness still reigned throughout space, when the aces, the creative powers, or Yan Chohans, were not yet evolved, and the Yggdrasil, the tree of the universe of time and of life, had not yet grown, and there was as yet no Walhalla, or Hall of Heroes. The Scandinavian legends of creation, of our earth and world, begin with time and human life. All that precedes it is them for darkness, wherein all father, the cause of all, dwells. As observed by the editor of Asgard and the Gods, though these legends have in them the idea of that all father, the original cause of all, he is scarcely more than mentioned in the poems. Not as he thinks, because before the preaching of the gospel, the idea could not rise to distinct conceptions of the eternal but on account of its deep esoteric character. Therefore, all the creative gods, or personal deities, begin at the secondary stage of cosmic evolution. Zeus is born in and out of Kronos, time. So is Brahma, the production and emanation of Kala, eternity and time, Kala being one of the names of Vishnu. Hence we find Odin, the father of the gods and of the aces, as Brahma is the father of the gods and of the asuras. And hence also the androgyne character of all the chief creative gods, from the second monad of the Greeks down to the Sephira, Adam Kadmon, the Brahma, or Prajapati Vak of the Vedas, and the androgyne of Plato, which is but another version of the Indian symbol. The best metaphysical definition of primeval theogony and the spirit of the Vedantins may be found in the notes on the Bhagavad Gita by T. Subaro, Parabrahman, the unknown and the incognizable, as the lecturer tells his audience, is not ego, it is not non-ego, nor is it consciousness, it is not even atma, but though not itself an object of knowledge, it is yet capable of supporting and giving rise to every kind of object and every kind of existence which becomes an object of knowledge. It is the one essence from which starts into existence a center of energy, which he calls the Logos. This Logos is the Shabda, Brahman of the Hindus, which he will not even call Ishvara, the Lord God lest the term should create confusion in the people's minds. It is the Avalokiteshvara of the Buddhists, the verbum of the Christians, in its real esoteric meaning, not in its theological disfigurement. It is the first nada, or the ego in the cosmos, and every other ego, is but its reflection and manifestation. It exists in a latent condition in the bosom of Parabrahman at the time of Pralaya, during Manvantara, it has a consciousness and an individuality of its own. It is a center of energy, but such centers of energy are almost innumerable in the bosom of Parabrahman. It must not be supposed that even this Logos is the creator or that it is but a single center of energy. Their number is almost infinite. This is the first ego that appears in cosmos and is the end of all evolution. It is the abstract ego. This is the first manifestation or aspect of Parabrahman. When once it starts into existence as a conscious being, from its subjective standpoint, Parabrahman appears to it as Mula Prakriti. Please bear this in mind, for here's the root of the whole difficulty about Purusha and Prakriti felt by the various writers on Vedantic philosophy. This Mula Prakriti is material to it, the Logos, as any material object is material to us. The Mula Prakriti is no more Parabrahman than the bundle of attributes of a pillar is the pillar of itself. Parabrahman is an unconditioned and absolute reality, and Mula Prakriti is a sort of veil thrown over it. 
Para Brahman by itself cannot be seen as it is. It is seen by the Logos with a veil thrown over it, and that veil is the mighty expanse of cosmic matter. Para Brahman, after having appeared on the one hand as the ego and on the other as Mula Pakriti, acts as the one energy through the Logos. And the lecturer explains what he means by this acting of something which is nothing, through it is the all by a fine simile. He compares the Logos to the sun through which light and heat radiate, but whose energy, light, and heat exist in some unknown condition in space and are diffused in space only as visible light and heat, the sun being only the agent thereof. This is the first triadic hypostasis. The quaternary is made up by the energizing light shed by the Logos. The Hebrew Kabbalists stated it in a manner which is esoterically identical with the Vedantic. Ein Suf, they taught, could not be comprehended, could not be located, nor named, though the causeless cause of all. Hence its name Ein Suf is a term of negation, the inscrutable, the incognizable, and the unnameable. They made of it thereof a boundless circle, a sphere, of which human intellect, with the utmost stretch, could only perceive the vault. In the words of the one who has unriddled much in the Kabbalistic system most thoroughly, in one of its meanings, in its numerical and geometrical esotericism, close your eyes and from your own consciousness of perception try and think outward to the extremist limits in every direction. You will find that equal lines or rays of perception extend out evenly in all directions, so that the utmost effort of perception will terminate in the vault of a sphere. The limitation of this sphere will, of necessity, be a great circle, and the direct rays of thought in any and every direction must be right line or radii of the circle. This, then, must be, Humanly speaking, the extremist all-embracing conception of the Ein Suf manifest, which formulates itself as a geometrical figure, viz. of a circle with its elements of curved circumference and right-line diameter divided into radii. Hence, a geometrical shape is the first recognizable means of connection between the Ein Suf and the intelligence of man. This great circle, which Eastern esotericism reduces to the point within the boundless circle, is the Avelokiteshvara, the Logos, or Verbum, of which T. Sabaro speaks. But this circle, or manifested God, is as unknown to us, except through its manifested universe, as is the One, though easier, or rather more possible to our highest conceptions. This Logos, which sleeps in the bosom of Parabrahman during Pralaya, as our ego is latent in us at the time of Sushapti, or sleep, which cannot cognize Parabrahman otherwise than a Mula Prakriti, the latter being a cosmic veil which is the mighty expanse of cosmic matter, is thus only an organ in cosmic creation through which radiate the energy and wisdom of Parabrahman, unknown to the Logos as it is to ourselves. Moreover, as the Logos is as unknown to us as Para Brahman is unknown in reality to the Logos, both Eastern esotericism and the Kabbalah, in order to bring the Logos within the range of our conceptions, have resolved the abstract synthesis into concrete images, these into the reflections or multiplied aspects of that Logos, or Avalokiteshvara, Brahma, Ormaz, Osiris, Adam Kadmon, call it by any of such names you will, which aspects or Manvantaric emanations are the Yan Chohans, the Elohim, the Divas, the Amashashpens, etc. Metaphysicians explain the root and germ of the latter, according to T. Sabaro, as the first manifestation of Parabrahman, the highest trinity that we are capable of understanding which is Mula Pakriti, the veil, the logos, and the conscience energy of the latter. Or its power and light, called the Bhagavad Gita, Deva Prakriti, or matter, force, and the ego, or the one root of self, of which every other kind of self is but a manifestation or a reflection. It is then only in this light of consciousness, of mental and physical perception, 
that practical occultism can throw the logos into visibility by geometrical figures, which, when closely studied, will yield not only a scientific explanation of the real, objective existence of the seven sons of the divine Sophia, which is the light of the logos, but will show, by means of other yet undiscovered keys, that, with regard to humanity, these seven sons and their numberless emanations, centers of energy personified, are an absolute necessity. Make away with them, and the mystery of being and mankind will never be unriddled, nor even closely approached. It is through this light that everything is created. The root of mental self is also the root of physical self, for this light is the permutation in our manifested world of Mulapakriti, called Aditi and the Vedas. In the third aspect, it becomes Vak, the daughter and the mother of Logos, as Isis is the daughter and the mother of Osiris, who is Horus and Mut, the daughter, wife, and mother of Ammon in the Egyptian Moonglyph. In the Kabbalah, Sephira is the same as Shekinah and is, in another synthesis, the wife, daughter, and mother of the heavenly man, Adam Kadmon, and is even identical with him, just as Vok is identical with Brahma and is called the female Logos. In the Rig Veda, Vok is mystic speech, by whom occult knowledge and wisdom are communicated to man, and thus Vok is said to have entered the Rishis. She is generated by gods, she is the divine Vok the queen of gods, and she is associated like Sephira with the Sephiroth, with the Prajapatis in their work of creation. Moreover, she is called the mother of the Vedas, since it is through her powers, as mystic speech, that Brahma revealed them, and also owing to her power that he produced the universe. That is to say, through speech and words, synthesized by the word and numbers. But when Vok also is spoken of as the daughter of Daksha, the god who lives in all the Kalpas, her Mayavik character is shown. During the Pralaya, she disappears, absorbed in the one all-devouring ray. But there are two distinct aspects in universal esotericism, Eastern and Western, and all the personifications of the female power in nature, or nature the noumenal and the phenomenal. One is its purely metaphysical aspect, as described by the learned lecturer in his notes on the Bhagavad Gita. The other terrestrial and physical, and at the same time divine from the standpoint of practical human conception and occultism. They are all the symbols and personifications of chaos, the great deep, or the primordial waters of space, the impenetrable veil between incognizable and the logos of creation. Connecting himself through his mind with Vak, Brahma, the Logos, created the primordial waters. In the Katha Upanishad, it is stated still more clearly, Prajapati was this universe. Vak was a second to him. He associated with her. She produced these creatures and again re-entered Prajapati. This connects Vak and Sephira with the goddess Kuan Yin, the merciful mother, the divine voice of the soul even in exoteric Buddhism and with the female aspect of Quan Shayin, the Logos, the verbum of creation, and at the same time with the voice that speaks audibly to the initiate, according to esoteric Buddhism. Bath, Kol, the Philia, Vochis, the daughter of the divine voice of the Hebrews. Responding from the mercy seat within the veil of the temple is a result. And here we may incidentally point out one of the many unjust slurs thrown by the good and pious missionaries in India on the religion of the land. The allegory in the Shatapatha Brahmana, that Brahma, as the father of men, performed the work of procreation by incestuous intercourse with his own daughter Vak, also called Sandhya, Twilight, and Shatarupa, of a hundred forms is incessantly thrown in the teeth of the Brahmins as condemning their detestable false religion. Besides the fact, conveniently forgotten by the Europeans, that the patriarch Lot is shown guilty of the same crime under the human form, whereas it was under the form of a buck that Brahma, or rather Prajapati, accomplished the incest with his daughter who had that of a hind. 
Rohit. The esoteric reading of the third chapter of Genesis shows the same. Moreover, there is certainly a cosmic and not a physiological meaning attached to the Indian allegory, since Vak is a permutation of Aditi and Mulaprakriti, or chaos, and Brahma, a permutation of Narayana, the spirit of God entering into and fructifying nature, and therefore there is nothing phallic in the conception at all. As already stated, Aditi Vak is the female logos, or verbum, the word, and Sephira, and the Kabbalah is the same. These feminine logi are all correlations in their noumenal aspect of light and sound and ether, showing how well informed were the ancients both in physical science, as now known to the moderns, and also as to the birth of that science in the spiritual and astral spheres. Our old writers said that Vak is one of four kinds. They are called Para, Pashyanti, Madhyama, and Vakari. The statement you will find in the Rig Veda itself and in several of the Upanishads. Vakari Vak is what we utter. It is sound, speech, that again which becomes comprehensive and objective to one of our physical senses and may be brought under the laws of perception. Hence, every kind of Vakari Vak exists in Madhyama, Pashyanti and ultimately in its para form. The reason why this pranava is called vak is this, that these four principles of the great cosmos correspond to these four forms of vak. The whole cosmos in its objective form is vakari vak, the light of the logos in its madhyama form, and the logos itself, pashyanti form, while para brahman is the para, beyond the noumenon of all noumena, aspect of that Vak. Thus Vak, Shekinah, or the music of the spheres of Pythagoras are one, if we take for our example instances in the three most, apparently, dissimilar religious philosophies in the world, the Hindu, the Greek, and the Chaldean Hebrew. These personations and allegories may be viewed under four chief and three lesser aspects, or seven in all, as in esotericism. The para form is the ever subjective and latent light and sound, which exist externally in the bosom of incognizable. When transferred into the ideation of the logos or its latent light, it is called pasyanti. But when it becomes that light expressed, it is madhyama. Now the Kabbalah gives the definition thus there are three kinds of light, and that, the fourth, which interpenetrates the others. One, the clear and the penetrating, the objective light. Two, the reflective light. And three, the abstract light. The ten sephiroth, the three and the seven, are called in the Kabbalah the ten words. Debrim, Dabarim. The numbers and the emanations of the heavenly light, which is both Adam Kadmon and Sephira, Prajapati Vak or Brahma, Light, sound, number are the three factors of creation in the Kabbalah. Parabrahman cannot know except through the luminous point, the Logos, which knows not Parabrahman but only Mula Prakriti. Similarly, Adam Kadmon knew only Shekinah, though he was the vehicle of Ein Suf. And as Adam Kadmon, he is, the, in the esoteric interpretation, the total of the number 10 the Sephiroth himself being a trinity, or the three attributes of the incognizable deity in one, when the heavenly man or Logos first assumed the form of the crown, Kether, and identified himself with Sephira, he caused seven splendid lights to emanate from it, the crown, which made in their totality ten, so Brahma Pajapati, once he became separated from, yet identical with Vak, caused the seven rishis, the seven manus or prajapatis, to issue from that crown. In exotericism, one will always find ten and seven of either sephira or prajapati. In esoteric rendering, always three and seven, which yield also ten. Only when divided in the manifested sphere into three and seven, they form a circle with a line, the androgyne and circle with a cross, or the figure X manifested and differentiated. 
This will help the student to understand why Pythagoras esteemed the deity, the Logos, to be the center of unity and source of harmony. We say this deity was the Logos, not the monad, that dwelleth in solitude and silence, because Pythagoras taught that unity being indivisible is no number. And this is also why it was required of the candidate, who applied for admittance into his school, that he should have already studied as a preliminary step the sciences of arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music, which were held to be the four divisions of mathematics. Again, this explains why the Pythagoreans asserted that the doctrine of numbers, the chief of all in esotericism, had been revealed to man by the celestial deities, that the world had been called forth out of chaos by sound, or harmony, and constructed according to the principles of musical proportion, that the seven planets which rule the destiny of mortals have a harmonious motion and, as Censorinus says, intervals corresponding to musical diastomines, rendering various sounds so perfectly consonant that they produce the sweetest melody, which is inaudible to us, only by reason of the greatness of the sound, which our ears are incapable of receiving. In the Pythagorean theogony, the hierarchies of the heavenly host and gods were numbered and also expressed numerically. Pythagoras had studied esoteric science in India, therefore we find his pupils saying, The monad, the manifested one, is the principle of all things. From the monad and the intermediate duad, chaos, numbers, from numbers, points, from points, lines, from lines, superfaces, from superfaces, solids, from these solids, bodies, whose elements are four, fire, water, air, earth, of all which transmuted, correlated, and totally changed the world consists. And this, if it is not unriddle the mystery altogether, may at any rate lift a corner of the veil off those wondrous allegories that have been thrown over Vok, the most mysterious of all the Brahmanical goddesses, she who is termed the melodious cow who milked forth sustenance and water. The earth with all her mystic powers, and again she who yields as nourishment and sustenance, the physical earth. Isis is also mystic nature and also earth, and her cow's horns identify her with Vok, who after being recognized in her highest form of as Para, becomes at the lower or material end of creation, Vakari. Hence she is mystic, though physical nature with all her magic ways and properties. Again, as goddess of speech and of sound and a permutation of Aditi, she is chaos in one sense. At any rate, she is the mother of the gods and it is from Brahma, Ishvara, or the Logos, and Vok, as from Adam Kadmon and Sephira, that the real manifested theogony has to start. Beyond all is darkness and abstract speculation. With the Dian Chohans or the gods, the seers, the prophets, and the adepts in general are on firm ground. Whether as Aditi or the defined Sophia of the Greek Gnostics, she is the mother of the seven sons, the angels of the face of the deep, or the great green one of the Book of the Dead, says the Book of Dian, or the real knowledge obtained through meditation. The great mother lay with the triangle and the line, and the square, the second line, and the star, in her bosom, ready to bring them forth, the valiant sons of the square, triangle, double line, or 4,320,000, the cycle, whose two elders are the circle and the point. At the beginning of every cycle of 4,320,000, the seven, or as some nations had it, eight, great gods descend to establish the new order of things and to give the impetus to the new cycle. That eighth god was the unifying cycle, or logos, separated and made distinct from its host, an exoteric dogma, just as the three divine hypostases of the ancient Greeks are now considered in the churches as three distinct persona. As a commentary says, 
The mighty ones perform their great works and leave behind them everlasting monuments to commemorate their visit. Every time they penetrate within our Mayavik veil atmosphere. Thus, we are taught that the great pyramids were built under their direct supervision. When Daruva, the then pole star, was at his lowest culmination, and the Kritikas, Pallades, looked over his head, were on the same meridian but above, to watch the work of the giants. Thus, as the first pyramids were built at the beginning of a sidereal year, under Daruva, Alpha Polaris, it must have been over 31,000 years, 31,105 ago. Bunsen was right in admitting, for Egypt, an antiquity of over 21,000 years, but this concession hardly exhausts truth and fact in this question. As Mr. Gerald Massey says, the stories told by Egyptian priests and others of timekeeping in Egypt are now beginning to look less like lies in the sight of all who have escaped from biblical bondage. Inscriptions have lately been found at Saqqara, making mention of two Sothaic cycles, registered at that time, now some 6,000 years ago. Thus, when Herodotus was in Egypt, the Egyptians had, as now known, observed at least five different Sothaic cycles of 1,461 years. The priests informed the Greek inquirer that the time had been reckoned by them for so long that the sun had twice risen where it then set, and twice set where it then arose. This can only be realized as a fact in nature by means of two cycles of precession over a period of 51,736 years. More Isaac shows the ancient Syrians defining their world of the rulers and active gods in the same way as the Chaldeans. The lowest world was the sublunary, our own, watched by the angels of the first or lower order. The one that came next in rank was Mercury, ruled by the archangels. Then came Venus, whose gods were the principalities. The fourth was that of the sun, the domain and region of the highest and mightiest gods of our system the solar gods of all nations. The fifth was Mars, ruled by the virtues. The sixth, that of Bel, or Jupiter, was governed by the dominions. The seventh, the world of Saturn, by the thrones. These are the worlds of form. Above came the four higher ones, making seven again, since the three highest are unmentionable and unpronounceable. The eighth, composed of 1,122 stars, is the domain of the cherubs. The ninth, belonging to the walking and numberless stars on account of their distance, has the seraphs. As to the tenth, Kircher, quoting Moore Isaac, says that it is composed of invisible stars that could be taken, they said, for clouds, so massed are they in the zone that we call via Straminis, the Milky Way. And he hastens to explain that these are the stars of Lucifer, engulfed with him in his terrible shipwreck. That which comes after and beyond the ten worlds, our quaternary, or the Arupa world, the Syrians could not tell. All they knew was that it was there that begins the vast and incomprehensible ocean of the infinite, the abode of the true divinity, without boundary or end. Champollion shows the same belief among the Egyptians. Hermes, having spoken of their father, mother, and son, whose spirit, collectively the divine fiat, shapes the universe, says, seven agents, media, were also formed to contain the material, or manifested, worlds within the respective circles, and the action of these agents was named destiny. He further enumerates seven and ten and twelve orders, but it would take too long to detail them here. As the Rig Vedana, together with the Brahmanda Purana and all such works, whether describing the magic efficacy of the Rig Vedic mantras or the future Kalpas, are declared by Dr. Weber and others to be modern compilations, belonging probably only to the time of the Puranas. It is useless to refer the reader to their mystic explanations. 
and one may as well quote simply from the archaic books utterly unknown to the Orientalists. These works explain that which so puzzles the scholars, namely that the Saptarshi, the mind-born sons of Brahma, are referred to in the Satapatha Brahmana under one set of names, in the Mahabharata under another set, and that the Vayu Purana makes even nine instead of seven rishis by adding the names of Prigu and Daksha to the list. But the same occurs in every exoteric scripture. The secret doctrine gives a long genealogy of rishis but separates them into many classes, like the gods of the Egyptians who were divided into seven and even twelve classes. So are the Indian rishis in their hierarchies. The first three groups are the divine, the cosmical, and the sublunary. Then come the solar gods of our system, the planetary, the submundane, and the purely human, the heroes, and the menushi. At present, however, we are only concerned with the pre-cosmic divine gods, the prajapatis, or the seven builders. This group is found unmistakably in every cosmogony. Owing to the loss of Egyptian archaic documents, since according to Mr. Maspero, the materials and historic data on hand to study the history of the religious evolution in Egypt are neither complete nor very often intelligible. The ancient hymns and inscriptions on the tombs must be appealed to. In order to have the statements brought forward from the secret doctrine partially and indirectly corroborated, one such shows that Osiris, like Brahma Prajapati, Adam Kadmon, Ormazd, and so many other Logai, was the chief and synthesis of the group of creators or builders. Before Osiris became the one and the highest god of Egypt, he was worshipped at Abydos as the head or leader of the heavenly host of the builders belonging to the higher of the three orders. The hymn engraved on the votive steel of a tomb of Abydos, third register, addresses Osiris thus. Salutations to thee, Osiris, elder son of Seb. Thou the greatest over the six gods issued from the goddess Nu, primordial water. Thou the great favorite of thy father Ra, father of fathers, king of duration, master in the eternity who as soon as these issued from thy mother's bosom gathered all the crowns and attached the uraeus, serpent or naja, on thy head, multiform god, whose name is unknown and who has many names in towns and provinces. Coming out from the primordial water crowned with the uraeus, which is the serpent emblem of cosmic fire, and himself the seventh over the six primary gods, issued from Father Mother, Nu, and Newt, the sky, who can Osiris be but the chief Prajapati, the chief Sephira, the chief Amshaspend, or Mazd? That this latter solar and cosmic god stood, in the beginning of religious evolution, in the same position as the archangel whose name was Secret, is certain. This archangel was Michael, the representative on earth of the hidden Jewish god. In short, it is his face that is said to have gone before the Jews like a pillar of fire. Bernouf says the seven Amshapans, who are most assuredly our archangels, designate also the personifications of the divine virtues. And these archangels, therefore, are as certainly the Septarshis of the Hindus, though it is next to impossible to class each with its pagan prototype and parallel since, as the case of Osiris, they have all so many names in towns and provinces. Some of the most important, however, will be shown in their order. One thing is thus undeniably proven. The more we study their hierarchies and find out their identity, the more proofs we acquire that there is not one of the past or present personal gods, known to us from the earliest days of history, that does not belong to the third stage of cosmic manifestation. In every religion we find the concealed deity forming the groundwork, then the ray therefrom, that falls into primordial cosmic matter. 
the first manifestation, then the androgyne result, the dual male and female abstract force personified. The second stage, this finally separates itself, and the third into seven forces called the creative powers by all the ancient religions, and the virtues of God by the Christians. The later explanations and abstract metaphysical qualifications have not prevented the Roman and Greek churches from worshipping these virtues under the personifications and distinct names of the seven archangels. In the book of Drushim, in the Talmud, a distinction between these groups is given, which is the correct Kabbalistical explanation. It says, there are three groups or orders of Sephiroth. First, the Sephiroth called the divine attributes, abstract. Second, the physical or sidereal Sephiroth, personal. One group of seven, the other of ten. Third, the metaphysical Sephiroth or, or periphrasis of Jehovah, who are the first three Sephiroth, Kether, Chokma, and Bina. The rest of the seven being the personal seven spirits of the presence, also of the planets. The same division has to be applied to the primary, secondary, and tertiary evolution of gods in every theogony if one wishes to translate the meaning esoterically. We must not confuse the purely metaphysical personifications of the abstract attributes of deity with their reflection, the sidereal gods. This reflection, however, is in reality the objective expression of the abstraction, living entities and the models formed on that divine prototype. Moreover, the three metaphysical sephiroth, or the paraphrasis of Jehovah, are not Jehovah. It is the latter himself, with the additional titles of Adonai, Elohim, Sabaoth, and the numerous names lavished on him, who is the Paraphrasis of the Shadi, the Omnipotent. The name is a circumlocution, indeed, a too abundant figure of Jewish rhetoric, and has always been denounced by the occultists. To the Jewish Kabbalists, and even the Christian alchemists and Rosicrucians, Jehovah was a convenient screen, unified by the folding of its many panels, and adopted as a substitute one named of an individual, Sephira, being as good as another name for those who had the secret. The Tetragrammaton, the ineffable, the sidereal, sum total, was invented for no other purpose than to mislead the profane and to symbolize life and generation. The real secret and unpronounceable name, the word that is no word, has to be sought in the seven names of the first seven emanations, or the sons of the fire, in the secret scriptures of all the great nations, and even in the Zohar, the Kabbalistic lore of the smallest of all of them, viz. the Jewish. This word, composed of seven letters in every tongue, is found embodied in the architectural remains of every great sacred building in the world, from the Cyclopean remains on Easter Island, part of a continent buried under the seas nearly four million years ago, then 20,000, down to the earliest Egyptian pyramids. We shall have to enter more fully into the subject later on, and to bring practical illustrations to prove the statements made in the text. For the present, it is sufficient to show, by a few instances, the truth of what has been asserted at the beginning of this work, namely, that no cosmogony the world over, with the sole exception of the Christian, has ever attributed to the highest one cause, the universal deific principle, the immediate creation of our earth, or man, or anything connected with these. The statement holds as well for the Hebrew or the Chaldean Kabbalah as it does for Genesis. Had the latter been over thoroughly understood and, what is still more important, correctly translated. Everywhere there is either a logos, a light shining in darkness, truly, or the architect of the worlds is esoterically in the plural number. The Latin church, paradoxical as ever, while applying the epithet of creator to Jehovah alone, adopts a whole curial of names for the working forces of the latter, names which betray the secret. For if the said forces had not to do with creation, so-called, 
Why call them Elohim? Alhim, a plural word. Divine workmen and energies. Incandescent and celestial stones. And especially supporters of the world. Governors or rulers of the world. Wheels of the world. Ophenim, flames and powers, sons of God. Vigilant counselors, etc. It is often asserted, and unjustly as usual, that China, nearly as old a country as India, had no cosmogony. It was unknown to Confucius, and the Buddhists extended their cosmogony without introducing a personal god, it is complained. The Yi King, the very essence of ancient thought and the combined work of the most venerated sages, fails to show a distinct cosmogony. Nevertheless, one existed, and a very distinct one. Only as Confucius did not admit of a future life. And the Chinese Buddhists reject the idea of one creator, accepting one cause and its numberless effects. They are misunderstood by the believers in a personal god. The great extreme, as of the commencement of changes, transmigrations, is the shortest and perhaps the most suggestive of all cosmogenies for those who, like the Confucianists, love virtue for its own sake and try to do good unselfishly without perpetually looking to reward and profit. The great extreme of Confucius produces two figures. These two produce in their turn the four images. These again, the eight symbols. It is complained that through the Confucianists, see in them heaven, earth, and man in miniature, we can see in them anything we like, no doubt, and so it is with regard to many symbols, especially those of the latest religions. But they who know something of occult numerals see in these figures the symbol, however rude, of a harmonious progressive evolution of cosmos and its beings, both heavenly and terrestrial. And anyone who has studied the numerical evolution in the primeval cosmogony of Pythagoras, a contemporary of Confucius, can never fail to find in his triad, Tetractis and Decad, emerging from the one and solitary monad, the same idea. Confucius is laughed at by his Christian biographer for talking of divination before and after this passage and is represented as saying, The eight symbols determine good and ill fortune and those lead to great deeds. There are no imitable images greater than heaven and earth. There are no changes greater than the four seasons, meaning north, south, east, and west, etc. There are no suspended images brighter than the sun and moon. In preparing things for use, there is none greater than the sage. In determining good and ill luck, there is nothing greater than the divining straws and the tortoise. Therefore, the divining straws and the tortoise, the symbolic sets of lines, and the great sage who looks at them as they become one and two and two become four and four become eight and the other sets three and six, are laughed to scorn only because his wise symbols are misunderstood. So the author of the volume cited and his colleagues will no doubt scoff at the stanzas given in our text, for they represent precisely the same idea. The old archaic map of cosmogony is full of lines in the Confucian style of concentric circles and dots. Yet all these represent the most abstract and philosophical conceptions of the cosmogony of our universe. At all events, it may, perhaps, answer better to the requirements and the scientific purposes of our age than the cosmogonical essays of St. Augustine and the Venerable Bede though these were published over a millennium later than the Confucian. Confucius, one of the greatest sages of the ancient world, believed in ancient magic and practiced it himself. If we take for granted the statements of Kia Yu, and he praised it to the skies in the Yi King, we are told by his reverend critic, Nevertheless, even in his age, 600 BC, Confucius and his school taught the sphericity of the earth and even the heliocentric system. While at about thrice 600 years after the Chinese philosopher, the popes of Rome threatened and even burnt heretics for asserting the same. He is laughed at for speaking of the sacred tortoise. 
No unprejudiced person can see any great difference between a tortoise and a lamb as candidates for sacredness, as both are symbols and no more. The ox, the eagle, and the lion, and occasionally the dove, are the sacred animals of the Western Bible. The first three are found grouped around the evangelists. The fourth, associated with these, a human face, is a seraph, i.e. a fiery serpent. The Gnostic Agathodemon, probably. The choice is curious and shows how paradoxical were the first Christians in their selections. For why should they have chosen these symbols of Egyptian paganism, when the eagle is never mentioned in the New Testament save once, when Jesus refers to it as a carrion eater, and in the Old Testament it is called unclean, when the lion is made a point of comparison with Satan, both roaring for men to devour, and the oxen are driven out of the temple. On the other hand, the serpent, brought in as an exemplar of wisdom, is now regarded as a symbol of the devil. The esoteric pearl of Christ's religion, degraded into Christian theology, may indeed be said to have chosen a strange and unfitting shell to be born in and evolved from. As explained, the sacred animals in the flames or sparks within the Holy Four refer to the prototypes of all that is found in the universe in the divine thought, in the root, which is the perfect cube or the foundation of the cosmos, collectively and individually. They have all an occult reference to primordial cosmic forms and the first concretions, work, and evolution of cosmos. In the earliest Hindu exoteric cosmogenies, it is not even the demiurge who creates, for it is said in one of the Puranas, the great architect of the world gives the first impulse to the rotary motion of our planetary system by stepping in turn over each planet and body. It is this action that causes each sphere to turn around itself and all around the sun. After which action, it is the Brahman Dika, the solar and lunar Petrus, the Yan Chohans, who take charge of their respective spheres earths and planets to the end of the Kalpa. The creators are the Rishis, most of whom are credited with the authorship of the mantras, or hymns, of the Rig Veda. They are sometimes seven, sometimes ten, when they become Prajapati, the Lord of Beings, then they re-become the seven and the fourteen Manus, as the representatives of the seven and fourteen cycles of existence, or days of Brahma, thus answering to the seven aeons when, at the end of the first stage of evolution, they are transformed into the seven stellar rishis, the saptarshis, while their human doubles appear as heroes, kings, and sages on this earth. The esoteric doctrine of the East, having thus furnished and struck the keynote, which under its allegorical garb is, as may be seen, the scientific as it is philosophical and poetical, every nation has followed its lead. It is from the exoteric religions that we have to dig out the root idea before we turn to esoteric truths, lest the latter should be rejected. Furthermore, every symbol in every national religion may be read esoterically, and a proof of its being correctly read when transliterated into its corresponding numerals and geometrical forms may be obtained from the extraordinary agreement of all glyphs and symbols, however much they may externally vary among themselves. For in the origin, these symbols were all identical. Take, for instance, the opening sentences in various cosmogenies. In every case, it is a circle, an egg, or a head. Darkness is always associated with this first symbol and surrounds it, as is shown in the Hindu, the Egyptian, the Chaldeo-Hebrew, and even the Scandinavian systems. Hence, black ravens, black doves, black waters, and even black flames. The seventh tongue of Agni, the fire god being called Kali, the black, since it was a black flickering flame. Two black doves flew from Egypt and, settling on the oaks of Dodona, gave their names to the Grecian gods. Noah sends out a black raven after the deluge, which is a symbol for the cosmic prolea after which began the real creation or evolution of our earth and humanity. Odin's black ravens fluttered around the goddess Saga and whispered to her of the past and the future. Now what is the inner meaning of all those black birds? 
It is that they are all connected with primeval wisdom, which flows out of the precosmic source of all, symbolized by the head, the circle, or the egg. And they all have an identical meaning and relate to the primordial archetypal man, Adam Kadmon, the creative origin of all things, which is composed of the host of cosmic powers, the creative Jian Chohans, which beyond which all is darkness. Let us inquire of the wisdom of the Kabbalah, even veiled and distorted as it is now to explain in its numerical language an approximate meaning, at least of the word raven. This is its number value as given in the source of measures. The term raven is used but once and taken as efeth, O-R-E-B-V equals 678, or 113 times 6, while the dove is mentioned five times. Its value is 71 and is 71 times 5 equals 355. Six diameters or the raven crossing would divide the circumference of a circle of 355 into 12 parts or compartments. And 355 subdivided for each unit by 6 would equal 213 to 0 or the head beginning in the first verse of Genesis. This divided or subdivided after the same fashion by 2 or the 355 by 12 would give 213 2, or the word brash, or the first word of Genesis, with its prepositional prefix, signifying the same concreted general form astronomically with the one here intended. Now, the secret reading of the first verse in Genesis being in rash, be rash, or head, developed gods, the heavens, and the earth. It is easy to comprehend the esoteric meaning of the raven once that the like meaning of the flood or Noah's deluge is ascertained. Whatever the many other meanings of this emblematical allegory may be, its chief meaning is that of a new cycle and a new round. Our fourth round. The raven, or the Ethha Oreb, O-R-E-B-V, yields the same numerical value as the head and returned not to the ark, while the dove returned, carrying the olive branch. When Noah, the new man of the new race, whose prototype is Vevasvada, Manu, prepared to leave the ark, the womb, or arga of terrestrial nature. He is the symbol of the purely spiritual, sexless, and androgyne man of the first three races, who vanished from earth forever. Numerically, in the Kabbalah, Jehovah, Adam, Noah are one. At best, then, it is Didi descending on Ararat and later on Sinai to incarnate henceforth in man. His image, through the natural process, the mother's womb, whose symbols are the Ark, the Mount, Sinai, etc., in Genesis. The Jewish allegory is astronomical and physiological rather than anthropomorphic. And here lies the abyss between the Aryan and the Semitic systems though both are built on the same foundation, as shown by an expounder of the Kabbalah. The basic idea underlying the philosophy of the Hebrews was that God contained all things within himself and that man was his image. Man, including woman, as androgynes, and that geometry and numbers and measures applicable to astronomy are continued in the terms man and woman and the apparent incongruity of such a mode was eliminated by showing the connection of man and woman with a particular system of numbers and measures and geometry. By the Peturient time periods, which furnished the connecting link between the terms used and the facts shown, and perfected the mode used. It is argued that, the primal cause being absolutely incognizable, the symbol of its first comprehensible manifestation was the conception of a circle with its diameter line. So as it wants to carry the idea of geometry, phallicism, and astronomy, and this was finally applied to the signification of simply human generative organs. Hence the whole cycle of events from Adam and the patriarchs down to Noah is made to apply to phallic and astronomical uses the one regulating the other as the lunar periods, for instance. Hence, too, the genesis of the Hebrews begins after their coming out of the ark and the end of the flood, i.e. at the fourth race. 
With the Aryan people, it is different. Eastern esotericism has never degraded the one infinite deity, the container of all things, to such uses. And this is shown by the absence of Brahma from the Rig Veda and the modest positions occupied therein by Rudra and Vishnu, who became the powerful and great gods, the infinites of the exoteric creeds, ages later. But even they, creators, as they all three may be, are not the direct creators and forefathers of men. The latter are shown occupying a still lower scale, and are called the Prajapatis, the Petris, our lunar ancestors, etc., but never the one infinite God. Esoteric philosophy shows only physical man as created in the image of the deity, which deity, however, is only the minor gods. It is the higher self, the real ego, which alone is divine and God. Section 13. The Seven Creations There was neither day nor night, nor sky nor earth, nor darkness nor light nor any other thing save only one, unapprehensible by intellect, or that which is Brahma and Pums, spirit, and Pradhana, crude matter. In Vishnu Purana, Parashara says to Maitreya, his pupil, I have thus explained to you, excellent Muni, six creations, the creation of the Arvak Shrota's beings was the seventh, and was that of man. Then he proceeds to speak of two additional and very mysterious creations, variously interpreted by the commentators. Origen, commenting on the books written by Celsus, his Gnostic opponent, books which were all destroyed by the prudent church fathers, evidently answered the objections of his contradictor and reveals his system at the same time. This was clearly septenary, but the theogony of Celsus, the genesis of the stars or planets, and of sound and color, found as an answer satire and no more. Celsus, you see, desiring to exhibit his learning, speaks of a ladder of creation with seven gates, and on top of it, the eighth ever closed. The mysteries of the Persian Mithras are explained and musical reasons, moreover, are added. And to these again he strives to add a second explanation connected also with musical considerations. That is to say, with the seven notes of the scale, the seven spirits of the stars, etc. Valentinus expatiates upon the power of the great seven, who were summoned to bring forth this universe after Arhetos, or the ineffable, whose name is composed of seven letters, had represented the first hebdomad. The name Arhetos indicates the sevenfold nature of the One, the Logos. The goddess Rhea, says Proclus, is a monad, duad, and heptad, comprehending in herself all the Titanidae, who are seven. The seven creations are found in almost every Purana. They are all preceded by what Wilson translates as the indiscreet principle, absolute spirit independent of any relation with objects of sense. They are one, Mahat Adva, the universal soul, infinite intellect, or divine mind. Two, Tanmatras, Bhuta, or Bhutasarga, elemental creation and the first differentiation of the universal indiscreet substance. Three, Indriya, or Indriyaka, organic evolution. These were the three Prakrita creations, the developments of indiscreet nature, preceded by the indiscreet principle. Four, Mukya, the fundamental creation of perceptible things, was that of inanimate bodies. Five, Taryagyanya, or Tiryaksrotas, was that of animals, Erdvas Rotas, or that of divinities. Number seven, Arvax Rotas, was that of man. This is the order given in the exoteric texts. According to esoteric teaching, there are seven primary and seven secondary creations. 
the former being the forces self-evolving from the one causeless force, the latter showing the manifested universe emanating from the already differentiated divine elements. Esoterically, as well as exoterically, all the above enumerated creations stand for the seven periods of evolution, whether after an age or a day of Brahma. This is the teaching par excellence of occult philosophy, which, however, never uses the term creation, nor even that of evolution, with regard to primary creation, but calls all such forces the aspects of the causeless force. In the Bible, the seven periods are dwarfed into the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, and the Westerns adhere to the letter. In the Hindu philosophy, when the active creator has produced the world of gods, the germs of all the undifferentiated elements and the rudiments of future senses, the world of noumena, in short, the universe remains unaltered for a day of Brahma, a period of 4 billion, 320 million years. This is the seventh passive period, or the Sabbath of Eastern philosophy, following six periods of active evolution. In the Shatapatha Brahmana, Brahma neuter, the absolute cause of all causes, radiates the gods. Having radiated the gods through its inherent nature, the work is interrupted. In the first book of Manu, it is said, at the expiration of each night, Pralaya, Brahma, having been asleep, awakes and, through the soul energy of the motion, causes to emanate from itself the spirit, or mind, which in its essence is and yet is not. In the Sefer Yetzera, the Kabbalist book of creation, the author has evidently re-echoed the words of Manu. In it, the divine substance is represented as having alone existed from the eternity boundless and absolute, and as having emitted from itself the spirit. And this is the Kabbalistic abstract trinity, so unceremoniously anthropomorphized by the fathers. From this triple one emanated the whole cosmos. First, from one emanated number two, or air, the creative element, and then number three, water, proceeded from the air, ether, or fire, completes the mystic four, the arba'il, in the Eastern doctrine, fire is the first element, ether, synthesizing the whole, since it contains all of them. In the Vishnu Purana, the whole seven periods are given, and the progressive evolution of the spirit soul and of the seven forms of matter or principles is shown. It is impossible to enumerate them in this work. The reader is asked to peruse one of the Puranas. Our Yehuda began, it is written, Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of waters. Come see, at the time that the Holy created the world, he, they, created seven heavens above. He created seven earths below, seven seas, seven days, seven rivers, seven weeks, seven years, seven times, and seven thousand years. That the world has been the seventh of all, the millennium. So here are seven earths below. They are all inhabited except those which are above and those which are below. And between each earth, a heaven, firmament, is spread out between each other. And there are in them, these earths, creatures who look different from one the other. But if you object and say that all the children of the world came out from Adam, it is not so. And the lower earths, where do they come from? They are from the chain of the earth and from the heaven above. Arrhenius also is our witness and a very unwilling one. That the Gnostics taught the same system, veiling very carefully the true esoteric meaning. This veiling, however, is identical with that of the Vishnu Purana and others. Thus, Irenaeus writes of the Macrosians, they maintain that first of all the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth, were produced after the image of the primary tetrad above, and that then if we add their operations, namely heat, cold, moisture, and dryness, an exact likeness of the ogdode is presented. Only this likeness of the ogdode itself is a blind, 
just as in the seven creations of the Vishnu Purana, to which two more are added, of which the eighth, termed Anugraha, possesses both the qualities of goodness and darkness, a Sankyan more than a Puranic idea. For Irenaeus says again that they, the Gnostics, had a like eighth creation which was good and bad, divine and human. They affirm that man was formed on the eighth day. Sometimes they affirm that he was made on the sixth day, and at others on the eighth, unless perchance they mean that his earthly part was formed on the sixth day and his fleshly part on the eighth day, these two being distinguished by them. They were so distinguished, but not as Irenaeus gives it. The Gnostics had a superior and an inferior hebdomad in heaven, and a third terrestrial hebdomad in the plane of matter. Iao, the mystery god and the regent of the moon, as given in Origen's chart, was the chief of these superior seven heavens, hence identical with the chief of the lunar Petris, the name given by them to the lunar Dian Chohans. They affirm that these seven heavens are intelligent and speak of them as being angels, writes the same Iranius, and adds that on this account they termed Iao Hebdomas, while his mother was called Ogdos, because, as he explains, she preserved the number of the first begotten and primary Ogdode of the Pleroma. This first begotten Ogdode was in Theogony the second Logos, the manifested because it was born of the sevenfold first logos, hence it is the eighth on this manifested plane. And in astrolatry, it was the sun, Martanda, the eighth son of Aditi, whom she rejects while preserving her seven sons, the planets. For the ancients have never regarded the sun as a planet, but as a central and fixed star. This, then, is the second hebdomad, born of the seven-rayed one, Agni, the sun and what not, only not the seven planets, which are Surya's brothers, not his sons. With the Gnostics, these astral gods were the sons of Yaldabaoth, from Ilda, child, and Boath, egg, the son of Sophia, Akamoth, the daughter of Sophia, or wisdom, whose region is the Pleroma. Yaldabaoth produces from himself these six stellar spirits, Iao, Jehovah, Sabbath, Adonius, Elonius, Orius, Astaphius, and it is said, they who are the second or inferior hebdomad. As to the third, it is composed of the seven primeval men, the shadows of the lunar gods, projected by the first hebdomad. In this, the Gnostics did not, as seen, differ much from the esoteric doctrine except that they veiled it. As to the charge made by Iranius, who is evidently ignorant of the true tenets of the heretics, with regard to man being created on the sixth day and man being created on the eighth, this relates to the mysteries of the inner man. It will become comprehensible to the reader only after he has read volume two and understood well the anthropogenesis of the esoteric doctrine. Yaldabaoth is a copy of Manu, who boasts, O best of twice-born men, know that I, Manu, am he, the creator of all this world, whom that male Virage spontaneously produced. He first creates the ten lords of being, the Prajapatis, who, as verse 36 tells us, produce seven other Manus. Yaldabaoth boasts likewise, I am father and God, and there is no one above me, he exclaims, for which his mother coolly puts him down by saying, Do not lie, Yaldabaoth, for the father of all, the first man, Anthropos, is above thee, and so is Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. This is good proof that there were three logi, besides the seven born of the first, one of these being the solar logos. And again, who was the Anthropos himself, so much higher than Yaldabaoth? The Gnostic records alone can solve this riddle. The Pistis Sophia, the four-voweled name I-E-O-U, is generally accompanied by the epithet 
of the primal or first man. This shows again that the Gnosis was but an echo of our archaic doctrine. The names answering to Parabrahman, to Brahma, and Manu, the first thinking man, are composed of one voweled, three voweled, and seven voweled sounds. Marcus, whose philosophy was certainly more Pythagorean than anything else, speaks of a revelation to him of the seven heavens, sounding each one vowel as they pronounce the seven names of the seven angelic hierarchies. When spirit has permeated every minutest atom of the seven principles of cosmos, then the secondary creation, after the above-mentioned period of rest, begins. The creators, Elohim, outline in the second hour the shape of man, says Rabbi Simeon in the Nakthemeron of the Hebrews. There are twelve hours in the day, says the Mishnah. And it is during these that creation is accomplished. The twelve hours of the day are again the dwarfed copy, the faint, yet faithful, echo of primitive wisdom. They are like the 12,000 divine years of the gods, a cyclic blind. Every day of Brahma has 14 Manus, which the Hebrew Kabbalists, following, however, in this the Chaldeans, have disguised into 12 hours. The Nukthemeron of Apollonius of Tyana is the same thing. The dodecahedron lies concealed in the perfect cube, says the Kabbalists. The mystic meaning of this is that the twelve great transformations of spirit into matter, the twelve thousand divine years, take place during the four great ages, or the first Mahayuga. Beginning with the metaphysical and the suprahuman, it ends in the physical and purely human natures of cosmos and man. Eastern philosophy can give the number of mortal years that run along the line of spiritual and physical evolutions of the seen and the unseen, if Western science fails to do so. Primary creation is called the creation of light, spirit, and the secondary that of darkness, matter. Both are found in Genesis. The first is the emanation of self-born gods, Elohim. The second of physical nature. This is why it is said in the Zohar, O oh, companions, companions, man as emanation was both man and woman, as well on the side of the father as on the side of the mother. And this is the sense of the words, and Elohim spake, let there be light, and it was light. And this is the twofold man. Light, however, on our plane is darkness in the higher spheres. Man and woman, on the side of the father, Spirit refers to primary creation, and on the side of the mother, matter, to the secondary. The twofold man is Adam Kadmon, the male and the female abstract prototype and the differentiated Elohim. Man proceeds from the Dian Chohan and is a fallen angel, a god in exile, as will be shown. In India, these creations were described as follows. One, the first creation, Mahadatva creation, the so-called because it was the primordial self-evolution of that which had to become Mahat, the divine mind, conscious and intelligent, esoterically the spirit of the universal soul. Worthiest of ascetics, through its potency, the potency of that cause, Every produced cause comes by its proper nature. And again, seeing that the potencies of all beings are understood only through the knowledge of that Brahma, which is beyond reasoning, creation, and the like, such potencies are referable to Brahma. That then precedes the manifestation. The first was Mahat, says Linga Purana, for the one... The that is neither first nor last, but all. Exoterically, however, this manifestation is the work of the Supreme One, a natural effect, rather, of an eternal cause. Or, as the commentator says, it might have been understood to mean that Brahma was then created, being identified with Mahat, active intelligence, or the operating will of the Supreme. Esoteric philosophy renders it the operating law. It is on the right comprehension of this tenet 
In the Brahmanas and Puranas that hangs, we believe, the apple of discord between the three Vedantin sects, the Advaita, Dvaita, and the Vishishtadvaita. The first argues rightly that Parabrahman, having no relation as the absolute all to the manifested world, the infinite having no connection with the finite, can neither will nor create, that therefore Brahma, Mahat, Eshvara, or whatever name the creative power may be known by, creative gods and all, are simply an elusive aspect of Parabrahman in the conception of the conceivers, while the other sects identify the impersonal cause with the creator, or Ishvara. Mahat, or Mahabudhi, is with the Vaishnavas, however, divine mind, in active operation, or as Anaxagoras has it, an ordering and disposing mind which was the cause of all things. Wilson saw at a glance the suggestive connection between Mahat and the Phoenician Mot, or Mut, who was female with the Egyptians, the goddess Mut, the mother, which, like Mahat, he says, was the first product of the mixture, of spirit and matter, and the first rudiment of creation giving it a still a more materialistic and anthropomorphic coloring. Nevertheless, the esoteric sense of the doctrine is seen. Through every exoteric sentence on the very face of the old Sanskrit texts that treat of primordial creation, the supreme soul, the all-permanent, sarvaja, substance of the world having entered, been drawn into matter, prakriti, and spirit, purusha, agitated the mutable and the immutable principles, the season of creation, Manvantara, being arrived. The noose of the Greeks, which is spiritual or divine mind, or men's, Mahat, operates upon matter in the same way. It enters into and agitates it. In the Phoenician cosmogony also, spirit mixing with its own principles gives rise to creation. The Orphic triad shows an identical doctrine. For their phanies, or eros, chaos, containing crude, undifferentiated cosmic matter, and chronos, time, are the three cooperating principles emanating from the concealed and unknowable point which produced the work of creation. And they are the Hindu Purusha, phanies, Pradhana, chaos, and Kala, chronos. The good Professor Wilson does not like the idea, and no Christian clergyman, however liberal, would. He remarks that the mixture of the supreme spirit or soul with its own principles is not mechanical. It is an influence or effect exerted upon intermediate agents which produce effects. The sentence in Vishnu Purana, as fragrance, affects the mind from its proximity merely, and do not from any immediate operation upon mind itself. So the Supreme influenced the elements of creation. The reverend and erudite Sanskritist correctly explains by, as perfumes do not delight the mind by actual contact, but by the impression they make upon the sense of smelling, which communicates it to the mind, adding the entrance of the Supreme into spirit, as well as matter, is less intelligible than the view elsewhere taken of it, as the infusion of spirit identified with the supreme into prakriti or matter alone. He prefers the verse in Padma Purana, He who is called the male, spirit of prakriti, that same divine Vishnu entered into prakriti. This view is certainly more akin to the plastic character of certain verses in the Bible concerning the patriarchs, such as Lot and even Adam, and others of still more anthropomorphic nature but it is just that which led humanity to phallicism, the Christian religion being honeycombed with it from the first chapter of Genesis down to Revelation. The esoteric doctrine teaches that the Yan Chohans are the collective aggregate of divine intelligence or primordial mind, and that the first Manus, the seven mind-born spiritual intelligences, are identical with the former. Hence the Quan Shi Yin, the golden dragon in whom are the seven, of stanza three, is the primordial logos, or Brahma, the first manifested creative power. And the dhyanic energies are the Manus, or Manu, 
Svayam Bhuva, collectively. The direct connection, moreover, between the Manus and Mahat is easy to see. Manu is from the root man to think, and thinking proceeds from the mind. It is, in cosmogony, the pre-nebular period. Two, the second creation, Bhuta, was of the rudimental principles or tanmatras, thence termed the elemental creation of Bhutasarga. It is the period of the first breath of the differentiation of the precosmic elements or matter. Bhutadi means the origin of the elements and precedes Bhutasarga, the creation or differentiation of those elements in primordial akasha, chaos or vacuity. In the Vishnu Purana, it is said to proceed along and belong to the triple aspect of Ahankara, translated egotism, but meaning rather that untranslatable term, I amness, that which first issues from Mahat or divine mind. The first shadowy outline of selfhood for pure Ahankara becomes passionate and finally rudimental or initial. It is the origin of conscious and as of all unconscious being, though the esoteric school rejects the idea of anything being unconscious, save on our plane of illusion and ignorance. At this stage of the second creation, the second hierarchy of the Manus appear, the Nyan Chohans or Devas, who are the origin of form, Rupa, the Chitrashikanandanas, bright crested or rickshas, those Rishis who have become the informing souls of the seven stars. Of the Great Bear. In astronomical and cosmogonical language, this creation relates to the fire mist period, the first stage of cosmic life, after its chaotic state, when atoms issue from Laya. Three, the third creation. The third or Indriya creation was the modified form of Ahankara, the conception of I, from Aham, I termed the organic creation or creation of the senses, Indriyaka. These three were the Prakrita creation, the discrete developments of indiscrete nature preceded by the indiscrete principle. Preceded by ought to be replaced here with beginning with Budai, for the latter is neither a discrete nor an indiscrete quantity, but partakes of the nature of both, in man as in cosmos. A unit or human monad on this plane of illusion, when once freed from the three forms of Ahankara and liberated from its terrestrial manas, Bhuti indeed becomes a continued quantity, both in duration and extension, for it is eternal and immortal. Earlier it is stated that the third creation abounding with the quality of goodness is termed Erdvastrotas. And a page or two further, the Urdvasrotas creation is referred to as the sixth creation, or that of the divinities. This shows plainly that earlier as well as later Manvantars have been purposefully confused to prevent the profane from perceiving the truth. This is called incongruity and contradictions by the Orientalists. The three creations beginning with intelligence are elemental, but the six creations which proceed from the series of which intellect is the first are the work of Brahma. Here, creations mean everywhere stages of evolution, mahat, intellect or mind, which corresponds with manas, the former being on the cosmic and the latter on the human plane, stands there too, lower than buddhi or supra-divine intelligence. Therefore, when we read in Linga Purana that the first creation was that of Mahat, intellect being the first in manifestation, we must refer that specified creation to the first evolution of our system or even our earth, none of the preceding ones being discussed in the Puranas but only occasionally hinted at. This creation of the first immortals, or Divasarga, is the last of the series and has a universal meaning. It refers namely to evolution in general and not specifically to our Manvantara, which begins with the same over and over again, thus showing that it refers to several distinct Kalpas. For it is said, at the close of the past Padma Kalpa, the divine Brahma awoke from his night of sleep and beheld the universal void. 
Then Brahma is shown going once more over the seven creations in the secondary stage of evolution, repeating the first three on the objective plane. Four, the fourth creation, the Mukya, or primary as it begins the series of four, neither the term inanimate, bodies, or immovable things, as translated by Wilson, gives a correct idea of the Sanskrit words used. Esoteric philosophy is not alone in rejecting the idea of any atom being inorganic, for it is found also in Orthodox Hinduism. Moreover, Wilson himself says, all the Hindu systems consider vegetable bodies as endowed with life. Charachara, or the synonymous Statvara and Jangama, is therefore inaccurately rendered by animate and inanimate sentient beings and unconscious, or conscious and unconscious beings, etc. Locomotive and fixed would be better, since trees are considered to possess souls. The Mukya is the creation, or rather organic evolution, of the vegetable kingdom. In this secondary period, the three degrees of the elemental or rudimental kingdoms are evolved in this world, corresponding inversely in order to the three Prakritic creations, during the primary period of Brahma's activity. As in that period, in the words of Vishnu Purana, the first creation was that of Mahat, or intellect. The second was that of the rudimental principles, Tanmatras. The third was the creation of the senses, Indriyaka. So in this one, the order of the elemental forces stands thus. One, the nascent centers of force, intellectual and physical. Two, the rudimentary principles, nerve force, so to say, and three, nascent apperception, which is the mahat of the lower kingdoms, and is especially developed in the third order of elementals. These are succeeded by the objective kingdom of minerals, in which this apperception is entirely latent, to redevelop only in the plants. The mukya creation, then, is the middle point between the three lower and the three higher kingdoms which represent the seven esoteric kingdoms of cosmos and of earth. Number five, the fifth creation. The Tyriac Shrotas, or Teriagyanya creation, that of the sacred animals, corresponding on earth only to the dumb animal creation. That which is meant by animals in the primary creation is the germ of awakening consciousness, or of Apperception, that which is faintly traceable in some sensitive plants on Earth and more distinctly in the protistic monera. On our globe, during the first round, animal creation precedes that of man, while the mammalian animals evolve from man in our fourth round on the physical plane. In the first round, the animal atoms are drawn into a cohesion of human physical form while in the fourth, the reverse occurs according to magnetic conditions developed during life. And this is metempsychosis, this fifth stage of evolution, called exoterically creation, may be viewed in both the primary and secondary periods, one as the spiritual and cosmic, the other as the material and terrestrial. It is archibosis, or life origination, Origination, so far, of course, as the manifestation of life on all seven planes is concerned. It is at this period of evolution that the absolutely eternal universal motion or vibration, that which is called in esoteric language the great breath, differentiates into the primordial first manifested atom. More and more, as chemical and physical sciences progress, does this occult axiom find its corroboration in the world of knowledge? The scientific hypothesis that even the simplest elements of matter are identical in their nature and differ from each other only in consequence of the various distributions of atoms in the molecule or speck of substance or of the modes of its atomic vibration gains more ground every day. Thus, as the differentiation of the primordial germ of life has to precede the evolution of the Dian Chohan, of the third group, or hierarchy of being in primary creation, before those gods can become embodied in their first ethereal form, Rupa, 
So animal creation has for the same reason to precede divine man on earth. And this is why we find in the Puranas, the fifth, the Tariyonya creation was that of animals. Number six, the sixth creation. The Urvasrotas creation, or that of the divinities. But these divinities are simply the prototypes of the first race, the fathers of their midborn progeny with the soft bones. It is these who became the evolvers of the sweatborn, an expression explained in Volume 2. Created beings explains the Vishnu Purana, although they are destroyed in their individual forms at the periods of dissolution, yet being affected by the good or evil acts of former existences, are never exempted from their consequences. And when Brahma produces the world anew, they are the progeny of his will. Collecting his mind into itself, yoga willing, Brahma creates the four orders of beings, termed gods, demons, progenitors, and men. Progenitors here meaning the prototypes and evolvers of the first root race of men. The progenitors are the Pitris and are of seven classes. They are said in exoteric mythology to be born of Brahma's side, like Eve from the rib of Adam. Finally, the sixth creation is followed and creation in general closed by number seven, the seventh creation. The evolution of the Arvaksrotas beings, which was that of man. The eighth creation mentioned is no creation at all. It is the blind, for it refers to a purely mental process. The cognition of the ninth creation, which in its turn is an effect manifesting in the secondary of that which was a creation in the primary. Prakrita creation. The eighth then, called the Anugraha, the Pratyaya Sarga, or intellectual creation of the Sankhyas is the creation of which we have a notion in its esoteric aspect, or to which we give intellectual assent, anugraha, in contradistinction to organic creation. It is the correct perception of our relations to the whole range of gods, and especially of those we bear to the Kumaras, the so-called ninth creation, which is in reality an aspect or reflection of the sixth in our Manvantara. The Vevasvara. There is a ninth, the Kumara creation, which is both primary and secondary, says the Vishnu Purana, the oldest of such texts. As an esoteric text explains, the Kumaras are the Jnanis, derived immediately from the Supreme Principle, who reappear in the Vavasveda Manu period for the progress of mankind. The translator of the Vishnu Purana corroborates it by remarking that these sages live as long as Brahma, and they are only created by him in the first Kalpa, although their generation is very commonly but inconsistently introduced in the secondary Varaha or Padma Kalpa. Thus, the Kumaras are exoterically the creation of Rudra or Nila Lohita, a form of Shiva by Brahma and of certain other mind-born sons of Brahma. But in the esoteric teachings, they are the progenitors of the true spiritual self and the physical man, the higher Prajapadis, while the Petris, or lower Prajapadis, are no more than the fathers of the model, or type of his physical form made in their image. Four, and occasionally five, are mentioned freely in the exoteric texts, three of the Kamuras being secret. The four Kamuras are the mind-born sons of Brahma, some specify seven. All these seven Vedhatra, the patronymic of the Kumaras, the maker's sons, are mentioned and described in Ishvara Krishna's Sankhya Karika with the commentary of Guda Padacharya, Shankaracharya Paraguru attached to it. It discusses the nature of the Kumaras, though it refrains from mentioning by name all the seven Kumaras, but calls them instead the seven sons of Brahma, which they are, as they are created by Brahma in Rudra. The list of names it gives us is Sanaka, Sanananda, Sanatana, Kapila, Ribu, and Panchashika, but these again are all Eliases. The exoteric four are Sanakumara, 
Sanananda, Sanaka, and Sanatana. And the Esoteric Three, Sana, Kapila, and Sanatsuyata. Special attention is once more drawn to this class of Yan Chohans, for herein lies the mystery of generation and heredity hinted at in the commentary on stanza 7, in treating of the four orders of angelic beings. Volume 2 explains their position in the divine hierarchy. Meanwhile, let us see what the exoteric texts say about them. They say little, and to him who fails to read between the lines, nothing. We must have recourse here to other Puranas for the elucidation of this term, remarks Wilson, who does not suspect for one moment that he is in the presence of the angels of darkness, the mythical great enemy of his church. Therefore, he contrives to elucidate no more than that these divinities declining to create progeny, and thus rebelling against Brahma, remained as the same of the first, Sanakumara, implies, ever boys, Kumaras, that is ever pure and innocent, whence their creation is called the Kumara. The Puranas, however, may afford a little more light. Being ever as he was born, he is here called a youth, and hence his name is well known as Sanakumara. In the Shaiva Puranas, the Kumaras are always described as yogins. The Kurma Purana, after enumerating them, says, these five, O Brahmins, were yogins who acquired entire exemption from passion. They are five because two of the Kumaras fell. So untrustworthy are some translations of the Orientalists that in the French translation of the Hari Vamsha, it is said, the seven Prajapati, Rudra, Skanda, his son, and Sanakumara proceeded to create beings. Whereas, as Wilson shows, the original is these seven, created progeny, and so did Rudra, but Skanda and Sanakumara restrained their power, abstained from creation. The four orders of beings are referred to sometimes as Ambuansi, which Wilson renders as literally waters and believes it a mystic term. It is one, no doubt, but he evidently failed to catch the real esoteric meaning. Waters and water stand as the symbol for Akasha, the primordial ocean of space, on which Narayana, the self-born spirit, moves, reclining on that which is its progeny. Water is the body of Nara, thus we have heard the name of water explained. Since Brahma rests on the water, therefore he is termed Narayana. Pure, Purusha, created the waters pure. At the same time, water is the third principle in material cosmos and the third in the realm of the spiritual. Spirit of fire, flame, akasha, ether, water, air, earth are the cosmic, sidereal, psychic, spiritual, and mystic principles preeminently occult on every plane of being. Gods, demons, Petrus, and men are the four orders of beings to whom the term mbamsi is applied. Because they are all the product of waters, mystically, of the akashic ocean, and of the third principle in nature. In the Vedas, it is a synonym of the gods. Petris and men on earth are the transformations or rebirths of gods and demons, spirits on a higher plane. Water is, in another sense, the feminine principle. Venus, Aphrodite, is the personified sea and the mother of God of love, the generatrix of all the gods, as much as the Christian Virgin Mary is Mare, the sea the mother of the Western god of love, mercy, and charity. If the student of esoteric philosophy thinks deeply over the subject, he is sure to find out all the suggestiveness of the term Ambamsi in its many relations to the Virgin in heaven, to the celestial Virgin of the alchemists, and even to the waters of grace of the modern Baptist. Of all the seven great divisions of Yan Chohans, or Divas, there is none with which humanity is more concerned than with the Kumaras. Imprudent are the Christian theologians who have degraded them into fallen angels, and now call them Satan and demons, as among these heavenly denizens who refuse to create the Archangel Michael, the greatest patron saint of the Western and Eastern churches, under his double name of Saint Michael and a supposed copy on earth, 
St. George conquering the dragon has to be given one of the most prominent places. The Kumaras, the mind-born sons of Brahma Rudra, or Shiva, mystically the howling and terrific destroyer of human passions and physical senses, which are ever in the way of the development of the higher spiritual perceptions and the growth of the inner, eternal man, are the progeny of Shiva, the Mahayogi, the great patron of all the yogis and mystics of India. Shiva Rudra is the destroyer, as Vishnu is the preserver, and both are the regenerators of spiritual as well as of physical nature. To live as a plant, the seed must die. To live as a conscious entity in the eternity, the passions and senses of man must die before his body does. That is to live is to die, and to die is to live, has been too little understood in the West. Shiva, the destroyer, is the creator and the savior of spiritual man, and he is the good gardener of nature. He weeds out the plants, human and cosmic, and kills the passions of the physical, to call to life the perceptions of the spiritual man. The Kumaras themselves are, then being the virgin ascetics, refuse to create the material being man. Well, may they be suspected of a direct connection with the Christian Archangel Michael, the virgin combatant of the dragon Apophis, whose victim is every soul united too loosely to its immortal spirit, the angel who, as shown by the Gnostics, refused to create just as the Kumaras did. Does not that patron angel of the Jews preside over Saturn, Shiva, or Rudra? And the Sabbath, the day of Saturn? Is he not shown of the same essence with his father, Saturn, and called the son of time, Kronos or Kala, a form of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva? And is it not old time of the Greeks, with its scythe and sand glass, identical with the ancient days of the Kabbalists, the latter ancient being one with the Hindu ancient of days? Brahma, in his triune form, whose name is also Sanat, the ancient? Every Kumara bears the prefix of Sanat and Sana, and Sanishara is Saturn, the planet, Sani and Sara, the king Saturn, whose secretary in Egypt was thought Hermes the first. They are thus identified both with the planet and the god Siva, who are in their turn shown the prototypes of Saturn, who is the same as Bel, Baal, Shiva, and Jehovah, Sabbath, the angel of the face of whom is Michael, who is as God. He is the patron and guardian angel of the Jews, as Daniel tells us. And before the Kumaras were degraded by those who were ignorant of their very name into demons and fallen angels, the Greek Ophites, the occultly inclined predecessors and precursors of the Roman Catholic Church, after its succession and separation from the primitive Greek church, had identified Michael with the Ophiomorphos, the rebellious and opposing spirit. This means nothing more than the reverse aspect, symbolically, of Ophis, the divine wisdom of, or Christos. In the Talmud, Michael is prince of water and the chief of the seven spirits, for the same reason that one of his many prototypes, Sanatsuyara, the chief of the Kumaras is called Ambamsi, waters, according to the commentary on Vishnu Purana. Why? Because the waters is another name for the great deep, the primordial waters of space or chaos, and also means mother, Amba, meaning Aditi and Akasha, the celestial virgin mother of the visible universe. Furthermore, the waters of the flood are also called the great dragon or, or Ophis. Ophiomorphos. The Rudras will be noticed in their septenary character of fire spirits, in the symbolism attached to the stanzas in Volume 2. There we shall also consider the cross, 3 plus 4, under its primeval and later forms, and shall use for purposes of comparison the Pythagorean numbers side by side with the Hebrew metrology. The immense importance of the number 7 will thus become evident, as the root number of nature. We shall examine it from the standpoint of the Vedas and the Chaldean scriptures. 
as it exited in Egypt thousands of years BC and as treated in the Gnostic records, we shall show how its importance as a basic number has gained recognition in physical science. And we shall endeavor to prove that the importance attached to the number seven throughout all antiquity was due to no fanciful imaginings of uneducated priests, but to a profound knowledge of natural law.